Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Are you still there? I believe that interpolation is hardly rhetorical, Mr. Spade. To what have you been up, if you'll pardon the expression? And has that girl regained her facilities? I uh, wouldn't know, but her uh, faculties are as good as ever, if you'll pardon the expression. Mr. Spade, sometimes I think you're a regular philanthropist. Don't you mean philanderer? How much money did you make out of that case? Well, I uh, broke even, anyway. That's what I mean. You're a philanthropist. Well, you know best, Bernadine. By the way, was that man really murdered with the bus saw, or was that just publicity? He really was, Bernadine. Why? There just happened to be one lying around. Oh, I don't mean that. Why was he killed? For the wheel of life. Oh. You're not going to ask what that is? Some curio, no doubt. Listen, Bernadine, the wheel of life is, uh... Oh, well. I suppose I don't have to tell you to stay where you are. Just sit quietly with your book in your hand, and I'll be right down to dictate my report on the wheel of life caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Come on, mister, give the gals a break. Treat them to a look-see at a really handsome head of hair. Neat, well-groomed hair, the way yours is going to look when you spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Famous Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, how about it, men? Why hold off any longer when now's the time to get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I went down to St. James Infirmary to see my baby there. Ready, Bernadine, little flower? I'm way ahead of you. Keep it clean. No more than three erasures per page. Okie dokie? Oak. I mean doke. I mean date. Oh, I'd love to. July 11, 1948. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Subject, the uh, wheel of life caper. Now, don't go away, Bernadine. I don't know why these things always have to happen to me. Under private detectives in the San Francisco Classified Directory, there are listed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 agencies, several with large display ads. But somehow she managed to find me. It's all so strange, Mr. Spade. I hardly know where to begin. Well, the beginning is always a pretty good place to start, Miss O'Farrell. Uh, yes, the beginning. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. Even the buildings along the street seemed to be leaning at a crazy angle. And then I realized I was traveling down a hill. I looked wildly around for something to help me get my bearings, and there was a street sign, O'Farrell, stuck in my mind, so I gave it to your secretary when she asked for my name. Uh-huh. And uh, what's your real name? I don't know. I don't know who I am, where I came from, or where I'm going. Mr. Spade, I'm so frightened. Uh, now, wait a minute. A lot of people suffer from uh, temporary loss of memory. Uh, most of them recover but amnesia is a sickness, and I am not a doctor. Oh, and you won't even try to help me? Well, I can give you the name of a good head doctor right here in the building. There's also uh, missing persons. Oh, but I'm not a missing person. I'm right here. Yeah, I mean, where you aren't, somebody might be missing you, Nespa. But the police! Oh, I'd rather not. I, I might be wanted for some crime. How do I know? You sure you want to find out? Oh, yes, I do. I do. It's terrible not knowing, but I want to find out for myself. Can't you understand that? What do you think I can do for you? You might save my life. From what? 
I'll try to tell you exactly how it happened. First, I looked at my watch. It was three minutes past ten. The cable car stopped at the corner and a man got on. I, I couldn't remember ever having seen him before, but then I couldn't remember anything. He sat down beside me and he caught hold of my arm. I tried to pull away. Well, you can see the marks where he... Yeah. Well, who was he? He acted as if I were... I think I know what you mean. Did you uh, find out who he was? No, no, I was too frightened to speak. What did he say? He sort of growled it out of the side of his mouth, but it sounded as if he said, Lathrop wants to see you. Mm -hmm. You remember anybody named Lathrop? I can't remember anything before three minutes past ten this morning. Well, let's go on with since then. The guy grabbed you, said somebody named Lathrop wanted to see you, and then what? I I went into a panic. I managed to jerk away from him, and I jumped off the moving car, and then I looked in the classified section, and I found you. Why me? I don't know. The name, I guess... A spade to dig up my past. Please, Miss O'Farrell. <laughs> Do you think I'm very silly? No, I think you're very beautiful. I wish you could remember whether you're married or not. Oh, no. Well, at least I have no wedding ring. Uh, what have you got? I mean, besides what's visible. Well, I couldn't find much of anything. I went over my clothing. There don't seem to be any, seem to be any marks of any kind. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you got any money? Uh, a little over $300. Let's have it. The purse, too. All right. Uh Uh-huh, lipstick, aspirin, bobby pins, Kleenex, uh, nothing here. They couldn't have been bought in any (sighs) drugstore. Powder. (coughs) Hey, what kind of powder is this? Uh, Then there was this in my coat pocket. A match folder. Sailor's Rest Bar, Hotel Calcutta, 1100 Embarcadero. Little number written inside. 120. What's that, a room number? I don't know. (gasps) My purse, you have to destroy. Here's $10 of your own money. Buy a new one. Well. Did you find something? Coin, Chinese bit. Good luck piece, probably sewn in by whoever made it, maybe in China. That uh, ring any bells? Mm, no. No, I'm afraid not. Shoe. What? Your right shoe. Let's see it. Take it off. Uh, you aren't going to tear it up the way you did the purse, are you? Uh, dust. Plaster dust. Is that a clue? I don't know, is it? I'm not a detective. Well, you are in this case, baby. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything. Oh, it doesn't. That's everything. What am I going to do? Well, let me see. First, we better give you a name. Oh, Farrell's all right. You look like, uh, well, uh, Lana would do, but, well, that's in use. Uh, how about, uh, Poppy for forgetfulness? Poppy O'Farrell. <laughs> that's a funny name. Oh, you think so? Huh? Uh, I think I like it. You do? I think I like you, too. I liked her, too. There may have been blanks in her brain, but the rest of her figured. In the elevator, I started adding it up, and by the time we reached the street floor, it came to quite a tidy sum. Where are we going, Sam? Far, I hope. But uh, first, we're going to find you a place to stay. Oh, yes, we must be practical. No use overdoing it, huh? Oh, no, Sam, I didn't mean... (gasps) Wait... What's the matter? You remember something? That man, the one who followed me this morning, he's standing right out there waiting. The one in the straw hat leaning against the newsstand? Yes. Where are you going, Sam? You stay here. I just remembered something I hoped I could forget. Hello, Shuggy. What brings you back to town? Do I know you? That doesn't matter. I know you. The name you were using when you blew this town was Shuggy Bellows. You wouldn't take the risk of showing your face here again unless the caper was worth it. You've got a big nose. Keep it clean. You've been tailing that girl all day. Why? Damn what damn. Who's Lathrop? I don't remember. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think it over. Hey, officer! You dirty hey, shamash yelling down. No, 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 you don't. Come here. Here, here no, what's go. going on here? Break it up. Oh, oh, Mr. Spade. Is this fella giving you trouble now? Yeah, what kind of a beat are you pounding here, Clancy? Letting a cheap grifter like this walk around with an armpit full of gun? Or are they handing out permits to characters like these this day? Uh, these well, days? now, uh, how about that, son? Uh, have you a permit now? And a goop, copper. Oh, so, one of them clever lads he is. Well... Come along, me bucko, before I lose me temper and give you your lumps out. Okay, okay, I'm coming. That's better now. Uh, much obliged, Mr. Spade. I'll pay you for this, Thomas. And I goop to you, too. I was sure he would, but I was also sure that I wouldn't have to worry about him for the rest of the night. I checked Poppy O'Farrell in at the Belvedere, locked her in her room, and told Tiny Stover, the house dick, to keep an eye on her. When I left him, he was, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying his work. Then I headed for the Embarcadero. (laughs) 
I found the Hotel Calcutta, but I couldn't find the lobby. There wasn't any. It had been squeezed out by the sailor's rest bar. So I tried the bosun-type bartender. Howdy, mate. You, you got business aboard? Yeah, where do I find the purser? He went ashore. All the officers went ashore except the janitor. He's passed out in his bunk. Oh, uh-huh. how about the passengers? Uh, you're in the thick of them right now. They spend most of their time and their money right here. Uh, which one belongs to 120? Uh, you a dick? Yeah, but I got ten bucks. Well, what I can tell you ain't worth it, but thanks anyway. He stayed in his cabin. I only saw him at once. That's when he went ashore. I says to the deck steward, that's room clerk to you, who's a general. He says, name of Coralenko. I noticed him because he was a real creep, see? Six foot four, a solid brass. His head stuck up in the air, and he didn't move nothing from his stern to his shoulders. A real Frankenstein. Hey, do I keep a ten? Yeah. Do I get a look at his room? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? So I went. Nobody stopped me until I opened the door to 120. Then I stopped myself. It was an inside room with one small window and an air shaft. But it looked as if a flurry of snow had blown in. The floor and the rest of the flat surfaces were sprinkled with a fine, dirty white powder. It wasn't snow, it was dust. Plaster dust. Like the stuff I'd found in Poppy's handbag and on her shoes. I shook the place down, not expecting to find anything. I didn't until I opened the wardrobe. the body of a well-dressed ship surgeon, but his uniform was rumpled, torn, and bloodstained. From the look of him, his throat had been cut. I wondered if Poppy would be able to jog her memory that far back. When I found the murder weapon, I hoped she couldn't. I really did. It was not a knife. It was not even a razor. It was an electric buzzsaw. That tore it. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Wheel of Life caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Times being what they are, I could use a little publicity. And so could you, Lieutenant Dundee. What with the elections coming up and you with no promotion all these years. This one time, I got it instead of you and wished I hadn't. The morning papers called it the buzzsaw murder and went on shamelessly from there. Horror killing related by private eye. Stan Slade, ex-Pinkerton man, mum on Mystery Woman. Elderly sleuth, dodges photographers, denies hotel visit, was in bed with Apple and Good Book says paper. There wasn't a word of truth in it, mainly because nobody could get at the facts. I wasted most of the day down at headquarters trying to find out what name Shuggy Bellows had been booked under. Then I dropped in at the Belvedere. Poppy had checked out. I decided to go back to my office and drink poison. I hardly got the desk drawer open when a sobering influence walked in. It was a Mr. Six Feet Four of Solid Brass. The Frankenstein, who had been described to me by the bartender, is the occupant of room 120. Excuse me. I am Korlenko. Please, I shall sit down. I am so heavy. Make yourself at home. Oh. 
Mr. Swade. Uh, Swade. Uh, uh, excuse me. I am so heavy. I, I am Korlenko. So you told me. I am really Spade myself. So, why are she hiding from me? Who? That girl, Miss Paget. Her, I am paying one month in advance, $300 American. Me, she have dessert. I am not rich, only moderately wealthy. But you understand, it's not question from Modius alone. That ship's doctor, he was most kind to me. He cared to me even after I arrived. Now he are dead for his pains, his dirty trick. Yeah, 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 I know how you feel. Now, if you'll uh, take it a little easy, I think we'll get farther. You say this girl's name is uh, Paget, and she traveled with you. Uh, from Macau, da, uh, where she is the Florence Nightingale for Portuguese hospitals, forcing me to employ her, all others being Chinese nuns. That figures. You were uh, sick? No, only I am so heavy, they are breaking my back in traffic accident, a uh, rickshaw collusion. You're uh, wearing a plastic cast? Yes, yeah, like a turtle, I am close with my neck sticking out. Look, see? Now it is better as before. The ship's doctor trimmed the rough edges with buzz saw. Buzz, 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 I can walk. But it's like suit from armor, for which I alive. Look. <laughs> I looked again where he opened his shirt front, exposing the gray-white shell of plaster that surrounded his trunk from collarbone to hips. In a six-inch circle over the left side of his chest, I counted four bullet gouges. I dug one of the slugs out and examined it. It was 32 caliber. The plastic cast, which was molded to the shape of his body, was no more than an inch thick. I didn't see how it had stopped the slugs, but it had. About then, the parts of Korolenko that were not held rigid in the cast began to tremble violently. Why are they doing this? Why? To a virtually helpless man. Why, Mr. Spade? Why? 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 Uh, where did you have that cast put on? Don't I said Macau? The Portuguese hospital there? The same. They are hanging me up with the neck and plastering me. Comes a great pain, they put me to sleep from anesthetic. I, I are waking up in ambulance arriving at shipboard. Uh, why you wish I should tell you my operation? More important things we should be discussing. Uh, I think so, too. I think Miss Paget and her friends had something they wanted to smuggle out of Macau and into San Francisco, and you're it. Oh, excuse me. I, I am not comprehensible. Look, I mean, while you were out with the anesthetic... They uh, planted the goods, whatever they are, in or under your cast. Oh, oh, that is why I am so heavy. The wheel, the wheel. The what? The wheel, look, I'll show you. He hauled a manila envelope out of his overcoat pocket and waved it in my face. I took it over to my desk and fished out the contents. It was a set of X-ray films. Three of his spine showing the fractures, four of the skull, three I couldn't figure out, and one of his rib cage... Only something new had been added. In silhouette, it looked like the wheel off of a child's wagon. What is it, this wheel? What to do? What to do? Six months, I must remain in this straight jacket. If I remove it, I die. If I keep it on, it, they kill me to get their smuggle. Well, you look to me like the luckiest man alive. That wheel or whatever it is saved your life by stopping four slugs. But still, I shall die. How shall I die? When shall I die? Your best advices, please. Korolenko, I think you'd better die right now. Excuse me? It's the only safe place for you. The morgue. I called my friend Maxie the morgue man, gave him pitch number 137596. He agreed to play along. An hour later, I stood on the curb, head bowed, hat in hand, as the morgue wagon drove away into the gathering mist. Stay facing away, uh. What do you want, Shuggy? I want to blast this gun straight through you, and I will if you give me any excuse at all. You sound like you mean that, Shuggy. You're getting smart, Shamus, and I get going. Where to? Mr. Lathrop wants to see you. Shuggy, dear boy, you've not failed me this time. This will be the fabled Mr. Spade, eh? Come in, come in, come in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Spade. 
We'll talk. Tell you, Gunsel, to get that pistol out of my ribs. Oh, yes, indeed, Sugar. You mustn't overdo it. And get him out of here. I'm tired and nervous, and my price goes up a thousand bucks every minute he's in this room. When I get to ten thousand, I kill him. Then the price jumps to a hundred to take care of me on a murder rap. I should ought to plug you downstairs. Come, come, Sugar. Don't be ungracious. You wait in the other room now. Okay, it's your party. I'll get mine later. <laughs> Oh, dear. His bite's much worse than his bark, Mr. Spade. Don't start boring me so early in the evening. I came here to talk about the wheel. Oh, so you know about the wheel. I do better than that. I've got it. That may well be, but uh, do you know what to do with it? I got two possibilities. I can turn it over to the cops and you with it, or I can sit on it until it hatches. <laughs> A quaint conceit, sir. Round and round the little wheel goes, and where it shall stop, nobody knows. That's where you're wrong. It stops right here. So you better start placing your bets. Yeah, just what do you mean by that, sir? There's part of it. What is it? It's one of the slugs your guns will throw at Korolenko. I got three more just like it that I dug out of him before he was carried to the morgue. Well, huh. an advantage, I'll admit. But uh, hardly worth your while to take advantage of. Don't be too sure of that. Just uh, how much do you know about the wheel? So far, it's been worth two human lives to you at the risk of your own. That tells me all I need to know. Oh, no, not quite. Men have been killed in hold-ups for a few paltry sovereigns, but the wheel oh, is a horse of another color. Well, let's not change wheel horses in midstream, Mr. Lathrop. <laughs> yes. You must understand that the wheel has no absolute finitive value. Uh, monetarily speaking, the British Museum might pay close on to 5,000 pounds, hot as it is for the privilege of returning it. <laughs> Occidentals aren't the puka saives that they once were in the Orient. The theft of the wheel, if countenanced by the Western powers, would have most grave consequences. Most grave. Uh, are you attending, sir? <sighs> Wake me up when you get to the point. Ah, well, the point, sir, is this. That little wheel, that little wheel of gold, is the wheel of life, which the Buddha himself is said to have received into his hands from paradise. Now, given such a relic, a few old Buddhist monks can set up a shrine which even in the most miserable surroundings can attract enough pilgrims to outgross Radio City, Madison Square Garden, and Miami Beach in season. To say nothing of Hialeah. Uh, yes, quite. In short... We propose to act as booking agents for the wheel on a royalty basis with the percentage of the house. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring it to San Francisco? But good God, sir. Were we to bargain in the Orient, we should be hacked to pieces in our beds. I'll settle for a lump sum and let you do the bargaining. Uh, and uh, your price, sir? We can talk money later. First, I got to give the cops somebody for the doctor's murder and for Korolenko. Uh -huh. Well, that ought not to be too difficult. Uh, when may I expect delivery? I'll check on it. I went out to St. James Infirmary. <laughs> Say, Mark. Maxie, Sam Spade. Yes, yeah, Sammy. Uh, deal's okay. Send it up. The address is... Sam, the... Sam, wait. Yeah? Sam, he ain't here no more. What happened? Somebody claimed him. A girl. Eh, said she's his daughter. What did he do? When I'm playing dead like you told him to. Maxie, where did she send him? Uh, Avalon Mortuary, Corner Lynch and Hate. Okay, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, yes, yeah, Sammy? Uh, Maxie, put some clean sheets in that morgue wagon, size 16. I may be your next passenger. <laughs> At the Avalon Mortuary, the night watchman let me in. He said Mr. Korolenko's daughter had brought an overnight bag and was keeping a vigil by his beer in slumber room number seven. I approached on tiptoe. Just as I reached the door, I heard the most terrible sound I've ever heard. It was a buzzsaw biting into plaster. How deep, I didn't like to think. I did the first thing that popped into my head. I grabbed up a lamp from a console, smashed the bulb, and plunged it into a vase of flowers. As luck would have it, slumber room number seven was on the same fuse box. As luck would not have it, I was facing a desperate woman in the dark. I hugged the carpet while she emptied the gun. I hoped she didn't have a spare. I forgot about the buzzsaw. The room lighted up momentarily from the lights inside my head, and I staggered back against the wall. I waited for her to get her bearings again. There was no hope of me getting mine. Then I heard a big, hollow thud. The whole room shook and the lights went on. Poppy O'Farrell and or Paget lay on the floor under the stony weight of Coralenko plus 60 pounds of plaster. Get up! Get up! You're crushing me! 
I can't. I am so heavy. You, uh, you comfortable there, Korolenko? Comfortable in such situation? Do you ask the turtle, are he comfortable? Is Faker on bed of nails? He's equally here as elsewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Just, just hold her there until I get a statement. And he did. Item, statement by the aforesaid. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. That was her story, and I had to admire the way she stuck to it. But if you keep trying, I'm sure she'll get back enough of her memory to confess that she planted the Wheel of Life in Korolenko's turtle shell when she decided to double-cross Shuggy and Lathrop. They never tumbled to her hiding place. They were gunning for Korolenko because they thought Poppy was working with him, which was true in a way, but not the way that they thought. That's why they tortured the doctor in an effort to learn Kay's whereabouts. I understand your boys have picked up the rest of the trio, and they can tell you everything except why I conceived the brilliant idea of having Korolenko play dead. Between you and me, uh, amnesia's a handy little gadget to have around, Dundee. I'm trying to draw a few strategic blanks myself. Period. End of report. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. Yes. There are just a few little coincidentals that I do not find entirely reprehensible. Such, uh, such as? Well, I don't want to appear lucid or anything of that type. Believe but... me, you doesn't. I mean, don't it? Oh, you say the sweetest thing. Mm. Uh, but it's about the wheel. Oh, yes, the wheel. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You type that up. I've got to call in about that now. <laughs> Tonight, when you're making out your must-do list for tomorrow, why not include a reminder to get Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair? Honestly, man, you'll be delighted with the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair. The way it relieves that annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Just try it and see if I'm not giving you a good steer. Make a note right now to call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, did you assert in the lowdown on the Wheel of Life? I certainly didn't. No, we won't know about that for six months. <laughs> because definitively, I mean definitely, that plastic cast has to stay on him. Doctor's orders, you know. Oh, but I won't be here six months from now. You can say that again. But I won't be here six months from now. Stop repeating yourself. But you just said you can say that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as distinctly as if I was sitting here. Uh-huh. That's what I like about you, Bernadine. A, a woman of distinction. That's what you are. Well, if you want to take me dancing, why don't you just say so? Bernadine. It's leap year, and I always say discrimination is the better part of value. You are absolutely corrupt. Well, I'm glad I'm right about something. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, and I'll say that it kills me, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away If you're thinking of volunteering for the US Army or Air Force, here's a word of reassurance. As an Army and Air Force man, you'll become a skilled professional in a specialized field. The training you get will always be useful, not only in military, but in civilian life as well. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting story about his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you something that maybe you already know. The fact that America's favorite wine is port wine. Did you know that? If you didn't, you'll know why port is the way out front favorite if you'll just sample some Petri California port. You just look at that Petri port and you know it's good. That wonderful, deep, rich red color. And Petri port is so clear. Just hold it to the light and you can sort of see right through the glass. But what you want to know really about a wine is how does it taste. And I'll tell you something. I've never yet been able to find the adjective that'll do Petri port justice. It's wonderful, honest. You've just got to taste it for yourself and find out for yourself. You'll love that Petri port in the evening after dinner when you're sitting around listening to the radio. And it's perfect to serve your friends when they come over. You can show them that Petri label, too. In fact, you can show it proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now for our weekly doctor's visit. Let's see... No, 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 Mr. Bartell. Don't say let's see if he's expecting us. You know, I always expect you at this time on Monday evenings, my boy. So draw up your usual chair and settle down. Thanks, Doctor. Ah, oh, that's it. Ah, all alone this evening, Doctor? Where are the puppies? Out on the patio. They had a most unfortunate encounter with a dead seal on the beach this afternoon. In consequence, they're a little, uh, malodorous, shall we say. <laughs> In that case, Doctor, perhaps we'd better change the subject. So, suppose I ask you about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, my boy, as I told you last week, the story took place in the foul alleyways of Limehouse. It was there on a foggy December evening in 1890 that my story began. An old friend and patient of mine, Isa Whitney, had disappeared, and his distraught wife had come to me for help. Knowing the man to be the victim of the shocking habit of taking opium, I suspected that I might find him in one of the vile dens inhabited by the dregs of the waterfront. And so, Mr. Bartell, about five o'clock on that December evening, I began my search. After an hour of fruitless wanderings, I found myself in a vile alley called Upper Swandham Lane. I could hear the distant moans of the river boats as I walked, eyes alert, and hand on the revolver in my coat pocket. Suddenly, I saw a steep flight of steps leading down to a black gap like the mouth of a cave. I walked down. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a frickling oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch and lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly. And I entered. There was a tinkle of Chinese wind bells as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with the brown opium smoke, I saw that the room was terraced with wooden berths, like the forecastle of an emigrant ship. Out of the shadows, there glimmered little red circles of light, now bright, now faint, as a burning poison waxed or waned in the metal pipes. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses. Bowed shoulders, bent knees, heads thrown back. The attendant came up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. I haven't come here to smoke your filthy drug. I'm looking for a friend, Mr. Isa Whitney. No, Mr. Whitney here. Oh, I'm going to search the place. You must not disturb the place. I'm carrying a revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Out of the way. I searched that filthy den, but found no trace of my missing friend. As I was leaving in despair, a long shaking hand reached out and plucked at my sleeve. 
I turned, and there sprawled in a berth was the wreckage of a man. His gaunt face yellow and twitching, his clothes filthy and ragged, and the pupil of his eyes like pinpoints. He spoke to me in a thin, quavering voice. Mr. Brim's sake, get me out of here. Now, look here, my man. Don't say you won't help me, Governor. Ain't you got no heart? Please help me, Governor. Take me out of here. Strike me pink. I'm going to bomb me, I tell you. Oh, what must you expect if you indulge in this filthy habit? Take me out of here, Governor. I'll go straight this time. Cross me out, I will. Oh, very well. Come along with me. I suppose it's my duty to help you. Ah, bless you, Governor. Here, you are. here now, give me your arm. You cannot take him away. He owe me money. That's a bleeding lie. I paid him when I come in, I did. He cannot go with you, mister. You remember what I said about my revolver, you blackguard? If I have any more trouble with you, I'll I'll fetch the police. Come along. He owe me money. He owe me money. Infernal scuttle, owe me money. You tell him all proper, Governor. And I hope you didn't. Now, look here, my good man. I'll give you a square meal, some advice, and some medical attention. But the rest... Never mind the advice, Watson, but I'll take you up on that square meal. Holmes! Yes, I'm very glad to see you, old fellow. What brought you to that filthy den of iniquity? Oh, uh, gracious me, I want to find a friend. And I, an enemy. (laughs) Your disguise is wonderful. It completely fooled me. But I'm afraid the proprietor was beginning to penetrate it. That's why I staged the little rescue scene. Had I been recognized, my life wouldn't have been w- worth an hour's purchase. Well, how long had you been there? Why were you there? Come on, Holmes. Tell me all about it. With pleasure, old chap. But first, let's find a, a chop house. I want that square meal you promised me. Excellent meal, Watson. Yes, you're surprisingly good for such a shoddy-looking place. Well, Holmes, now perhaps you'll tell me what you were doing in that opium den. I've already told you my story. I'm shadowing a most unusual criminal. A man who haunts the opium dens. Yet I know that he himself is not an addict. I don't see anything very criminal about that. He might be looking for a thrill, or perhaps he's one of those writer fellows or something. But this man pretends to be an addict. I watched him closely. He fakes his smoking. And grease paint has enabled him to simulate the characteristic pallor of a drug victim. He even affects the typical mannerism of nose scratching. But it's his eyes that give him away. Mm, The pupils are wide open, I suppose. Exactly, old fellow. Whereas... If he were really addicted to the drug, they would, as you know, be contracted. I myself always treat my eyes with a special, well, a special kind of drop on the occasion when, uh, well, I have to enter these dens. Well, why does a man haunt an opium den in order not to smoke? That, my dear Watson, is the problem that I intend to solve. Well, perhaps the fellow's a policeman or a private detective like yourself, Holmes. I've already checked on those possibilities. No, Watson, I believe there is only one answer. I believe the man is planning a murder. A murder? A tempting setting for a murder. Your victim is an addict, drugged and helpless. Your witnesses are in an equal state of befuddlement. The proprietor is anxious to cover up the crime because of the police. That you. Yes, sir. Now, the question is, who is the intended victim? That, my dear Watson, is why I've been shadowing this man. Unfortunately, he was not present in the den we just left, but I intend to continue my search. Holmes, uh, can can I help you? My my wife's away, you know. You know, it's... A long time since we were on a case together. I should be delighted, my dear chap. I've missed you sadly during the past few months. And I, you, Holmes. What's the next move? Back to Baker Street, old fellow. My disguise is wearing thin, and I must contrive a new one. New disguise, eh? Well, which one shall it be, Watson? Well, how about the old flower seller? <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> well, it's... Pretty impressive, aren't it? Oh, no, 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 my dear fellow, no. Hardly appropriate for an opium dinner. In any case, the clothes are so wretchedly uncomfortable. Well, how about the music hall singer? Oh, that chap, yes. Oh, I don't want to be beside the seaside. Oh, I don't want to be beside the sea. I don't want to stroll along the prom, prom, prom where the brass band plays tiddly. I'm oh, confounded. Who can that be? You weren't expecting anyone, were you? No. So this is just like the old days. The doorbell ringing, Mrs. Hudson toddling off and... Bringing up some poor devil in trouble and... Say that rather wistfully, old fellow. Don't tell me that you repent of marriage. No, of course not, Holmes. Mary's a perfect darling and I couldn't be happier. Just the same. (laughs) It is rather fun to be back here again. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, It's a gentleman, sir. He gave me this card. Says he's very anxious to see you. Hmm. Wayne J. Layton. President, Layton Corporation, Chicago, United States. Ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Aye, sir. 
Well, it's quite the cold times to see you back here, Dr. Watson. That's just what I was saying myself, Mrs. Hudson. Hmm. Mr. Layton has scribbled a message on the back of his card. If a thousand pounds for a week's work interests you, you'll see me. A thousand pounds? Big fish, Watson. Very big fish. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh. How do you do, Mr. Layton? I guess you're Sherlock Holmes. You guessed correctly, sir. Excuse me. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, just a moment, Mrs. Hudson. Aye, Mr. Holmes. Sit down, won't you, Mr. Layton? My name's Watson, Dr. Watson. I'm Sherlock Holmes' colleague. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard about you, too. Uh, like a cigar, Doctor? It's a good one. Sent me back three shillings. Oh, three shillings? Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Sir. Just put one. Oh, three three shillings. shillings. Oh, yourself. Splendid. And now, Mr. Layton, may I ask what brings you here? I'll talk fast and to the point. I'm a businessman. I like to do things in a business way. I have a chance to control the guano deposits of the Republic of San Pedro. Their minister will be in London tomorrow, and if it weren't for one thing, I know that I could swing the deal and get the concession. And what is that one thing, Mr. Layton? The deal is secret, see? I thought no one knew about it, but when I got here, I found out that my biggest business rival has gotten wind of what's going on. He's an Englishman. I've never met him, but uh, he's right here in London. Now, I'm not going to tell you his name. Not until you give me your word that you'll work for me. Just what you wish me to do, Mr. Layton. Get this rival of mine and keep him out of circulation for a week. I don't care how you do it, and I won't ask. In a week's time, I'll give you the other half of this 500 pounds I brought with me. Oh, good, Scott. What kind uh, of Watson, detective... Watson, give Mr. Layton his hat and gloves. That's it. Thanks, old fellow. Goodbye, sir. Uh, what are you doing, throwing me out? I can't think where you uh, gathered the impression that I indulged in kidnapping. Once again... Goodbye, sir. And here, sir, you can take back your cigar. Well, if you don't want some easy money, I'll soon find someone else that does. This is the last you'll see of me, Mr. Holmes. Life is full of little consolations. Hmm. Some people seem to think that money can... Watson, buy... the game's afoot. Mr. Layton is the man I've been seeking. The man who pretends to be an opium smoker. Why, well, Blaze, did you let him get away? Here, I'll go after him. No, 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 no. Don't worry. I've already arranged for that. Oh, how? When I left the room just now to talk to Mrs. Hudson, I was intending to tell her to summon some of my band of street urchins. You know, the Baker Street Irregulars. When she informed me that half a dozen of them were in the kitchen at this very moment, partaking of one of her incomparable steak and kidney pies, the rest should be obvious. You left instructions for one of them to shadow Mr. Layton when he left her. Elementary, my dear Watson. Oh, don't tell me that Layton back again. No, I think not. I should say that at the moment he's just about to walk out of the front door. No, I think we shall have another visitor. And judging by the commotion, the income Coming and the outgoing visitors know each other and are not on the best of terms. Well, it sounds to me as if we're having a fight. Here comes Mrs. Hudson to tell us about it. Come in, come in. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you've got another visitor. Uh, so I gathered. Mrs. Hudson, you gave my instructions to one of the boys? I did that, sir. Young Wiggins was going to follow the gentleman. Well, Mrs. Hudson, what was all that commotion about downstairs just now? Oh, it was the two gentlemen shouting at each other. Him that was leaving and the one that was waiting on the doorstep. And who is our new visitor, Mrs. Hudson? Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Linton Chumley, 9 Belgrave Square. Well, ask him to come up, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Very well, Mr. Holmes. Oh, one thing more. Yes, sir. Uh, please instruct another of the Baker Street Irregulars to follow this Linton Chumley when he leaves here and report to me. All right, sir. Hmm. You're taking no chances, Holmes, eh? You're having this fellow shadow, too. Leighton is a potential murderer. Of that I'm convinced. This Mr. Chumley might possibly be his intended victim. While we are talking to him, Watson, old fellow, I want you to be sure to look at the condition of his eyes. Oh, I certainly will. Come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Chumley. How are you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Uh, that was Wayne Layton that was just left here, uh, wasn't it? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Uh, thank you. I don't want to sit down. All right. You needn't answer my question, but I know it was Layton. I've never met him, but I've seen his picture in the newspapers. Oh, very well, then, sir. It was Wayne Layton. Ah, I know why he came to you. He's, he's trying to have me put out of the way while he closes that deal on the San Pedro and Guana concession. Now, look here, Holmes. You've got to be on my side. Whatever fee he offered you to dispose of me, I'll double it if you'll take care of him for a few days. Oh, dear me, this is becoming monotonous. Watson? The hat and gloves? Thank you, old chap. That's right. Good night, Mr. Chumley. Uh, look here, Holmes. I'll, I'll treble his fee. I'll quadruple it. My dear Mr. Chumley, I have accepted no fee from Mr. Layton. I don't propose to accept one from you. Your hat and gloves, sir? Uh, that man is out to kill me, Holmes. Well, if you won't help me, I'll go to the police. That's an excellent idea, Mr. Chumley. Again, good night. 
Did you notice his eyes, Watson? Yes, the pupils were contracted. He's obviously an opium addict. And also a potential corpse. Well, what do we do now? Wait for the irregulars to report? No, you'll return home for your medical bag. I have a feeling that you'll need it before the night is out. Then come back here. If I've gone before you return, I'll send one of the irregulars to bring you to wherever I may be. Wait until you receive a message from me. On your way, old chap. There's work ahead of us. <laughs> Wiggins, you're certain that this is the place that Mr. Holmes told you to bring me to? Oh, yes, Dr. Watson. The corner of Swanham Line and Brixel Street, Mr. Holmes said. Yeah, well, this is the spot, all right. I don't see any sign of him. Hello? This old woman coming towards us. <laughs> so that's the disguise he chose. Oh, spare me a few coppers, will you, mister? <laughs> My feet had something awful, and I had a bite of food all day. Oh, no. no, you don't, Holmes. You... Can't fool me this time. As a matter of fact, your makeup isn't very convincing. You hardly look like a woman, and nobody's nose could be quite as red as that. Don't look like a woman, don't <laughs> I? My nose is too red, is it? I'll take that. Uh, no, steady, look at that. My confounded, poor old woman who's plighted me. Oh, I'm s- sorry, like madam. I, I didn't mean to insult you. <laughs> well, matey, she gave you a bit of work for all right, didn't she? I box your ears. No mistake about it. You mind your own business. <laughs> and anyhow, why aren't you aboard your ship at this time of night? I'm not a sailor, Watson. It's Mr. Holmes. Great heavens, Holmes. I wish you you wouldn't confuse me like this. I'd never have recognized you. My dear Watson, when you're able to recognize me, it will indeed be the beginning of the end. When your eagle eye penetrates my disguise, I shall realize that my retirement is imminent. But enough of this. See that house opposite? You mean the ramshackle place with the broken tiled roof? Yes, I gave the irregulars instructions to let me know at once. If our two quarries ever enter the same house at the one time, they're inside there now. And I'm going in after them. Be careful, Holmes. I'd better come along with you. Can't I come too, Mr. Holmes? No, no, certainly not. Both keep watch outside. If I need any help, I'll smash one of the windows, and then you can come in after me. Wait here for me. I don't expect I'll be very long. I'll be here, Holmes. Don't worry about me. Just take good care of yourself. <laughs> One o'clock, Doctor. Yes, I know, Wiggins. He's been in there half an hour. I'm beginning to get worried. Start going off, No, no, sir. no, Wiggins. You know Mr. Holmes. When he gives orders, he likes some... There, they're signaling for help. Keep watching the house, Wiggins. I'll be out in five minutes. Go for the police. Right, sir, sir. All right, Holmes, all right. I'm coming. You have searched my house from basement to attic. Why do you not give up? I tell you again, there has been no one here tonight. But my friend came in here half an hour ago. I saw him, and before that, two other men are known to have come in here. Uh, If that is so, then where are they? Three men cannot vanish. That's just the point, you scoundrel. Out of the way. I'm going to search this hovel again. I'm not leaving here until I find Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. And if you don't mind, I'll take that second to say just one word to the ladies. And that word is muscatel. Petri California muscatel. I want you women to know about it because Petri muscatel is one wine that practically every woman likes. Maybe because it's such a beautiful color, like pale gold. But I guess really because Petri Muscatel brings you the wonderful flavor of luscious, sun-ripened Muscat grapes. And that's a flavor. Try Petri Muscatel after dinner, or any time as a change from Petri Port. Remember, if it's a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. And now back to Dr. Watson and tonight's story, The Eyes of Mr. Layton. Well, what happened next, Doctor? When you searched the house for the second time, did you find any trace of Sherlock Holmes or the two rival businessmen? No, Mr. Bartell, I'm afraid I didn't. What did you do? I told Wiggins to report the matter to the nearest police station and then rattle back to Baker Street in a handsome cab as fast as I could. When I arrived at the old familiar doorstep, I wrenched at the bell in a frenzy of anxiety. Finally, the door opened, and there stood Mrs. Hudson. Dr. Watson, what is it, sir? 
Why, oh, you're as white as a ghost. Mr. Holmes, is he here? I sir. Came in half an hour ago. He was dressed as a sailor and was half carrying some drunken friend of his. Oh, thank heavens he's safe. I'll go up. All right, sir. I want to know, Jeff. There you are. Holmes, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Who's that, uh, that lying on the sofa? Well, I'll be back, Watson. Though I'm afraid the poor devil's done for. Great Scott, it's Wayne Layton, the American fella. With a knife wound between his ribs. See what you can do for him, will you? Right. This is extraordinary, Holmes. You said that Layton was a potential murderer. And now he's a victim himself. And a bite a bit, eh, old chap? Yes, he's still breathing, but he, he hasn't a chance. I'll try him with an injection of strychnine. Holmes, how did you get his body out of the house? I, I searched the place from top to bottom. I... I found no trace of any of you. When I went in, I found the stabbing had already taken place. The proprietor then bribed me, or rather the broken-down cellar he took me for, to smuggle the body out through the secret stairway leading to the wards at the back of the house. Oh, there's no trace of Chumley there? No, he must have left before me by the same exit. And then you smashed the window and bolted? Yes, I knew that I could count on you to hold the fort while I was getting the body away. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's uh, try to say something, Watson. I, yes, the injection's beginning to take effect. Uh, yes, Mr. Layton? What are you trying to say? Uh, Tell us, who stabbed you, sir? Uh, shh, shh, shh. Lips are moving. Man, do I. He's dead, Holmes. Yes, but he gave us the clue to the murderer's identity. How? In the word he mumbled just before he died. It sounded to me as if he said Mandalay. Precisely, old fellow. Never did a corpse give us a clearer instruction as to our next and final move. And that is? Back to Limehouse, Watson. Back to Limehouse. Now, here we are. This must be the place. What's this? Another opium den? Yes, I knew that since Chumley refrained from smoking earlier on in the night in order to keep his faculties alert for murder, that an enormous reaction would set in. He'd have to find a den at once, and beyond question, a different one from that in which the murder was committed. But how do you know that he's inside here? Well, just before you returned to Baker Street tonight, I had a message from one of my irregulars. He tracked him here after he escaped from the scene of the stabbing. That was a couple of hours ago. He might have slipped away again. No, Watson, tonight he came to drown his senses with a wretched drug. He'll be here. Come on. Second injection of caffeine should bring him round. He's heavily drugged, but I think it'll work. Surprising what a five-pound note will do, isn't it? Yes, the proprietor let us bring Chumley into his private room and he... Shh, shh, shh. Mm-hmm. Look, he, he's coming mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Who, who, who are you? Who, what, what do you want? You remember me, sir? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Oh, yes, yes, I, I remember you. You're in serious trouble, Mr. Chumley. Very serious trouble. Uh, trouble? What What trouble? Wayne Layton didn't die. Oh. He's badly wounded, but he's going to live. He's at Baker Street now. He wants to go to the police and give evidence. You, you've got to get me out of this, Holmes. I'll, I'll pay you anything. Uh, Ten thousand, twenty thousand. Why did you stab Layton? He, he was in my way. I wanted the San Pedro concession. I, I meant to kill him. But we can fix it up now, can't we, Holmes? We can fix it up yes, now. Yes, we can fix it beautifully, sir. As neat a murder confession as ever I listened to, Holmes. Exactly. Come along, Mr. Chumley. I think some night air will be good for you. We'll take you for a nice drive to Scotland Yard. <laughs> some kippers, gentlemen. You've both been up all night, and I'm sure you can do it. It's very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Watson. Yes, indeed it is. Uh, what is Mrs. Watson going to say when she finds you've been out all night? Oh, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Hudson. She's very understanding. <laughs> it's lucky for you that she is. Well, I'll go and leave you to your breakfast. Holmes. Yes, dear fellow? There's only one thing that puzzles me about this case. Oh, what's that? When Leighton was dying, he muttered the word Mandalay. How did that give you the key to the murderer's identity? Oh, 
The dead American had never met Mr. Chumley, you remember, except when they bumped into each other in our hallway. Yes, he told us that he recognized him from the newspaper photographs. Being an American, he had no reason to know that the name Chumley is in no way pronounced the way it is spelt. No, Joe, I never thought of that. Chumley. That name spelt C H O L Chow M O N Mon D E D L E Y. Chow Mondele. Mondeley. Precisely, old fellow. What you thought to be Mandalay was really Chow Mondeley, the name of the murderer. What an amazing case. You did a remarkable job, Holmes. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to be confoundedly sleepy. Yeah, why not sleep, old chap? Your old uh, room's all ready for you. Are you going to take a nap? Oh, dear me, no. Hmm? I have much too busy a day ahead of me. Let me look at my engagement book. Uh, Baxter Square Murder. Mm-hmm. I put the police on the track. The Duchess of uh, Ferrers. I got her material. The princess who was about to run away from home. Good gracious me, let her run. The Pope's cameos. Ah, yes, yes. His Holiness must not be kept waiting. Uh, can uh, can I help you again, Holmes? Uh, Mary doesn't return un- until tomorrow. <laughs> well, I thought you were sleepy, old fellow. Sleepy rubbish. I never felt more wide awake in my life. <laughs> That was a swell story, Doctor. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And it was really funny when you mistook that old lady for Holmes and she slapped your face. It wasn't very funny at all. <laughs> ah, sure it was. Come on, admit it, Doctor. Well, she did look like Holmes in disguise, you know, and you would have made the same mistake that I did. Okay, okay. Her nose was ridiculously red and she did look like a man. Uh, look, Doctor, forget I ever said anything. Hmm? I won't say another word. I- I'll keep my mouth closed forever. Oh, come on, I wouldn't do that. Mr. Bartell? Mr. Bartell? Uh, won't you even open your mouth to uh, finish your wine? Your your Petri wine? Okay, you win. You know I'll open my mouth for Petri wine any time. That Petri wine is always good wine. And for good reason, too. The Petri family has always owned and operated the Petri business. They've been making fine wines for three generations, since way back in the 1800s. That adds up to a lot of experience. Experience handed on down from father to son, from father to son. The Petri family really knows how to turn luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And that's why, no matter what kind of wine you want, I'm sure you'll like it better if it's a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watson, what story are you going to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a most unusual adventure that Holmes and I had in the heart of the English countryside. It concerns a corpse, a missing revolver, and a beautiful girl who was frightened of her own shadow. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Man with the Twisted Lip. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Lieber Brothers, makers of Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso, present Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. <laughs> Front boy, did you sign the register, please, sir? Right here. Yes, Miss Manletter. Is there some trouble with your room? Oh, no, it's fine, thank you. I was just wondering, do you know a Mr. Boston Blackie when you see him? No, I don't know him. I'm sorry, Miss Manletter. Well, thanks, just the same. I was supposed to meet him here in the lobby, but I have no idea what he looks like. My uncle arranged the appointment before I left San Francisco. Oh, there's a man standing over by the newsstand who looks as if he were waiting for someone. Oh? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sure that must be Mr. Blackie. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Hello there. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Wasn't I supposed to meet you here? Uh, uh, you're you, aren't you? Yes. At least Uncle should have had you wear a white carnation. According to Uncle, white carnations don't stay white long in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Uncle told me that you were very witty. Uh, but they do in San Francisco, you know. <laughs> well, shall we go? Where to? Oh, no, don't uh, tell me. I'd rather be surprised. All right, let's go. Oh, clerk, I found the man I was looking for. Thank you for your trouble. Uh, no trouble at all. Hello? Room clerk speaking. Hello. Uh, would you do me a favor, please? I'm supposed to meet a young lady in your lobby, and I've been delayed. Would you have a page, please? Her name is Alice Manletter. Miss Manletter? Yes. Why, she just left here a minute ago. She met someone she was expecting, and she left with him. Well, that's impossible. Miss Manletter doesn't know anyone in New York. Well, she told me she had an appointment with a Mr. Boston Blackie, and that's the man she left here with. But that can't be possible. And why not? Because I'm Boston Blackie. In a few moments, we will meet Boston Blackie, but uh, right now, a thought about the weather. I'll bet it sometimes doesn't seem fair to you ladies. Here it is, summer, blistering hot days, days when you ought to be taking it easy. And what happens? You've got a bigger wash than ever to worry about. More towels, more of the kids' play, play clothes, more of your own wash dresses, more shirts of dad's, more everything. Well, you couldn't pick a more ideal time than now to switch to Soapy Rich Rinso. With Rinso, even the biggest, grimiest wash goes like a breeze. As little as five minutes per load with Rinso in your washer, and your clothes are sparkling Rinso white, clean as a whistle. And Rinso is safe for washable colors, too. Leaves them Rinso bright after dozens of dozens of washings. You'll be mighty proud of your Rinso wash, and proud, too, that you bought the big green and yellow package that made it so easy to do. Better get Rinso before next wash day. <laughs> And now, meet Boston Blackie, radio's newest adventure star. Meet Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friend. Uh, listen, clerk, try to think. What did the man look like? I mean, the one Miss Manletter left with. I don't know, Mr. Blackie. You're rather good-looking yes. about your height and build. But Miss Manletter didn't know anybody in New York. Her uncle told me that when he asked me to meet her. Well, I'm sorry I can't help you. Well, thanks just the same. Oh, uh, here's my card. Mm -hmm. If Miss Manletter returns, have a call this number, will you? Yes, I will. Taxi, sir? No, oh, no, thanks. Uh, look, Dorman, did you happen to notice a man and a girl leaving here about ten minutes ago? A, a pretty girl and a man about my height? Uh, yes, sir. Come to think of it, I did call a taxi for a couple of that, that answers that description. Well, do you remember which cab it was? Uh, yes, it was the one uh, Mike O'Hara drive. Oh, oh uh, that's O'Hara just pulling up to the end of the line now. Well, thanks a lot. Here, buy your wife some flowers. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, O'Hara? Yes, sir? You just drove a man and a young lady somewhere. I want to go where they went. Oh, you want to follow someone? <laughs> You're a bright lad, O'Hara. I don't want to get into any trouble. Maybe you'd better get another cab. Oh, you won't get into any trouble. You see, I'm Inspector Faraday of the Homicide Department. Oh, Inspector Faraday. That's right. Okay, step on it. Oh, sure, Inspector. I'll go as fast as I can. <laughs> Uh, 
this is it. This is the place I left them off. Right in front of this store. Oh, thanks. Uh, here, buy yourself a couple of cigars. Oh, thank you, sir. Gee, I'll buy you a box. No. <laughs> well, how do you do? I, uh, I'm looking for a young couple who came here a few minutes ago. You're looking for a couple. I'm looking for a couple. I'll take a single yet. Nobody comes here. Only Pop and me. Even Pop ain't here now. They have nobody else. See for yourself. Well, thanks. Uh, may I use your telephone, please? Certainly. That'll be ten cents. Oh, um. You wouldn't be interested in buying anything, would you, mister? No, no thanks. No. Well, nobody ever buys anything. Hello, Ashley Hotel. I'd like to speak to the room clerk, please. Uh, say, Mom, have you got any chewing gum? Chewing gum, he asked for. Is he kidding? Room clerk speaking. Uh, this is Boston Blackie. Have you had any word from Miss Alice Manletter? Oh, Mr. Blackie, Miss Manletter's been trying to reach you. She wants you to come down here to see her right away. She's in room 305. Well, thank you very much. I'll be right over. <laughs> Three, please. Third floor. Oh, thank you. 301, 303. Oh, here we are, 305. Come in. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So you're Boston Blackie. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to see you, Miss Manletter. You know, your uncle asked me to look out for you, and then you disappear. Well, you didn't even give me a chance. Oh, you mean this morning? Yes. No, I, I just met a friend, that's all. He followed me from San Francisco. Well, I, I don't blame him. I'd have followed you, too. Uh, how was your trip? Oh, wonderful. This is my first time in New York, you know. I, I practically lived in a dream all the way here. <laughs> well, how do you like what you've seen of it? <laughs> wonderful. You know, uh, I'd like to show you the real town. Oh, uh, well, I'd like to, only I, I've sort of an engagement tonight. Oh, the same fellow? Mm-hmm. You haven't wasted much, much, much time before I came here, have you? <laughs> Only the 18 years since I, before I came here. Isn't that enough? Well, that's enough for me to be running along, Alice. Oh, here's my phone number, and uh, if you want anything, you just call. How about lunch tomorrow, huh? Oh, I'd love it. Thanks, Mr. Blackie, for everything. Oh, everything is nothing. Good night, Alice. <laughs> Twenty-five, boss. Nice shooting. Oh, Shorty, she's a beautiful girl. Look, why don't you forget Danes for a minute? Give me a good reason. Fifteen. Just like I'm telling you, boss, your hand ain't steady. You need some more practice. Well, this Maxim silencer doesn't fit this gun too well. Oh, how come the new gun, Blackie? Where's your old one? Well, uh, well, you see, Shorty, I, um... You what? Well, I, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but, uh, I guess I was robbed. Boston Blackie Rob? Yeah. <laughs> hey, boss, you ain't in any trouble. I don't know. Gee, bullseye, boss. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this new gun will do until I get my old one back. Well, uh, there's nothing like a workout with a target to keep your aim in shape, Shorty. You know, I got a funny idea about that, boss. Yeah? I don't care if my aim ain't so good as long as the other guys ain't either. <laughs> I'll get it, Shorty. All right. Hello? Blackie? Well, 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 Inspector Faraday, my favorite cop. Mm-hmm. How'd you guess? Oh, how could I miss those low, dulcet tones, Inspector? I want you down here in ten minutes, Blackie, or I'll send for you. Well, that's fine, but where's down here? The Ashley Hotel, room 305. You won't have to send for me, Inspector. I'll be right down. Mm-hmm. Say, boss, uh, Faraday hasn't got you jumping through a rope, has he? Mm, room 305, Ashley Hotel. Shorty, that's Alice Manletter's room. <laughs> Third floor, please. Watch your step getting out. Thank you. Come on. Hi, Inspector. Holy Mac. Yeah, Blackie, she's dead. Dead? As if you didn't know. Now, wait a minute. How did you know about this, Faraday? O'Hara, the taxi driver, got suspicious, so reported to headquarters. Oh. From his description, I knew it was you, and then I got suspicious. So you're going around impersonating me now, eh, Blackie? Well, you should be flattered. Why did you kill her? Wait a minute, Faraday. Okay, boys, cover him. Now, don't be a dope. I promised to look after this girl. She was all right when I left her a little while ago. Yeah, maybe. 
After we discovered the body, the boys and I waited for you to make an appearance. We knew you'd be back. Now, Faraday, listen. This girl was Arthur Manletter's niece. Mm -hmm. And I'll take care of whoever was responsible for her murder. No, no, I'll do that, Blackie. You killed her. Now, that's your gun in her hand. My gun? But I don't see how that... We checked the serial numbers, Blackie. I don't care what you checked. Mm -hmm. You can't take me in for this. I didn't kill her, I tell you. Okay, maybe not. Maybe the serial number on this gun is wrong. You know what a paraffin test is, Blackie? Oh, sure, I know. All right. Well, we'll go down to headquarters and cover your hand with paraffin. Fine. Then we'll be able to tell whether you fired a gun in the last couple of hours. Now, Inspector, will you listen? Yeah. This girl came to New York this morning. Mm -hmm. She wasn't supposed to know anybody in town. Mm -hmm. And then she told me she'd met a friend. Well, what are you trying to prove? I'm trying to prove that somebody killed Alice Manletter, and I've got to be free to find out who did it. Well, you won't be. I'll see to that personally. And now, oh, wait a minute now. What are you doing in that girl's now, handbag? Don't, don't get scared, Inspector, please. Well, now, what are you doing? You've got four cops with guns on me. Yeah? This isn't a trick. I might find something here that will help me track down the murderer. Well, we've searched this whole place, Tom Blackie. There's nothing here. Oh. Uh, oh, oh, hold on, wait a minute. What are you taking out of that bag? Well, I don't know yet. It's, uh, it's just a piece of paper. Well, I'll take it. Mm, what's this? Boston 5, Zealand, Zealand. Louisiana 3, Saskatchewan, Tennessee 2, Nevada. Well, yeah, Nevada, go ahead. Well, what are you doing? I'm just writing down what you've said. Well, this doesn't make sense. Missouri 1, 3, Denver 4, France... Frank? Well, you see, Faraday, that's a code. Well, you're going to have plenty of time to work it out, Blackie. Come on, let's get going. I'm going to give you a hand a paraffin test to find out whether you fired a gun recently. And if you have, take it from me, pal. You'll have to do some talking to keep your head above water. <laughs> well, I'm afraid, Inspector, the only way I can keep my head above water is to duck you. <laughs> Boston Blackie apparently is in a spot. And uh, speaking of spots, so was a friend of mine the other day. You see, a lady I know of looked out of her window one morning, and it was such a lovely day, she felt like singing. Dum, da, 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 dee, 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 dee. And all of a sudden, she remembered it was wash day. Oh, shucks. So she got ready to do her wash and found she was out of soap. Well, time was wasting, so she borrowed some from her next-door neighbor. A soap she'd heard a lot about but never tried before. Yes, you guessed it. It was Soapy Rich Rinso. And when she saw what mountains of suds Rinso made... Well, 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 what do you know? And how quickly those Rinso suds soaked her clothes dazzling white, and how she only had to give the very dirty places a few quick finger rubs because Rinso gets out more dirt, she started singing all over again like this... Rinse all white, rinse all white, happy little wash day song. Rinse all white, rinse all white, pretty sing it all day long. Your fine feathered friend has a message you send, so listen, you can't go wrong. Rinse all white, rinse all white, happy little wash day song. Sing your way through your next wash day with Rinse <laughs> Boston Blackie is in Inspector Faraday's office awaiting the police laboratory report that will show whether he has fired a gun within the past few hours so that Faraday can build a complete case against him for the murder of the girl in the Ashley Hotel. How does it feel, Blackie? To be sitting there just waiting for a report that could send you to the chair? You nervous? Boston 5, Zealand, Zealand. That's the first word. Now, you take the first letters of each word and you get buzz. Great. Ha! <laughs> How do you do it, Blackie? Hmm? You get... That's right. Yeah. Now we know everything. Who killed the girl, what her mother's maiden name was, and what town she was born in. That's exactly what I'm trying to find out. <laughs> After the first letter, there's the number five. Mm. See, that could be the fifth vowel. You know, A-E-I-O-U. That's right. Or do you? Yes. Then the word would spell B-U-Z-Z. -Z. Marvelous. Buzz. Buzz. Inspector, this is a clue to the murder. Oh. Now, using that system of spelling out the first letters of each word, the note reads, Buzz, listen, made, off. Yeah. What does that mean? I wish I knew. Yeah, Faraday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Thanks. Well, that was it, Blackie. The test showed you fired a gun, all right. And the gun we found next to the girl's body was yours. Now, Inspector, I lost my gun, and it's true I fired another. But I was just practicing. Sure, sure, on a live target. Oh. You don't expect me to believe that, do you, Blackie? Well, frankly, no. You killed her and then you put her gun, your gun, in her hand. 
After wiping off your fingerprints, of oh, course. Oh, oh, that's an old trick, Blackie, an old one. I'm surprised at you. Hey, Matthews? Inspector? Take Blackie down to the cell floor and lock him up. We'll book him later. Right, Chief. Come on, Blackie. Okay, okay. Well, you look very nice today, Matthews. New uniform? Who's your tailor? You won't be able to go to him for a long time. <laughs> you know, good old Matthews. Snappy clothes and padded a match. Say, Inspector, may I wash my hands? Well, they're covered with ink from that fingerprint pad. Is it okay? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. But keep an eye on him, Matthews. I'll beat it, both of you. I'm thinking. Thinking, huh? I'd love to watch. Oh, come on, Matthews. Lock me up. So long, Inspector. Faraday said I could wash my hands, Matthew. Remember? Go ahead, but no tricks. Here's the washroom. But remember, I'll be right back here with my gun in my hand. Oh, goody. I let you in on a little secret, Blackie. What's that? The inspector brought in a half a dozen extra cops from another precinct. Just to make sure you didn't break out of here. No. Only half a dozen? Well, I'm flattered. Uh, by the way, Matthews, did you take a shower this morning? No, last night. Well, you need another one. Now. Hey, quit splashing water all over me. I can't see. Hey, give me my gun. Me... Uh, not a chance. I'm going to gag you, Matthews, and lock you in here. Come on, turn around. There. Now try and yell. And I want to borrow your uniform. If there are strange cops here, they'll think I'm one of them. You see, I'm leaving in your uniform. Come on, Matthews. Come on, take it off. Blackie, if Faraday ever finds this waterfront hideout of ours, you know we're some. Oh, Faraday couldn't find a skunk in a perfume shop. Can we just stop worrying? Okay, okay. What do we do next, boss? Well, nothing until I get that long-distance call through to Arthur Manletter. The operator's trying to reach him in San Francisco now. So after we reach him, so what? Well, I won't know, Shorty, till I talk to him. You see, the only thing I've been able to do since I walked out of headquarters an hour ago was to break the code we found in that girl's bag. It read, buzz, listen, made, off. Yeah, 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 you told me that before. Yes, yes, I know, but those words don't make sense. However, suppose we try an association. You mean we're going to join a club? Oh, cut it out, Shorty, please. Now, for instance, what does the word buzz make you think of? A bee. That's right. Now, let's say the first word is B. Yeah. Now, the second word in the code message is listen. Uh-huh. What does that make you think of? Listen, I don't know. Hey, wait a minute, boss. Yeah? Don't tell me, don't tell me now. I, I'll get it. Listen, get... listen. The word is here. Oh. So the message starts, be here. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Then the last two words are made and off. Oh, by the way, Shorty, what's the maid's day off? Thursday, if anybody still has got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thursday's right. So the message reads, be here Thursday. Oh, that's it. Yesterday was Thursday, the day the gal came to town. Sure. Ooh, that's the code, all right. Only what good... There's my call now. Right. Hello? Blackie, this is Manletter in San Francisco. Oh, hello, Arthur. Blackie, what's happened? I just heard the radio. It said that Alice has been murdered. The police were searching for you. It's not true, is it, Blackie? Yes, yes, I'm afraid it's true, Arthur. But you know I didn't do it. Well, of course you didn't. I don't know how it happened, but I'm going to find out. Blackie, look, I feel terrible. Oh, this is shit. her 20th birthday. The trip was a present from me. 20th birthday? Oh, uh, oh, wait a minute, Arthur. Is, uh, is she a brunette? Oh, no, she had the most beautiful blonde hair you ever saw. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Arthur, your niece wasn't murdered. What? It wasn't Alice. Now, take my word for but it. The radio said... Never mind the radio. Your niece wasn't murdered, and I'm going to find her, Arthur. You'll hear from me. Thanks, Blackie. Thanks. Call me as soon as you know anything, will you? I will. Goodbye. Now, why did you tell him that for Blackie? Because it's true, Shorty. You see, I never saw the real Alice Manletter. I took it for granted she was the girl in the hotel room. Oh. But that girl said she was 18, and Manletter's niece is 20. And the color of her hair settles it. Okay, but what happens now? Well, the real Alice Manletter left the hotel this morning with a man. Uh -huh. The cab driver gave me the address, but she wasn't there, of uh -huh. course. They, they evidently got off there, but must have walked down the street to another house. Well, what do we do first? Well, let's see. First, we've got to get a couple of messenger uniforms. Yeah. Then you'll take one side of the street, and I'll take the other, and we'll ring every doorbell and say we have a wire for Alice Manletter. Well, what could will that do? Whoever is holding Alice will know it's a trick and will try to grab us. That's what I'll be waiting for. <laughs> Uh, telegram for Alice Manletter. Ain't nobody here for that name. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. There ain't nobody in this block for that name either. I don't know. I've lived here for 40 years. Gee, this reminds me of Alan's Alley. <laughs> uh, should I try the next block? Well, we'll try it together, but I got two more houses to go. Wait for me. Okay. 
I've got to find that girl, Shorty. Okay, boss. If it's a girl, you'll find her. What do you want? Telegram for Alice Manletter. Did you come in? Well, is, uh, is Miss Manletter here? She, uh, she's got a sign for this person. Yeah. Ah, nice place you have here. I, uh, I noticed a sign outside saying this was a doctor's uh, home. In here, please. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Hey, what's this? See if he is armed, Otto. Yeah, I'll see. Keep your gun on him, Joe. Yeah. Well. Hey, here's his gun here, Doctor. Here, in his card case. Boston Blackie. We were hoping you would come. It took you a little longer than we thought. Oh, you knew I'd be here, huh? The girl said she was supposed to meet you in the hotel lobby. Uh-huh. And Otto here made a mistake and thought she was one of us. I see. So that's what happened. Otto was supposed to meet one girl, he met another. He thought she was someone else and she thought he was someone else. Simple blunder. Oh, oh, oh. you mean the super race has made a simple blunder? But everything has been taken care of. This girl knows no one else in the city and very soon... She will know nothing at all. Oh, I see. And that goes for me, too, I suppose. Yeah, boy. Ouch, you believe you take it easy with my hands back there, boy. <laughs> I am tight, Otto. Mm. You see, too? Easy. Good, good. <clears throat> we have only a few moments. Yeah, that's right. You just listen to the newscast. You better work fast, boys. You have only a few moments. Warsaw, Paris, Berlin. <laughs> American oh, kick. Take him in the other room. Better carry him. Yeah. Help me, Joe. Yeah. I open the door for you. Just throw him in. The lens on his neck. It's too bad. Ready, Joe? Throw yeah. Who is that? <laughs> well, I, I I think it's me, Boston Blackie. Oh. Your uh, your Alice Manletter, of course. Oh, Boston Blackie, I'm so glad you're here. My gun when I was up there, figuring that if I found out she was a spy, she could take care of me. Oh. Well, the legs are free. Now I'll untie you. Thank you. What's that? They're going to send a message. We'll be able to hear what they say. The microphone's right up against the wall. Now, your hands are free. Work on your ankles. And I'll listen. All right. Yes, catch you on. Hand over four, two. Yes, catch you on. S-H-O-E-S. Shoes. One, Nevada, ten, one. A-N-D. Hand. Shoes and... Uh... Yes, catch you on. Two, one, Louisiana, three, Nevada, Georgia, Wisconsin, one, ten, tipping. Ceiling wax. Shoes and ceiling wax. One five M S C five Missouri Nevada. A U T U M N Autumn. Shoes and ceiling wax Autumn. That, that's uh, the message so far. Geneva one, Louisiana one, Hanover one, Denver, Louisiana one, Nevada, Chicago two, Louisiana four, Tennessee. That spells Galahad and Lancelot. They stopped sending. Yeah. What did they say? Do you know? Now keep working on those ropes, Alice. Yes. Now, here's the message: shoes and ceiling wax. That's from Alice in Wonderland. The word missing is ships. Well, that could be the first word in the message. That's the way it works? Sure. Now, let's see. The next next thing was autumn. Autumn, autumn, autumn. Uh, what's that make you think of, Alice? I don't know. Autumn leaves, perhaps? That's it. That's it. And then they said Galahad and Lancelot. They were two knights at the round table. Two knights. That's it. Ships leave to night. That's the message. We've got to get out and stop that convoy from sailing. There'll be a U-boat pack waiting, waiting for it, sure. I've worked the knot loose, I think. Good. Now, give me your ropes. I'm going to need them. What are you going to do? Well, they'll be in for us in a minute. Is, um, is there a chair in the room? There's one next to me. I'm leaning against Good. it. Good. I'll put it alongside the door and stand on it. When the Nazis come in, you'll be in back of the door and slam it shut behind them. But they'll see you. Oh, no, no, no. Not a chance. The room is too dark. I'll drop a noose over them, but quick. Shh. I think I hear something. Okay. Now, I'll carry this chair over, and you stand behind the door. Already, Blackie. Yeah, me too. We'll do it, Doctor, just like you said. Oh, come in with me, Joe. Yeah. Now, Alice. Oh. Your gun. Get out your gun, Otto. I can't get it out. My arms are pinned down. Here's a present, Nazi. Oh. Now, don't be jealous, pal. Here's one for you, too. Oh, oh you can take it, huh, kid? Okay. Well, oh, I guess that does it, Alice. What's going on in there? Otto, oh, you... wa- watch this, Alice. <clears throat> Come in here, Doctor. Quick. What is look? This is. <laughs> Alice. Alice, get on that telephone in the other room quick. Tell the FBI what you know. Then call Inspector Faraday while I keep an eye on these Nazis. Now, when you get him, I hold want it, you to... Hold it, Hold it. Don't move. I've got you cold this time. 
Well, hot or cold, you'll hate yourself in the morning, Faraday, but yeah. I'm glad you're here. Okay. How did you manage it? I managed it, boss. What? I got worried and I couldn't bust in here alone, so I called your old friend Faraday. Oh. Yeah, and I landed up here with both feet in ten minutes flat. When you do anything with your feet, Faraday, flat is the right word. Uh -oh. Thanks, Alice, for clearing me with Faraday. Oh, Blackie, you're wonderful. Oh. You saved my life and broke up a spy ring, and it doesn't bother you a bit. Don't you feel good about it? Oh, I should say I do. So good, I'm going to celebrate. Alone? Oh, no, no. You're coming with me, Alice. But first, we're going to call your Uncle Arthur. What are you going to say? Well, I'm going to tell him I've spent a lot of time looking for you. But from now on, I'm looking after you. <laughs> We'll be back in just a moment with an interesting preview of next week's program. Now, you know those rich Rinso suds I've been telling you are such a help on wash day? Well, they're just as big a help come dishwashing time. Yes, ma'am. Milder than ever Rinso is easy on your hands, too. Doesn't get them rough and red. So, for dishwashing and for all the soap and water jobs around the house, better get Rinso to help you out. <laughs> Now, uh, Matthews, you say this is a complete record of the people who came into Gordon's store yesterday? That's right, Inspector. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Van Dyke Smythe, George Ellis, Lady Mary Andrews. Hey, quite an exclusive list of customers for a small shop. Yeah, ain't it? Let's see now. Uh, uh, this name here, was he a customer? Yeah, Inspector. Gordon says he was in about noon, but that could have been a coincidence. Matthews, when a string of pearls is missing from a certain store and a certain party was in that certain store and the certain party's name was Boston Blackie, that's no coincidence. Friends, of course you know the tremendous part our Merchant Marine is playing in the war. But did you know that the Merchant Marine is being expanded to meet increasing supply problems on every front? to meet the universal demand for a strong post-war merchant marine? Yes, six ships a day instead of five will soon be coming off the ways of our shipyards, and every one of them must be manned by 40 to 50 men. So, if you have had previous sea experience, or if you want to get into a well-paying job where everything you do will help to win the war and to build your own personal future, then join the United States Merchant Marine. Apply at once by wiring collect to United States Merchant Marine... Washington, D.C. Warm weather's here, and that means greater danger from perspiration. Protect yourself. Use Life Boy in your daily bath. You know, of seven leading brands, Life Boy gives you the most soap for your money. And its rich, purifying Life Boy lather grease with your skin. And don't forget, Life Boy's the only soap especially made to stop... Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday, music by Charles Cornell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying good night for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. Science does not pay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll take lobster Diavolo every time. Nothing like it. Boy, that red sauce. <laughs> sure it ain't the spaghetti fill on account of it looks like rope. <laughs> yeah, could be. Yeah, could Wh be. Why you use a rope all the time, Phil? A gun or even an ice pick would be quicker, like today. Puggy almost got away. Yeah, maybe Dookie's got something, Phil. 
Look how that joint fit my hand. That's because you're slipping, Tiny. You didn't used to have to stick your hand in their mouths. Well, I still don't answer Dookie's question. Yeah, Phil. Why a rope all the time? It's simple, like ABC. We all got records, ain't we? And you carry a loaded piece when you got a record, it's another felony, ain't it? Carrying concealed weapons, see? Well, I've been wise to the flat feet since I've been a kid. And nobody can prove in no court that you had a weapon on you when all you're carrying is a piece of rope. In the interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay, based on the famous Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer series of short subjects. In just a moment, you will hear A Piece of Rope. Starring Cameron Mitchell as Dukey DeFore. Does Not Pay, starring Cameron Mitchell as Dukey DeFore in A Piece of Rope. There is a school of thought among the men whose job it is to fight organized crime that the old method of searching for clues and obtaining convictions on such evidence is not nearly as effective as attacking from within the organization itself by the use of informers. A typical case is that which involved Dukey DeFour and the gang which made its headquarters in a certain city at the corner of Warrenburg and Paoli Avenues. This organization serviced other groups. They accepted commissions to do certain jobs, as they did on the day Jack Paris told them... Like I said, this puggy Jackson is getting too smart for his own good. Like, for instance, what? You ask too many questions sometimes, Pittsburgh. Why don't you behave nice and quiet, like Dookie here? Oh, Dookie, the kid's got a lot to learn yet. He'll learn working with you. Only don't teach him to ask too many questions. Sorry, Jack, I was only asking on account of if we know what he's pulling, we can find him easier. You'll find him. That's what I'm paying you for. Sure, we'll get him okay. They call him Poggy in account of his nose. Some two-bit punk flattened it for him. Now I want him flattened. Complete. Yeah, we'll take care of him. Sure, we'll take care of him. And nobody, see? The bulls know he's been trying to cut me out. I don't want nothing to point to me. When we get through, there won't even be a grease spot. And it's a deal? Yeah, sure is. Sure is, Mr. Paris. Sure is. Okay, you got the contract. Just be sure you carry it out. Understand? <laughs> Yeah, Dookie. Telephone, back in the store. Okay, I'm coming. Who is it? Wouldn't say. You just asked for Pittsburgh Phil. Know the voice? Sounds a little like Mr. Paris. Uh, he got ants in his pants again. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, if we can't find the jerk, we can't take care of him. <laughs> you know Paris. He thinks he's a big executive. Yeah, I know. Pittsburgh Phil here. What's wrong with you guys? Do I have to take my business someplace else? Well, take it easy. We'll get him. I've been waiting three weeks. He hijacked me again last night. We can't do nothing until we find him. Then find him. I'll give you three days. What's he want? Blood out of a stone. Yeah, I thought he was sore. That don't get him nothing. He give us three days. We gotta find that puggy. We'll find him. Tiny's making a contact today. Uh, Tiny, that fat overstuffed... When you one. get as smart as Tiny or as strong, you can talk. Okay, okay, Phil. I didn't mean nothing. Don't bother me now. Okay. I gotta think. Go okay. catch a car or something. We'll need one for this job anyhow. I beg your pardon. Yeah, sure. So when? I, I wonder if you could give me some information. You hear that, Dookie? He comes to the corner of Warren Boy and pay only for information. <laughs> yeah. That is, I was told I could find Tiny Schultz around here. Yeah. Uh, why do you want Tiny. I uh, owe him some money. So Tiny's still Shylock, and what do you know? Well, I'm sure I don't know where Tiny is, but uh, if you let me have what you owe him, I'll see that he gets it. No, I'm very sorry. I got to see him personal. And uh, who shall I say came calling? 
Tell him uh, Puggy Jackson. Puggy Jackson? Um, now that I come to think of it, uh, I think I know where he might be. That's good. Yeah, it's good. Uh, tell you what, uh, Dookie. Yeah, right here. Take this gentleman around to Tiny's usual resorts, and uh, if you don't find them, bring the gentleman to my place in three quarters of an hour. I'm expecting Tiny there then. <laughs> gotcha. I don't like to put you to so much trouble. Like... Oh, any pal of Tiny's is a pal of mine. It's no trouble at all. In fact, pal, it'll be a pleasure to know you better. You know, Josie, the rest of us girls... Well, I think you ought to know how lucky we think you are. Lucky? Me? Uh Uh-huh, your own house, a fur coat, and... (laughs) Those bills about the sharpest husband we ever saw. (laughs) I don't know, Ellen. He's like most husbands, I guess. Always dropping things that you got to pick up after him. But I will admit, Phil's anything but stingy. Uh, what business is Phil in, darling? Contracting, dear. You mean like road building? Oh, goodness, no. Oh, I'm sure that's one business Phil never wants to get mixed up with. Well, what then, darling? To be perfectly frank, Josie, the girls were wondering and I said I'd ask you. Seeing as how I know you best, that is. Uh, well, I don't know if I can describe it exactly, but... He takes orders and does things for people, kind of a service company. Uh-huh. Uh, but what kind of a company? Look, why don't you ask him yourself, honey? That's his key in the door. Oh, Hiya, uh-huh. girls. Hiya, darling. You know, Tiny, Josie, uh-huh. Ellen, this is Tiny, Tiny Schultz. Hiya, Josie. Hello, Ellen. Of all people are called Tiny, for goodness sake. <laughs> sure. Anybody over 250, they call Tiny. And skinny guys, they call fat, so. <laughs> yeah, you really over 250, Tiny. 300 if it's a pop. <laughs> Nothing small about this character. Uh, look, Josie, some of the boys are coming over in a few minutes. Okay, Mr. Man. What is it tonight? Poker or talk? Talk, uh, mostly. Well, don't make a mess. How can talk make a mess? Oh, you don't know Phil's gang in their gab fest. Get your hat, dear. I didn't wear any. We'll go to a movie, Phil. Yes, yeah, good idea. Here's a fin. Treat the girl. Oh, thanks, dear. Hmm. Come on, Ellen. Well, I... Goodbye, all. Ah, goodbye, so long. Hey, Remember what I said, dear. No mess now. <laughs> what a dame. Oh, dang. Well, let's get going, Tiny. Dookie will be here with the joke in ten minutes. The usual? Yeah, straight chair next to the door, big chair facing it. Yeah. yeah. That way. When the door opens, he'll see only you, and I can get him from behind. Yeah. How's this? Okay, uh, sit down and read that newspaper. <laughs> How am I doing? Swell. What are you using? Here it is, Tiny, the usual... Four feet of brand new wash line. Now all we got to do is wait. This the place? Huh? Oh yeah, yeah. This is it, Mr. Jackson. Not bad. Very nice, in fact. It's kind of quiet. Oh, they'll be there. Phil said so. You sort of like this fella, don't you? Uh, he's the best. The best. Uh, let me ring the bell for you. Come on in. Doors open. We're coming. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Jackson. After you. Oh, thanks, kid. Tiny. Come in, Puggy. Been waiting for you. Come on. All right. Give me a hand. Get on him, Tiny. I'm trying. Stronger than I thought, this chicken. Don't be lend a hand. Uh, don't make me feel. Don't make me. I'm scared. Don't. Couch. Get him on the couch. Yeah. All right. Twist it. Twist the rope. I'm trying. Uh, stuff his mouth. Stuff it. He's making too much noise. Yeah. He's got a mouthful of fist. Twist it, Phil. Sit on him. Hold him down. Yeah. Yeah, that does it. Yeah. Brother, this character was strong. Hey, he's dead. Yeah, he's dead. Look what the dog did to my hand. That fella could get lunch off my bite like that. You got any mercurochrome, Phil? Iodine's better. No, no, it stinks too much. Well, go look in the medicine chest. Josie's got all kinds of junk in there. I hate iodine. I hope she's got mercurochrome. Ain't got my wind back yet. Maybe I'm slipping. Nah, you ain't slipping, Phil. You're done fine. Dookie, get some of that newspaper quick. You gonna read the paper? Give me it, will you? Hey, you got mercurochrome. What are you doing, laying them out in state? You heard Josie when she left. No mess on the rug, she said. 
It's all I need now. Trouble with my wife. You, you ain't gonna leave him here like this, are you, Phil? You got the car? No, I didn't have no time. I was taking him around the back. You can use mine. Mine for the night, anyway. Okay, roll him up. The rest of the rope is under the couch. Ah, yeah. uh, here's the keys, Duke. You go out and start the engine. Thanks. I'll have the car ready by the time you come out. Okay, usual way, Tiny. Knees up, head down. Put him in a ball. He'll burn better that way. Yeah, how's that, Phil? Good. Stay at the wheel. Come on, Tiny. Got the gasoline? Yeah, right here. Boy, it's quiet out here. And Dookie and me, we was riding around. We spotted these empty lots. You got them? By the rope, like a satchel. <laughs> Funny how a guy who weighs so little could be so strong. Yeah, this good enough. Now the gas. Man, ought to be enough. Okay, get a match? Uh, yeah, yeah. Here it goes. Come on, let's get out of here. All set, Phil? Yeah, get going. Hey. <laughs> hey, don't he make a pretty bonfire? <laughs> In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with A Piece of Rope. We continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Cameron Mitchell as Juki DeFore in A Piece of Rope. The vacant lot where Pittsburgh Phil and Tiny left the flaming body of Puggy Jackson was covered with weeds and sumac and littered with tin cans. Half a block away was a row of small houses. From one of those houses came a boy of 16 or so to watch the crackling bonfire. From the back door of another house came Emma Adams, in her hand a pan of water for her dog. Emma saw the flames and the boy standing there. Angrily, pan of water and all, she descended on the boy. How dare you start a bonfire here? I ought to call the police. Uh, honest, Miss Adams, I didn't start it, honest. Just like all boys your age, do things before you think. When those weeds catch, they'll set fire to the sumac bushes. Everything's dry as a bone. The whole neighborhood could burn down for all you care. But I didn't do it. I was just watching. Oh, that's I... what you all say. I'm going to put it out. Okay, put it out. See if I care. All right. There. Hey. Hey, there's something in that fire. It ain't wood. Miss <laughs> Adams, stop it. Hey, cut it out, Miss Adams. Somebody will think I hit you. Hey, stop. What's going on here? What are you up to, young fella? It's not me. It's not me. It's there in the fire. Officer, a dead man is in the fire. In the fire. Oh, father, love him. Stop that yelling now, lady. Just stay if I tell you. Young fella, get to a phone quick now. Call the precinct. Tell him Officer Martin told you. Give him the address. Run now, run. There ought to be a radio car close by. <laughs> Wainer, stick with the medical examiner. Let me know when he's through. Check, Lieutenant. Now then, Martin. Like I said, Lieutenant, I heard the de- uh, lady uh, screaming just as I finished talking to the desk sergeant from the car box up the block, so uh-huh. I beat it over here, and you know the rest, sir. I wish I did. This is the lady, Martin? Yes, sir. Mrs. Adams, this is Lieutenant McKenzie, 51st Precinct. Oh, yes, sir. You live around here, Mrs. Adams? Yes, sir. That, that house, just the edge of the lot. And as I understand it, you saw the flames and came over here. Yes, I... I was so angry. I, I saw that boy standing here. Mm-hmm. I, I thought he started it, and it's so dangerous in dry weather. I, I had some water for Skippy. That's my dog. I, I threw it on the fire. Oh. And that's all you know? 
Yes, sir. Uh, you here see any automobiles just before you saw the fire? No, sir. I couldn't have. I, I was in the kitchen with the water running and all. Uh-huh. You, son, you see a car of any kind? Uh, I, I think I heard a car. I'd see it. Do you know who he is? No, not yet, son. But we will. Yes, Wiener. The M.E. says he was killed and brought here. Strangled. Rope is deep in his neck. Fire didn't reach it. Oh, can I... That isn't... May I... Yes, Miss Adams, you can go. We'll call you if we need oh, you. Oh, thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you. Any chance to identify, Wiener? Plenty. His face is okay, and they had his hands inside his legs, so we ought to get fingerprints. Well, what do you know? A break. All right, tell the boys in the meat wagon they can have him, and we'll see him at the morgue in half an hour. got the girl outside, Lieutenant. I showed her the ring we got from him, and she came quick enough. What's her name? Jean. Jean Jackson. Her brother is Puggy. It's Puggy. Fingerprints checked downtown. We better have complete identification anyhow. The DA likes it that way. Bring her in. Check, Lieutenant. All right, Miss Jackson. This way. Yes, Mr. This is Lieutenant McKenzie. Sorry to bring you down here this late at night, Miss Jackson, but if this is your brother... It's his ring. Father gave it to him. Had it made... I begged him, I begged him, but he wouldn't listen. They never do until it's too late. This way, please. Do, do I have to see him? Someone from the family must make an identification if uh, if you'd prefer your father. My father's dead. Mother just couldn't. I hope she never needs to know. If you'll do what's necessary, I think that'll be enough. What's necessary? Identify, then swear to it on the witness stand when we get the gang that did it. Fourth and the left winner. Check. But, but if I go on the stand, the newspapers... Maybe you won't have to do it. If you do, maybe we can get the papers to forget your share. This is it, Miss Jackson. I can't. I, I can't. Lift the sheet, winner. Check. You'll have to look, Miss Jackson. You'll have to. Yes. Yes, it's buggy. Huggy. All right, Wiener, close it up. Then give me a hand with the girl. Why do they always faint? Does it do any good? So what have we got, Wiener? What have we got? We got a body, period. We haven't got that anymore, literally speaking. It was released for burial yesterday. Then we got a funeral to go to. Watch. What for? I know who'll be there. And you know more than I do. The mother, the sister, a few relations. Pittsburgh Phil Stone, Tiny Schultz, Dookie Dufour. How do you figure that? Their handwriting's all over the job. And the method, the attempt to dispose of the body, the rope especially. Those boys know you can't prove a rope is in violation of the concealed weapons law. They never carry guns. Oh, smart. Very. But... If we start the idea that they did it... But why? Puggy never worked in that district. They were hired, as usual. Go on. They have a weak sister in their outfit. Huh. Weak or not, I'd hate to turn my back on any one of them in an alley. Except Stooky. The kid? Right. I've got an idea, Wiener. Dookie doesn't know us. He's never seen either of us. Come along, Wiener. We're going for a little ride. Out to the corner of Warrenburg and Paoli Streets. Okay, Wiener, pull over and park. Leave the engine running. Check, Lieutenant. Watch yourself, Lieutenant. Don't worry, I'm a big boy now. Don't move, Dookie. What? Feel that in your back, Dookie? You're through, kid. You're through. Look, I didn't do nothing. Honest, I didn't. Don't look behind you. You do, and you'll never see anything again. Now, please, Shut up. Do like I tell you. See that black car across the street? Yeah. Okay. Start walking nice and easy, just as if you were going for a ride. (laughs) 
How are we doing? On schedule, sir. Don't rush. We don't want no trouble with cops. What? No trouble. You heard me, didn't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Look. What? Why don't you say something? I never, I never seen you before. Huggy Jackson never saw you either. Who's Huggy Jackson? Look, look, where are we going? Where, where are you guys taking me? What do you care? You're not coming back. Look, I didn't do nothing. All I did was take orders. You can't blame me if something went wrong. We got a job to do, that's so. all. You understand that, Dookie. Yeah, sure. Sure. Look, look I, I got some dough. I got it stashed. You, you can have it if you let me go. All of it. Nobody will ever know. I'll disappear. Change my name. You can, you, can, you can tell your boss you took care of me. I never did nothing, I tell you. Nothing. Just, I was the driver is all. But I never touched anybody. Not even Puggy. You hear that, Joe? He says he never touched Puggy. He says. But I didn't. So, so you are some of Puggy's boys. But I never touched him. I just drive the car after. Just after I drove the car. Look. Look, I'll give you the door, like I said. If you let me live, see? I, I want to live, you see? And I'll do more. I'll think of the others for you. I'll show you. Pittsburgh Phil and Tiny Joe. They did it. I watched them. They did it. They did it, I tell you. I never laid a hand on them. Honest. Honest. you got to believe me. You say something, will you? Don't just sit there like a statue or something with a gun in your pocket. Say something. I'll play ball. I'll play ball. Yeah, I'll figure it for you. I know. I know lots. You know what anybody thinks. Say something. Please, you gotta let me go. You gotta let me go. You gotta. You gotta. Should I tell him, Joe? Yeah, tell him. Put him out of his misery. Okay, might as well. No, 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 don't shoot. Let that gun alone. Don't take it out, please. No gun, Dookie. Just my hand in my pocket. Cops never carry guns in their pockets. They might catch it in the lining. You. You. Cops. Yes. Want to see our badges, Dookie? Cops. I spilled my guts to cops. You want to live, don't you, Dookie? What do you mean? You want to fry, Dookie? Fry? Fry? No. No, no, I'll talk. Oh, I'll talk plenty. I want to live. Tell me I can live if I sing. Please, please tell me. On the radio, Wiener. Tell him to pick up Pittsburgh, Phil and Tiny Schultz, and turn back. We'll take this punk in with us. Jack, Lieutenant. Here we go, Dookie. After you sing, home to mama. No, you can't do that. I'll talk. Oh, I'll talk, but you got to give me protection. I can't go home. I wouldn't live a day, not if I talk. One way or the other, I'm done. you got to protect me. I'll tell. Everything I know, I'll tell you. But you got to help me. you got to give me protection. I want to live. you got to help me. If I help you, you got to help me. you got to. Cameron Mitchell, who was starred as Dukey DeFore in A Piece of Rope, will be back with you in just a moment. Now, here in person is Cameron Mitchell. Well, I think it's obvious to everyone that Dukey DeFore became a criminal not so much of his own free will as because of the conditions into which he was born and the friends he made who came into existence in the same poverty-stricken slum areas where Dukey himself first saw the light of day. It follows, then, at least to my way of thinking, that a certain responsibility rests upon all of us more fortunate citizens. Our own complacence... Even the shameful little thrills we get when we read of murders and other sadistic crimes in our daily papers tend to encourage, rather than uproot, the organized crime which has such a tight grip on so many phases of our national life. And in the last analysis, it falls on us, even more than on our police, to prove to one and all that crime does not pay. Thank you, Cameron Mitchell. Time Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Mark B. Lowe, with music composed and conducted by John Gart. Technical advisor is Burton B. Turkus. 
The events, characters, and names used in the story you've just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental.
Singapore. At all the places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. The National Broadcasting Company presents the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Steve. You're going to run this pretty little boat right onto the rocks if you don't put your hands on the wheel. Uh-uh. Automatic pilot. W5, oh. WRS, <laughs> calling w 2 I should have known you'd have one of those on your boat. <laughs> so help me. First time in my life I've ever used it, Evelyn. Eloise. Hello, sure, sure. Yeah. W5, WRS, calling w 2 BYR. Steve. Mm-hmm. Why don't you turn that radio off, hmm? I never should have turned it on. What's all that W stuff? Hmm? Who's that silly woman trying to get, anyway? Oh, W5, WRS, calling W2BYR. That's the ship to shore operator. <laughs> Brother, you know them all. What does she want with you? I'm afraid I know. <laughs> well, I guess I better answer before they send the Coast Guard. <clears throat> W5WRS from W2BYR. Go ahead. Stand by, W2BYR. I have a call for you. Go ahead. This is Ruth, Steve. The commissioner wants to see you right away. Over. Now, look, Ruth. I said only call me in an emergency. Over. The commissioner says this is an emergency. Over. But I'm in the middle of a big deal, Ruth. I'm tied up. Over. Just a minute, Steve. He says untie her and get into the office. But tell him... Oh, okay. I'll come back. Out. Eloise, I'm afraid... And for this, I broke another day. Now, look, Eloise, I'm sorry. So what do I do? I go out and buy a new sun suit. And it's a very nice sun suit. I even fry some chicken for the first time in my life. I fry some chicken. But this probably won't take long. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? And what am I going to do with all that fried chicken? Uh, well, keep it on ice for me, huh? Hello, Commissioner. Steve, I trust you concluded your big deal satisfactorily. Uh, <coughs> well, I... Uh-huh. <laughs> Steve, ever hear of the Throp Foundation? Throp Foundation? Sure. That's the private charity that's been sending a lot of relief shipments to Europe. Right. They've done quite a job over there. Tons of food and medical supplies. Yeah, that's the outfit. What about them? Their last three shipments to Sicily have been stolen. Oh, uh, you mean off the boat? No, from the foundation's warehouse in Messina, Sicily. I see. We've been instructed to get to the bottom of it. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Ruth has your credentials in order. Okay. On the surface, your assignment will be to write a story about the stolen shipments. Actually, I want you to find out who's been stealing those shipments. And to be frank, Steve, I'm sending you into a pretty nasty situation over there. What do you mean? The Throp Foundation has had two men working on this case... One of them has been missing for two weeks. Mm. What about the other one? Oh, they found him all right. His throat had been cut. Well, that's reassuring. We're sending you because we think you can take care of yourself and handle the danger. When do you want me to leave? Good. As soon as possible. Now, if you need help or information once you get to Sicily, contact Emilio Donati in Messina. Who's Emilio Donati? He runs a bar in Messina. We think he's our friend of ours. Okay. There's just uh, one more thing I should warn you about, Steve. You know, you're making this assignment sound real attractive, Commissioner. (laughs) What is it? I guess you've heard of the Sicilian bandit they call Lorenzo. Yeah, who hasn't? He's got the whole countryside terrorized. Steve, I don't know whether he has anything to do with all this or not, but if he has, watch yourself. Yep, 
Huh? Looks like I got a real honey this time. You did. But it's vital to us that those relief shipments get through. Trouble usually starts from empty stomachs. Yeah. That's all. You've got your assignment, Steve. Your plane leaves in two hours. Good luck. Eduardo, this is Dino speaking. The American just landed at sea. Report it to the chief at once. Senor, taxi, huh? You want a taxi, senor? Yeah. Hey, uh, look, driver, you know your way around Messini pretty well, huh? Mas, you. I live here most of my life, senor. At the age of three, I was brought here from Palermo. So I know every house, every street, every building, every bar. Yeah, every... yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know your city. Now, take me to the Trap Foundation Warehouse. Again? Trap Foundation Warehouse. You know where it is? Trap? No, no. Trap. It's a... Ah, well, never mind. Just take me to the Rienzi Hotel. I'm sure you must have heard of that. (laughs) Why, sure. I'm going to put your baggage in the car, senor. Hello. (laughs) Sorry I'm late. Hmm? (laughs) You're not late. You're just in time. I heard you inquiring for the Throp Foundation, so you must be Ralph Gillette. I'm Helen Collier. I was supposed to meet you here at the airport, and I... Uh, Look, I'm afraid there's been a mistake. My name's not Gillette. It's Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Oh, oh, I I thought you were the one I was supposed to meet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Believe me, I'm sorry, too. Couldn't we just pretend I was? I'm afraid Mr. Archer wouldn't understand. <laughs> Already I don't like Mr. Archer. Don't even know him. Who is he? My boss. He's in charge of the Foundation's office here in Messina. Oh, wait a minute. Do you work for the Throp Foundation? Mm-hmm. Mr. Archer's been expecting a new man to fly down from Rome, uh, Mr. Gillette. I thought you were he. Oh. I wonder if you'd tell me where the foundation office is. I'm a foreign correspondent, and I'd like an interview with your boss. Oh, well, I could go with you and show you where it is, because it doesn't look like Mr. Gillette is on the plane anyway. Fine. I have a cab over here. You say you're a foreign correspondent. I suppose you want to do a story on the stolen relief shipments. Yep. Well, good luck. Mr. Archer doesn't want any publicity about it. Thinks it would have an adverse effect on donations from the States. Oh, well, here we are. Uh, pardon us, gentlemen. Uh, si, senor. If the water, the water, the man's way. Of course, your pardon, senor. Well, I'll see if I can get some kind of a statement from him. Are there just the two of you in the Messina office? Yes, right now. There were three of us. <laughs> Paul Wainwright was the third, but he... Well, he... Got fired a few days ago. At the Hotel Rienzi, no? No. Trop Foundation. Tropa? Tropa? Oh, Via Delgada. Oh, si, senorina. <laughs> hey, you must have the magic touch. Uh, this Paul Wainwright, he was fired by Mr. Archer? Uh, yes, three days ago. Senor, you ready, huh? Si. <laughs> Did you hear what the signorina told the driver? Si, Eduardo. Via Delganda. That is the address of the Throp Foundation. I will report it. You follow the American. Mr. Mitchell, you must understand my position. It's not that I don't want to cooperate with you and your press association, but at the same... The uh, stolen shipments are news, Mr. Archer, and news is my job. Well, I know all that, but just stop and think what's going to happen if the news spreads around back in the States. Our donations would probably stop coming in. We think it's vital that these shipments continue. I see. Well, in that case, could you give me an off-the-record statement about it? Hmm, I might, if I were sure it would be treated as such. I'll make a deal with you. We won't break the story unless or until the thieves are rounded up. Hmm. Well, all right. I guess that's fair enough. There have been three shipments stolen, right? Yes, from our warehouse. It's right downstairs. Yes, I noticed it as I came up. Did you have anyone guarding the shipments? Of course. We kept doubling the guard, but each time they were overpowered. Mm-hmm. Sounds like the thieves have a pretty large outfit. Yes, apparently they do. I suppose you've heard of the bandit they call Lorenzo. Oh, certainly. Everybody in Sicily's heard of him. He's got the whole country terrorized. He's supposed to have a hideout up in the mountains. Uh, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Mitchell. That Lorenzo's men could have stolen the shipments. 
I thought of that right away myself. Well, it's possible, isn't it? Yes, it's possible. Personally, I don't think Lorenzo had anything to do with it. With Lorenzo's reputation what it is, it would be relatively easy for someone else to make it look as if Lorenzo had done it. That's an interesting thought. Incidentally, you fired one of your men a few days ago, didn't you? Paul Wainwright? That is something that I'd rather not discuss. Oh? Of course, I don't want to persecute the man just because some of his actions appeared vaguely suspicious to me. I, uh, I have no proof of anything at all. I see. Well, thanks for the information. I'll see you later. You wish a favor, senor? Hmm? Oh, yeah, please. Right here. Hmm. Thanks. I am Carlotta. What will you have? Beer. But it is after dark. It's time to drink wine. <laughs> Emily Post may not like it, but I still want beer. Anything you wish. I will bring it. <laughs> Look, uh, is the boss in, Carlotta? Emilio Domati. See, si, he's here. Why? I like the scenery. I might set up a charge account. <laughs> Where is he? Uh, the fat one. Over at the bar. I will tell him to come over. Oh, no, no, never mind. I'll go over there. I see, see, I'm coming. Emilio Donati? Eh? So I am called, Signor. I uh, told a friend of mine in the States I'd say hello to you. So? I know many people in the States, Signor. I'm pretty sure you'll know my friend, the Commissioner. Commissioner? Yeah. I think you're expecting me. I'm Steve Mitchell. A name can be used by anyone, Signor. Here. You recognize the handwriting? Ah, see. Si. You are Steve Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Well, how can I help? I'm working on the theft of the relief shipments. Yeah, I thought that would be it. Oh, it's a very bad thing, Steve. There are so many people are hungry here in Sicily. Yeah. Uh, look, a fellow named Paul Wainwright was fired from the Throp Foundation a few days ago, and Archer acts like he thinks... Wainwright's involved in the theft. Paul Wainwright. I know who he is. I'd like to talk to him. Can you arrange it? See, si. In an hour or two, I will send the word for him to come to the back room of my bar off the alley. We can talk to him there. Order after 11. Wainwright ought to be showing up pretty soon, hadn't he? See, si. He should have been here by now, Steve. Mm -hmm. There's another lead I want to run down, too, Emilio. Hmm? Do you have any idea where the bandit Lorenzo's headquarters are? Oh, si. In the mountains to the west over here. Think you could furnish me a guide? A, a guide? Yeah. Just to get me into the general area. After that, I'll go it alone and do a little reconnoitering undercover. Steve, you must not try a thing like that. Look, it's the quickest way of proving whether Lorenzo's involved in these thefts or not. If he is... He's probably got a lot of the supplies hidden away in those mountains. My, his men would capture you. He has lookouts all over the mountains. Well, just last month, an entire division went up there and... Sure, they... sure, that's the point. There were so many Lorenzo's men spotted them easy. But one man alone in the brush could be hard to find. My Steve, Lorenzo has a small army of cutthroats up there. They are fanatically loyal to him. Could you get me a guide? My, look, the danger, you must realize the danger. Yeah, yeah. Lorenzo isn't stupid enough to kill an American correspondent. Ah, uh -huh. that must be Paul Wainwright. Oh, come in, uh, Senor Wainwright. No thanks. Look, Donati, and you too, whatever your name is. This is a waste of time. We've got nothing to talk about. Oh! Wainwright. Uh, knife in the back. Emilio, get out of the light. Get down. Yeah. Someone's running down the alley. Don't follow him, Steve. Huh? It may be a trap. There may be others waiting in the dark. Yeah, I guess you're right. Wainwright. See, uh, he's a dead, Steve. Now perhaps you realize that there's a real danger here for you. They know you are not a correspondent. Do you still wish a guide? I'll be waiting in room 23, Rienze Hotel. All right. I will send a man over. Senor Mitchell? Yeah. Who are you? Casella. Casella? 
That's supposed to mean something to me. Emilio Donati said me to you. Oh, oh, you're the guide. Si, senor. I am to conduct you to the mountain where Lorenzo and his band are hiding. Oh, Emilio didn't lose any time, did he? It was thought best to travel at night so that we may be in the mountains before the sun comes up. Yeah, I guess that would be best. We will drive to the foot of the mountains by car. Then we'll use horses on the trails. It is all arranged. Good. When do you want to start? As soon as possible. Okay, let's go. Hey, pretty narrow trail up here, Casella. Uh, si, senor. About time for sunrise, isn't it? But a few more minutes and it will be light. Hmm. You say, you think Lorenzo's hiding out somewhere on that mountain up there ahead of us? See, uh, that is what I have heard. Okay, let's stop here a minute. I'll go it alone from here, Casella. There's no point in your going any farther. Thanks very much. See, Signor, you're right. There is no point in going any farther. Put your hands in front of you. What? Do as I say, Signor. I am going to tie your hands. Look, what is this anyway? Hey, wait a minute. You're one of Lorenzo's men. Here's one of... Oh, all right, oh, senor. I will no, no. push the gun this way. So, senor Mitchell. Casella, are you all right? See, si, uh, I think so. Except my nose. It is bleeding. Fool, you deserve it. Come, we'll take the American to Lorenzo. He's coming to Eduardo. Go tell Lorenzo. See? Si. Oh. oh. Casella. See, si, Casella. This is for the bloody nose you gave me, senor. Hey. Well, thanks. Looks like I got taken for the well-known ride. I thought Emilio Donato was a friend. <laughs> Sometimes it is difficult to know who your friends are. You're so right. Uh, here, here is Lorenzo now. Well, Senor Mitchell, you're feeling better now, huh? Not much. <laughs> Welcome to my camp. Thanks. So you're Lorenzo. See, si, I have that honor. Honor? Of course. Hmm. Where are we? Walk with me and I will show you. As you see, you're on top of a mountain. This is my headquarters. Mm-hmm. Hey, you can see a hundred miles from here. See, si, this is why I choose this place. But where are the guards? Guards? <laughs> you are not my prisoner, you are my guest. Mm-hmm. But see, below us, my men are camped there. Is it not a reassuring sight? Hey, that looks like a small army. 120 patriots. Patriots, you call them? Of course, they serve Lorenzo. (laughs) Got a pretty good opinion of yourself, huh? (laughs) I am one of the most brilliant men I have ever met. Really? (laughs) You know, you don't talk like you've spent your whole life in these mountains. Oh, I have, as you say, been around. I attended a university in Italy for two years. But you came back to this. How come? A sense of duty, senor. I rub the rich and give to the poor. Yeah? That sounds pretty, Lorenzo. But are you sure it's not just because you're a thief at heart? (laughs) You are shrewd, senor. Well, why not? From my experience in the world, I have learned that one must look out for oneself. Oh? Consider the recent war. Nobody won it. Consider the peace. Again, nobody wins it. Everyone quarrels and fights. Now, is it not much more clever to take what one wants, to be concerned only with oneself? You know, your kind of thinking isn't helping things any. Perhaps not, but it is profitable to me. And, senor, this conversation is pleasant, but I still do not understand why you were so anxious to spy on my camp. No? You ever hear of the Throp Foundation? No. What is it, senor? A relief outfit that's been shipping food and medical supplies here to Sicily. Oh? Does this concern me? That's what I'm wondering. At least three shipments have been stolen from a warehouse in Messina. (laughs) And of course you think that I stole them. It's a pretty good bet. Well, I am sorry to disappoint you, senor, but as you see, there are no supplies here. Look around you. I have nothing to hide. No? Uh, It is my fate, senor. Whenever a crime is committed in Sicily, I am immediately accused. I suppose I should feel flattered. It has often occurred to me that the police must find me very convenient. How so? Uh, It would be most embarrassing for them if I were captured then they would have no one to blame for all their unsolved crimes. 
Well, I'm sorry you made this trip for nothing, senor. Well, if you've got nothing to hide, how come you went to so much trouble to capture me? I was told you wanted to see Lorenzo, so I thought I would make it easy. You were very rough with my men, senor. But uh, no matter. We will be friends. And you will go back to America and tell everyone what a gracious host is Lorenzo. Oh, huh? you want a press agent, huh? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. That, that girl coming up the trail, she looks awfully familiar. Oh, her name is Carlotta. Yeah, yeah, now I recognize her. She works at Emilio Donati's bar. See, hmm. Everything's starting to add up. I am afraid Carlotta is not very happy with me at present. No? She has been very useful to me in the past, but she is so uh, possessive. She is very upset to learn that there had been another woman here. There, you see how she sulks? I believe she thinks that she is punishing me. Ah, Carlotta, my dear. Speak to me, Lorenzo. Do not speak to me. You climbed up here to tell me that. I am true with you. You have not been true to me. Oh, you are not very flattering, my dear. Of course I have not been true to you. That would be to deprive others. Oh, so good for nothing, you. (laughs) I think I'd better leave you here to take out your temper on the American. I have other affairs to look after. The beast. I lie for him. I steal for him. Uh, Maybe you ought to pick your friends a little more carefully. So, you're the one that put the bee on me at Donati's, huh? You had Lorenzo send that phony guide to my room. Treat me this way after all I do for him. Oh, the beast. I do not think you would treat me that way. Huh? I think if you were my friend, you would treat me nice. Now, look... Would you like to be Carlotta's friend? It's okay with me if you're trying to make Lorenzo jealous, but use somebody else. Kiss me. They cut it out. Come on, come on. Kiss me. Hey. You like it? Well, under other circumstances, maybe. Right now, no. You should not have done that, Carlotta. Lorenzo, Perhaps that will show you you cannot treat me as you have. If you do not want me, there are others who do. Uh, You are such a child, Carlotta. I am afraid this presents a problem. Look, there's no problem. I've got no interest in Carlotta, believe me. Oh, I'm aware of that. But some of my men there below may have seen her kiss you, senor, and that is the problem. I must not allow anything to shake their confidence in me. The appearance is everything. No, it is not Carlotta I am thinking about. She is nothing. Dog, that you should talk about me like that. What if I were to tell the American about... Shut up, Carlotta. Wait a minute. What did you say, Carlotta? Then you would wish you had not treated me that way. I told you to keep your mouth shut. I will tell. Carlotta! On the other side of the mountain is a cave. Lorenzo has hidden the relief shipments there. Well, Lorenzo, so you've got nothing to hide. Now, indeed, I have no choice, senor. Carlotta, give me your scarf. You are going to fight with the knives over me. Fool, to think it is you I am considering... Hey, look, how let's consider me for a minute. I did not intend to kill you, senor, but as you see now, I must. Here, take this knife. Now, wait a minute. Put the end of the scarf between your teeth. Huh? There, as I do the other end. Oh, what so, fool? now we circle slowly. Hey, look, let's cut out this foolishness, will you? Do not hold the knife that way. Huh? Use the underhand grip. Hmm. Do you know nothing at all about knife fighting? As much as I want to know. Not for the last time. I am sorry. Defend yourself. Okay, you ask for it. <laughs> You twist the knife from my hand. Yeah. You may know knife fighting, but you're pretty sad on judo. (coughs) Oh, Lorenzo! You killed Lorenzo! Just a rabbit punch, lady. Won't even leave a scar. So long. Dog of a dog! Oh, caro. Carissimo. He has killed you. Lorenzo. Lorenzo. Will you stop that silly babbling? Lorenzo. You are all right. See, except the back of my neck. I will tell your men to go after him. No, this is a personal matter. They might find it hard to understand how the American escaped from me. I will go after him alone. I will go with you. You will wait here, Carlotta. I will attend to you when I return. Lorenzo. I may be gone until dark, because if I do not find the American, then there is someone in Messina I must talk to. Now get me my horse. My wind is shot. Maybe it's the altitude. Hey, the horse. Ahead of me somewhere. I better play it safe. Hey, Donati! What? Over here, Emilio. 
Steve, Steve Mitchell, you are safe. Yeah. I sent the guide to your room the first thing this morning. He said you were gone. Yeah, one of Lorenzo's men got there first. Your waiter, Carlotta, tipped them off about me. Carlotta? Yeah. Think that horse of yours can carry both of us? Ma, Lorenzo's men, they will be after you. Yeah, yeah, that's a good reason for not hanging around here any longer. All right, come. I, I'm going to help you up. Wait, listen. My horse is coming. Come on, get your horse into the brush here. Yeah. Cover up his nose so he won't whinny. Lorenzo, he's alone. Yeah, heading towards Messina, too. Look, I have a gun. We can capture him. No, no, not yet, Emilio. Come on. We'll give him the lead, then follow him into Messina. It's possible he's got more on his mind than just finding me. If so, I want to know what it is. Lorenzo. Your arch. Why, you, you fool, coming here to the foundation office. My secretary will be back any minute. The American escaped. What? How could he? We will not go into that. Oh, you stupid fool. You've ruined everything. Mitchell must know all about the stolen shipments now. See, he knows I stole them, but he does not know that you are involved, Archer. He might as well. We're through now, Lorenzo. Through. And all because of your stupidity. Do not talk that way to me, Archer. I planned it so well. Even when Paul Wainwright became suspicious, I fired him. Then I had his mouth shut permanently. And now you've ruined it, you blundering half-breed. You keep your mouth shut. This will help you. Lorenzo, I'll kill you. This gun is quicker than your knife. Well, Lorenzo and Archer, the gold dust twins. Mitchell. <laughs> Very neat. So you two did work it together, huh? You're, you're wrong, Mitchell. I, I've just captured a notorious bandit. What? Why, you lying dog. It was you who arranged me. Hey. Get back. Get back, Mitchell. Give me that. That gun's safer with me, Archer. Uh, you, you've got nothing on me. <laughs> you mean because Lorenzo can't talk? If you want to put it that way. There's one witness you overlooked, Archer. Carlotta. Yeah. When she finds out you kill Lorenzo, she'll sing plenty, and it's a song you're not going to like. Well, did you send your report to the commissioner, Steve? Yeah, I called him. He said the Throp Foundation had sent a new man over to head up the office here. Well, and now you can relax for a few days. We, we're going to eat and drink and have a good time. You will have such a food as you never taste. Scalopini, escarole, a pizza, I, I, pizza I, 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 that yeah. melts in your that, mouth. That sounds fine, Emilio, but I, I think I'll be heading back to the States. Now, what's the hurry? Well, someone back there is keeping some fried chicken on ice for me. Well, it uh, would... Uh, fried chicken? Yeah. It's got to be eaten on a boat, too. Steve, I don't understand. What's so special about the eating of fried chicken on a boat? Well, you see, she's... Uh, not the chicken, that is, I... Oh, well, just take my word for it, huh? So long, Emilio. <laughs> just heard the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy and written by Bob Wright. This program was directed by Bill Carn with music by Bruce Ashley. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, as Steve Mitchell, embarks on another Dangerous Assignment. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Tired from a strenuous weekend? Spring fever give you the wanderlust? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. You are hanging by your fingertips on the sheer face of an ice cliff. Suspended a thousand feet above instant death with your strength running out. And with no chance for escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, 
We escape to the cold loneliness of a glacier high in the Swiss Alps and to a man who learned much about death as told in C.E. Montague's grim story, Action. High in the Swiss Alps, well above 12,000 feet, a man clings with desperation to the frozen glass wall of the Chaliot Glacier, hands and feet jammed into shallow steps chopped in iron-hard ice. A cold wind drives a spray of dusty sleet along the overhanging wall, and the sun has fallen away among the crags to the west. Darkness lies one hour ahead. The man has climbed with painful care a thousand feet up the glacier's face from the broken moraine at the foot and has moved now onto the underside of a great bulge in the ice, a part of the wall which breaks out beyond the perpendicular. And the man is forced to hang from slots cut by his axe much as a sloth hangs from a tree branch. Twelve more feet lie between him and the brow of the overhang. Six more steps to be chopped out with the axe. And a thousand feet of void space waits beneath him. The man is unable to lift his heavy axe for even one more stroke. He's tired, and he's 52 years old. No experienced mountaineer would ever attempt the west face of the Chaliot Glacier. And yet this man is an experienced mountaineer. But why? Why? What strange events have conspired to bring him along the path of his life and leave him hanging now in peril on the brink of eternity. Through what shadows has that path led him, and where are those who saw him pass? Can we ourselves move back along it, move back step by step against the river of time, move backward along the life path of Christopher Bell? <laughs> My name is Jean Valjour, and I am a guide for all the mountain trails on the Vaisorn and the Chaliorn. I talked with Mr. Bell this morning as he was leaving the village, though, of course, at the time I did not know that was his name. The season is over, you understand. Winter will come in another week or two, and most all the visitors are gone. So, you see, I was very surprised to hear a stranger call out to me in English. Hello there. Ah, bonjour, monsieur. I mean, uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Well, I'm glad to see there's at least one other early riser in the village besides myself. Oh, only a few people are left in the village, sir. It is the end of summer. The end of summer. Hmm. How well I know it. Oh, by the way, which of these paths takes me to the foot of the Chaliot? Uh, the one on the left. But you will find no climbing there, sir. One arrives very soon at the glacier and can go no farther. Except, of course, to climb up it. The glacier? <laughs> that is impossible. It has never been done. Of course not. It's never been tried. Well, there is not anyone who would be so foolish. Well, it isn't that. There are plenty of foolish people in the world. But even they hold on to their margin of safety. Margin of uh, safety? Yes. The difference between the point where a man thinks he's reached his limit and the point where the limit really is. Que diable racontez-vous? I mean, I'm afraid I do not understand this. Oh, all right. Well, take a mountaineer such as yourself. Hmm. Now, you look at a slope. You estimate the effort needed to climb it. Then you estimate your own endurance. And if there isn't a good-sized safety factor, you just don't make the climb. But it would be foolish not to do so. Oh, yes, I dare say. It's all tied up in the fear of death. Hmm. Take that out of a man for one instant, and there's no telling what he might be able to do, or what limit he might reach. And uh, how should a man lose that fear? Hmm, he can't. He can't lose it. It has to be done for him by... by things outside. <laughs> He turned and left me then, this, uh, this Mr. Bell. Walked up the path toward the glacier. Uh, that was early this morning, and I did not see him again. Uh, his talk with me made no sense, and I could not understand what he meant to do or why he was going to do it. I remember thinking, uh, ah, what a strange man. But I know really nothing more about him. I believe he arrived in the village only last night and took a room in the Zinal Inn. Greta de Gaspar, 
and I'm staying out the week here in Zinal to close up the inn for the winter. I have known Mr. Bell for the last 30 years. Always before, he came in the summer season for the climbing, and I was most surprised when he arrived last night. I opened one of the rooms and found something for him to eat, and then later, we sat and talked in front of the fire in a big empty lounge. This is very good coffee, Madame Gaspar. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. Had you let me know, I would have had everything ready for you, just like all the other times. Like all other times, eh? <laughs> now, this one's a little different, Madame Gaspar. You might call it a special visit. Uh, it is all so different now from the old days. Then it was you and your madame would come here. And it was Gaspar and I. And the summer seemed to last forever. Mm. I thought everything would be forever when she was alive. Now I'm really alone in the world. As I am. And it is not good to be alone. Mm. It gives one little reason for living. And makes one no longer afraid of dying. Yes, but there are stronger reasons for that than just being alone. Mr. Bell, you look so strange. Hmm? Is, is there something troubling you? Why, no. Not now. Well, there may have been, but not now. Well, I should be leaving quite early in the morning for, for a climb, so I think I'll go on to bed. Good night, Madame Gaspar. Mr. Gaspar, I left the inn this morning before I awakened, and I have not seen him again. I've never known him to act so strange before. I have no idea what the reason is or what he may be planning to do. But I'm sure something is troubling him. Perhaps it may be something connected with his business back in London. My name is Matthew Bruff. I've been chief clerk in Mr. Bell's London office over the past 25 years. I've always found him to be a considerate and dependable employer. I've never noticed anything you might call unusual about him until one day about three weeks ago. Mr. Bell entered the establishment a bit late, as I recall, and passed immediately into his own office without acknowledging my customary greeting. A little while afterward, he sent for me. Well, Matthew, where do we go from here? I can't say that I follow you, Mr. Bell. Well, I mean, the company's on a steady footing, so if we use our heads at all, we don't stand much chance of losing anything. Our position is quite secure. On the other hand, we can't expect to do any more growing. We're through expanding. From now on, it's just a matter of operation. A most enviable condition, sir. <laughs> is it? There's nothing more to look forward to, nothing more to work for. So, as I said, where do we go from here? Matthew, I'm putting you in charge of the business, turning it over to you, effective this week. Mr. Bell, you, you can't possibly mean that. Oh, yes. I've just decided. But uh, what are you going to do? I'm taking a trip. I'm, I'm going to Switzerland. Uh, climb a mountain. Oh? Oh, well, then, at least it's only temporary, just for whatever time you're gone. That's right. Yes, for whatever time I'm gone. Just uh, for whatever time I'm gone. Before the end of the week, he had arranged all the necessary papers and had left London. I haven't heard a word from him since, though I presume he's somewhere in Switzerland. Actually, however, I haven't the faintest idea where Mr. Bell may be right at this moment. Minutes pass on the glacier. And the shadows grow longer from the jagged peaks to the west of the Shariok Glacier. And reach out with dark fingers toward the man who clings to the icy wall. While his pounding heart beats out the number of his time on earth. Already those shadows have flowed into the awful depths below his swaying figure. Blurring the sharp points of the tumbled rocks a thousand feet down. And making the harsh void seem soft and inviting. The man's thoughts have grown as unwieldy as the heavy ice axe gripped in his hand. He keeps trying to remember that he is Christopher Bell, a human being, and not a part of this free and empty space. 
or he knows if he stops remembering that, he may forget all else too and then let go. There's been no reason for trying to locate Mr. Belt since nothing of any importance has occurred during these three weeks. I'm sure he's quite all right. Only uh, one thing still puzzles me a bit. The remarkable change in him on that morning three weeks ago. I never heard him talk like that before. And whatever the reason for it, I'm quite sure it was something that happened that morning before he came to the office. My name is John Huxford, and I've been a conductor on the Westminster route for some 14 years now. And during all that time, Mr. Bell has been a daily passenger of mine on the early morning inbound run. As I recall it, the first time anything you might say out of the way ever happened between us was one morning about three weeks ago. I saw Mr. Bell waiting at the usual place, so I signaled to the driver to stop. Oh, good morning, Mr. Bell. Good, good morning. I'll I'll be right there. Here now, let me come down and help you, sir. I, I'll make it. If you just take my arm, Mr. Huxford. My, my, my arm, please. But I have taken your arm, Mr. Oh, Bell. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Up we go now. Uh, 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 there you are, sir. Thank you. I... I uh, uh, had a bit of a shock this morning. I, I'm all right now. Well, if it's all right now, that's fine, I say. Now, take hold of the strap there now. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, let me see. I have the fare here somewhere. Oh, yes, here you are. Thank you, sir. And and thank you. I, I'm i afraid you've brought something home to mind. I don't understand what you mean, sir. Well, Mr. Huxford... Have you ever had anyone take your arm and help you up a flight of steps? No, and I might say that I hope the day never comes when I... Uh, uh, Well, (laughs) I'm sorry, sir. Not at all. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Thank you very much. I don't rightly know what was wrong with him, though it's certain that something was. I haven't seen him for nearly, oh, three weeks now. I can't imagine what it might have been what happened to him that morning before he got on the bus. My name is Jenkins. I've been Mr. Bell's personal valet for the past 12 years and 7 months. The master's travelling somewhere on the continent just at present. Been gone something over two weeks now. Decided rather suddenly, I believe. In fact, I rather think something happened one morning about three weeks ago that caused him to make up his mind. I really haven't faintest idea what it might have been. I can remember noticing a very strange look on his face when he came down to breakfast that morning, but uh, thought nothing of it at the time. Good uh, morning, Jenkins. Good morning, sir. I trust you had a pleasant night's rest. Uh, uh, yes, 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 I did. Thanks, Jenkins. Uh, you're having the usual, aren't you? Just toast and tea. Uh, no, no, I, I want nothing except some coffee. Very well, sir. I'll bring it right away. I can't let him find out. I can't let anyone find out about it. Maybe it's a little better now. Maybe it's going away. Maybe I'm giving it too much importance, but... No, 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 it's still there. That same lack of feeling clear down the whole right side of my body. There. I can move my arm and leg all right. But there's no feeling in them. They're numb. It's simply that at 52 years of age, I've had a light stroke. Your coffee, sir. Oh, 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 thank you, Jenkins. Would you care for something more, sir? No, 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 that's all. If you'll pardon me, sir, you don't seem quite yourself this morning. I do hope you're not ill. No, 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 no. I'm all right, Jenkins. I hope you won't mind my saying this, Mr. Bell, but you don't take very good care of yourself anymore. Oh, please, It's been years now since you had a check-up, not since the mistress passed away, in fact. I'm quite all right, Jenkins. I'm quite all right. Yes, sir. I'm relieved to hear it, sir. I'll bring your paper now, sir. Good Lord. This is what a man slaves his life away for, to end up helpless, dependent on others, to be wheeled about, put out in the sun, taken in like some great fat lava. That's disgusting. Pardon me, sir. I didn't quite hear you. Oh, uh, nothing, nothing, Jenkins. Here's your paper, sir. Oh, thank you. Please uh, call if you need anything else, sir. I'll be in the pantry. I couldn't go on that way. I'd rather not go on. I've got to face it. This stroke is the first warning. There'll be others, worse ones. And in a short time, I'll be helpless. There must be some way out. Not suicide. But some way. There's got to be some way. The icy wall hardens into cold, vitreous steel as the dusk-born shadows chill its surface. The 
The merciless ice is beginning to freeze the cramped joints of the man's fingers now. And the heavy axe swings idly at his belt, tracing a fumbling pattern on the thin air of the void. How much longer can he cling to those slots in the glacier's face? How much longer does he have to live? Thirty seconds? A minute? What's the margin of safety now? And what does a man think of while his pulse beats slower and he waits to die? Strange how I'm able to go on, hanging to this slope, clinging on to life. And I can't feel another ounce of strength left in me. Strange, too, how it seems I could stay here forever, becoming part of the glacier itself, looking down at the rocks below and out across the peaks and the ice. I was right. Dying isn't so bad, really. Not when it's like this. Rather pleasant, in fact. It looks so soft down there, the shadows and the snow, and the wind. <laughs> Perhaps I could let go, float out on the wind like an eagle, or be blown along by it like drifting snow. Oh, the sun's gone now. It will be full dark in a few minutes. Maybe I can hold on that long. But everything is dark, even the snow and the ice. And who knows? Perhaps I'll watch the sun rise tomorrow and set again. And even beyond. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't last even one full minute longer. I'm through. I'm finished. I can't even last a half. Huh? Chips of ice sliding over the edge. It's funny how a glacier sheds off that way. I suppose the difference in temperature between day and... Oh, wait. An ice axe. That was an axe. No other sound in the world like it. Fell from up above the overhang there. There must be somebody up there on the slope. Coming down from the top. There is. Wait. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine... That's a mountaineer's call for help. Someone's dropped his axe and he's in trouble up there. It's right above this bulge. If I can only... No, 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 my throat. My throat's too dry. Well, six more steps to cut to reach the edge there. All right. Done in. I was finished. And now. Now. Five more steps. Just about does it. The last step. Ted, cut the rope and let me go. There's no use of it. Good Lord, it's a woman. And there's a man upon the slope. Uh, hold, hold on up there. Huh? I'll be with you in a minute. Ted! Somebody's coming. There's someone down here. Over the edge. <clears throat> Take it easy there. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, thank heaven. I, I don't know where you came from, but thank uh, heaven you're here. Uh, yeah, easy now. Let's get a step out for your feet. Uh, I was I'm just below the old hang there. I heard the fellow up above call out. He's got quite a voice on him. It's, it's my husband. Uh, Please in, hurry. Easy now. Uh, Step out here in a second. You can put your feet on it. You, you get your breath. Then we'll tackle the slope. All right. Here now. I'll scrape this ice away. Easy now. There. Oh, that's better, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, oh. oh you're all right now. Just lean there. When you feel like it, we'll, we'll go on up. Oh, my name is Christopher Bell, by the way. I'm... I'm Anna Gerland. What do you do? Thank you. I... I thought we were done. I was cutting steps down ahead on the slope and I slipped and dropped my axe. Oh. The rope held me, but neither of us dared to move. Oh, yes. Well, you're all right now. As soon as you rest up a minute, we'll cut some more steps back up the slope. Oh, you should have started down this way. You, you've never been able to pass that bulge. Yes, I can see that now. Of course, it, it's harder to tell when you're moving down the slope. Yes, I, I suppose it is. You were coming up the slope, weren't you? Yes, I, I, I came up from the foot. Alone and without a rope. And you deliberately climb onto the underside of an overhanging wall. 
Well, let's just say we're both foolhardy. Is that what you call it? Ah. If you've got your breath back now, I suppose we start up the slope. <sighs> oh, here. I'd like to take my axe and cut the first step. You'd trust me with it? After I dropped my own? Oh, anybody could make a mistake like that, dropping an axe or climbing up under an overhang. My name is Theodore Gurren, and I'm the husband of the woman who slipped and fell on the wall of the glacier. I'm a physician, formerly of Harley Street, London, who I've practiced in Paris for several years now. I met Mr. Bell when he and my wife reached the ice ledge where I stood waiting above them. I was not immediately aware of his trouble, but found out about it a short time later when we reached the rest hut at the top of the ridge. While my wife heated water for tea at the far side of the room, Bell and I fell into a much more personal conversation than strangers normally do. But this sometimes happens when people have been very close to death. At any rate, Dr. Gurlin, well, you can see how it is. Uh, the life of an invalid doesn't seem very appealing. Mm, uh, tell me something, Mr. Bell. Huh? I gather you were pretty well done in when I called out there on the glacier. You couldn't lift a hand. Then how do you account for being able to chop six steps into that ice in a matter of some five minutes? I, I don't know exactly. I was through. I couldn't have lasted 30 seconds more. But when I realized someone was in danger, I don't know, I, I forgot about it. And this numbness, this lack of feeling in your right side, it didn't bother you? No, I didn't notice. It isn't quite so bad now, as a matter of fact. And there's your answer, Mr. Baron. I... I don't believe I follow you. Action. When you were in action, working because you had a reason, living because you had to, because somebody was depending on you, then you were all right. Everything was back in its place again. Oh, perhaps, but a man can't spend all his time climbing up a mountain to save someone's life. Oh, I don't mean physical action, movement. Uh, call it incentive, if you like. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Incentive, eh? That's right. It's the one top pressure that keeps life moving and growing. And it's what you need. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting theory, Doctor. Mm, yeah. But it's only a theory, eh? I'll have uh, the tea ready in a moment. Is anybody interested? I am, my dear. Lucky we brought it. If, if no one minds, I, I believe I'll have a turn outside while we're waiting. Well, of course not. Only be careful out there in the dark. The ridge breaks off pretty sharply here. Oh, yes. I, I'll be careful. Oh, um, Dr. Gurley. Yes? Yeah. If, if things were turned around, I wonder if it would be any more than just a theory to you. Mr. Bell, where are you? I'm over here, Mrs. Gold. Beautiful, isn't it? With the stars so clear and bright. Yes. Well, there won't be any more clear nights before the winter storms. It would be a shame to give it up, you and I. What do you mean? I've got to say this quickly, because I don't want my husband to know. We're not the kind who commit suicide, you and I. But I think we understand each other. Well, you, you'll have to say more than that. You deliberately climbed into a dead end out on that glacier. Deliberately extended your safety margin beyond all possible limits, didn't you? What do you mean, we understand each other? Because I did the same thing. I went ahead. I picked that route down the slope. But I... No, please wait. In 30 seconds, I would have cut myself loose from that rope. Oh, we went to an awful lot of trouble so we wouldn't have to call it suicide, didn't we? You? But why? I have a brain condition. There's no point in going into it, but it's incurable. And sooner or later, at any moment... I shall go blind. Oh, no. My husband doesn't know about it, and I don't want him to. Mr. Bell. Yes? I'll make a bargain with you. What sort of bargain? I'm not brave, really. To go on living, I need something to cling to. I need to know all the time that there's someone else with courage, too. Mr. Bell, I'll go on living if you will. I'd say you're amazingly brave. If I were, I could do it alone. Without having to make myself dependent on you and your courage. Hmm. Well, that sort of thing could work both ways. 
I wouldn't dare let you down. Nor could I, you. Do you want to make the bargain? Shall we go on living, Mr. Bell? As I said before, I am Dr. Theodore Gerland. And I met Mr. Bell some three hours ago on the Chalioch Glacier. At the moment, he's outside the hut a few yards away, talking to my wife. I can hear the sound of their voices, but I can't make out the words. However, I know what they're talking about. What his answer would be. My wife and I discussed that before she went out to join him. You may have heard of my wife, incidentally. Though it would likely have been under the stage name she uses in the Paris Theatre. You see, she's, uh, she's quite a talented actress. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. And tonight brought you Action by C.E. Montague. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield. And featuring Joseph Kearns as Christopher Bell and Eric Rolfe as The Voice. With Louis Van Ruten as Dr. Golan, Marta Mitrovich as Greta, Jeff Corey as Bruff, Ray Lawrence as Huxford, Barry Kroger as Jenkins, and Joan Banks as Mrs. Golan. The musical score was conceived and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Next week... You are in mid-ocean. Aboard a jinx ship. Already three men have died. And you know that some malignant force is aimed at you. And you cannot escape. Next week, escape with Joseph Conrad's great story, The Brute. Good night, then, until the same time next week, when we again offer you Escape. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. It surely is. After all, robbery is robbery. Whether it's racketeers stealing cars or a luscious blonde stealing your husband. I'm Gail Collins, and my husband, he's a private detective. But don't go away now, because I'll be back in a minute to set the stage for our puzzling crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. Is that right, Mrs. Collins? It was murder, too, Jack. Oh, plenty of killings on this case, huh, Gail? Oh, yes, but I'm talking about how it was murder, the way that blonde went to work on my husband. <laughs> and, well, it began when Greg and I were at home in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. We were having breakfast and opening the morning mail. Doesn't anybody ever get anything in the mail but bills and ads? Let's see this. Uh -huh. uh, here's a bill you've neglected to pay for a full year. It's a year old today. Oh, my gosh. What do you tell them? Oh, just send it back and write happy birthday. Oh, Greg, now, really? Okay, we'll pay him. I often wonder where the percentage is in being a private detective. Do you think J. Edgar Hoover started this way? Greg... What would you say if I told you I can get us a brand new car at a $1,000 discount? We do not need a brand new car. 
The model we have? It is not a model. It's a horrible example. Gail, we do not need a brand new car. That jalopy of ours is so hopeless. There we go again. I can see myself now languishing away in debtor's prison gasping. Gail, I told you we did not need a new car. Yeah, Greg, read this letter from my Uncle Ollie. Remember him? He's an auto dealer in Redwood City. Mm. I sent Uncle Ollie a very sad letter about how badly we needed a new car. Oh, you did, huh? You never told me about it? Of course I didn't. You're not the sympathetic type. You'd never have understood. Here. Uncle Ollie says that for us, he'll beat all the usual discounts they're giving now and save us a thousand dollars. A thousand off? If you could do that, I'm Bing Crosby. Let me see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what he said, all right. Save you a thousand dollars. Hi, you Bing. How's every little thing? Greg and I grabbed a weekend bag, a box of Havana cigars for dear old Uncle Ollie, and we were off to Redwood City in a cloud of exhaust from our old jalopy. Just outside the town limits, we stopped at a drive-in. A streamlined blonde was behind the counter. What'll it be, ma'am? Oh, just coffee, thank you. How about you, Greg? Yeah. What'll you have? Dream boy. Dream boy? You're the subtle type, aren't you? Yeah, how'd you know? Well, what will you have? Dream boy? I think I have it. Greg! I think I'll have a glass of milk, that's all. You don't need milk, man. Not with that Merlin Brando physique. Believe you me. I'm going to have trouble with this one. What's your name? Lulu. That's quite a head of blonde hair you have today, Lulu. Now you might have steal deposit bottles. I'll put your order in. Coffee and milk, huh? Mike, draw one, two and a half. Mike's a Spanish type. See the omelet on his shirt? That's what I like about you, Greg. When we're out together, it's one sophisticated rendezvous after another. Here's a chat. 20 cents. A cup of coffee and a glass of milk. Huh. That's what I like in a man. Throw your money away. Live dangerously. See you in a minute. Don't go away, handsome. You just changed on my plan. Get that smile off your face, Greg Collins, or I'm leaving you right here and now. I've got the fed Reno, you know. Been saving it in a secret bank account just for a moment like this. Uh, uh, she's just having fun, Gail. Help. Help me. Greg! Oh, that man that came in. He's bleeding. Uh, He's gonna fall. Uh, I got him. He put the chair under him, Gail. Oh, That's it. Stealing my car. I... Uh, uh. Oh, Greg! He's unconscious. No, he isn't, Gail. He's dead. He's been beaten to death. Hey, tell that guy to get up over the floor. What's the matter? He's been drinking? No, Lulu, he's dead. Gee, I didn't think the food here was that bad. He's been killed. He has. Well, what are you waiting for? Call the cops. Do you know him, Lulu? He's the second one in a week. Getting to be more popular in this town and square, dancing. What is? Murder. Who is this guy? I don't know. Ever seen him before? Who made you a quiz master on this program? I'm a private detective, Lulu. Can you tell anything from looking at the body, Greg? Uh, and his wallet says Charles Livingston, 414 Bay Drive. Owner's permit for the car, 32 bucks cash. What's this in his hand? If I can... Force his hand over. What in the world is that, Greg? A piece of pottery. Very small chunk. No markings on it. Like it came from a broken crockery jar. Now that's a help. Maybe it is, Gail. What do you mean? Call the police. You won't have to. Why not? Because the whole Redwood City police first just walked in. <laughs> Howdy, folks. That's the police. You're late again, Sheriff. Uh, late for what, Lulu? That guy on the floor. He's been murdered. Mm, murdered, huh? Mm. Uh, it's a shame. It's horrible, isn't it, Sheriff? Uh, sure is, ma'am. I was planning on going to bed early tonight. Uh, wanted to go fishing tomorrow. 
I'm awful tired. Uh, Sheriff, I'm Greg Collins. This is my wife, Gail. Your wife? I'm a private detective, and I'm just down here to pick up a car. Sheriff, the case is all yours. Uh, yes, yes, so okay, yes, so okay. Morris Perry. Uh, what did this fellow die of? Um, overwork? Uh, kills people, you know? No, Sheriff. Somebody stole his Cadillac. I guess he must have caught him doing it, and they beat him up. He came staggering in here and passed out. Well, I'll call Doc Snyder. I understand this man's the second person who was murdered in the past week. Yep. He's raising Mary Ned with my efficient schedule. Yeah, but Sheriff... You don't dig the Sheriff, Mr. Collins. Six days a week, he sits in a rocker, taking it easy. Every Saturday, he stops relaxing and works hard. That's where he rocks against the grain. Greg and I left the very sleepy Sheriff and Lulu and went on to Uncle Ollie's store. Keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a minute with more of our story. At Uncle Ollie's place, show enough, he had a brand new shiny car waiting for us to drive away. Well, here it is, kiddies, and it's all yours. A turquoise blue convertible. Uncle Ollie, you're an angel. Just get it straight from the factory, Uncle Ollie? That's right, Greg. Just came off a rattler from Detroit. Mm. Oh, let me sit at the wheel. Go right ahead, Gail. Maybe Greg would like it. Where are you going, Greg? Ah, uh, just moseying around. Hear about the stolen car and the murder, Uncle Ollie? Yeah. Sod for this town. It's usually very quiet, isn't it? Greg, oh, you must sit at this wheel. It's wonderful. Oh, and look at the upholstery. Who's the young fellow in the back, Uncle Ollie? Oh, that's Harry. Works for me as a salesman. Fills in when I'm out. Hey, Harry! Come here and meet my niece and her husband. Okay, Ollie. Harry's been working on the new sign. A green spotlight. You see it outside? <laughs> Clever idea. <laughs> it's a green traffic light. See, but, but underneath it says, Stop. Buy here. Best car bargains in California. Oh, oh. Uh, Harry, uh, this is Gail Collins. Uh, how are you doing, man? Mm -hmm. uh, shake hands with her husband, Greg. Uh, how are you doing? Well, I'm very proud of my uncle, employing a salesman like you. Makes quite a staff for you, Uncle Ollie. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm happy to be working for your uncle. He's a darn nice guy. You like a new car? Oh, it's wonderful, Harry. Hey, come on, Greg. Let's hit the highway in it. I'll make out the papers, the check. Ollie's already got our plate. We're not hitting the highway yet, girl. Why? I'd rather stick around a while, play guessing games. About that corpse back in the lunch wagon. We signed all the papers. Greg made out a check. And the brand new car was ours. At a terrific saving. There wasn't any place to stay in that giant redwood tree area, but a very small hotel. So we dug in there for the night. Just about half a mile from Uncle Ollie's place. We were getting ready to go to bed. Well, here we are, broken, tired. Hey, what in the world are you up to? Why are you putting your coat on? I can't stand it, Greg. I've got to go outside and take one more look at that car. Oh, it's just unbelievable. Brand new. Gorgeous. Oh, and all mine. Now, I got a bed, Gail. It's late. You can stare at it all day tomorrow. Oh, just one look, Greg. Mm, okay. Come on. Uh, where's my top coat? Uh, here. Right, huh? Let's go. It isn't every day a girl gets a car like that, Greg. Yeah. It isn't every day somebody steals it, either. A beautiful... What did you say? Exactly where did you park that cocktail lounge on wheels, Tim? Right, right here, by the cottage. Well, I thought I... I know you did, but it's gone, huh? But, but that's impossible. I... An hour ago, we parked it here. Yeah, so we did. In fact, I scolded you for nearly scraping the fenders on those rocks there, remember? Of all the... Well... Turn in an alarm. Where's, where's the phone? The phone, Jim, like the man explained who runs this motel, is in his office, which is closed after 9 p.m. You gotta go down the road into town. Well, fine thing. Fine thing. Somebody steals our brand new car. Just quick like that. And who's with me? The best private detective in America. At least so he tells me. And what does he do? 
He stands there. This doesn't call for acrobatics, Gail. It calls for brains. And that, my sweet, is where I come in. Well, genius, you stand there and think. Me, I'm going for the police. I'm going to get a hitch in this car that's coming. The great hitch you'll get in that percolator. That's a Model T Ford, chum. And five will get you ten. It doesn't even get up this hill. I'll bet it does. Watch. See? <laughs> I told you. Folks, the sheriff. You're late again, Sheriff. Hmm? Uh, what did I miss this time? By the usual margin of a few minutes, this time you missed a robbery. Someone just stole our new car. Uh-huh. Uh, well, get in. I'll give you a hitch over to the state police barracks. Uh, uh, we'll send an alarm. Uh, fellas will have to stop us here, crime wave, and wear me out. Uh, I'm a sleepy man. We reported the stolen car to the state police. Then Greg routed my uncle out of bed and took him to his car store and made him open it up. Now, oh, really, Greg, to drag me out of bed, to force me to open the shop and go poking around here. I don't like it at all. Not the crudeness of it, mind you, but, but if you think I've been mixed up in this car stealing racket... How do you open this desk? That's my desk, and I'll thank you to keep out of it. I said, how do you open it? You want me to handle this discreetly and clean it up quietly? Now, shall we drag the state police and the newspapers into it? Oh, don't do that, Greg. I'll lose my franchise. The publicity... Will... Open the desk, Ali. Now. Greg, what in the world are you looking for? Uh, a little jar. A little jar? The what? Hmm. Uh, it's not in here. Open Harry's desk. I'll do no such thing until the you last tell me. Time I ask you, Uncle Ali. The sheriff should be working on this case, not you. The sheriff? Are you kidding? If there was ever a more useless. Uh, all right, all right. Here's the key. Open Harry's desk. It's not here. Confound it. How about a locket? He has one. Follow me. In the back here. By the grease pits. And I have the light switch. Mm, by now that car of ours is in another state, I'll bet. Unless it'll really cool off for a few days in a hidden garage. I'll do a repaint job, upholstery, maybe change the dashboard around. But the registration, Greg, they can't change the engine serial numbers. The police have an asset now that brings those numbers out no matter how much you buff them off. Well, they leave the numbers, Ollie. Drive the car to a state with no title laws. There were 16 states like that. Get a fake bill of sale, notarize it themselves. But what if the information gets to the state where they take your car? Ah, it takes weeks to check. By that time, they'll sort it in Canada or South America or Europe. But American cars bring down a big price. Here's the locker. I know the combination. Just wait. Uh, let's see what Harry's got here. Uh, old shoes. Rags. Aha. Uh-huh. This is it. This little jar. And when they open it. What is it? What's in there? When a man came into the lunch wagon, he mumbled his car was stolen. And after he died, I found a little piece of crockery in his hand. Same kind as this jar. When your charming young employee, Harry, shook hands with me, Ollie, I noticed his fingers were stained with a black substance. It wasn't until our own car was stolen that I suddenly realized what this was all about. The stain on Harry's fingers was the kind you can't get out. Not dirt or a smudge, but deep in the skin. It comes from handling a chemical. The stuff that's in this jar. This is mercury. Mercury? Mercury is kept in a pottery jar, usually. And one of his little-known uses is for stealing cars. How? Come on. 
We're going to pick up his assistant first. His assistant? Yeah, the luscious blonde at the diner, Lulu. Now, where's your car? Right over here. Steal a car with mercury. If you don't have the ignition key, you pour a little mercury in the keyhole, keep it there with a piece of gum. It completes the starting circuit. Well, I'll be a... We'll all be if we don't grab Lulu and Harry. It's just as well my nerves are good. In just a moment, we'll bring you the climax of the case. When we got back to the drive-in again, the streamlined Lulu slinked up to Greg. Well, if it ain't my lover boy and the missus. Hiya, Mr. Collins. There's no time for hosting around, Lulu. Let's get to the point. Where's Harry? Harry? How should I know? Start talking to make it quick. I know you've been working with Harry, helping him steal cars. You what? Now, look, baby. The first night we came here and a man staggered in and died right in front of that jukebox... You said to the sheriff, somebody stole his Cadillac. But nobody had said the dead man owned a Cadillac, Lulu. When I looked through his pockets and found his registration, remember? It was a Cadillac. How'd you know that? Mental telepathy? Okay, handsome. I'm no sucker. I'll tell you about it. I was gonna spill the whole thing anyway. Those guys gave me plenty of dough to help him out, and I took it. But they didn't say there'd be murder wraps in this deal. And that's where I hang up. Where is he now? He beat it. Where to? They loaded a bunch of hot cars into a tram steamer and they're going to South America. They get five grand apiece for him down there. He boats up the river. There's a dock up there nobody used in years. They go down the river to San Francisco Bay and... Gail, stay here and keep an eye on Lulu. Me? With her? Oh, not in your life. I'm going along. Greg, Ollie, come back here. Sit down, Lulu. Looks like it's going to be a long winter. That must be the tramp steamer out there, Greg. See it? Yeah, come on, Uncle Ollie. Where are we going? See if we can borrow one of these boats and row out there to the steamer. Okay. Just getting kind of dark. All the better. Come on, there's a speedboat down there by the steps. I wonder where that Harry is. And I guess he's out there on that ship. I hope we'll get there in time. Down on your face, Ali. Who fired a screen? Was it Harry? Who else could it have been? Keep back, Collins, or you'll get plugged. You could get plugged yourself, Harry. You got a gun, Greg? Yeah, but I can't see anything to fire at. What? There he is. In the speedboat. Oh, yeah, I see him now. You gonna give yourself up, Harry? Look out, Greg. I just missed you. Okay. Two can play at that game. You got him, Greg. Come on down to the speedboat. Uh, careful, Ollie. It could be foxing. Yeah. What? There he is. He's coming up the steps towards us. That isn't Harry. It's a much smaller man. You got your gun ready, Greg? Yeah. It's ready. Here he comes. Folks, uh, Sheriff. Sure. Uh, evening, Mr. Collins. Uh, Molly. Where's Harry? Uh, lying back there in the boat. Uh, did I shoot him? No, but he missed him by a mile. I don't get this at all. Not at all. Uh, nothing to it, Bob. You see, as you know, I like to take a nap every afternoon. Oh, well, sir, this afternoon I moseyed down to the dock. I uh, seen this speedboat. Uh, they got a very comfortable bunk in her, I can tell you that. Well, sir, I stretched myself out and went to sleep. Uh, I'd still be sleeping down there if it weren't for that gosh darn shooting. It woke me up. So I sat up, found that fella Harry popping off fireworks. So I says to him, how can a fella sleep with all that noise? 
Uh, well, sir, uh, he says something I won't repeat, count of my being a gentleman. Uh, so I bopped him one on the bee, sir. Uh, started to quite a ruckus. Uh, you mean for once you're on time, sir? <laughs> yeah, I was jolly on the spot, Mr. Collins. Uh, yeah, I made out kind of well, too. There's Harry, out cold as a mackerel. Mm, it serves him right, too, for breaking up a man's sleep. Uh, 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 what are you been shooting at each other for? It's a long story, sir. Uh, well, you'd better save it till tomorrow, then. Uh, i got to get home and get to bed. i got to be ready for tomorrow. Uh, what happens tomorrow, sir? Oh, tomorrow's my day off. Uh, I'm going to take my wife and children out somewhere. Well, where are you going? Oh, some nice deserted spot in the woods where we can all lie down and sleep. <laughs> After the sheriff dumped Harry into the county clink, Greg came back to the lunchroom, where I was watching Lulu. Say, handsome. Yes, Lulu? Here we go again. Could I have a picture of you? What for? Well, I'm going to jail. I believe it's going to be nice to hang on the cell wall. It'll be my last order, huh? Yeah. Then we walk over to the sheriff's office. What do you have? Just coffee. Milk. Still a big spanders, huh? Okay. Draw one, two and a half. You don't seem to be too unhappy about going to prison, Lulu. Me? Oh, I don't mind. I was wondering where to spend my vacation anyway. Now I'll have a private room, three meals a day, and a gorgeous view of the river all for free. They, uh, find your car on that tram steamer? Yes, thank goodness. We'll drive it back to San Francisco. Lulu, tell me, what was your connection with this auto steering bracket? I was the spotter. And what, pray tell, is a spotter? Well, the mob gets an order, Gail, for a certain type of car. The spotters take the highway, so they sight one, see? Then they tip off the gang. And they heist it away. Somebody must have ordered a car like ours. And I must say they're a lovely taste. Mrs. Collins? Yes, ma'am? I guess... Uh, well, you're kind of sore at me for pitching at your husband that way, huh? Well, Lulu, not really. I always say... Men are men, and women are women. And for fun and games, you can beat that combination. In just a moment, we'll be back with you. Well, folks, Gail and I hope you enjoyed our adventure, the green stoplight. So be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For where there is crime and romance. There you go. For Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. One of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at this same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Engaged Girl Murder Case. When you are suffering from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia pain, you want fast relief. Well, just try Anison. Anison gives incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. Many people first discovered Anison tablets through their own physician or dentist. Next time you want effective relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, get Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N, comes in boxes of 12 and 30 tablets or in economical bottles of 50 and 100. Now for Mr. Keene and the engaged girl murder case. Our scene opens on a wealthy, fashionable estate in Connecticut. A number of people are riding across the estate on horseback. But two of them have fallen behind, not realizing that they are both about to become participants in a tragedy. 
Better hurry, Audrey. The others are getting ahead of us. Herbert, wait. Let's walk the horses a bit. I... I want to talk to you, and this is the first chance I've had to see you alone all day. Well, what's the matter, darling? You look concerned about something. I am concerned. About your sister, Martha. Martha? Herbert, I... I don't think she wants you to marry me. But that's sheer nonsense. Martha's very fond of you. She pretends to be in front of you. But I believe she hates me. Now, Audrey, don't you think you're being oversensitive? Herbert, I know how much you love your sister, and I didn't imagine you'd believe me, but it's true, and I just can't... What's that? That sounds like one of our dogs. Yes, it is. It's Sultan, my sister's dog. There he is, Audrey, near that clearing. Come on, let's ride over there. What's the matter, boy? Herbert, look! It's my sister, Martha, lying in a thicket. Hold my horse while I dismount, Audrey. What's happened, Herbert? Has she been hurt? Audrey, she's been struck on the head. Martha's dead. <laughs> The police said, Mr. Keene, that someone must have struck my sister Martha on top of the head with a heavy club and killed her instantly. And this occurred while you and your guests were out riding, Mr. Langley? Yes. Uh, was your sister Martha part of the group who were on horseback? Yes, I, I thought she'd gone on ahead with the others. Well, hitting a horseback rider on the head with a club when you stand on the ground, well, that ain't an easy trick. Somebody on a horse must have followed the girl and struck her from the saddle. My partner, Mike Clancy, has a good point there, Mr. Langley. Tell me, were all your guests questioned by the local police? Yes, Mr. Keene, but none of them was held. They were all Martha's close friends and mine. It, it's unthinkable that any of them would have wanted to harm her in any way. In other words, you can't put the finger of suspicion on any of them. No, Mr. Keene. My sister Martha was a beautiful, intelligent woman... Very popular with men, though she never married. I loved her as much as I've ever loved anyone in this world. With the exception of Audrey, perhaps. Mr. Langley, tell me a little more about your fiance, Audrey Stafford. She's a wonderful girl. We met last summer on a cruise to Bermuda. She was on vacation at the time. She, she worked for a banking firm. But she resigned her position at my request shortly after we announced our engagement. I see. I'm wealthy. My late father left his entire estate to my sister Martha and to me. I didn't think it was necessary for my future wife to retain her job. Well, what about that incident you mentioned when you told us the story before, Mr. Langley? What incident, Mr. Clancy? I imagine Mike is referring to your talk with your fiance Audrey, just before you found your sister's body, the talk concerning her unfriendly attitude toward Audrey. Oh, oh, that... That was nothing. I shouldn't even have brought it up. Mr. Langley... I presume you came here to ask me to solve the mystery of your sister's murder. Yes, Mr. Keene. I came to plead with you to enter the case, for Martha's sake. And also for Audrey's? What do you mean? From what you told me, Mr. Langley, I imagine there is one suspect in this murder case. You mean my fiancé? Yes. You said that Audrey told you that Martha was against your marriage. But Audrey would never have murdered my sister for that, or for any reason. There still remains a question to be answered. However, uh, I can't accept the case, Mr. Langley, unless you tell me everything openly and truthfully. I should have known better than to try to hide my real feelings from you, sir. Yes, I want Audrey protected. So far, no one knows that she quarreled with Martha before the murder. Over you? Yes, Mr. Keene. I overheard the argument. I said nothing to Audrey, thinking it would pass over after the wedding. Why did your sister want to stop the marriage, Mr. Langley? For a very silly reason. Martha thought Audrey wanted to marry me for my money. I never believed that, Mr. Keene, and I never will. At the same time, if I accept the case, you must be prepared to have me include your fiancé as a possible suspect. I understand that, Mr. Keene, and I'm willing to meet those terms. All right. Now, how far is your estate from here? It's just over the line in Connecticut. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Keene's office. Mike Clancy speaking. It's Mr. Herbert Langley there, please. This is Mrs. Wrightson, his housekeeper. Uh, just a minute. Uh, your housekeeper, Mr. Langley. Oh, well, yes, I told her where I'd be in case there were any messages. It must be important. Well, here you are. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. 
Hello. Mr. Langley, this is Mrs. Wrightson. Yes. Mr. Ernest Porter's here to see you. He says it's very urgent and he wants to know when you'll be home. Is he near the phone, Mrs. Wrightson? No, he stepped out in the garden. Well, tell him I expect to be home within an hour. Mr. Porter didn't say what his business was, did he? No, sir, but he acted like it was a matter of life and death. All right, Mrs. Wrightson, I'm on my way. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Langley. It's a neighbor of mine named Porter, Mr. Keene. He seems to have something terribly important to tell me. Who is he, Mr. Langley? He has an estate near mine. He and his nephew, Alan, come over quite often. I can't imagine what he's got in his mind... Unless it refers to my sister Martha's murder. It probably does. The sooner we find out just what it is, the better. Mike Clancy and I will go with you to your home right now. For just a moment, Mr. Keene, I have a key to the front door. Well, Mike, while I'm inside the house... Suppose you take a look around, you know, the usual checkup. Right, sir. Come in, Mr. Keene. Oh, Mr. Langley, I, I didn't hear you come in. This is Mr. Keene, Mrs. Wrightson. Mrs. Wrightson, my housekeeper. I've heard of Mr. Keene, the great investigator. I'm very glad to know you, sir. How do you do, Mrs. Wrightson? Where's Mr. Porter? In the study. Oh, Mr. Keene and his partner, Mr. Clancy, will be staying overnight. Would you have one of the maids prepare a room? Of course, Mr. Langley. Oh, um, Miss Audrey called. She said she's coming out to see you at five o'clock. But it's almost that now. Show her in when she arrives, please. Yes, sir. This way, Mr. Keene. Well, this is quite a handsome house you have here, Mr. Langley. It's been in the family for generations. Oh, here's Mr. Porter. Herbert, I want to speak to you alone. This is Mr. Keene, the famous investigator, Ernest. Mr. Keene? You mean he's taken over the investigation of your sister's murder? Yes. Well, then I suppose I ought to say what I have to say in front of him. I think you should, Mr. Porter, if it concerns the murder of Martha Langley. It does, Mr. Keene. Then what is it you want to tell us? Well, I have a nephew, Alan, of whom I'm very fond. He's been living with me since his parents died. And I'd stand behind him under any circumstances. What are you trying to say, Mr. Porter? Mr. Keene, you can accuse me for that matter or anyone else who was along on that morning ride. My nephew's innocent and completely honest. What are you driving at, Ernest? I think I know what Mr. Porter's trying to say, Mr. Langley. Apparently his nephew, Alan, is connected with your sister's murder in some way. And Mr. Porter is attempting to clear him, even before he's been accused. Mr. Keene, knowing you for what you are, a fair man, I, I don't mind putting my cards on the table. My nephew, Alan, came to me today and confessed that he was the first one to find Martha's body. You mean he found her there near the woods before I did? Apparently, Herbert. How did he happen to find Martha's body, Mr. Porter? Well, he dropped behind the rest of us as we were riding through the woods. The reason he said nothing about it up to now was that he didn't want to become involved, Mr. Keene. That's not a very good excuse. The boy was excited, frightened perhaps. At any rate, he admitted the truth, didn't he? Yes, and it's in his favor. Mr. Porter, is there anything else you wanted to say to Mr. Langley? No. Except that he has my deepest sympathy. I appreciate that, Ernest, and thanks. In recent months, you and my sister Martha have become fast friends, and I... I know you miss her, as we all do. In recent months, did you say? Well, Mr. Keene, Martha Langley and I were better than friends. I dared to hope that she would marry me. I didn't know that, Ernest. I said nothing, Herbert, because she turned me down. It was too bad. Both our families are rich and would have been a most advantageous marriage, as well as a happy one for me. I'm glad you brought that out by yourself, Mr. Porter. You mean if I'd hidden it, I too would have become a suspect? Well, Mr. Keene, as far as I could... That sounded like a gun. It was. It came from the back of your house. Both you gentlemen remain where you are. I'm going out to investigate. All right, young fella. Just Mike. I'll join you in just a minute. Okay, me bucko. Let's go. Good evening. Who are you? My name is Keene. Oh, the famous investigator. I'm Audrey Stafford. I'm glad you've come, Audrey. I wanted to ask you a few questions in regard to the murder of Martha Langley. Leave her alone. I beg your pardon. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Wrightson. Please, Mrs. Wrightson, I can handle this alone. Audrey hasn't done anything, Mr. Keene. You have no right to question her. Well, aren't you taking a few liberties, considering that Mr. Langley asked me to investigate this case, and you're one of his employees? Oh, it's not meant as disrespect, Mr. Keene, but... 
Oh, I've come to look on Miss Audrey as my future mistress, and I want to protect her. What makes you feel that she needs protection? You suspect her of being one of Miss Martha's enemies, don't you? I haven't mentioned that to anyone. Neither has Mr. Langley, I'm sure. Oh, then... Then I made a mistake. I beg your pardon, Mr. King. However, you're not far from wrong. What? I do suspect Miss Audrey. Mr. King, you don't You can't that. suspect Miss Audrey. She admitted to Herbert Langley that his sister Martha was against their marriage. And that alone could be construed as motive enough for murder. Don't say it, Mr. King. Don't say that word. Mother, or... please, Mother, don't. Audrey, did you say Mother? She lied. I'm not her mother. That won't help, Mrs. Wrightson. It ties in with your strange desire to protect someone who should be almost a stranger to you. So, Audrey is your daughter. No one knew up to now. There are many more things that are still concealed in this murder case, Mrs. Wrightson. But I intend to bring them all to the surface. And at the same time, bring Martha Langley's killer to justice. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the engaged girl murder case. Meanwhile, beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those cracks and crevices where food particles can decay must be reached to have a really clean mouth, a welcome breath. Your dentist knows this to be true. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos gives amazing dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of active cleansing bubbles to penetrate hard-to-reach dental areas. Helps dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and tooth decay. Use Kalanos toothpaste with dental floss action. Kalanos has high polishing action, too. Brightens dingy teeth by removing ordinary yellow surface stains. Kalanos is gentle, safe even for children's teeth and tender gums. Enjoy its cool, clean, minty flavor. Kalanost is dentist recommended. Cleans your teeth bright, keeps your breath right. Use Kalanost toothpaste with dental floss action. Get Kalanost with dental floss action today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the engaged girl murder case. The murder of wealthy Martha Langley brings Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner Mike Clancy to the fabulous Langley estate in Connecticut where Mr. Keene begins a difficult investigation. He has just discovered that Mrs. Wrightson, the Langley housekeeper, is actually the mother of Audrey Stafford, who is about to marry the victim's brother, Herbert. After learning of this startling revelation on the driveway in front of Herbert Langley's palatial home, Mr. Keene continues to question Mrs. Wrightson and Audrey in the hope of obtaining further information. Mrs. Wrightson, I advise you to be truthful with me. If you really want to protect your daughter, Audrey. As long as you know my secret, Mr. Keene, I'll tell you everything. But not in front of Audrey. You shouldn't have made me keep that secret, Mother. I wanted Herbert to know about it. Please, dear. Let me speak to Mr. Keene alone for a few minutes. Very well, Mother. Audrey, you'll find your fiancé, Herbert Langley, in the house, along with his neighbors, Mr. Porter and his nephew, Alan. I'll talk to you later, Mother. Yes, darling. Mr. Keene, there's one thing you must understand. My daughter, Audrey, is no snob. She pleaded desperately with me to allow her to tell Mr. Langley I was her mother. And why didn't you? I thought it would hurt her marriage, at least socially, since I'm Mr. Langley's housekeeper. I was so happy knowing she'd get those things in life I always dreamed she'd have. Wealth, social position, and happiness. Go on, Mrs. Wrightson. It was easy to keep the secret as far as our names were concerned. I married twice. Audrey's name is Stafford, but I kept the name of my second husband, John Wrightson. I did it thinking that one day I might not want Audrey to admit that her mother was poor and ordinary. I wouldn't call your love for your daughter ordinary, Mrs. Wrightson. Her meeting with Herbert Langley was just a coincidence. I came here to work as his housekeeper after Audrey left on her cruise to Bermuda. And she didn't know about my new job until she got back. Then I cautioned her to say nothing about it to Mr. Langley. I see. Is there anything else you'd like to tell me, Mrs. Wrightson? Only that Herbert Langley wasn't the only millionaire who wanted to marry Audrey. Who else was there? Alan Porter. He was mad about her. And he's very rich, Mr. Keene, a well-known polo player. 
He wanted to marry Audrey, too. But she loves Herbert. And Martha Langley, Alan Porter, and his uncle all together couldn't change that love. How do you mean, Mrs. Wrightson? Did they try to stop the marriage? Mr. Keene, two hours before Martha Langley's body was found, I happened to pass by the Chinese tea house. The Chinese tea house? It's a small cottage on the estate over there in the woods. Inside the tea house, Martha Langley, Mr. Porter, and Alan were having a conversation. What were they saying, Mrs. Wrightson? Mr. Porter was saying that Audrey and his nephew, Alan, would make a good match. Martha Langley seemed to be irritated. She asked young Alan why he hadn't been able to win Audrey away from her brother. And what was Alan's answer? He didn't have time to answer, Mr. Keene. That moment, my daughter Audrey walked into the tea house, so they changed the conversation. Hmm. It's very interesting, Mrs. Wrightson. It puts a new aspect on the case. What do you mean, Mr. Keith? I'll explain later. Meanwhile, would you please ask my partner, Mike Clancy, to meet me inside the Chinese tea house immediately and tell him it's very important. Mike. Is that you, Mr. King? I'm over here on the tea house porch. Sure, this is certainly a fancy shack, isn't it, boss? Hey, it looks like something from a Chinese palace. Mike, uh, come inside for a moment. I want to show you something. Oh, look at this. Saints preserve us. Like someone must have tried to tear the house down, Mr. Keene. There's a hole right through the wall. The walls are flimsy, Mike. But they've been reinforced with short, narrow beams. That's the one part of this tea house that isn't authentically Chinese. One of those wooden beams, small but solid, has been pulled out right here. Mr. Keene, that missing piece of wood could have been the murder weapon. Exactly. And here's something else, Mike. Why, it's a bit of cloth. I found it hanging on this nail head here where the beam was torn out. Now, if you wanted to tear a beam out of this wall with the aid of a chisel, say, how would you brace yourself? Well, I'd stick my knee up against the wall on this side for leverage. That's just what the killer did, Mike. But he unknowingly left this bit of cloth on the head of that nail. This bit of cloth comes from heavy riding breeches. So the killer probably never even scratched himself or herself. Herself? Well, nowadays women wear heavy riding breeches too, Mike. Yeah, but Mr. Kane, that still leaves us with the job of picking out the killer. Several people were riding that day when Martha Langley was murdered. I know that. However, I think I have an idea. Tomorrow morning, Mike, we'll all go riding here on the Langley estate and turn my murder theory into a fact. <laughs> you like to ride with Audrey and me? We're going through the woods. No, you better ride on ahead of us, Mr. Langley. My partner, Mike Clancy, and I will join you in a few minutes. All right, Mr. Keene. Come on, Audrey. Well, the horses ain't exactly in my line, boss, but I, <laughs> I try to keep up with you. You ride very well, Mike. Well, not half as good as you do. Hold up there, you old partner. Take it easy. I'm sure they were all pretty curious about why you wanted to take that ride this morning. My uh, reason paid dividends, Mike. It, it did, boss? Uh, I know who murdered Martha Langley. All I need now is proof of how it was done. That's what... Here comes Alan Porter. Mr. Keene. Yes, Alan? I, I don't know why you suggested this ride, but... Uh... I feel I owe you an explanation. Of what? Last night, when Mr. Clancy fired at me, I wasn't prowling. I only... Well, it was a natural mistake in all our parts, Alan. But you seem to take it more seriously than it warrants. Well, I just wanted you to know that I'm being honest. And I have nothing to hide. I'll see you later, Mr. Keene. Sure, and he sounded like a young man with a guilty conscience, boss. He might have a very good reason for that, Mike. I found out last night, after seeing a picture of the murdered girl, Martha Langley, that she and Audrey were the same height and often wore identical riding habits. Well, what does that mean, sir? Alan realizes that I may know that Audrey refused his proposal of marriage and so may have wanted to take revenge. You mean that he may have killed the wrong girl because they, they looked alike in their riding clothes? Yes, it's possible. 
Uh, Mike, uh, do you see that thicket over there under the apple tree? Uh, that's where Martha Langley's body was found. Mm. Seeing it gave me an idea. Here, let's get near the tree. Oh. All right, Mike. Right here. Uh, would you mind dismounting? Well, it'll be a pleasure to get off this nag, boss. Oh, oh there. Oh! Mike, the critter ran away. Now, uh, we'll round him up later. Mike, the lowest branch of this tree is just a little above the head of a rider on horseback. Climb up there and I'll explain what I'm getting at. Well, I do my best, boss. Riding horses to tree climbing. That's for the investigating business is sure getting a bit strenuous. Yeah, That's good work, Mike. Now, unless I look up and peer very carefully through the branches, I wouldn't see you. Well, then, Mr. Keene, the killer could swing from here in the tree and as his victim came by on horseback, hit her on the head. Yes, Mike. I'm convinced that's the way it was done. Yeah, but who was the murderer, boss? He seems to be joining us right now. Be quiet, Mike. Stay up there in the tree, out of sight. Tired of riding with the others, Mr. Porter? What are you doing here, Mr. King? Solving a murder. That's why you decided to see what I was up to. What do you mean? The man I intend to arrest for Martha Langley's murder is you, Porter. You think you can prove that I killed Martha? Very easily. I have a tiny piece of cloth torn from your riding breeches. When you pulled your murder weapon, a wooden beam out of the tea house wall. And there's the hole in your breeches. I saw it just before we left the house. Don't spur your horse, Keen, or I'll shoot you out of the saddle. That gun won't help, Porter. The others are riding half a mile away by now, and you seem to have lost your partner, too. I think this gun may help a great deal. Why did you kill Martha Langley? I don't mind telling you, you'll never get a chance to pass it on to anyone else. I killed Martha to protect myself, Keene. Protect yourself? How? Five years ago, my brother left two million dollars to his son, Alan, and made me his guardian until he came of age. Alan comes of age tomorrow. He's 21. Did you steal his inheritance? No, I spent it. I knew how to enjoy it. And not only spent most of that money, but I left it in some of the most fashionable gambling houses in the world. And how did you think you'd get away with it when your nephew, Alan, became of age? It would have been simple if it wasn't for Martha Langley. I was going to tell Alan his parents lost the money in those gambling houses. And that I kept it from him all these years just to save their reputations. But Martha Langley found out the truth? Yes. She made a deal, though. Said if I could get my nephew, Alan, to marry Audrey... She'd keep my secret and add $50,000 in the bargain. But you didn't succeed. No, that fool nephew of mine was crazy about Audrey. But she fell for Herbert Langley. I think I know the rest, Porter. Do you? Martha Langley became angry when you couldn't fulfill your part of the bargain. It was her only hope of separating her brother from Audrey. You thought she'd give you away and you killed her to prevent that. The way I'm killing you, King, right now. Look out, boss! Good work, Mike. Wait a minute, I'll dismount. He's out cold, Mr. King. When I hopped on his head from that branch, I fell right on top of him. And he hit the ground first. Yes, Mike. Porter met justice on the same spot he committed his crime. He lured Martha Langley over here when she became separated from the others. Probably by calling her as he crouched in the tree. And then he struck from above. Now he'll pay for his treachery in a court of law. And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the engaged girl murder case. The next time you're suffering from the pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. 
So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison, A N A C I N. Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel, Mr. Keen. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Cleek. Then a kill pack plays Mr. Keen. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keen next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the concrete cellar murder case. Chevron Gas Station invites you to Let Yours Do It. Brought to you by the makers of climate-tailored Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. George Valentine would be the last person in the world to take a job that was not exciting, even with a large salary attached. That's why he opened his office and advertised to solve any problem for a fee, of course. Well, he's had his excitement all right, sometimes more excitement than he bargained for. Right now, George, his secretary, Claire, and Sonny are driving along in his car. Mr. Valentine, why so much mystery? Where are we going? Just playing hooky from the office, huh, Mr. Valentine? We can't afford to play hooky, Mr. Valentine. You know that. Have you two ever heard of the Harding Bookshop? Not I. Never. Why? Should we have? Well, that's where we're going. To buy a book? Of course not, Sonny. Mr. Valentine has a book. <laughs> Here, bright girl, take a look at this newspaper clipping. What does it say, sis? Hmm. William Harding, exec- eccentric owner of the Harding Bookshop, died in his sleep last night. He leaves his widow Harriet and a nephew Frank. Mr. Harding had been in poor health. Okay, and... that's enough. Well, what about it? man dies in his sleep. Where do we come in? Well, his widow phoned. She wants me to meet her at the bookshop at 11. She made it sound urgent. Jeepers, I wonder why she wants to see you. An eccentric book dealer dies in his sleep. His widow is very anxious to see me. Kids, I don't know what it's all about, but it has all the ingredients for some real excitement. No use, Mr. Valentine. The bookshop's closed. Maybe Mrs. Harding hasn't arrived yet. Wait a minute. I think I hear someone in there. I'm sorry, but we're not open for business. The shop is closed. Oh, Mrs. Harding, I'm Mr. Valentine, and these are my assistants. Oh, of course. I've been expecting you. Come in. Suffering cats. Look at the place. Books scattered all over. Yeah. Somebody been searching for something, Mrs. Harding? You can see why I called you. Someone broke in here last night. Did you phone the police? No, uh... No, I didn't. No? Why not? Because I think it was an inside job. The windows were securely locked. They don't look as though they'd been tampered with. Someone unlocked the door and walked right in. I see. You suspect someone in your family. That's why you didn't phone the police. Mr. Valentine, I won't try to keep anything from you. I suspect my husband's nephew, Frank. Did he have keys to the shop? So far as I know, my husband and I had the only keys. But you must have some reason for suspecting Frank. Well, he's always been a wild boy. I never had any use for him. My husband was fond of him. He even had Frank helping here in the shop. Uh, Mrs. Harding, just what was this person looking for, do you know? Money. Money? I'm not sure, of course, but I think my husband had some money hidden away here. Uh Uh-huh. You may have heard my husband was... Well, he was odd. It would be like him to hide the money in his shop. Then he mentioned some money to you? He always said that we'd be well taken care of in our old age. And yet he died penniless. I see. And uh, just what do you want me to do? If there's any money here, I want you to find it. I'll pay you, of course. Oh, of course. But the shop's already been searched. Maybe the money's been found. I don't think so. You see, I frightened the person away. Oh, then you saw someone. I just caught a glimpse of someone running away. It was dark, but... 
I think it was a man. Mm Mm-hmm. Why did you come down here last night, Mrs. Harding? I, uh... I wanted to look around myself. Oh, yes, yes, of course. All right, Mrs. Harding, I'll keep in touch with you. Come on, kids. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Let's go, kids. What do you make of it, Mr. Valentine? Say, quite a girl, isn't she? Her husband dies, and that same night, she's down at his shop looking for any money he may have hidden. Well, why don't we stay here and search the shop? Because someone beat us to it, Sonny. Besides, I want to know a little more about this case. And a little more about Harding's death, too. Mr. Valentine, do you mean... Do you think he was murdered? Uh, I'm just guessing. Come on, let's go to the car. Hey, wait a minute. I want a word with you. Jeepers, I wonder who that is. Must be the nephew. I just want to warn you not to believe half of what my aunt tells you. She's she's not herself. She's hysterical. Oh. Well, I don't agree with you, Frank. Your aunt seems unusually calm, considering. Calm? She called you in, didn't she? If she knew what she was doing, why would she call in a private investigator? How did you know I'd been called in? Well, you were, weren't you? Suppose she told you there's some money hidden away. That's a lot of baloney. Is it? You're just wasting your time. They said some money disappeared after my father died, too, but we never found any. There's always that kind of talk when someone eccentric dies. Just when did your father die? Five years ago. Uh-huh. Frank, were you with your uncle when he passed away? No. It was during the day. I was in the shop with my aunt. Miss Barry phoned us. Miss Barry? Alice Barry, the nurse. My uncle's known her since she was a child. Of course, she's a young woman now. Very attractive, too. Okay, Frank. See you again sometime. No, you won't. I'm going to tell Aunt Harriet to call you off. Yeah, do that. Do you think she'll listen to him, Mr. Valentine? No, she doesn't trust him. Claire, I want you to get all the information you can on Harding's death, then meet me here. Here? Yeah, in front of the bookshop about 10 o'clock tonight in Sunny. Yes, sir. Get down to the Evening Express. Talk to Ben Steele. He's a friend of mine. He'll let you look through the old newspaper files. But what am I going to be looking for? Well, Frank's father died five years ago. Get what you can on it. Okay, Mr. Valentine. Hey, what are you going to be doing? Oh, he's going to talk to the nurse, of course. Why, Claire, how did you guess? Oh, she's young and attractive. Naturally, you'd want to investigate that yourself, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Harding had been ill for years. There was nothing mysterious about his death. But don't take my word for it. Talk to Dr. Mark. Oh, I'd rather talk to you, Miss Perry. And I know Mr. Harding didn't leave any money. You're wrong about that, too. If you don't mind my saying so. Miss Berry, when a woman is beautiful, she can toss my theories into the ash can, and I don't open my mouth. I'll find that out after I get to know you better. Oh? You're going to know me better? Of course. What makes you think Harding didn't leave any money? Because he couldn't even afford to pay me a salary. He gave me this box of old phonograph records instead. I see. Uh, Miss Berry. Alice. Alice? Alice. Alice, uh, did Harding die in his sleep? Oh, yes. Then he didn't say anything before he died? Mm, Well, he mumbled something. Mumbled something? What, could you tell? I suppose he thought he was a little boy again, listening to Mother Goose. Why? What did he say? Mary had a lamb. Mary had a lamb? Are you sure? Well, the words Mary and lamb were plain enough. Uh Uh-huh. Look, here's my card. If you think of anything else, give me a buzz, will you? I'll give you a buzz. Oh, good. Say, uh, how does that verse go? Do you remember? Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Oh, yeah, yeah. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. You're late. I was detained. By the nurse? Now, never mind. What are we going to do, Mr. Valentine? Well, we're going to get inside this bookshop. Hey, Mr. Valentine, where did you get those keys? They've opened lots of doors. They never fail. I'll try to find the light switch. Now, don't bother. I'll use my flashlight. Sonny. Yeah, Mr. Valentine? Stand near the window, will you? Let me know if you see anyone. Okay. Mr. Valentine, the books are all back in place. Well, Mrs. Harding must be a neat housekeeper. Come on, Claire. Now, we're looking for the section that has books for children. Then the nurse did give you a clue. Was she helpful? Oh, yes. And beautiful. Really? Tell me about her. Well, I haven't time. Couldn't do it justice. Here we are now. Uh, let's see. Peter Rabbit, Alice in Wonderland. Hey, look for Mother Goose. Is she a blonde? Yes. Treasure Island. A natural blonde? Oh, Claire, will you concentrate on Mother Goose? Oh. Is this what you're looking for? Yeah, good, good. Now find Mary had a little lamb. Why? Oh, Claire. Oh, all right. Little Jack Horner, little Miss Muffet. Mary had a... Oh, here it is. Good, good. Now read it. Mary had a little lamb, 
Its fleece was white as snow. Uh-huh. And everywhere that Mary went, Lamb was sure to go. Do you want all the verses? Well, isn't there anything written on that page? No. Well, maybe there's some more Mother Goose books. These are all there seem to be. Okay, hang on to it. Put your hands up. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Supper and cat. Now, what are you doing here, Frank? Where did you come from? I was in back. I've been waiting for someone to show up. Why? What made you think someone would show up? Well, the place was ransacked last night. And you thought it might happen again tonight, huh? You can't tell. And Harriet says she frightened the person away. He might come back. Uh-huh. That may be why you're here. Or then again, you might be looking for the money yourself. I told you there isn't any money. Okay, Frank. Now put that gun away. You might hurt somebody. And get out of here, all of you. All right, we're going. Coming with us? I'm going to stay here and keep an eye on things. Say, that's a very good idea, Frank. Just keep an eye on things. <laughs> Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. I could oh, Mr. Valentine, it's a little late to be reading Mother Goose. Well, look, here's what we've got so far, kids. Harding's brother, who's supposed to have money, dies, but he doesn't leave anything. On the other hand, Harding, who's supposed to be poor, tells his wife they'll be provided for in their old age. Oh, I see. You think he had his brother's money. And he hid it in his bookshop. That's what Mrs. Harding thinks. And so does Frank. Well, go on. Well, this Mother Goose rhyme should lead us to the money. Why? Because Harding tried to tell Alice about it before he died. Alice? The nurse. Oh, first name. Oh, definitely. Hey, who'd be phoning at this hour? Hey, get it, will you, Claire? Hello? Is Mr. Valentine there? Yes, who's calling? Alice Barry. Oh, just a minute. Your nurse. And she's not a natural blonde. I can tell by her voice. Oh. <laughs> Have it your way. Hello, Alice. Mr. Valentine, maybe I can help you after all. Yeah, what's up? Would well, you remember that Mr. Harding left me a box of records? Yes. Well, I was looking through the box of phonograph records when suddenly I... Oh! Hello. Hello, Alice. Mr. Valentine, what's the matter? Something's happened to her. I've got to get over there quick. Well, it'll take George a few minutes to get to Alice's apartment. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about a conversation I had recently... One of my Chevron dealer friends asked me the other day what qualities I look for in a gas station. So I said that first of all, I looked for Chevron Supreme gasoline and RPM compounded motor oil. Well, that's easy, he said. Just keep your eye peeled for a cream green and burgundy station. That's your cue for Chevron. Then I told him that I'm a credit card user. Don't blame you, says he, and don't forget that Chevron credit cards are as good as gold at our stations. So then I told him my favorite gas station must be a friendly place where I can depend on getting good service for my car. The dealer laughed and said, sure sounds like a Chevron gas station to me. We all had plenty of experience before branching out on our own. Now that we're in business for ourselves, we know how to keep our customers happy by keeping their cars in good shape. I had to agree with my friend. Chevron gas stations offer just about everything a motorist wants. Try them yourself and see. Well, George was about to get some important information. The nurse, Alice Barry, phoned him, but before she could explain, something happened to her. Now it's a few minutes later, George is opening the door to her apartment. Alice! Alice! Oh, you poor kid. Oh. Here. Let's get you up on that couch. Oh. Now, take it easy. You're going to be all right. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Wait a minute. I'm going to put you down here. There you are. Now, you better lie still for a few minutes. I'll get you a drink of water. No, no, please don't leave me. Don't be frightened. Hey, you've got a nasty-looking bruise on your forehead. Otherwise, you seem to be okay. How do you feel? Oh, like I've got two heads. Yeah, I'll bet. Want to tell me what happened? Well, there isn't anything to tell. I was talking to you on the phone, and, and then it happened. Somebody took a sock at me. Well, who was it? Don't you know? No. He must have crept up and hit me from behind. From behind? Yes. Oh, you didn't see him at all, huh? No, for all I know, it might have been a woman. Yeah, it might very well have been a woman. What about the records? Oh, I guess they're gone. They were on that table over there. That's bad luck. Oh, don't worry about them. It was just an old bunch of records. Believe me, if all those endearing young charms, who is Sylvia, and a few more like that. But I thought you discovered something about them. I guess the person who stole them thought so, too. No, Mr. Valentine, that's not why I phoned you. Feel like telling me about it? Of course. You see, while I was looking through the record, I got to thinking about Mr. Harding and, and what he'd said just before he died. Yes? I could almost see the whole thing all over again. 
He was moaning and, and tossing around in the bed. I ran to him and felt his pulse. Go on. I told you that he said Mary had a lamb. But now as I think back, Mr. Valentine, I'm almost certain he said, Mary Hayden Lamb. Mary Hayden Lamb. Mary Hayden Lamb? A woman's name? That's right. Do you think it means anything? Well, it must mean something. Yeah. It'll probably lead us right to the money. That is, if there is any money. Um, now, look, i got to beat it. But I want you to lock the door behind me, understand? Don't worry. After this, I'll always lock my door. Good. Better put some ice in that forehead. It's turning a beautiful purple. I'll be all right. Uh, Mr. Valentine. Yeah? If it does mean anything, will you let me in on it? <laughs> I feel as though I have a stake in this now. Oh, I don't blame you. Okay, Alice. I'll keep in touch with you. Hey, open up. Hey, Mr. Ward. Mr. Ward, hey, open up. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. You out of your mind? What are you doing here at this hour? I want to buy a book. Well, go away, go away. We're closed. Come back in the morning. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't close the door, Mr. Ward. i got to have something to read tonight. Do you realize it's after 11? I know. I'm terribly sorry, but let me in, will you? Oh, all right. Come in. Other people have sane customers, but I suppose it's got to be a mystery with at least six murders <laughs> in it. <laughs> Mr. Ward, did you ever hear of a book called Mary Hayden Lamb? Never, no. Are you sure? I came here because you have a reputation for knowing every book that's ever been published. There's never been a book published by that name. Now, however, if you were to ask if there were ever a novelist by that name, I'd, I'd give you a different answer. A novelist? Hey, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Well, tell me about it, will you? Well, she was a local writer, and to my knowledge, she wrote but one book, thank heaven. Why do you say that? Because it's by far the worst trash it's ever been my bad luck to read. I see. What's it called? I Love Love. It's about a girl and an island and a man. And if you want something to put you to sleep, I'll personally guarantee you your money back. <laughs> then you've got a copy, huh? One. Almost sold it this afternoon. Almost sold it? Is that so? Someone wanted it, huh? Well, ask me about it anyway. But evidently I had the good taste to turn it down. I found it on the counter when I was putting my books away. Well, who asked to see the book, Mr. Ward? Do you remember? Certainly not. I do a big business, young man, and I can't keep track of every customer who walks into my shop. Unless they make a special impression by getting me out of bed at this unearthly hour. Okay. Anyway, you've made a sale. I'll take Isle of Love. No, you've made a bad choice. Yeah, here you are. Mark down 89 cents. And young man, believe me, I'm cheating you. Hey, Claire. Sonny. Come on, wake up. Oh, hello, Mr. Valentine. May we go home now, slave driver? Oh, I'm sorry, kids. I know it's late, but we can't stop now. Don't dare take the chance. Somebody may be getting desperate. What do you mean? What do you expect to happen? Well, nothing, if I can beat him to it. Now, Claire, I've got a job for you. How are you in the charm department? Charm? Yeah, that's right. Have you got any? Don't answer that. Whom do I have to charm? Frank. The nephew? I quit. Hey, I knew he was suspicious. As soon as I saw him, I said to myself, now there's Shut up, will you, Sonny? Claire, I want you to get Frank out of the bookshop tonight. So that you can get in there without his seeing. That's the idea. Think you can do it? Oh, it should be simple, even if my hair isn't blonde. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Valentine. I'll take care of Frank. Who is it? Oh, put that gun down, Frank. It's Claire. Oh. You're Mr. Valentine's assistant, aren't you? What do you want? Well, Mr. Valentine's just down the street at your aunt's house. What do you want? Well, I was with them, but then they wanted to talk alone, so... Well, they sort of left me stranded. Don't I look stranded? Yeah. Well, your aunt was giving Mr. Valentine an earful. She's not very fond of you, is she? You can't forget that I was once a wild kid. I... I have straightened out since then. Oh, I can see that. What do you want? I want to come in. Use the phone to call a cab. Why didn't you stop at a drugstore? Oh, well, all right, if that's the way you feel about it. Good night. Wait a minute. Hmm? Pretty late for you to be wandering around. Oh, I knew you had fine instincts, Frank. Oh, all right, come on, I'll take you in my car. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, Sonny, come on. The coast clear? Yeah, they just drove away in Frank's car. Now, don't turn on the light. Excuse me for asking, Mr. Valentine, but just what are we looking for? We are looking for a book. More Mother Goose? No, The Isle of Love. There ought to be a copy just like this one somewhere in here. But why do you want two copies? Don't you understand, Sonny? I've got to have Mr. Harding's copy of this book. Oh, no, I don't understand. <laughs> Never mind, just start looking. Yeah, but Mr. Valentine, there's at least a thousand books in the shop. Let's see now. Mary Hayden Lamb was a local writer. Now, why would Harding choose her book unless... Hey, wait a minute, I think I got it, Sonny. He must have known her. Well, what of it? That means it would be Harding's personal book, see? Oh, no, I don't see. <laughs> come on, there's a little room in the back of the store. Remember? That's where Frank was hiding the last time we were here. Yeah, that's right. Well, come on. It's dark. Careful now. Here we are. I'll look around with my flashlight. Now, let's see. Hey, there's a desk, Mr. Valentine. Are there any books on it? Sure. Read the titles. Webster's Dictionary. The Complete Shakespeare. Cooking for Fun. And the Isle... The Isle of Love. That's it. Grab it, Sonny, and let's get out of here. Okay, Mr. Valentine. We'll take it back to the office. Hey, aren't we ever going to get to sleep tonight? We haven't time. Now, let's get to the car. Sonny! Duck! Jeepers, what was that? Somebody took a shot at it. Mr. Valentine... It's all right, Sonny, you missed. Yeah, but let's get out of here quick. I don't think that person likes us. <laughs> And then somebody started shooting at us. Oh, it was plenty exciting, sis. You're lucky. Frank's a bore. His conversation is brilliant. It's either yeah or yeah. <laughs> I guess it was Mrs. Harding shooting at us, huh, Mr. Valentine? Because Frank was with Claire. Not for long. No? No, he just took me to a cab stand. I see. Run out of charm? Oh. Gee, because Mr. Valentine, you've just about taken that book apart. Well, there's nothing in here. No secret compartment, no writing on the pages. I can't find a thing. Well, then let's go home and get some sleep. No, we can't stop now. Okay, kids, make yourselves comfortable. What are you going to do? Well, I'll have to start reading the book. Aloud? Certainly, I might miss something. You're going to read all of it? That's right. Here we go. The summer sun was setting in a blaze of glory, casting its light like a shimmering ribbon of golden orange across the lake. On the bank, her wavy hair streaming from her uplifted head stood Jennifer. Oh, I can tell this is going to be a classic. Perhaps her dream of love was to become a reality, for coming toward her was a canoe, and in the canoe was a man. Mr. Valentine, do you think Sonny's old enough? Oh, keep quiet, will you? <laughs> Jennifer sighed longingly. <sighs> Sonny. Perhaps her stay on the island was at an end. Her face was alive with expectancy. Weeks had gone by. Jennifer knew that this was her man. What choice did she have on a desert island? In spite of his aloofness, in spite of his air of mystery, Jennifer knew that she loved him. And then a wonderful thing happened. He knelt beside her and kissed her. Well, it's about time. <laughs> oh, she said, then you do love me. Naive creature, isn't she? Yes, he answered. I love you with all my heart. If you don't believe me, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. And I love you too, she told Wait him. Wait a minute. What was that again? And I love you, too, she told him. No, no, no. Go back to where he loves her. Oh, yes, he answered. I love you with all my heart. If you don't believe me, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. Hey, that doesn't make sense. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The printing on this page looks a little different. Yeah, so does the paper. Claire, get my copy of the book. Here it is. Okay, turn to page 82. Come on, come on. Okay, now read that part. Yes, he answered. I love you with all my heart. I swear it, Jennifer. That's enough. This is it, kids. Mr. Harding printed this page himself. Look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. Mr. Valentine, there's a grandfather's clock in the bookshop. That's right, Sonny. And there's where that money must be hidden. Claire, get Mrs. Harding on the phone. Tell her to meet us at the bookshop right away. At this hour? And then phone Frank at the shop. Tell him to expect us. All right. Oh, and Claire, phone Miss Berry, will you? She wanted to be in on the kill. Oh, now you've got me phoning your blonde for you. Well, whatever you say, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> Oh, 
What are you waiting for, Mr. Valentine? Why don't you give me my money? You mean my money, Aunt Harriet. Now, don't fight over the money. We don't even know if there is any. Then why did you call us here? And why bring Alice uh, into this? Well, if there is any money, you'll have to thank Alice. She gave me the clue. Then it really was a clue, Mr. Valentine. That's right, Alice. It led me to a book. And in the book, I found some words that Mr. Harding printed. It said, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. The grandfather's clock? I'm going to see about that. Take it easy, Frank. Now, Frank, that's not your property. Get away from that clock. There's nothing in here. The clue didn't say there was something in the clock. It said, look carefully when the grandfather's clock strikes the hour of midnight. Well, it's striking 12 now. Well, what's different about the clock when it strikes 12 than at any other time? When it strikes 12, both hands point up. <laughs> Smart girl, Claire. Sonny, hand me that chair. Okay. You think there's something on top of the clock? No. Above it. On the wall here. Yeah, you see? There's a false panel. Need any help? Oh, thanks, Frank. I think I could do it with the heel of my hand. Well, that does it. What is it? Is there something in there? Yes. A package. What's in it? Just a minute, I'll see. Well, well, well. Bill. Large denominations. And lots of them. Let me have that. Now, don't rush me. Hey, there's a note here, too. What does it say? This is Harding. Is this your husband's handwriting? No. No, it isn't. That's my father's handwriting. You see, the money is mine. Not so fast, Frank. Well, what does the note say? It says, Dear Brother Bill, I'm leaving this money in your care. Frank is too wild to be trusted with it. When he settles down, you can give it to him. Then give it to him. Wait a minute, there's more. There's a condition I attach to this. Frank must provide for you and your wife as long as either of you shall live. Is that all? That's it, Mrs. Harding. Then it is Frank's money. Give it to him. He doesn't have to provide for me. No, this money is for both of us, Aunt Harriet. Well, that's more than I deserve, Frank. You can stop talking right now and hand that money over. Alice! Give it to me, Mr. Valentine, and hurry up about it. I never argue with a beautiful woman, especially when she has a gun in her hand. Mr. Valentine, was she the one who was after the money all along? That's right. When she phoned me and got bumped on the head, I thought it was funny I didn't hear the blow over the telephone. And if she was hit from behind, why was the bruise on the forehead? Never mind the explanation. Hand that over. Then she's the one who shot at us. Certainly. She couldn't get in here to look for the book because Frank was guarding the place. First, she tried to put me off the track with that Mother Goose stuff. But she finally gave me the right clue. She figured if she told me the truth, I'd get the money and she'd tail me and pick it up. That's enough out of you, Mr. Valentine. Give me the money. Oh, certainly. Here you are, Miss Berry. But, Mr. Valentine... Don't try to stop her, Frank. It's dangerous. You're right. It is dangerous. Stay just where you are. Don't any of you make a move. But, Mr. Valentine... Careful. But you're letting her get away. Not very far. The police are out there. Let's go! Let's go! It's okay, Mr. Valentine. They got it. Your money will be returned to you, Frank. Thanks, Mr. Valentine. I I owe you a lot. That's right. But you'll get a bill in the morning. <laughs> Come on, kids. Good night, Mr. Valentine. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm really going to sleep tonight. Yeah, so am I. Oh, too bad. Too bad it had to end this way. Huh? What do you mean? He's thinking about the nurse. Aren't you, Mr. Valentine? You know, Claire, I believe she was a natural blonde after all. George will be back in a moment. Meanwhile, it doesn't matter whether you sit in an office or ride a tractor. Life these days seems to be getting more complicated for everybody. Any convenience that makes living a little simpler is always as welcome as spring. Your Chevron dealer knows this, as any friendly businessman should. So he tries to make you his friend by making his cream green and burgundy station as convenient and efficient as he can. He'll make it a point to know your car and the grade of RPM compounded motor oil you use. He'll urge you to use a Chevron credit card because he wants to save you time. He handles Chevron Supreme gasoline because he knows it'll give you good going wherever you drive. He takes the trouble to know the country nearby so that he can give you good travel tips. When you get right down to it, at Chevron gas stations, you get the same sort of convenient service you expect from any other wide-awake home-owned business. Get acquainted with the one near you. You'll like it. Well, next week, George Valentine is confronted with a problem, a big problem. You'll probably hear something like this. Client or no client, Mr. Valentine, you can't keep a dog that big in this apartment. Cheapers, do you realize he eats six pounds of food a day? Six pounds? What kind of food? Well, I'm not sure, but he seemed awfully fond of my head. <laughs> okay, Sonny. Go out and buy him a bone. Shh. 
Chevron gas stations all through the West invite you to be with us again next week for another chapter of Let George Do It, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It, starring Robert Bailey as George, with Francis Robinson as Claire and Eddie Firestone Jr. as Sonny, is written by Pauline Hopkins, produced and directed by Owen Vincent. Others in the cast were Jane Morgan as Mrs. Harding, Harry Bartell as Frank Harding, Evelyn Scott as Alice Barry, and Paul McVeigh as Mr. Ward. The music was composed and conducted by Charles Dant. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Come in. You're a Steve Granger. Yes, I am. I'm Marsha Kendall. I want you to do something for me. Sure, sure, but you'd better sit down, Mrs. Kendall. Oh, I'm tired. I feel dazed. Things go around. Here, sit right here. Thank you. Well, then, what's this all about? It's about the letters. I have your confidence, do I not? Of course you do. I minded the letters, but they weren't quite as bad as the telephone calls at six in the morning. You've been receiving threatening calls and letters, is that it? What do they say? Always the same things. The letters, the voice on the telephone. I recognize his voice, his handwriting. Do you know this man? He's blackmailing you. Certainly I know him. He's my husband. You mean your own husband is sending you threatening notes? Yes, he is. Well, that certainly should be easy to stop. I don't think so, Mr. Granger. Why not? Because my husband died three months ago. This is Steve Granger, private detective, with a story about a woman, a series of threatening notes and telephone calls, along with a very clever scheme to commit murder. In just a moment, I'll take you back to one of my most interesting cases. This is Granger. It came as quite a shock when the woman, who was my client, announced she was getting notes and telephone calls from a dead husband. But it seemed like it was more of a shock to her than to me, because as soon as she'd got that much out, she keeled over in a dead faint. And just to make matters worse, that was the moment my newspaper pal, Cal Hendricks, picked a fair call. Whoa, 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 what's this? The Steve Granger method for captivating beautiful women? Oh, what you do, Stevie boy? Knock them cold to make sure they fall oh, for you? Oh, look, go peddle your wise cracks to television. She fainted. Yeah, one good look at your homely puss, no doubt. You'd faint, too, if your dead husband had been writing you letters and calling you on the phone. Her dead husband? Well, that's a little oh, twist. Oh. And she's coming out of it. Oh. What happened? You just fainted. Here, let me help you up. Oh, thank you. Well, this is a friend of mine, Cal Hendricks, uh, Mrs. Marsha Kendall. How do you do, Mrs. Kendall? Uh, maybe you better go home and have a rest. Would you like me to call your doctor? No. No, I must settle this thing. Now, Mr. Granger, do you remember a man named Clark Kendall? The name sounds vaguely familiar. Sure, Stevie, I remember the story. He was drowned. Yes, Mr. Hendricks. And I'm his widow. Of course. He fell overboard off his boat. You tried to help him. The police had you in custody for several days. That is correct, Mr. Granger. They finally agreed that it was an accident and let you go. And now your dead husband is writing you and telephoning you. What's this all about? I married Claude two years ago. We were very happy in spite of certain obstacles. What do you mean by obstacles? Well, some of Clark's relatives didn't like me at all. Clark and I love boating. We spent most of our time aboard the sea car, our 50-foot sailboat. Just how did your husband die, Mrs. Kendall? It was about three months ago. We were below in the cabin. The storm was coming up, and the sea fire was straining at him worse. Tell you, it's 
quite a blow coming up. I think I'll go topside and check the line. Oh, but Clark, you've been on deck twice. Surely you must have taken care of everything. Well, I just want to make sure of that's all. You act like you're afraid of a little wind, darling. Well, I am. <laughs> I am. Uh-oh. I wonder what that was. Something bumped the hull. Well, I do hope another boat hasn't flipped its moorings. You want me to go along? Well, I'll call if I need you. I'll be right back. Come up, be careful. Don't worry. I'd better close that hatch. It's beginning to rain. Clark, are you all right? Clark! Clark, where are you? Oh, did that boat come loose? Clark, what are you doing in that boat? me. Clark, Clark, where are you? Ah, in the water. Help. The life preserver. Clark, here. Catch. saw Clark again, Mr. Granger. I got in touch with the Coast Guard on the boat's radio. They came out and searched the entire area, but it was too late. But his body was found, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. A week later. You identified him? Yes. Look, Mrs. Candle, don't you think you'd better go home and get some rest? You're obviously unwell. Why go home? I can't sleep. I've got to find out about those letters and telephone calls, and I need Mr. Granger's help. Very well, Mrs. Candle. I'd like to have a look at those letters. You have them with you? No, they're at the apartment. I'll pick them up later. And I'd like to have a look at your boat, if you still own it. I do. You can pick up the keys at the yacht club office. I'll, I'll telephone now, Which club is it? The Island Yacht Club. Oh, yes, on City Island. I'll go out there today. Uh, here's my card. When shall I hear from you? Probably later in the day, Mrs. Kendall. Oh, thank you. And you, Mr. Hendricks. Oh, I didn't do anything. Goodbye. Well, Steve, you got yourself quite a deal, haven't you? Yeah. I wonder. You wonder what? How much Mrs. Kendall didn't tell us. An interesting conjecture, Stevie. You know, I think I'll go out to that anchorage with you. I'll continue with this interesting story in a minute. and I got into his car and we drove out to the city island of the island yacht club. We got the keys to the yacht seafarer and stood for a moment waiting for a tender to take us out to the boat. I always love the water, Steve. Ought to buy myself a little sailboat. Yeah, it's an interesting sight. Everybody working on the craft, painting, sanding, varnishing. Oh, here comes the tender. You, uh, gentlemen, uh, want something? Yeah, old timer. You take us out of the seafarer? Hey, I reckon I can. Ain't nobody aboard, though. Uh, you got a key? Right here. Okay, I'll have you out there in two shakes of lamb steel. Hey, hey, sit down in the stern here, mister. <clears throat> Boat rides easy. Right you are. It's uh, kind of surprising uh, you want to go aboard the seafarer. Eh? Oh, why? I talk around the yacht club each day. Uh, she might be haunted. Cal and I looked at each other, and the balance of the ride was made in silence until we neared the slim, sleek-looking yacht. My curiosity got the better of me. Say, Pop. Yeah? You said there was talk about the seafarer being haunted. Where'd you get that reputation? Yes, yeah, them who say uh, Mrs. Candle just could have pushed the skipper overboard uh, during that storm. And maybe hit him over the head with a boat hook while he was struggling in the water. Could be. I thought the Candles got along pretty well. There's yeah, them who said they didn't. Like who? I'm not saying, Mr. I'm just the man who runs the tender at this yacht club. 
This is the seafarer, mister. Uh, grab a hold of that wheel there. Hold us fast while right. spend time to board. Okay. I got it. Go ahead, Cal. Uh, all right. Now then, uh, you hang on to this boat. Right. Say, how do I get you back here, Pop? Yeah, they got a kind of electric horn on the seafarer's deck. Uh, when you want to be picked up, just sound it. I'll come out and pick you up. Thanks, Pop. Uh, how long you intend to stay aboard? Oh, not too long. Well, you just sound that horn. Nice old character, isn't he, Steve? I'm thinking about that haunted stuff. Somebody's been shooting off their mouths around here. Uh-huh. Now, let's go below and look around. Mmm. <clears throat> pretty musty down below. Coming along, Cal? Yes, yeah, certainly. Wow. Nicely arranged little craft. Say, look at the navigation aid. Ship to shore radio telephone. Everything a man would want. Steve. What? That bunk over there. Hmm. Somebody's been aboard this boat. Very recently, too. Cal and I got curious, and we went over the seafarer from stem to stern. The burner on the galley stove was warm, so was the coffee pot. There was pipe tobacco on the ashtray, but that was all. Uh, well, Steve? Yeah, that's that. There's nobody aboard. Unless they're cleaning the bottom of the hull. Hey, go up in there, Cal. Find that boat horn gadget. Give it a quick blast when we get back to shore. All right. You find it? How's that? Good. What are we doing down below, Steve? I just opened a couple of portholes of ventilation. Whoever was here last had them all closed. Down, quick! Callie, you were right. Cal! I crawled over to Cal Hendricks, looking around to try and discover the source of the mysterious shot. I saw no one. The newsman lay on his side, curled up like an unnatural kitten. There was no wound, but there was a bullet hole through the brim of his hat. Cal! Eh? Cal, come out of it! Oh. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, Steve. I didn't mean to pass out. Somebody punctured my hat with a bullet. I do the same act. You okay otherwise? Yeah, yeah. Hey, here comes Pop. I wonder if he heard the shot. Did you notice where it came from? No, sound traveled in circles when you're on the water. Imagine it came from the shore, due west. Hey, look. The man running the tender boat. That isn't Pop. So I noticed. Oh, probably a relief man. Yeah, maybe. You fellas want to go ashore? Yeah. Climb aboard, then. Right. You first, Cal. There. I'll hang on while you get in, Steve. Right. <clears throat> right, all set, fellas. Okay. Here we go. Do mind if I ask you a question? Go right ahead. Where's the old timer who brought us out here? You mean Pop. He gave me this five dollars to come out here and get you. He said it was worth it not to come back out here. I asked the new boatman if he'd heard any shooting, which brought a negative shake of the head. At the dock, we asked for Pop, but no one seemed to know where he'd gone. From there, we automobiled it back to Manhattan. Cal had to finish off the story, and I headed back for my office. When I reached the door, I stopped. Through the frosted pane of glass, I could dimly make out a figure, bent over, as though it could be going through my desk. I got out my gun. <laughs> Mr. Granger. Why the gun? I thought you were going home to rest, Mrs. Kendall. I tried. I became terrified. I, I thought the phone would ring. I, I couldn't stand it anymore. So you came down to my office. You make yourself at home. After all, the door was unlocked. Uh-huh. What's wrong, Mr. Granger? Why are you looking like that? Have you found out something? Yes, Mrs. Kendall. How long has it been since you've been aboard the seafarer? Not since the police made their investigation. Why do you ask? Do you permit anybody aboard your boat? Well, of course not. Why should I? Cal Hendricks and I went out to the island club. We were aboard the seafarer. We found a warm stove plus a warm coffee pot. Also, some tobacco in one of the ashtrays. You got anything to say? No, I know nothing of this. Who would go aboard the seafarer without permission? How about some of the in-laws? Oh, I, I don't think they'd trust us. Who are they? They're Clark's sister, Anne, his brother, Paul. You live in New York? 
Last I heard, Anne was in Canada. Paul's in Mexico, Vera Cruz. Just loafing, is that it? Paul runs a commercial fishing fleet. It's called the Candle Company. Hmm. Mrs. Kendall, why don't you go back home? I can't, Mr. Granger. I'm frightened. I keep hearing Clark's voice on the telephone. Gotta get some rest. I'll telephone a hotel nearby and get your room. But, Mr. Granger... By the way, Mrs. Kendall, there's an old boatman down at the Island Yacht Club. They call him Pop. What about him? What reason would he have for saying that the seafarer was haunted? What do you know about that? Nothing, Mr. Granger. Absolutely nothing. She stood there, straight and dignified, and her voice never gave a quiver. But I noticed the look of dismay in her eyes when I mentioned Pop. A look which went as quickly as it came. In just a moment, I'll bring you the climax of the case. I conducted Marsha Kendall to a nearby hotel and fixed her room. If the letters and telephone calls from a dead husband were bothering her so much, I figured she ought to be safe from them for a while. But the look in her eyes at the reference to Pop, who had taken Cal and me out to the Kendall's yacht, sent me in search of the old boatman. I was told he might be found in a bistro called the Cross Anchors. This was quite a hangout that evidently was not frequented by the upper classes. It had an odor which reminded me of bilge water, which wasn't bad when he got used to it. The old-timer was seated at a back table. There was another man with him. A sailor, complete with dungarees and a beard. When he left, I moved over. Hiya, Pop. What do you want? You took me out of the sea pair a couple of hours back. I might want you to do it again. Now. Get my relief man. The relief man doesn't know anything about a shot that was fired at us. Would you? I got nothing more to say about the seafarer, and I don't know nothing about no shooting. Even over a drink? Even over the whole Atlantic Ocean. Clark Kendall was drowned off the seafarer, old timer. I'd like to ask some questions. There are those who say that Mrs. Kendall can answer a lot of questions if, if she wants to. Ask her. Ask her what? Like, uh, did she hit Kendall over the head with a boat hook instead of fishing him out of the water? You said they didn't get along. There are those who say she married him for his money. Who is those who say, Pop? I could mention your remarks to the police. Then what? Your placement? No. Nope. You talk not. Hey, Charlie, come here a minute. So, you are having a drink on me. Yeah. I'm having one on you right now. What's yours, Pop? This fella here. He's been sort of threatening me. He says he might tell the police I was talking about the sea fair. Uh, get up, mister. Why? Never mind why. Get up and get out. Okay. I'll go along with you and make sure. You don't have to guide me, bartender. I can find my way to the door. Yeah, I know you can. Well, I don't find your way back in here again. I might have argued with that bartender, but he was out of my weight class. He tipped the scales at about 210. I went back to my office and put in a long-distance call. As I waited for the connection, I made a quick call to Cal Hendricks. Hendricks speaking. Cal, this is Granger. Oh, yes, yeah, Stevie. What's new with the haunted lady and the haunted boat? I want you to do me a favor, Cal. Clark Kendall was buried in Long Tier Cemetery. Check for me. See if he was actually interred, will you? Oh, you think he was never buried? Just check. I'll take it from there. And when you've done it, come around here and pick me up. I hung up and waited for a reply to my long-distance effort. When it came through, I knew a lot more, but still not enough. I sat thinking till Cal Hendricks showed up, and then we beat it around the corner to the hotel where Marsha Kendall was registered. Took me a little longer than I figured, Steve. What'd you find out, Cal? Facts. Coroner's jury listed Clark Kendall's death as accidental. Marsha Kendall was exonerated of any suspicion. Yeah, I know that. He was in Lawn Tier Cemetery. Was he definitely uh, identified as Clark Kendall? When a corpse spends a little time on the water, they change appearance. His dentist identified him definitely. He'd had some special bridge work done. Hmm. Well, that really fixes me. Ah, oh, now don't tell me you believe that Clark Kendall is still alive. Right now, I'm believing nothing. Now, here's a room. 504. I only hope she hasn't taken a powder. 
Mr. Granger, I've been so frightened. Come in, please. Thanks, Mrs. Kendall. I don't know what you're scared of. Nobody knows you're staying at this hotel outside of Mr. Hendricks and me. Unless you told someone else. Why should I tell anyone else? I'm going to be very blunt with you, lady. Is it or is it not true that you could have pushed your husband overboard that night? And when he tried to climb back aboard a seafarer, you hit him over the head with a boat hook. How can you say such things? Why would I employ you to find out who's been making these telephone calls and writing these letters? That's why I'm here, Mrs. Kendall. I want to look at those letters you mentioned. Very well. I have them right here. Now, take it easy, Granger. She's in no condition to stand too much of this time. I'm in no condition to stand this kind of malarkey. Here, Mr. Granger. These are the letters I received. And any number of people will identify them as Clark's handwriting. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can uh, prove he actually wrote these? I can. Mrs. Kendall, it's impossible for a man buried in a cemetery to write letters. That's what is so fantastic, Mr. Granger. That's why I came to you. You've got to believe me. I did not kill my husband. Another thing, Mrs. Kendall. You said these letters were at your apartment. I picked them up when I went home, before I registered at the hotel. Uh Uh-huh. Mr. Granger, you're thinking horrible things. Go easy, Steve. Uh, Shall I answer it, Mrs. Kendall? I think she'd better do that, Cal. Hello? Marcia? <laughs> it's my husband. Call the receiver away from here so I can listen. I want you to meet me tonight. Aboard the seafarer at 10 o'clock. And if you're not there, I'll come after you. That was your husband? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Mm. Mr. Granger, what shall I do? Be aboard the seafarer at 10 o'clock like he told you, because Cal Hendricks and I will be there too. And we'll prove whether your husband is really dead or not. Cal Hendricks stayed with Marcia Kendall to make sure that she would be aboard the yacht Seafarer at 10 that night. With a few hours in my hands, I ran an errand, one which took me back out to the island yacht club and the old gent we knew as Pop. You back again? What do you want now? From you, I want nothing but the truth. I ain't talking to you. But you are, old timer, and right now. This was 10 o'clock. Marsha Kendall had come aboard the seafarer by herself. Cal Hendricks and I had rowed out from an inconspicuous spot. We were huddled in the forward cabin waiting for a dead husband to come alive. Granger, did you hear that? Yeah, small boat just tied up alongside. Ain't that our man? Yeah, it must be. Well, my dear, and how are you? Paul! Not Clark, but Paul. That's right, I'm Paul. But you're supposed to be down in Mexico fishing off the coast. It was you, you who sent those letters and made those calls. You copied Clark's handwriting, you imitated his voice. That is correct, my dear. I also trailed you to the hotel where you were hiding. But why? What have I ever done to you? What do you want? I wanted you on board this boat. We're going to sail out of this harbor. Together. Paul, you're insane. I don't think so. You were around the night Clark was drowned. You must have been hiding on deck. You pushed him over the side. Did I? And it was you I saw huddled in the small boat that night. I had dismissed it as imagination. Very true, dear sister-in-law. Why did you do it? I hated him. And you. I'm going to notify the police. On the ship to shore radio? It's disabled, darling. Let go of me! Oh, no. First, I was going to take you with me. I still am, but I don't think you'll complete the entire trip. Oh, you're hurting. I'm going in there and get that character. Okay. Help! Help! You're wasting your breath, my sweet. There's no one to help. That's where you're wrong, Kendall. What? The detective. Get away from her, Kendall. And give up my shield? Oh, no, Granger. You won't shoot so long as I hold her in front of me. Be careful, Mr. Granger. He's out of his mind. Oh, I am, am I? I'll show you. All of you. Mr. Granger, he's got a gun. <laughs> Well, friends, that's the story. I'll be back to wrap up the case in just a minute. Paul Kendall started backing towards the hatch, but exposed one shoulder just enough for me to puncture it. That made it easy for Cal and me to overpower him and deliver him to police headquarters. The whole story came out a few days later. I didn't know that Paul was up here. He was supposed to be down in Veracruz. Well, he had a run of bad luck. Came up here to try to get money from your husband. How'd you find out about that, Steve? I telephoned the offices of his company in Veracruz. They couldn't produce Paul Kendall on the phone. And I remember the man I'd seen at the cross tankers talking to Pop. It was Paul? Yeah. 
What was he doing with Pop? Now, Pop confessed that uh, he'd been around the night of the killing. He saw your brother-in-law push your husband off the boat. And didn't say anything? Paul Kendall promised him a job in Mexico, if he'd help him out. The results of Pop tried to scare Cal and me, too, by firing at us when we were aboard a seafarer. Your brother-in-law will probably go to an institution for the criminally insane. Insane? Oh, oh it's... Uh, Catch a couch. Uh, she's passed out again. I've got her. Good. Take care of her. Hey, where are you going? Home, old boy. This is one time where you're left holding the baby. Steve Granger again. You just heard one of the most interesting cases in my files. I'll have another one for you. So be around next time. The sensible thing to do on a hot summer night is to remain quietly at home with your shoes off, the radio on, and a pitcher of lemonade cooling quietly in the refrigerator. That's why we find the Norths out strolling on this particular night with, of course, their shoes on. What about them, darling? The world would be a happier place if more of them were off more feet more of the time. Shoemakers. What about them, Jerry? They'd starve to death. Their little children would roam hungrily about the streets. All right. The little children does it. Let's keep on walking. You hot? Uh Uh-huh. And it isn't the humidity. It's the heat. That ain't the way I heard it. Oh, Jerry. Hmm. Over there. No. All right. Now we'll never know. Never know what? Whether your voice is really as romantic as Charles Boyer. Huh. It's more romantic. Listen. Hedy. Hedy, meet me in the Casma. Hedy. <laughs> no. No, you can't, you can't compare them that way. Well, how could you? There's a studio across the street, a sound studio, you see? Mm, I begin to understand. Only uh, 75 cents to record your voice and take it home with you. I can take my voice home for nothing. We could both make a record, a love scene. It's too hot. Oh, yes. I meant to go into one of those sound booths. Boy, eh? What a voice. What magnetism. What charm. All right, all right. Let's go. Oh, darling. Uh-huh. We'll record our voices for posterity. And will they be sorry? Yeah. Oh, we want to record our voices, clerk. My friends call me happy. Why? Oh, why do they call you happy? Uh, no. Nah. Oh. Why do you want to record your voices? Uh, my wife thinks I sound better than Boyer. Oh, well, maybe to her. Women are funny like that, especially wives. Oh. Uh, why do they call you happy, happy? On account of I'm always bubbling with good cheer. Happy? Lead us to the slaughter. Who's getting killed? Happy, we want to record our voices, uh, remember? Oh, yeah. Uh, you're the couple who want to record, record their, their voices. voices. Uh, this way, please. In there. Thanks. Uh, what do you do, uh, throw a switch or something? A friend of mine once had a switch thrown on him. He was never the same afterwards. He wasn't? The guy who threw the switch was a fella up at Sing Sing. Oh, uh, Jerry, uh, Happy is just joking. <clears throat> uh, when do we start, Happy? Uh, when the bell rings. Uh, over there, see? But ain't you going to rehearse? I guess so. Huh? Uh, well, I, I don't know. Uh, we, we've never done this before, but uh, I suppose we'd better. Yeah. Uh, leave me know when you're ready. Oh, uh, by the way. Yeah? Uh, over there on the table, there's a book. All about love. Poems. Poems. About love. Uh, but, Ain't uh, you don't... two gonna make like you was in love for the record? As a matter of fact, we were, but how did you know? Mister, they always do. <laughs> the suckers. Go ahead, folks. <laughs> My 
love is like a red, a red rose. You know, Pam, as a matter of fact, you're not like a rose at all. Jerry, we're being recorded. Oh, okay. My love, you have a red, red... No, no, no that's not right. Uh, where were we? Uh... Yeah, my love is like a melody. Oh, that's sweetly played in tune. I never could carry a tune. Back in school, my music teacher used to ask me for a command performance in reverse. You know, to keep still, I used to mislead the other kids. Jerry North, at this moment, you're supposed to be making violent love to me. Oh, sure. Come here. In verse. Who can be violent in verse? <laughs> Jerry. All right, let's see. Um, how do I love thee? Boy, that was a snappy answer. With bells. I'm afraid, darling, that's all posterity is going to get. I'm afraid that's all posterity may want. Well, let's go out and collect our disc. All right. But um, somehow I've got a feeling that it isn't going to turn out to be one of the recording gems of all time. Because you heckle. I never heckle except on odd Tuesdays. Is today or not? Uh, oh, happy. Uh, uh, here it is, all wrapped up. Uh, for the record, uh, <laughs> the name and address, please. Mr. and Mrs. Gerald North, 24 St. Anne's Place. Collectors of rare recordings. Heard on appointment only. Uh, yeah. Uh, this I hate to do, but uh, Mr. Jerome wants I should get 75 cents from all the customers. Oh, your boss. Uh, he was. Uh, thanks. You don't care how you spend your money, huh? Well, you know the old saying, you can't take it with you. Yeah, in that case, don't go, Mr. North, don't go. Oh, I can hardly wait till we get home, darling. Oh, that's love. To hear our record. Oh, I can wait. Twenty years or so. Hey. I... Our driver. Yes? Maybe you ain't gonna get home. What do you mean? We ain't alone. Of course we're not. Pam's with us. I meant in the sense a car is following us. Ah, a record collector, perhaps. Although we heard of the new masterpiece rather quickly. Jerry, somebody is shooting at me. Don't be selfish at us. Not a record collector, maybe a collector of old automatics. A driver. I hired and they ain't mosquitoes. Well, can't you speed up a bit? I can, but this hack can't. I'll take a look. What? Oh. They got the back window. Pam, get down the floor. I will not. Then I'll never know what happened. If one of these bullets hit you. Oh, don't be so gruesome. Don't look now, folks, but I think... What? We're going to hit a lamppost. You're dead. I am not. Oh. Yeah, we did hit that lamppost. I call him, pal. Uh-huh. Has anybody been hurt? The post. Uh, don't look now, darling, but we're not alone. The crowd? They saved our lives. They have? Sure, because they made it impossible for whoever was chasing us to finish the job. What lovely people. Jerry. What now? Our voices. Oh, we've still got them. Oh, you mean the... Uh, oh, here it is. I is it broken? Let's see. Nope. Not a dent in the disc. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, let's go home, darling. Right. Uh, driver, do you think you can divorce the cab from the lamppost? Sure. Like you might say, it was only a marriage of convenience. Home. Dear old apartment 6B. Home is where the heart is. Where the... Jerry. Standing outside of our door. Oh, home is where happy is. Hello. 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 I'll get the door open. Sorry we kept you waiting, happy. What can we do for you? I observe you still got the record I give you. Yes. Our voice. Well, I'm awfully sorry, but it ain't your voice. It isn't? I... Uh... I, I made a mistake. I wrapped up the wrong record. That seems a strange thing to do. Yeah. I'm always doing strange things. Oh, why don't we just unwrap the record and see, darling? Sounds reasonable. Here's the wrapping paper. And here's the record. Uh, the label. Oh, Jerry. Animal imitations. Us? No, Mrs. North. That's my print. That uh, record is devoted to guys making like animals. I wonder. So, uh, the Jerem studio doesn't seem to be run very efficiently. 
Maybe this is the right record and the wrong label. Uh, Mr. North, I give you my word of honor. I'm not sure I care to take it. We were shot at on our way home. Not by me. I am a voice to fire around. Maybe, but I still think we ought to make sure this is really the wrong record. I have a feeling you're right, darling. Uh, I'll turn the phonograph on. Thanks, Pam. And now the record. Needle. Unreasonable, Ma. We're alone, you can spill. Spill what? I got word there's been a heavy snowfall lately. Yeah? Did you also find out I had Hank taken off the snowplow myself, personal? Because I did. And what's more? Hmm. That seems to be all. <sighs> Nothing very mysterious, darling. Just a discussion about the weather. I wonder. Happy. Happy. Jerry, he's gone. Must have sneaked out while we were listening to the record. I better shut the phonograph off. That's strange. That record very definitely doesn't belong to us, and... Happy beat it as soon as we began to listen to it. Which means I that... I suppose you could say there's more in that discussion of the weather than meets the ear. <laughs> Doorbell rings. I'll see who it is. All right, darling. Mr. Norris? Yes, what can I do for you? Uh, you won't mind if I sit down, will you? I'm not as young as I used to be. Oh, of course not. Uh, please, uh, oh, uh, Pam, this is... Um... Uh, Mrs. Claney. Oh, how do you do, uh, Mrs. Claney? Mm -hmm. Oh, but you must be... That's right, my dear. People call me Ma Claney. You're the owner of Ma Claney's Kitten Club. Jerry, that's one of the most famous nightclubs in New York. I've heard of it. Have you come to invite us to appear there? Aha, you must have heard our record. Oh, well, and, uh... not exactly, Mr. North. Although any time Mrs. North and you would like to come down, there'll be a ringside table waiting for you and no check. That's very sweet of you. Well, you're a very sweet child. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Jerrams told me you'd received by mistake a record belonging to me. I hate to bother you, but... Oh, then it must be the... Oh! Uh, what's wrong? <laughs> Pamela bit of tongue. She's always doing that. Aren't you, darling? <laughs> Uh, yes, darling. Uh, you were saying, Mrs. Claney? Well, I just thought I'd stop by and pick up my record myself and save you the trouble. Oh, that's very nice of you, but we don't have your record. The only one we have is our own. How do you know it's your own? Because we played it on our phonograph. Quite a thrill hearing your own voice coming back at you. Uh, would you mind playing it for me? Just to be sure. And... Why, Mrs. Claney, you don't doubt Jerry's word. Oh, no, of course not. And it is so late, isn't it? So why not drop in some other time earlier? And we'd be glad to let you listen to our record. For hours on end. But right now, uh, good night, Mrs. Claney. Yes, good night. Now, Mr. wait a minute. Uh, having trouble with your bag, I'll take it. Don't. There. Oh, heavy, isn't it? And inside... Why, Ma, a revolver. Give me that. Do you have a license for it? Of course I have. Good, then you won't have any trouble reclaiming it from the police. Your bag, Mrs. Claney, and the door. You know, you two are either very smart or very dumb. I'm not sure yet, but when I find out... Come back and tell us, won't you? Good night. Jerry, shut the door. Delighted, darling. Well, she wasn't very happy. Jerry, was that gun loaded? To the brim. Darling, get your shoes on. Uh, again? Uh-huh. I think we should pay a visit. Oh, goody. To whom? Mr. Jerrams of Jerrams Sound Studio. Are we going to return the record to him? Why, no, darling. As a matter of fact, I think we're going to put him on the record. Oh, the streets are almost deserted. <laughs> it's late enough. I have a feeling Mr. Jerrams may be annoyed when we burst in on him. Then let's not burst, huh? Or, uh, oh, we have to. I think so, darling. Well, here's the studio. It's dark. Funny, I hadn't expected that. The door. Locked. Home. Not yet. Uh, there was a back room to the place. That alley, darling. Come on. Jerry. Hmm? Uh, how long can you go to jail for burglary? Oh, not very. And you meet such charming people. Ah, uh, window. It's still dark, except... Jerry. I know, smoke. It's coming from the studio window. I can't see. Hey, Pam, there's a man lying on a cot in the room. I thought you couldn't see. I can now because flames are creeping into the room. Uh, Jerry, we better turn in an alarm. Ah, uh, stand back. That isn't the way. Uh, sure it is if you want to break a window. What are you going to do? That man on the cot isn't moving. 
I'm going in after him. Oh, you can't, darling. You, you, you wouldn't look nice, Toasted. I've got to. He's unconscious. Darling, call the fire department while I Nothing go in there. doing. I'm going with but you. But, Pam... I'm too young to be a widow, so I've got to make sure that you don't die. Anyway, not before I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jerry, that smoke was awful. Uh, it's all over now, darling. Is he still unconscious? Uh, as a matter of fact, I think he's given up consciousness for good. Jerry, he's dead? Very much so. Uh, the smoke? I don't think the smoke had much of a chance with him. You see, somebody had presented him with a revolver full of bullets first. Mullins, we've identified that corpse you rescued. The name is Jerems. The man who owned the studio. The same. You were uh, kind of wasted that rescue act, Mr. Noah. No, we didn't, Mullins. You see, that fire was set for one purpose. Which was? It's hard to find bullet holes in a skeleton. Oh, Jer- Jerems was supposed to be burnt completely, darling, so that it would look like accident instead of murder. Well, I guess you're right at that. Have you got any ideas on the subject of who killed him? I don't know. It may have been someone we heard him talking to. But, darling, we never heard Jerems. Oh, oh, did we? I rather think we did, Pam. Hmm. But it's not much help. Still, we... We almost have it. Except... No proof, no real understanding of the motive or what part Happy played or... I don't know. We'd better go home and go to bed, darling. But it's all there, I'm sure. It's all there where? Why, Sergeant Mullins. In the groove, of course. <laughs> No, I'm getting right up. Getting up. Huh? Wake up, Jerry. It's too dark. I prefer my mornings with a touch of sun. Jerry, I heard something in the living room. Mice. Big mice. Uh-huh. Are you going to... I suppose so. When they start moving furniture around, stay there and get ready to scream. It's dark in here. I just stick my head in like this. Jerry! Darling, you, you've got an echo. Have I got a live husband? I think so. Oh. Anything missing? I, I don't know. Uh, try the record cabinet. You think that... Uh-huh. Oh, of course. Oh. Uh, the record was, um, was... It isn't. Jerry, the burglar took that animal imitations record, the one that Mark Claney and Jerem's on it. You mean he thought he did. But it, it's gone. What the burglar took was a little item called The Way You Look Tonight. Incidentally... You look all right. Oh, thank you, darling. But the way you look tonight is right here. And... Uh-oh. <laughs> the, the label's sticky. You switchy? I switchy. And isn't baby talk repulsive? I guess Mullins is indicated. Indicated? He'll be apoplectic. <laughs> My goodness, even when you not go to sleep, do you stay asleep? No. You go around getting hit by strangers. It was in our own living room, Sergeant Mullins. And it may not have been a stranger. Uh, Mullins was happy. Who knows? The department has been looking for him, but I guess he took a powder. Uh Uh-huh, under the circumstances he... What did you say? I said he took a powder. That's a slang expression meaning he scrammed, blew, took it on the lamb. But Mullins, suppose it isn't a slang expression. Suppose Happy really took a powder... I don't get it. I know what Jerry means. And I sort of think Mark Laney got it. A Mullins. Hmm. We came to see Ma, not her daughters. Hmm. Nice family she's got. <laughs> A little short on clothes, though. Uh, Jerry? Oh, uh, we're on our way. Uh, office is back here. Shall we knock or... We go in. Oh, that... Oh, the north. Did you find my record? Uh, not exactly. 
Mrs. Craney, this is Sergeant Mullins. Hello, Sergeant. Rest your arches. No, ma'am. I'm from home, sir. Oh, I thought... who's been killed lately? A man named Jerems. Well, it's too bad. A friend of yours? Why, Mrs. Craney, we rather thought he was a friend of yours. Did you? Well, uh, you no him. sense in wasting time. Mrs. Craney was happy. Well, what makes you think This I... is the only place in town where he could be hiding out. Well, why should he hide out? The police want him. Murder? You could say that. Oh, the penalty for accessory before or after the crime is the chair, Mrs. Claney. Oh, sorry. I hadn't realized. I mean... You the... mean you hadn't realized. All right. Take us to him. I don't like to let a friend down, but if it's murder, well, I suppose friendship goes just so far, don't it? He's in the next room. Thank you, ma'am. No, let's be getting in there and see... Jerry! I, got... I hide. I hide. No copper is going to take me. You hear? No. Now, look here, young fella. I've got a big gun, see? A, a big gun. Jerry, and be a... careful. Hey, hey, don't get so close. Sorry, happy, but I'll take that gun. No, no. Get me. Let go of me. Get... I don't want to... Oh. Lovely sucking, Mr. Noah. Hey, he's out cold. I want to take a look at his eyes. Why? Because you said happy took a powder. Hmm. <laughs> Pupils like pinpoints. Then his nickname wasn't because he was sad all the time. That's right. Happy was only half of it. The other half was dust. Happy dust. I certainly appreciate your asking me to come to your home with you, Mrs. North, and offering to return my record. Jerry and I just wanted to clean up all the loose ends. Right, Jerry? Mm Mm-hmm. Happy's in jail, and, uh, oh, Mrs. Crane, you'll find your record in the cabinet there. Excuse me while I fix a few drinks, hmm? Sure, I'll just get the record and... Hey, sure it's here, Miss North? Of course. Uh, Jerry... Here we are, darling. Oh, uh, Mrs. Crane, you find it? No. Jerry, maybe Happy stole it uh, last night when he burgled the place. Maybe he did. Because whoever burgled us last night killed Jerems for that record. Uh, Mrs. Craney, you know how the record was labeled, don't you? Animal imitations? Is that so? Jerry, look. Another gun. And Mrs. Craney is pointing it at us. <laughs> Very inconsiderate. If it went off, Listen, then... I know that animal imitations record isn't the one with my voice on it. How do you know? Well, I... Because you stole it last night and tried it on a phonograph and found out I'd switched labels? Wouldn't that be how, Mrs. Craney? Maybe it would be, not. So what? So you burgled our apartment, and therefore you killed Jerems. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why would I kill him? He was blackmailing you with that record. It must be in this... Oh, shut album. up, you. Now, North, what's in that record to give anybody a hold over me? Snowfalls. You and Jerems weren't talking about the weather. Heroin, cocaine. Snow is quite a common expression for narcotics. And you admitted getting rid of Hank from off the snowplow. Or should I say the truck delivering narcotics? Nice figure, North. Very nice. Happy was just a stooge for you. You bribed him to steal the record, but dope fiends aren't very reliable, are they? All right, they're not. But I don't take the stuff. I just sell it. So you'll find my aim is reliable unless you hand over that record. Now, where is it? Why, Mrs. Claney, it's right here in this album. Here, take it. Album and all. Darling, you knocked a coal. Oh, not me, Jerry. Tchaikovsky. Uh-huh. Okay, Mullen, so long. She's confessed. Police were looking for the murderer of the guy known as Hophead Hank to the narcotics squad. That record will put Mrs. Claney in the chair. Mm. Jerry. Hmm? Do you realize that when Jerem's studio was burned, our recording was burned with it? I hadn't realized. Oh, well. Oh, well, nothing. Now, I'll never know whether you're as romantic as Charles Boyer. Well, darling, there are other ways of finding that out besides having my voice recorded. As for example? As for example... Mm. Again. (sighs) Again. Who's Boyer? Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This started with a man on trial for his life, and an A-1 citizen eager to testify. But there it was interrupted. And it wasn't until I found a corpse in a bubbling bath, gunplay in the woods, and lots of blackmail, 
that the real eager witness had a chance to talk. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Eager Witness. Division 88 of the Superior Court of the State of California and for the County of Los Angeles now in session. The Honorable Albert Winston, judge presiding. Everybody rise. It was the case of the people versus the oft-arrested, never-convicted, smooth Earl Jernigan, sometimes bookie, charged in the first degree with a month-old killing of a kindly, gray-haired horse trainer named Kurt Hopper, who had once almost been my client. It was the afternoon of the fourth day of the trial, and the prosecutor for the state had already built an almost airtight case against the alleged gambler when my turn finally came. To further substantiate the state's claim that Earl Jernigan did willfully and with malice of forethought take the life of the deceased Kurt Harper. <laughs> Will Mr. Philip Marlowe take the stand? <laughs> Raise your right hand. <laughs> Promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, happy God. I do. Take your name and occupation. Philip Marlowe, private detective. Take a stand. <laughs> Mr. Marlowe. On the morning of the 30th day of July last, the day on which the late Kurt Harper was murdered, were you hired as a private detective by the said Mr. Harper? I was. And at that time, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper state his reason for hiring you? He did. He wanted me to act as his personal bodyguard on the following day when he planned to drive to San Francisco. Did he say why he needed a personal bodyguard? He did. He told me he was uh, afraid for his life. And he refused the gambler's demand that he drug a certain racehorse a week earlier. That that gambler had threatened to kill him. I see. Now, Mr. Marlowe, did Mr. Harper name that gambler? Yes, he did. Who was it? Earl Jernigan. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Counsel for the defense. Counsel for the defense waves cross-examination, Your Honor. The witness is excused. Didn't make sense. No cross-examination. Because, from the opening adjective, the counsel for the defense, a dapper item named Calder, who always appeared in French cuffs, gray gabardine, and a cocky, uninviting smile, had raved, ranted, and practically spit at each witness the state had presented. So the courtroom was left with a tingling impression that Earl Jernigan's attorney had something of a surprise waiting up his legal sleeve. Later, when Calder was on his feet and addressing the jury, that something started out fast. Now that the state has taken the trouble to offer so much circumstantial evidence, so much hearsay, rumor, conjecture, now will I smash all of that with the testimony of one man. One man known to all of you as an outstanding citizen of this city. A prominent real estate broker. An unimpeachable witness eager to testify. Mr. Leonard Gaines. It worked. Landed in each and every lap like a live grenade and exploded all the way around at once. And when the eminent Mr. Gaines, gray at the temples, maybe 45, a neat and expensive midnight blue flannel with giant stick pin to match, took the stand. And in his own meeting of the board, tone of voice told the court that Earl Jernigan had spent the entire day and night of July 30th last with him at his Malibu Beach home. The prosecuting attorney's jaw dropped to his chest and he stared dumb. day or night did Mr. Jernigan ever leave my home. And as for the hour of the murder, 8 o'clock in the evening, we were having dinner. After that, we played gin rummy until... Oh, until midnight. Are you sure of that, Mr. Gaines? The hour of your dinner, I mean. I am positive, Mr. Calder. No, you can't be! You're tired! Quiet! Quiet! Order! Miss Harper! Order in the court, please! No, I won't be quiet! I won't any longer! Miss Harper! Quiet! Order! Order! This court is adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Another scotch and soda, mister? Yeah, I guess so. Oh, wait a minute, baby. I think I'm going to have company. Mr. Marlowe, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm... Gail Harper, yeah, I know. 
<laughs> what I don't know is why you're not doing 30 days on a rock pile for that rumpus you just kicked up in court. Would you like a soft drink? No, thanks. All right, just one, baby. Jack. The judge said he understood and left me off with a short lecture, which is what I counted on. Oh. You mean all that fireworks in there was planned, not just spontaneous combustion? That's right. I had a half time. <laughs> Look, Mr. Marlowe, will you work for me? Oh, well, now, look, will baby... Will you help I... me prove that Mr. Leonard Gaines is alive and that Earl Jernigan did kill my father? Well, take it easy, Gail. It's a big mouthful, you know. Mr. I... Marlowe, listen, please. There isn't much time. we got to prove this tonight or never. By noon tomorrow with the outside, the case will go to the jury. Okay, what do you want me to do? Take over where I left off. But first, let's get out of here. All right. And never mind that drink, miss. Where do we start, honey? With Leonard Gaines' ex-wife, Debbie Jansen. Here's a snapshot of her. Mmm. They were divorced about six months ago, Mr. Marlowe, and she wasn't very happy about it. No, huh? Made you figure she was your in? Yes, and I was right. Mm. Mr. Marlowe, it took eavesdropping, bribery, second story work, but I found out plenty. I'll bet you did. Like what? Oh, hold it, Gail. Lights red. Like the fact that Debbie and a guy called Eugene Mowry are putting a bite on Gaines for $20,000. Mm. Blackmail, Mr. Marlowe, with the payoff schedule to be made sometime tonight. Right now, she's staying at the Sun and Sulphur Springs Lodge out in the valley. Gaines used to go there once in a while for his arthritis. And the why of the whole business is a letter Gaines once wrote to his ex-wife. No fooling. Uh huh. <laughs> well, tell me, what's that to do with Jernigan's trial and Gaines being a? Al- oh, it's green now. I think there's a connection because yesterday I overheard Debbie tell this Maui something about Gaines' scheduled appearance at the trial today, and oh, oh Mister, hey, 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 those jerk California drivers. The man behind the wheel. What about him? That thin face, blonde hair. I've seen him before. I know he was trying to hit one of us. Oh, fine. Well, that'll keep things from getting dull, won't it? Then, then you're going to help me. Well, now, look, I... <laughs> uh, who could resist you, baby? Okay, tonight I check in at the lodge at Sunland Sulphur Springs. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> It was 8 o'clock and almost dark when I reached the foothills of the mountain range that separates the San Fernando Valley from L.A. proper and turned off onto a narrow dirt road that ran through a twisting gorge past a moon-faced watchman who asked no questions as he slowly opened a sagging wooden gate faintly labeled Sunland Sulphur Springs where Mother Nature's remedies bubbled from the earth private. It was another five minutes along the same dirt road uphill and through thick foliage before I was at a parking space out of my car and walking the last quarter of a mile saw the lodge itself that was spotted with widely separated cottages also sagging. And each tag, casa, and followed by something Spanish and hard to pronounce. Inside the place was cheap porch furniture and occasional threadbare rugs over scarred pine and deserted. Except for a sleepy old guy with thick-lidded eyes and an accordion wrinkled face who was slouched in a heap behind a sign on the reservation desk that read Maynard Sharp, no less, night manager. When I gave him my name and said that both my rheumatism and I needed to rest, he came too, almost. Uh, uh, Rumi, Mr. Marlowe. Well, let's see. Can let you have most any one of the cottages. Half of them are empty. Things kind of slow this time of year. How slow can you get? You'd be surprised. Uh, how's about uh, Casa Francisco de Leon? Casa Francisco, hmm? Yeah, that'll be fine, Mr. Sharp. All righty, sir. Now, if you'll just sign the register here, I'll get your key. But, uh... You'll As have I to signed my name, I checked the guest list quickly. And the next second found what I wanted. Nice. Deborah Jansen. Oh, so and next to that, and in a different hand, her cottage for the night. Yeah. Uh, Casa Rolando de... Uh, Baron Dido. That's close enough. Well, anyway, it was all I needed. I took the key from Mr. Sharp, a misnomer if ever you heard one. Learned the location of my quarters, paid him in advance, and left. Thanks, son. Outside, I turned to my right, past a large open bath that smelled like rotten eggs and talked to itself like a junior Vesuvius, as more warm sulfur waters equally unpleasant to smell bubbled from a pipe in the center. Beyond that was the first cottage, another casa I couldn't pronounce, and it stayed like that all the way down the line until I reached the second one that showed light. It was the casa known as Rolando de Barandido. And when I moved closer and around to a window that was screen only, I knew that my client had done her eavesdropping well. Because in the center of the room and putting on her coat was the ex-wife named Debbie. And standing nearby and holding on tight to the cigarette in his hand like it was support. Debbie, what had darling, to be the boyfriend, sure Eugene you know Mowry. You're, you're, you're sure that Gaines will go through with this all right? For the hundredth time, Eugene, yes, I'm positive. Can't you understand? He has to. 
Besides, $20,000 won't break him. It won't more than bend him a bit. Now, stop worrying. But I can't. Debbie, why must you go alone? Now, why can't I go with you? Eugene, please, we've been over that. I told Leonard that I'd meet him in town at the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 and alone. He agreed to also be alone. Except for the month. Debbie, you do handle things well. Come here, darling. With a kiss for your brilliant. Oh, please, Eugene, there isn't time. Oh, what's the matter? Are my kisses losing their flavor at this point? I'd be a fool. Look, it's late, Eugene. It's after nine already. I've got to hurry. Now, go on. Go on, be a good boy and leave now. We shouldn't even be seen together tonight. Well, why not, Debbie? It's not smart. Yes. Meet me at the tulip room, darling, at 11 as we clock. And you, too. We'll have time and reason to relax. 20,000 bucks worth of reason. <laughs> As Maori oozed toward the door, I slid away from the cottage and into the shadow of a clump of trees nearby. I stayed there as he walked out of sight down the road that led back to the parking space. Then a few minutes later, when Debbie clicked off the light and left, I moved out of hiding and started slowly after her at a safe distance. Until from some place in the night, an ugly, snub-nosed automatic that belonged to someone blonde and thin-faced as a near-automobile accident stopped me cold. Where you going, Jack? For air. I love to walk in the country at night, okay? I wouldn't know, Jack. I'm a city boy myself. But as long as that's what you want, it's Jake with me. As long as it's where it's good and dark. Now, go on. That way. Move. Uh, Jack, that's far enough. Hold it. Turn around and face me. Why, so I can watch you pull the trigger? Never mind why. Just turn. Okay, turn it is. That's better. Now, one step closer. One step closer. Hey, what's that? Now, present, my friend, taking me. <laughs> now, before I beat you in little pieces, let's have it. Who are you? Who do you work for and what do you want with me? Come on, gunman, talk. Okay. Okay, uh, no more. My name's Langley. Work for Earl Jennigan. Oh? Uh, yeah, I've been watching you ever since the trial started. Jennigan didn't want you moving in, hon. Which is why you tried to pick me off with a car when I was with Gail Harper this afternoon, huh? Come on! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Now, now what are you going to do with me? For the time being, Buster Levy as is. Flat on your back, because I've still got to catch up with a lady before she reads a letter! City boy... In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, because of the sharp rise in America's birth rate during the war, we face a very serious educational crisis. Many communities will find that their schools lack sufficient teachers, classrooms, and facilities. Citizens must get together and work for better schools, more teachers. If we want all of our children to have a chance for a good education, we must take action now. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Eager Witness. It was strictly hit and run. I piled Langley into the Manzanita and didn't even wait to see him bounce. Instead, I took off through a gully that was a shortcut to my car because I knew that Jernigan's watchdog had nothing to offer compared with our hot-headed Debbie Jansen who at the moment, no doubt, was well on her way to the Beverly Crest Hotel and the blackmail rendezvous that was a cinch to wind up in the final destruction of the letter. That was my theory. But I dropped it like a hot rock just as I crossed the path to the sulfur pool. Mr. Marlowe! Mr. Marlowe! Somebody screamed! Yeah, in there by the spring! Oh, gosh! Oh, my gosh! It was nothing but sulfur fumes and the thick gurgle of the springs until Sharp played his flashlight over the pool. Then we saw it. Oh, my gosh. And the water that was turning red from blood oozing around the knife in her back. Look, It's Miss Jansen. Come on, Pop. Give me a hand. Let's get her out of there. Come on. Take it easy now. Take it easy. That's it. Debbie. I never should have tried it. Tried what? Who was it, Debbie? Who did this? Who? Who got the letter, Debbie? Debbie. 
Lionel, did she, did she pass out? For good, Maynard. She's dead. Oh, uh, well, she, she seemed to be mumbling something about a letter. Did you get what it was? Yeah, only part of it. The killer apparently took the letter away from her. Believe me, that's bad. Letter? What's a letter? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Oh, it's probably that pheasant again. Letter? Pheasant? What are you talking about, Oh, I guess I'm just getting jumpy. Hey. Hey, there is somebody. Come on, Pop. Sounds... Sounds like he's over there, Marlowe. Yeah, I can hear him. No, that, that ain't going to do you any good, son. Not in that brush, it ain't. And what's more, I wouldn't go any further if I was you. But, Pop, all he needs is ten seconds and he can destroy that letter for good. Well, just to see him, there's a million and one places a killer can hide in there and lay for you, son. Yeah. Yeah, Pop, well, the moment it's a stalemate. I'd sure love to find out who that snake in the bush is. You know... I've run a peaceful place up until it's getting to be like one of them there movies. <laughs> Only thing left out is a posse. Yeah, you're so right. Murders in the night, lost letters. It's corny enough without a posse. Yeah, and uh, my dangers, too. Hmm? Yeah, I see what you mean. Are you ready to, uh, to... Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'll lead you back to the office. My Jasper, I don't understand this one bit. Miss Jensen is stabbed to death over that letter, and in her dying... Hey. Ma- huh? What is it? Shh. Up ahead there. What? Somebody duck behind that big tree. Keep the chatter going, man. Walk what? on up the path. Don't let him know we swatted him. Go on, talk, talk. Oh, well, I, uh, okay, sure, sure. I was saying, I don't understand. Well, our place here is generally as quiet as a tomb. As the old now, man grimly had led his way up the path, I followed a few feet behind. When he got even with the tree, I turned suddenly, took three fast steps, and grabbed him. Come here, you. Hang on to him. Hang on Hang on to him. Well, well. Mr. Leonard Gaines, the unimpeachable citizen himself, stands still, Gaines. Uh, uh, a gun. What's the idea, Marlowe? Try running and it'll come to you. I suppose you've got a legitimate reason for being here all thought up? I, uh, I'm here because I, I've got a touch of arthritis. I need a treatment and night's rest. Arthritis isn't all you're going to have if I find what I think I'm going to find in your pockets. Empty him, Buster. I'll I said empty him. Oh, all right, I'll, I'll empty them. That's better. A sharp, you're a witness, and I demand that you... Now, uh, just a minute, Mr. Gaines. You're in a pretty bad spot to demand anything. There, there's our baby. There's a letter we've been looking for. Pick it up, Gaines. Pick it up and read it. Now, now see here, Marlowe. See there, Gaines. Read it while you're able to. Yeah. My dear Debbie... If I didn't know you so well, I'd resent your stupid accusations. Now, look, Mark. Read it. We've already made our property settlement, as you're well aware, and you'll be a long time finding a court that says otherwise. Now you know where you can go, so why not get started as ever Leonard? Oh, fine. That's as about as incriminating as a lecture on the family meat bill. Sharp, whose jurisdiction are we under here? Uh, Jurors, uh, why, uh, county sheriff's office. All right, call him. Also, call your man out on the highway and have him lock that main gate. Main gate? Yeah. Say, now, that's a good idea. I'll do it right now. now. Wait a minute. Have you got a gun? Yep. Got a rifle. Been in the family for years. Can you use it? Well, yeah, I reckon I can. Well, where are you going? Out the roundup Langley. And be pushing hard to give his boss a star witness here a big helping hand. I want to be in shape to push back. And remember, Pop, uh. keep your eye on Gaines and not on the phone when you make those calls. I'll see you. The second time that night, I started down the hill and toward the car lot, keeping in the shadows and moving slowly this time. Because it was odds on that Langley had taken everything in. And I knew that he'd try to part my hair with a gun barrel and pull Leonard Gaines out of the jam he was in the very first chance he had. So I stayed off the paths long enough to have both socks full of burrs when it happened. But not what I expected. It was the sharp family blunderbuss that had exploded with a blast like a small howitzer. So also for the second time, I turned and ran back up the hill, this time to the office. I got there just as Maynard climbing hand over hand up a smoking rifle barrel made it to his feet. Maynard! Maynard, what happened? Where's Gaines? Well, I, I, I don't know. It got away, I guess. Well, the shot. What about that? It went up there, through the roof. Oh, fine. Well, gosh, I, I, I didn't suspect a thing. He just said he wanted to smoke. But he didn't happen to have a match, I know. So you hung your rifle over your arm, stuck both hands in your pockets to find one for him, and that's when he took you. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Well, how'd you know? Never mind, Pop. 
Well, I, 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 I made a grab for him, though. Uh, ripped his coat about halfway off. Oh, that's great. That's uh, great. Yeah, but I, I, I'm sure sorry he got away, Mark. All right, don't worry about it, will you? Can't get far with the gate locked. Well, I, uh, I got bad news there, too. Oh, oh, the gate's locked all right. But uh, there's a back road. There's a back what? Back road. Right, yeah, well, uh, right. Yeah. It, it ain't much. It's uh, rough and rocky, but it's passable. And uh, anybody's been up here as often as Mr. Gaines has... Sure know about it. Oh, great. Look, Pop, can't you understand that there was a murder committed here tonight and we had the murder yeah, but and no my... buts? Fell well, for the oldest gag in the world. But I was my... a sucker to turn him over to you. And will you stop waving that envelope? I just think you ought to see this. All right, what is it? You, you... Oh. Where'd you get all that loot? Gaines dropped it when I ripped his cot. Twenty grand, it says here on the wrapper. There's something else written here, too. Casa Rolando de Barandito. It's him. Casa Ron- Pop, that's it. That's the answer. Come on, we got to get down that back road now. Hurry. We shot at the wheel of the pickup truck. We bounced over the pair of sometimes parallel ruts studded with stones the size of bowling balls. It was called a back road. It was the better part of two miles before he cut lights and motor and whispered that if Gaines was going to get stuck at all, it was sure to happen in a dry wash just around the next bend. I told him to wait and went ahead on foot. He was right. Gaines was stuck in more ways than one. His car was up to its hubcaps in sand and his wallet up to its stamp compartment in blackmail. Conducted by his ex-wife's murderer with the same leather she'd had. The letter. It was Eugene Maury and clenched in his hand was a tattered white envelope, nothing more. I'll make it easy for you. I held my 38 in close my to my side and edged up behind them. 20,000. Now, Maury, uh, I don't have that much. You lie. You're going to pay her that. I don't know. I know because we, we, we worked the deal out together. Only she got greedy, tried to double-cross me and pull it alone. Oh, so you killed her? Yes, I I didn't intend to, but when I found out that she tricked me, I, I was furious. <laughs> the first thing that I knew, I, I, I stabbed her. Yeah, that's enough of that. Just give me the money. You've nothing to worry about. Now, listen, Maury, I no, tell you I... you listen. You're in no position to buy it's better than having your $200,000 gambling debt exposed and your reputation ruined, isn't it? Uh, or facing the trigger man, Langley, if you refuse to alibi for Jernigan, isn't it? Or bucking a perjury charge if you do alibi? Oh, no, 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 you got yourself in the corner again, so pay off. It's only 20 grand. Well, I tell you, Maury, I don't have it. You're lying again. No, he isn't. Hold don't down. move. I don't want to be. Leave your hands where they are. I got the 20 grand right here, and it's pretty well earmarked as blackmail payment already. Just to round things out, Maury, I'll take that envelope you've got there. This? Well, what do you want this for? Funny man. Because there's no doubt postmark with an hour, a date, and a location. Which, together with Brother Gaines' own handwriting, places him out of town on July 30th. A time he swears he was at his Malibu home all day with Jernigan. Right, Gaines? Yeah, smart boy, aren't you, Marlowe? You've still got a chance, Gaines. You'd better gamble with me. You've got nothing to lose now. I'm with you. Stand still, Buster. So help me out. Now, Gaines, go! Go! Oh! Oh, my leg! Were you thinking of going someplace, Mr. Gaines? Uh, no. No, I... I'm not going anyplace, Mr. Marlowe. Well, Gail, the big show's about to start. The court will be in session in a few minutes. I know. And different from yesterday. Yeah. Oh, you did a swell job, Mr. Marlowe. See, see, I don't know how to thank you. Save it, baby. If that scale Lady Justice holds in her hands isn't better balanced today, it was your hunch and old Maynard's blunderbuss did as much to put it there as my running around through the brush at Sulphur Springs. But all I knew was that Gaines was lying. I didn't know it was as complicated as it was. Well, that's because Debbie Jansen was twice as treacherous as we figured. I still don't understand. How did you know that Eugene Maury had killed Debbie? Well, you see, baby, I overheard her tell Maury that she was going to meet Gaines in the Beverly Crest Hotel at 10 for the payoff. Uh-huh. But I figured that was a lie strictly for Maury's benefit when Pop gave me the packet of money Gaines had dropped. It had that complicated name of a cabin in the time of the appointment, which was also 10, written on it. Mm. So I knew the real meeting was scheduled to take place out there. See? Oh, I see. And she was going to send Maury off to the Beverly Crest while she collected the money at Sulphur Springs and then beat it alone. That's it, honey. You see, if her cabin had been named something simple like uh, Number Four, then Gaines could have remembered it. Instead of that Casa Robino del Bangadoro, or <laughs> whatever it was, he had to write down, you see. Well, then things might have been different. Ah, oh, you'd have found a way. 
After all, you figured out it was the postmark that was important. Only after I've been slapped in the face by a perfectly harmless letter with no envelope. Had to be the postmark. What else? Oh, they're starting. Yeah. Good luck, Mr. Morrow. Give him the work. Don't worry, baby. I'm the eager witness today. We're going to knock him dead. Literally. <laughs> they got it coming. I watched Jernigan's face as the preliminaries got underway. The killer was beaten. When the court finally settled down to work and the prosecutor took over, I listened to his deft build-up as he primed the jury and the dramatic ringmaster voice he used when he called... Will Philip Marlowe take the stand, please? Now, Mr. Marlowe, you told us yesterday that you are a private investigator. Now will you tell the court in your own words what happened to you last night? I sat there looking into the cold, baleful eyes of the prosecutor and thought of a paraphrase on that wonderful quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. It's not enough to ask for justice. One must also hope for mercy. Mr. Marlowe. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Well, it began here in this room yesterday afternoon at about 3.30 when the counsel for defense called a witness, a Mr. Leonard Gaines, to the stand. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joy Terry, John Daner, Michael Ann Barrett, Junius Matthews, Ben Wright, Lou Krugman, Larry Dobkin, and Bud Whittem. The special music is by Richard O'Runt. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... The trail started in Montana with a bum with two names rushing away from his lady love and led fast into L.A. past a southerner from Canada, a worried wool dealer and a chorus girl with a forty-five. When it finally stopped at murder in the park, the tramp was still in a hurry. <laughs> Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Thelma. Well, I'm glad you called, but tonight is out, Angel. Uh -huh. A girl is trying to break off with her boyfriend, but he loves her too much to let her go. And it's up to me to see he doesn't love her to death. This is Ed Hurley, he friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Gangster's Girl. Before we join the Falcon in his latest adventure, I'd like to tell you folks about Kraft's golden cheese food, Velveeta. Velveeta is such good eating. Just taste that grand, rich, yet mild cheddar cheese flavor. And Velveeta is so good for you. It's rich in important food values from milk itself. For swell-tasting snacks, for good, hearty sandwiches, for thrifty, easy, hot dishes, it's smart to keep stocked with Velveeta. Get it tomorrow in the handy quarter-pound package or in the economical two-pound loaf. The cheese food of top quality... Velveeta is made only by Kraft. And now, the case of the gangster's girl. It's late Sunday night in New York, and Mort Potter, a local gambler, is returning home after hitting a few of the night spots. When a large sedan pulls alongside on a deserted street... Potter pulls over to let the second car by, but instead of passing, it starts crowding him, forcing him toward the curb. Hey! Hey, what's the idea? Why don't you look where you... Oh, oh Murray. Hello, Potter. Come on, will you? Yeah. I'm disappointed in you, Potter. 
Hilliard tells me you turned down our proposition. Yeah, well, it's just... Well, I, I... I thought... He didn't think so good. Come on, get out. Hey, what's the idea? Get out or do I have to... Oh. All right, Hilliard, hold him. Yeah, Mary. <laughs> look, look, fellas, if, if you'll just let me... Oh, oh. hey, come on. Oh, yeah, oh... Don't you believe in knocking? If you want privacy, keep your door locked. I thought it was. Well, you should be more careful soon. Well, where do you think you're going? Mm, little trip. Looks more like a big trip. You've cleaned the closet. If I want to go away... From me? You wouldn't do that, baby doll. I saw the paper. That man has three broken ribs. What man? You know what man. Everybody knows you did it. Baby doll, don't take everything so serious. Three broken ribs are serious. Are they your ribs? You said easy money. Well, I didn't like it from the start. But you insisted, what's the harm? Well, when you start beating up people, that's harm. Next, it'll be killing. Or maybe that's happened already, too. Now, look, I don't want to talk about it. You're staying here, understand? No, Murray. I said you're staying here. Now, start unpacking. No. Start unpacking. <laughs> <Now, hurry> up. <laughs> Wanting to go away. You don't know how lucky you are, baby doll. I'm going to be big in this town. Real big. I liked you when you weren't going to be big. Now, don't talk dumb. And quit your bawling. We're doing a town tonight. I don't want your eyes all red. Why can't you leave me alone? <laughs> Sometimes I ask myself that. I just can't, that's all. You know, you ought to be flattered. As soon as Hilliard told me you'd been over to the airline ticket office, I'd come right over. Oh, Hilliard. How did he know? Well, he keeps his eyes open. Have you got him spying on me? Well, he just likes to look after my interests, that's all. He just likes to make trouble, that's all. Oh, he's okay. Like a rattlesnake, he's okay. And one of these days, he'll make trouble for you, too. Don't make me laugh. You'll see. Things aren't bad enough. You have to have worms around. All right. You don't like them? I'll can them. Anything for you, baby. Well, doll. except getting out of the whole dirty business. Except that. Or letting me out. Oh, you don't want to out, baby doll. Not if it means leaving me. Hmm. Now, come on, honey. Get those bags unpacked. Hello? Is that Michael Waring, the Falcon? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. I want to hire you. <laughs> well, considering the price of groceries, I want to be hired. Who are you? Oh, uh, Sue Sanders. Mm-hmm. And why do you want a detective? Or don't you want to say over the phone? It has to be over the phone. I don't dare come to see you. I might be followed. I'm calling from a phone booth. And I'll mail you the money for your fee. All right. What do I do to earn it? I want to get rid of my boyfriend. Rid of him? Yeah. I'm hoping you can have him put in jail. Oh. For a minute you had me worried. Well, you may still have something to worry about. He plays rough. What's his name? Murray Ross. Oh, I see what you mean. I've just been reading about him. Yeah, it's in the papers. The police questioned him, but they couldn't prove anything. But I know he beat up that man because he wouldn't join Murray's outfit. They want to corner all the numbers men in town. Who's they? Murray and Al Burkett. Uh-oh. Is Burkett in this deal? He is the deal. Murray just runs the West End for him. Uh-huh. And just where do you fit? I don't fit anymore. That's just the trouble. I've been going with Murray, but I want out. And he has other plans for you, huh? That's right. And my only hope is for him to be picked up. But so far, nobody's been able to prove anything that would stick. What makes you think I will? Well, I have to do something. I've heard a lot about you, and I've got to get away. i simply got to. Even if it means sending your boyfriend to jail? He hasn't left me any choice. Hmm. Well, I'll do what I can for you, but uh, how do I get in touch with you? I'll have to get in touch with you. I'll call you from time to time. Right. Can you tell me anything that might help? Well, nothing more than I already have, and the police already know all of that. The problem's getting proof. If I learn anything, I'll let you know. Now i got to go. He's expecting me for dinner. Well, have fun. <laughs> Are you kidding no, I'm dead serious. <laughs> it's just the way I'll be if Murray finds out about this call. Goodbye, Mr. Waring. Come on, baby doll, let's have a smile. I'm trying, Murray. Oh, you shouldn't have to try. What's the matter? You know what's the matter. Ah, look, baby doll, I know it's a little rough getting organized, but everybody's just about lined up now. 
No more knuckle deals. Now it's a business, just like any business. I'll have an office, nine to five. You'll see. Yeah, first it's getting people in line, and then it's keeping them in line. They'll stay in line. Not because they want to. You enjoy throwing your weight around, Murray. You know you do. You like people to be afraid of you. Makes you feel important. You have to pretend to be a big shot because you know you're just Burkett's errand boy. Well, Look yeah. out, you'll knock over the champagne. Just Burkett's errand boy, huh? Listen, baby doll, I'm going to tell you something. I run the West End, see? All the collections are turned over to me. And you pass them on to Burkett with a little cut for yourself. Little cut? Listen, Burkett don't know all the angles. I got two sets of books. If Burkett knew what to take in this part of town, really comes to it with curl his hair. I'm taking him but plenty. And when he finds out... Who's going to tell him? Maybe he won't have to be told. He's good at arithmetic. Yeah, but he can't figure what he can't see, baby doll. Now, come on, stop worrying, will you? Everything's going to be all right. Yeah, I guess it is. Just depends upon what you call all right. Yes, what is it? Murray Ross is here to see you, Mr. Paquette. Oh, good. I've been waiting. Send him in. Yeah. Okay, go on in. Right. Hello, Paquette. I, uh... Understand you wanted to see me. Yes, I like to check up from time to time. You know how it is. Uh, sit down. Cigarette? No, thanks. How's Sue? Baby... D oh, she's all right. That's good. Uh, anything special you wanted to see me about? As a matter of fact, yes. There is. Shoot. Uh, don't give me ideas. Huh? Do you take me for a fool, Murray? I don't know what you mean. I think you do. But just so there won't be any question, I'll lay it on the line. Cards on the table. To put it bluntly, Murray, you've been holding out on me, shortchanging me. What? Who told Never you? Never mind. I have sources of information. Well, your sources are talking through their hat. Perhaps. Won't take long to check. Want to see the books? Which set? Are you... You got the wrong idea. I think not. But uh, as I said, I'll check. But not books. There are other methods, more reliable. Okay, you'll find out. I'm sure I will, my boy. And while I'm working on it, you'll stay here where I can keep an eye on you. Here? Yes, house guest. The boys will see you're comfortable. Uh, What's the matter? Oh, nothing, nothing. You're too warm? I see you're perspiring. Shall I open a window? I'm getting out of here. What? Going somewhere, mister? Well, I, uh... Close the door. Yeah. All right, now come back here and sit down, boy. We've got to finish our conversation. What are you going to do? Ah, yes. What am I going to do? Let's discuss that, shall we? This is Ed Hurley here again, friends. And while Mr. Burkett is talking about what he's going to do, I have a little suggestion for you ladies who wonder what you're going to do for some interesting Lenten menu ideas. And my suggestion is this. Just get a two-pound loaf of Kraft smooth-melting, pasteurized, processed cheese food, Velveeta. You can melt Velveeta for smooth, delicious cheese sauce that'll add extra goodness to vegetables or seafood or rice or just plain toast for a fine main dish. And it's such an easy sauce to make. All you do is melt a half pound of Velveeta in the top of your double boiler. Notice how smooth it melts, without any lumps at all. Then slowly stir in a quarter of a cup of milk, season to your taste, and there you have it. A delicious cheese sauce with a wonderful, rich, yet mild cheddar cheese flavor. A flavor that everyone, the youngsters and grandma included, will enjoy often. And it's a wholesome dish. Because Velveeta is so rich in important food values from milk. So whether you melt Velveeta for a swell cheese sauce or slice it thick for hearty sandwiches, you'll find Velveeta is a mighty handy helper, Mother, especially now, during Lent. Get a two-pound loaf tomorrow, won't you? It's America's favorite cheese food, the one and only Velveeta, made by Kraft. <laughs> Back to the adventures of the Falcon. It's a couple of hours since Al Burkett revealed he knew about Murray's double dealing. And now there's a knock at the door of Sue Sanders' apartment. 
Sue goes to the door, opens it, and finds herself facing Murray. Hello, baby doll. Surprised to see me? No. Should I be? <laughs> Look out, I'm coming in. All right. Why are you locking the door? I've just come from Burkett. Oh? He knows about the finagling. How do you find out? How do you find out? That's rich. Well, he, he let you go. Yeah. Yeah, he let me go. Says I can still be useful, but now he's going to keep his eye on me. Won't that be real cozy? Somebody's going to pay for this, baby doll. Well, you don't think that Somebody I... Somebody tipped Burkett. He didn't have proof, but he knew about the deal. Well, if he didn't have the proof... He could always get proof once he was wise, so I had to come across. Come here, baby doll. What do you want? I just want you to come it's here. Hurry. Why did you tip Burkett? Not much, you didn't. I tell you, and right away, Burkett knows all you about it. You believe me. Yeah? Ouch, Murray, don't. You little double cross. I tell him, I swear it. Then who did? How about Elliot? <laughs> Why should he? I told you he was dangerous. He spied on me for you, well, he'll spy on you for Burkett. Get in good with the big boys, that's his motto. Maybe. That must be it. Hilliard would sell out his own brother if it would help him get ahead. Well, we'll see, baby doll. We'll see. Hello. Hello, Mr. Waring. This is Sue Sanders. Have you found out anything for me? I'm working on it. I've got a phony deal cooked up. If I can get Murray to go for it, I may be able to hook him. Well, I hope you can work fast. He thinks I've double-crossed him. Does he know about me? No, it's something else. All right, I'll put on the heat. But I think I'd better try the act out on Hilliard first. Hilliard? Yeah, I have an idea he's more gullible than Murray. If I can sell him, Murray's a cinch. Well, anything you think best, only Hurry. <laughs> Hilliard, you can at least double your take if you work with my crowd. How do you know what my take is? Well, it's all down there in black and white. I'm not admitting those figures are right. In fact, I'm not admitting I have anything to do with the numbers. All right, look, I don't blame you for being cagey, but think it over, Hilliard. If you want to do business, you know where to reach me. Okay, Larry. But I'd like an answer by tomorrow. We want to get moving. Yeah. And uh, if I were you, I wouldn't mention this to anyone. You think I'm crazy? It's always a possibility. Well, now I've got... Look out, Hilliard, the window! Driver, did you see anybody come out of that alley just now? Uh-huh. He just got in a red sedan, drove off. You see where he went? Turn right the corner. All right, let's see if we can catch him. Okay. Hey, what's it all about? Did you hear those shots? Shots? I thought it was backfire. Backfire never killed anybody. Oh, somebody's dead? Yeah, very. Hey, I don't think I like this. Well, I'm not exactly turning cartwheels myself. You said red sedan. Is that it up ahead? Yeah, it could be. All right, step on it. Yeah. Uh-uh. See, this coming. He's starting to speed. Well, catch him. Well, I'll try, but I'm just as happy if I don't. He just turned left. Yeah, yeah, I see. Hang on. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, there he is. Yeah. Uh-uh. Just got through the light. It's changing. Well, lean on your horn and go through on the red. Now, look, if I get a ticket... I'll I... stand the fine. Okay. Do you stand the hospital bills, too? Yes, and the funeral expenses. Just keep going. Yeah, you say the nicest thing. He's taking another turn. Yeah. Hey, he'll never make it at that speed. I told you he's going to crash. <laughs> well, end of the line, mister. Yeah, certainly looks like it for him. Hello, Murray. Do I know you? Name's Mike Waring. Oh, the Falcon. Ah, you see, you do know me. Of you. What do you want? Well, I got a proposition you might be interested in. No, thanks. How do you know till you hear it? I said I've heard of you. I didn't like what I heard. Well, neither did Hilliard, but he was willing to look over my wares. Oh, you talked to Hilliard? Uh-huh. What did he say? Said he'd consider it. I'm not surprised. Now I know I'm not interested. You don't care for Hilliard? Do I don't care for rats. How much don't you care for them? I? Well, just wondering if you'd try to exterminate them. What's that supposed to mean? Well, somebody exterminated Hilliard. 
And since you called him a rat, it's Thurman. You mean he's dead? That's right. So that's her angle. Whose angle? My. Ah, nothing. Anyhow, it's not going to work. I can prove where I've been all afternoon. Yes, but this job was done by a professional trigger. You could have hired him. Are they picked up who done it? Picked up the pieces. Well, he wasn't working for me. But I got an idea. I'll be seeing you where... Uh, just a minute, Murray. I got things to do out of my way. Yeah, well, first... I, I said out of my way. No. Okay, if that's the way you want it, maybe this will keep you around a while. Yeah. Mr. Waring, you shouldn't have come here. I said I'd call you. Well, I didn't want to wait. But if Murray comes... He won't. How do you know? The police are keeping him busy. Oh, you've had him arrested? Yes, temporarily. They're holding him for questioning. Well, they questioned him before. They can't prove anything. That's why I hired you. Well, they never questioned him about this before. About what? Hilliard's murder. What? Has Hilliard been murdered? Uh Uh-huh. And when I told Murray about it, I got the idea he was coming for you. That's the reason I tried to put him on ice for a while. Well, do you think they'll be able to hold him long? I'm afraid not. Unless you can give us a little something to go on. Like what? Like a motive, for example. Now, do you know any reason why Murray would want to kill Hilliard? Now, look. It's going to be bad enough for me if Murray gets out of this. I'll only make it worse by saying anything, make him that much angrier. Well, maybe he won't get out of it, if you tell enough. But this is murder. Yeah, I want him locked up, but the electric chair, that, that's something else. Yeah, but you're hired to his, Angel. And if he's a murderer... I, I don't know what to say. Say whatever you know. Well, I don't know much... Look, did Murray have a motive for killing Hilliard? Well, yeah, I guess he did. All right, what was it? I told you Murray thought I double-crossed him. Yes, but you didn't say what about. Well, he'd been holding back some of Burkett's money. Burkett found out about it. Murray thought I told him. I said it must have been Hilliard. Mm -hmm. Well, that could do it. Anything else you know? I don't think so. Well, I'll call that much into the police. Then I'll go see Burkett. Now that the heat's on, I've got to find out what's cooking and make sure it's not your goose. Yes? Mike Waring is here. He wants to see you. Waring, huh? Good. Tell him to come in. Yeah. All right, Waring. Well, thanks, sweetheart. Hello, Burkett. I've been wanting to meet you. So I understand. You've been snooping around. What's it about? Snooping? Asking questions. Oh. If you hadn't dropped in today, I was just about to look you up. Well, I saved you the trouble. All right, now let's have it. I'd like to know where I stand. Why the interest in me? Well, I'll tell you. I'm interested in the numbers game can be very profitable. Yes, that's what I hear. Well, that's what you know. You're in it up to your ears. <laughs> All right, if you like. I won't deny it, but it'll take some proving. The DA's been working on it for months. I don't have to prove it except to my own satisfaction. I'm not trying to convince a court. Who are you trying to convince? I told you, myself. Just wanted to make sure you were the boy to hit with my proposition. Proposition? Yeah, there's a new outfit coming into this game... They sent me on ahead to line things up. We're big. Lots of backing. Now, we could run you out, but we prefer to do business with you. To your advantage and ours. Whose outfit is it? We'll get around to that when you join. But now you deal with me. Look, friend, if I was up to my ears in a racket, as you say, why would I want to deal with a character like the Falcon who's so chummy with the law? (laughs) Sure, I've been chummy with the law. That's why the organization wanted me. A thing like that can come in handy. Now, look, I don't blame you for being cautious, but I've got the whole thing worked out on paper. Dollars and cents. Can't hurt to look at it. Oh, can't hurt. Be glad to look it over. Let's have it. Well, I uh, don't have it with me. I left it at Hilliard's. Hilliard's? What were you doing there? Well, I didn't think it was any use hitting you until I found out how your boys took to this idea. So I talked to Hilliard and Murray Ross. Ah. What did they say? Why not ask them? Don't think I won't. I'm supposed to come here tonight. If they've been holding hands with you... So you admit they work for you. That's no secret, Waring. I have an investment business. <laughs> Still don't trust me, do you, Burkett? Why should I? You shouldn't. But I'm always willing to look over any proposition. Mm-hmm. I'll send one of the boys over to Hilliard's to pick up your papers. Yes, do that. I'm sure you'll find them interesting. What I want to know is just how interesting did Hilliard and Murray find them? Well, I'm afraid you'll never find out from Hilliard. Why? Haven't you heard? Heard what? Hilliard's been murdered. What? Yes, I thought you knew. Oh, Hilliard talks to you, and right away he gets himself murdered. What's the matter? Did he turn you down? 
Said he'd think it over. And... Who are you working for, Waring? I told you, that's not for publication yet. I'm asking. <laughs> Sorry. You know, sometimes silence can be very unhealthy. Why? You're just a businessman. Investments. You wouldn't try any rough stuff. That's right, Waring. I wouldn't. But you can always have an accident, can't you? This is Ed Hurley again, friends. Well, Mike won't tell Mr. Burkett what he wants to know, but I do want to tell you something I'm sure you mothers especially will want to know. It's how to get the finest cheese food you can buy for your family. It's simple, really. Just be sure you buy Velveeta, Kraft's delicious pasteurized processed cheese food. Velveeta tastes good, and it's so good for you, too. For Velveeta is rich in important food values from milk, and it's as digestible as milk itself. So it's perfect any time for snacks, sandwiches, and grand hot dishes. Try it, won't you, Mother? Make Velveeta your handy helper. Just be sure you get genuine Velveeta, the pasteurized processed cheese food of top quality, made by Kraft. <laughs> Back to the adventures of the Falcon. It's 20 minutes since Mike Waring left Al Burkett. Now he's back at Sue's with a plan to wrap up the case. Now look, Angel, I want you to call Burkett. Ask him to come over here. Why? I want to get him away from his gorillas. He was expecting Murray and Hilliard tonight. Now, he knows Hilliard can't make it, but he's still waiting for Murray. He knows you're Murray's girl, so maybe he'll come if he thinks you have an important message for Murray. He'd probably want me to go to his place. Well, you can be expecting a phone call from Murray and don't want to leave till you get it. All right, I'll try. But what happens when he gets here? Well, the only way to clinch anything against these boys is to get one of them on record against the other. I think I know how to do it now. And it ought to work. Well, it better. After all, Mr. Waring, I hired you to get me out of danger. Not into it. Come in, Mr. Burkett. Right, oh, Sue. Where's... Oh, Waring. Hello, Burkett. Oh, she didn't tell me you'd be here. I thought Murray might be here. What did you want with him? You said you'd already talked over your proposition with him. No, it wasn't about that. I want to talk to him about the murder. So? What did he think he could tell you? Well, as a matter of fact, it... Murray. Well, what do you know? Right on cue. Come on in, Murray. What is this? What are you doing here? Waiting for you. I didn't think the police would hold you. But maybe they will next time D round. Police? So that's your game, Waring. The proposition was just a bluff. I thought as much. Yes, Burkhead, I've been trying to find some way of proving what everybody knows about you fellas. It's not easy. But maybe it won't be necessary if I can pin the murder on you instead. On who? Who do you think, Murray? You tell me. Well, Burkhead found out you had double-crossed him. Haven't you wondered why he didn't do something about it? The only reason you're not on the slab with Hilliard is that you make such a nice patsy. Uh, how's that? Hilliard blabbed on you. Gives you a good motive. So it's safe for Burkett to have Hilliard rubbed out with you around to take the rap. What rubbish? I don't know, Burkett. I've been wondering how come you turned me loose. Well, I told you I, I needed you. Maybe. And maybe Waring's making sense. Now you're going to tell me. I told you. I... No. Come on, Burkett. Talk. But you idiot can't you see what Waring's trying to do? You're going to talk. Sure he will, Murray, at headquarters. That's where you're going as soon as you fellas get through dancing. And just in case you have any doubts about it, this gun ought to remove them. So let me know when you're ready, will you? Well, Angel, before they got through, they certainly spilled plenty on each other. He won't have much to worry about from Murray anymore. He has a long stretch ahead for racketeering. And Burkett is going up for murder. But why did Burkett have Hilliard killed? Hilliard was helping him. He told me about Murray's cheating. Yes, that's just it. You see, Hilliard was a stool pigeon. He squealed on you to Murray, squealed on Murray to Burkett. So Burkett reasoned he might just as likely squeal on him to the law. I see. Now, Burkett's motto was never trust a stoolie. Makes sense. But how did you know that he was behind the murder? Well, he pretended he didn't know Hilliard had been killed. But when I told him I'd left some papers he might be interested in at Hilliard's, he said he'd send one of the boys over to pick them up. But since he was supposed to be expecting Hilliard, 
Why didn't he simply call him to bring the papers along? Of course. He must have known Hilliard wouldn't be coming. That's right. Because he knew he was dead. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad it's over. And I'm certainly glad you got me free of Murray. <laughs> and believe me, I'm going to be careful who I start going out with from now on. That's a very good idea. Of course. A private detective ought to be safe enough. Uh-oh. Don't look at me. What's the matter? Uh, you had your last boyfriend sent to jail. I'm going to be careful, too. Good night, Angel. Friends, America's defense program has placed on the Red Cross one of the greatest responsibilities it has ever had to assume. Now, in addition to day-to-day aid to the sick and injured, the Red Cross must extend its services to the men of our growing armed forces in camps and hospitals, at home and overseas. Now, too, the Red Cross must recruit train and equip millions of home defense volunteers in first aid and home nursing. And the Red Cross system of blood banks must be expanded to meet greater civilian and military needs. That's why Red Cross needs your help. By giving as generously as you can to the Red Cross, you are helping to mobilize for the defense of your family, your community, your country. The Case of the Unsilent Butler. The Case of the Unsilent Butler. That's the title of next week's adventure of the Falcon, when Mike Waring learns that the way some people get a bang out of life is by using a gun. So be sure to listen at this same time next week to another exciting adventure of the Falcon, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company. The adventures of the Falcon are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake, produced by Bernard L. Schubert, Written today by Jerome Epstein and directed by Richard Lewis. Music was by Arlo. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Jan Minor as Sue. Be sure to hear The Great Gildersleeve next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. In next Wednesday's broadcast, Gildy comes face to face with an hilarious problem and solves it in a way that will keep you laughing for days. Remember the show, the time, and the place, The Great Gildersleeve, next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. Check your local newspaper for time of broadcast. This is Ed Hurley. He's speaking for the Kraft Foods Company. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Bernadine. Anything wrong? You sound almost human. It's not Bernadine, Sam. It's me, Effie. F. But I'll tell Bernadine about your compliment. How are things? Well, uh, I've made out as best I could. I don't want to, don't want you to think that I begrudged you a vacation. After all, you have worked hard. You uh, did deserve it. Sam Spade, is that all you have to say to me? I am not putting the blame on you. After all, it is a state law, so I can hardly accuse you of letting me down at a time when I needed you most. You might at least ask me if I had a good time. I'm sorry if your conscience bothered you. Oh, well, it didn't. I had a divine time, and I met all sorts of interesting people. Mostly men. You don't say. What else? Well, it was this desert ranch, you know, with a lot of uh, buttes around. You uh, mentioned those. No, Sam. No, no, no. They're the result of erosion. Those outdoor types, they go to pieces. Sam, are you pulling my leg? Not over the phone, Effie, but stay where you are. I'll be right down to look at your snapshots. And when you have the time, I'll dictate my report on the missing news hawk caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Wild Root Cream Oil. That's the famous name to remember, men, next time you buy hair tonic. And look what Wild Root Cream Oil does for you. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Yes, men, Wild Root Cream Oil is your shortcut to really handsome hair. So be smart. 
First chance you get, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> of Kanab on Virgin River. Kanab, the Pearl of the West. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And did I mention the buttes? Oh, well, they're very interesting. The uh, result of erosion. Yes. And it's authentic, too. Faye Hamlin's ranch. You uh, mean a working ranch? Yes. You see, that way you get into the spirit. Mm-hmm. My job was to feed the chickens. And that's how I met him. <sighs> One of the buttes? Oh, Sam, he's a very cultured gentleman. Culture smulcher. What's he do for a living? He, well, he, he cures stammering. You don't say. What's his name? Charlie Shank. Charlie Shank? He's the founder of the Shank Institute of Arch- Ar- Articulative Correction, which Ar- I should learn. Articulative Correction. Where is this institute? Oh, I have the address here. Um, General Delivery, Butte, Montana. Mm-hmm. You're sure you didn't help him break parole, Effie? Oh, no, oh, no, no. We just went on long walks together. Where to? Oh, different points of interest. Like, uh, like Wolf Canyon... Figures. Uh huh. He invited me on this camping ship, a trip, honorable, of course. Mm. But I couldn't go on account of my sunburn. Oh, oh. I had an awful, awful. Oh, I still got bad. it, you see. Mm. And then, then he went back to Butte. He had to leave in such a hurry, he couldn't even say goodbye. Well, it was a pity too, because an old friend he hadn't seen in years came looking for him just a few minutes later. With a warrant? No, no. He was an attendant in a nearby hospital. Mm. Mental? Oh yes, very intelligent. <coughs> he read me some of his poetry. Maybe you've heard it. Um, a loaf of bread. A jug of wine and thou. Now, wait a minute. Isn't that the Rubiat of Omer Cayenne? That was written by a guy named Fitzgerald. Well, of course. That's his pen name. Quite a penman. Yes, but he's paid his debt to society. And the other time it was a bad beef. Oh, no. He told me all about it. He cried on my shoulder afterwards. Sweetheart, when you make a mistake, it's a beaut. Sam, nothing happened. Well, I'm glad he cured you of stammering, anyhow. Ready? Oh, yeah. I got a brand Work, new you notebook. Know. Life goes on. I got a brand new notebook, Sam. I'll just turn over a new leaf. Not a bad idea, dear. <laughs> uh, date uh, July 18 to Mr. Alex M. Youngblood. Uh, mm. Try that again. Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, P.O., Box 317, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Dear Mr. Youngblood, I need a vacation myself. You need Charlie Shank. <sighs> On tarts, Sam. Fortunately, until I met you, my only experience with any of the men and women who make your newspaper run had been with one of your corner newsboys who shortchanged me two times within as many days. I have not read your rag since. But your name looked imposing, and so did the $300 check upon which you had written it. Per your instructions, promptly at 4 p.m. on the 15th inst., I munched through the litter of your city room toward a door marked A.M. Youngblood, publisher, managing editor, and city editor. I wondered if you were ambitious, frugal, or three men. I did not know that you had good taste until I saw the trim, 20-ish, and toothsome secretary in your outer office. Hello. You're new here, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm not exactly here. I'm just here to see Mr. Youngblood. Oh. The name is Spade. Samuel Spade? Sam, except to my most intimate friends. <laughs> well, my advice to you, Sam, is to beat a hasty retreat. He's in a foul mood. Oh? Uh, why? Is he blind or older than he feels? I refer, of course, to your spectacular charm, Miss... Uh, if I may call you Miss. Please, this is neither the time nor the place. My name is Phyllis Watson and my phone number is in the directory. If you're really interested. I could be. Thank you. And if a man answers, tell him you're my French teacher. We. Oui. <laughs> you better go in now. If you're late to an appointment with him, you're through. Uh, do you have any more words of wisdom? No, but I hope you can do something to improve his state of mind. He's been awful lately. Good luck, Sam. Uh, thank you, Phyllis Watson. Come in, come in. Now, one minute past four. You must be Mr. Spade. That's right. You're almost late. Sit down, Spade. Cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Well, don't expect me to offer a drink. You aren't a drinker, I hope. You don't listen to the radio, do you? Well, you'll not drink in this office. Nothing here but a cooler filled with water from a clean, gurgling, laughing mountain stream. You sound like a reformed drunk, Mr. Youngblood. What's that? Well, it was a good many years ago. 
If you don't mind, I'll just paste up the weather report for my morning edition before we talk. Oh, you do that too, huh? Yes, obviously. And with good reasons. I remind myself that I was once a copy boy, and I find it a splendid way to, uh, at least once each day, to lower myself to the level of the working man. There we are. Very hot in Phoenix, I see. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, just what do you want a detective for, Mr. Youngblood? I was coming to that, Mr. Spade. Sorry. Now, uh, <clears throat> well, first let me warn you that your assignment is a highly confidential one. They all are. In this case, a man's life may be at stake. Mm-hmm. The situation, my newspaper, at my order and under my guidance, has launched a campaign against crime. Not aimed at the petty criminal, but at the easy-living leeches at the controls of the rackets. The hoods in bankers' clothing. The mansion house parasites who direct the pickpockets, the second-story men, the housebreakers, who gamble away yeah, half a million uh, dollars a year uh, and uh, pay income taxes. Yeah, yeah, don't go to pieces. Of that uh, yes, I and, understand, I understand. Uh, you're after the boys on the safer side of the fences. Uh, uh, nicely put, Spade, yes. Thank you. Well, the long and short of it is this. The author of the expose series, Ray McCulley, my top crime reporter, has been missing for two days. I want you to find him. What makes you think he's still alive? Good heavens, Spade. Why must you suggest that he isn't? Because if I were a mansion-housed parasite in danger of being unhoused by a newshawk, I'd see said newshawk standing in a cement block on the bottom of the bay. I will accept that only when no stone has been left unturned. Every straw and every haystack has been searched. Every... Uh, nook and cranny? Uh... Yes. Sounds as though you need at least one police force, Mr. Youngblood. Now, why don't no, you just... No, uh... no, no, no. Impossible. We've already had a brush with the police over the expose. I'll not be dictated to at this stage of the game. I started this investigation, and I'll finish it alone. Well, it's a pretty big order, Mr. Youngblood, but uh, times are tough. I'll see what I can do. Good. I hereby turn over to you all the resources and power of this, my newspaper. When one of my reporters is in trouble or danger, sir, I will spend every penny of my fortune, if necessary, to deliver aid and succor to his side. You then gave me Ray McCulley's expose stories to date. I saw why you, his family and friends, and his creditors could have been worried about him. They were hot. One followed a stolen car from the time of the heist through the alteration of the body color, tire brands, license number, motor serial number to the time it was shoved onto a used car lot. They named names all the way through. And another did the same to the firm of Otter, Badger, and Mole, furriers, and alleged manufacturers of coats from clouted pelts. Ray McCulley had dropped out of sight right after that story had been published. So I left your office hoping that I'd reach the address of Otter, Badger, and Moe before closing time. I did. The plushy showroom was occupied by a dozen attractive fur-bearing models, female, but wax. The live models, male, were wearing padded shoulders, pointed shoes, and coats tailored for underarm artillery. They would have looked more natural at Madame Fassard's waxworks, Bertram the burglar section. Hey, yo, hey, what'll it be? Something for the little woman? Uh, where do I find Mr. Otter? Are you the law? Uh, Leo sent me. He's in his office. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't crowd me. You say you want to see the boss? On business. Stop nudging me with a rod. In there, hey, move. Okay, okay. Hey, your boss. Yes, Woody? Here's a Joe here to see you. Leo sent him. Well, nudge him in, Woody. No nudging, Woody. Well, well, well. So Leo's sending a man to see me. I wonder why. If you'll uh, comb this character here out of my hair, I'll try and tell you. Sit down, Woody. Mm. Thanks. You're new in town. Uh, yeah, that's why Leo sent me. A local muckraker named Ray McCulley interviewed you. He also interviewed Leo, but it didn't get printed yet. Uh, Leo wants to find him. So do I. How can I help? Well, uh, he walked out of here, went to his hotel, wrote the story, and mailed it in. That's the last anybody's seen of him. Uh, Leo was just sort of hoping that you'd already taken care of him. Not yet. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Just a moment. Yeah? Leo sending you out alone? Why not? That's a tough boy, that McCulley. He's got plenty of protection. That's what you need. What kind of protection? Go along with him, Woody. Who, me? You're Woody, aren't you? Now, look, uh, look, Mr. Otter. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but the way I see it, this is a, a lone wolf type caper. Hey, what's the matter, hey? You think I'm too good for you? Well, Woody, I wouldn't say that. Good, it's settled then. Take care of him, Woody, and don't mix it up with any of Leo's boys. If he's out to get that rat McCulley, he's our friend. <laughs> I 
was beginning to wonder who Leo was. I'd grabbed the name off a calendar on the wall, Leo's van and storage. I didn't know whether he was the Leo Mr. Otter didn't like, and I hoped I wouldn't find out. The best way I could think to keep from finding out was to shake Woody. On the way uptown, I walked him past four police stations. Crossing Market Street, I pushed him straight into the arms of a traffic cop who begged his pardon and let me off with a warning. At the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, I gave Joe, the bartender, the Mickey Finn sign, but Woody liked it. He ordered another. Then he said he knew a place on Columbus where the drinks were even better. It was called Leo's Place. I wondered if that meant anything. Hey, oh, hey. Uh, who, me, huh? I want you a drink. Don't you like this joint? Yeah, sure, it's fine. Uh, we're not getting anywhere, though. You really take your work serious. Me, when I go gun for somebody, I go where I'm least likely to succeed. You live longer. Yeah. Uh, Woody, what do you know about this guy, uh, McCulley? You hear the puss. He says he's a rat. Yeah, but he said he's got plenty of protection. Who's furnishing it? Well, you see, there's a... Boy, oh boy. Look at what just walk in. I looked. What I saw was not disappointing. She was wearing a skin-tight black satin with a plunging neckline and a new look only in places where it didn't matter. But she still looked enough like your secretary, Phyllis Watson, to be out of place in Leo's place. She didn't stay there long. She made a beeline through the kitchen to the rear exit. I made a beeline right after her. Woody was breathing down my neck as I started up the rickety outside stairway at the back of the building. I uh, stopped the landing and turned around to face him. See you later, Woody. I didn't wait to see if he made it all the way to the bottom of the stairs. I was more interested in what was going on at the top. A door had opened and Phyllis stepped inside. The man who let her in looked like Ray McCulley. Who are you? Well, the name is Spade. I don't know that name. Your boss hired me to find you. Private Dick. Yeah. Can I uh, talk to you for a minute? Sure. Put your hands behind your neck and walk up slow. Okay. All right. Go inside. Well, what's the matter? You're not acting glad to see me. This is the guy, fellas. Yes. Alex hired him this afternoon. There you see. Now, uh, what do you want me to tell young blood? You're not going to tell anybody anything. Oh. It caught me right behind the ear. The last thing I saw was that plunging neckline as Phyllis rushed forward. I didn't know whether she was rushing to my rescue or to get in a few licks of her own. Five seconds later, I didn't care. As the design of the linoleum slammed up at me, I had just time to wonder why, of all the people who were looking for Ray McCulley, I had to find him. Then I was out. Boing. Maced for my pains. <laughs> The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the missing Newshawk caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I was lying on the floor in a room with nothing in it but a sink, an army cot, a square of dirty linoleum, and a body. I staggered to my feet, ran some cold water over my head, and took a closer look. It was Ray McCulley. He was a very dead, crusading reporter. He'd been stabbed clean through with a long-bladed kitchen knife. It set on the handle, property of Leo's place. I went through his pockets. And his wallet, a press card, a police card, union card, and ten genuine, crisp, new thousand-dollar bills. 
That gave me a line on the killer. He was crazy. So was I. I left it on him, too. Folded up in his vest pocket, I found two newspaper clippings, one from the Chronicle and one from your paper. Both weather reports for the same date. It was very hot in Phoenix, according to both papers. But according to your weather report, the temperature in Needles, California, was 135 degrees. That needled me. So did the slip of paper I found on his shoe. The number nine and a date had been stamped on it with a rubber stamp. The date was the same as that of the weather reports. I turned it over. It said Ruthie's Booth, Manson Bowling Alley. You're the cigar type. Corona's a panatelic. Uh, thanks. I'm just shopping. Uh, I got a nice line of notions. So have I. Uh, no, I mean the dolls, the Hollywood dolls. You know, for the bed, only a dollar plus tax. Very reasonable. Say, what's on your mind? Uh, Leo sent me. Oh. Are you going to collect the slips hereafter? Well, uh, not tonight. You see, I'm uh, sort of a troubleshooter. Leo's uh, checking up on some of the numbers that didn't come out right. Listen, I'll tell him to his face. I don't want any part of those wrong numbers. They're scary. Nuts. Who bought this one? Let me see. Oh, last Thursday. Oh, number nine. How can I forget? He put $500. And honest, if he's been around once, he's been around a hundred times to see if it paid off, did it? What's his name? Mr. Spinelli. He buys a slip every day. And if you ask me, he's learned a system. Because he's been winning, you know. Dimes and then a dollar and then five dollars. And then when he come in with 500 on number nine, until he dropped dead. Did it win? Where does he live? <gasps> it did. Wait, I'll look on the sheet. Hey, somebody else was in just this afternoon. Give me that address. Hurry up, will you? It's right around the corner on Manson, 810. Say, maybe that's his system, 8 and 1. Don't that add up to 9? Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going in such a run? Please, come back later. Tomorrow... Next week. Are you Mrs. Spinelli? Yes, please. I had so much trouble. Is your husband home? Oh, my poor man. They take him away. He is dead. Oh, I'm sorry. How did it happen? Who are you? I'm a detective. Maybe I can help you. May I come in? All right. Come on. It took quite a while to gain her confidence, and after that it took still quite a while to piece together the grief-stricken grumble of words that poured out of her. When I got it down in the form of a statement, I asked her to read it over. Item. Statement by Mrs. Arturo Spinelli. All the time he played those numbers. I told him they're just a bunch of gangsters. They don't let you win. Then he met this man McCulley, a writer for the newspaper. My husband says this man shows him how to win. He wins and wins. Then he goes to bank and takes out all our savings. I begged to him not to do it. Ten thousand dollars. I don't want it. I am scared. I took it while he is sleeping with wine and gave it to the men. I tell him all I want is the five hundred. He tried to tell me we do good. We help catch the big gangsters. I say we don't want to do so good we get murdered in our beds. So he says, okay. But if I change mine, here is address. I don't change my mind. Because already my husband, he is dead. Has home. Stand. No, I don't change my mind. She signed it, and I left her alone with her grief. I wasn't working for you anymore, Mr. Youngblood. You hired me to find your reporter, and I had. And I wished I hadn't. The rest of it I did for myself. You weren't in your office when I got there, but Phyllis was. I found her behind the city desk in the act of dropping tomorrow morning's weather report into the slot. I grabbed it out of her hand. What? Oh, it's you. Where's your boss? At home, I guess. We'll talk in his office. Come on. Sam... Uh, I can explain how I have. You're going to, to be... explain plenty before I'm finished with you. Sit down. Oh, you. 
don't have to be so rough. What's the matter with you? Plenty. I'm stupid. I was stupid to take this job, and I was stupid to play it cagey with you. I should have beaten the story out of you before the trouble started. It's a little late in the day now, but not too late to send you up for McCulley's murder. Oh, you're insane. Ray McCulley was... I'm the only one who ever tried to help and you. And I'm the only one who can place you in that room, not ten minutes before the murder. I told you, I can explain Stop why... trying to save your own skin. Spinelli was only one of a half million poor dumb yucks that lose their nickels and dimes and dollars every day in the policy racket. Only he had the bad luck to win. There won't be any more lucky dead people like him if I have to make a patsy out of you to stop it. It won't stop it. Nothing will. Ray talked big and brave like you. Now he's dead. Yeah, with 10,000 bucks dirty money in his wallet. I won't let you say things like that. Ray was an honest reporter. Too honest. He thought young blood meant what he said about that cleanup campaign. Yeah, he did. He wanted to run this town by himself, clean up his competition. When Ray started collecting material on the numbers racket, he still thought young blood was on the level. But that was before he stumbled onto the thing about the weather reports. Yeah, yeah, that was a new one. The old Dutch Schultz mob used to add up the stock market quotations. If they cheated, they knew their customers weren't good enough at arithmetic to prove it. But who knows how hot it is in Phoenix unless they live there. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen. That's how the number game works, sweetheart. The suckers pick a number from one to ten, see? The operators tally up the slips, and the least popular for that day has to win. The weather report doesn't have to pass through the copy desk, and with young blood pasting it up with a few strategic corrections, it was easy to make their winners look as if they were on the level. But, of course, you had no way of knowing that. You only watched them do it day after day. You know, I couldn't understand why he did those things. It's... It seemed silly falsifying a weather report, but it didn't seem as if it could do any harm. What did you meet McCulley for? To get your cut of the ten grand Spinelli was killed for? How dare you? I went there to warn him about you. Who killed him? I don't know. You're lying. All right, I'm lying. But I can prove that Ray was on the level. I've got the proof right here. The whole story he wrote on the numbers racket, even naming Youngblood as the head of it, his own publisher. I went there to get it. I was going to take it to another newspaper. Why didn't you? I can't tell you that. You don't have to. Mrs. Spinelli was confused, grief-crazed. She had to put the blame on somebody, and when she did, she got her revenge the only way she thought she could. She may have been right about that, but she killed the wrong man. Why didn't you tell me you knew who killed Ray? I wanted to give you a chance to tell me yourself. I'm glad you didn't. And that, Mr. Youngblood, is the crop. I'm sure you appreciate the fact that I gave the double scoop to your paper. Like uh, Mrs. Spinelli, I have my own ideas of vengeance. Besides, it may up your circulation a little, and you can certainly use a little extra money for your defense. Uh, by the way, who's Leo? Uh, period, end of report. But Sam... Yes, Evie? I thought Mrs. Spinelli killed Ray McCulley. The vacation helped. You are absolutely correct. Mrs. Spinelli killed Mr. McCulley, if you'll pardon the expression. But why did she kill her husband? I was wrong. The vacation didn't help. You mean she didn't? She killed McCulley to avenge the murder of her husband. You mean Mr. McCulley killed Mr. Spinelli? Effie, stop. I'll go mad. Oh, you need a vacation, Sam. Look, type that up. The clatter of the keys may stimulate you to further cerebral activity. I beg your pardon, Sam? Brain work. Now, shoot. Oh, brain work. Oh, you know best. Tonight, men, or first thing tomorrow, get Wild Root Cream Oil and see what wonders it does for your hair. Notice how easy it is to apply. Notice what a neat, natural job it does of grooming your hair. Notice, too, how effectively Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. No getting around it. Once you try it, you'll never be without it. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And you were absolutely right. The typing cleared my mind. It's all clear now except for one thing. Well, let's clear that up right away. Why did Mrs. Spinelli kill her husband? She did not kill her husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant, why did Mr. McCulley kill Mr. Spinelli? Kelly did not kill Spinelli. Who's Kelly? McCulley. McCulley's real name was Kelly? Now, let's start all over again. Disregard everything we've said up until now. Make your mind a complete blank. All right, Sam. In the first place, McCulley did not kill Spinelli. That's what I said. It was his wife, wasn't it? Now, wasn't it, Sam? Oh, stop teasing me. Sam, why do you look at me like that? Effie, Mr. Spinelli was killed by one of the policy racket hoods to get back the ten grand he won on the numbers game. Then how did the money get into Kelly's pocket? McCulley's. Why do you 
insist on using his alias, Sam. Effie, it's... Effie, that was a tip of the song. I, I mean, look, Mrs. Spinelli took it to him because she was afraid her husband might be killed for then it. why didn't they take the money when they killed him? Because Mrs. Spinelli had already taken it. Then she did kill him. Go home, Effie. All right, Sam. I'm sorry I'm so irritable to you, but I, I thought it's... Well, it's been so long since oh, I've no, been here, you know, there. Sam. Angel, and I... Angel, you're just tired. Vacations have a habit of doing that to you. After a week or two in the office, you'll be all rested up again. I'll take it You easy. act as though you thought my mind were affected. Come here. Oh, Come Sam, here. now don't. My sunburn. Yeah. Oh, it hurts. Now... It's nice to have you back. You look good, too. All tanned and healthy. You're roof. It's great. I think my nose is feeling... Well, don't pick at it. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> good night. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And say, let me tell you something I found out just the other day. Steaks are really back again. Good, thick, juicy porterhouse steaks. Mm. That's for me. A thick, tender steak on the rare side, together with a glass of Petri California Burgundy. You know, Petri Burgundy is a perfect mealtime wine. And with meat or any meat dish, it's the very last word in good eating. Honestly, when you taste the wonderful flavor of that rich red Petri Burgundy, you're tasting one swell example of the art of winemaking. It's full-flavored and just about the most delicious wine that ever poured from a bottle. Try it the next time you have steak or chops, or the next time you have hamburger or pot roast. Believe me, Petri Burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. And now let's look in on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Evening, Doctor. Just in time to join me in a cup of coffee. Draw up your chair, young fellow, my lad. Thank you. Ah, that's it. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure takes us to the south of France. That's right, Mr. Bartell. The south of France in the year 1900. A beautiful playground bordered by the bluest of blue seas and populated with an extraordinary cross-section of cosmopolitan Europe. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. All of them attracted by that Riviera paradise. All of them drawn by the magical spell of a small white ball spinning round the rim of a roulette wheel. Now, don't tell me that you and the great Sherlock Holmes were there on a gambling spree. We were not, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> At the time my story begins, we just concluded an extremely delicate mission. A mission, I may say, that uh, concerned the safety and good name of uh, a very prominent member of the royal family. 
say, Doctor, you don't mean... Uh, one story at a time, Mr. Barco. In any event, my boy, I'm afraid that's the case about which my lips are sealed for all time. But to return to tonight's adventure, one June evening, I persuaded Holmes to accompany me to the gambling casino at Fragus, not far from Cannes, where we were staying. It wasn't quite as fashionable as a casino at Monte Carlo, but as I intended to do a little modest gambling myself, it seemed an establishment more suited to my means. As we stood there at the green baize covered tables, the chatter of voices and the melodic chanting of the croupiers as they called the results of each spin of the wheel formed a background to a quiet conversation that Holmes and I were having. Lost ten, Watson. Oh, confounded. That number ten must come up soon. Oh, why not cut your losses, old fellow, and come for a stroll with me on the water? Well, just a big wig. A couple more bets, Holmes. I, I have a big ten is bound to come up in a minute. <laughs> Watson, I believe the blood of a gambler courses through your veins. Oh, there's no harm in taking a little flutter once in a while. Why don't you risk a few francs, Holmes? Oh, no, thank you, my dear chap. The law of averages convinces me that my money is safer in my pocket. In any case, I'm a little dubious as to the integrity of this particular casino. Oh, what makes you say that? Well, you will observe that this roulette wheel has a double zero. Most continental wheels have only a single one. It would indicate that this house is extremely concerned with its percentage. Mesdames et messieurs, faites vos yeux. Oh, just two more turns of the wheel, Holmes, and I'll take that walk with you. Oh, you must have a feeling. Why do you not get on the other side of the table? Why must you always stand next to me? Hello. Good trouble up there. I've placed my bet, so, so let's go and see. I ask you, so why do you play here beside me? I'm afraid I don't see any reason why I can't play wherever I... Squish, you are. You've broken my luck. Ever since you come to the table, I've done nothing but lose. Please, to move away. Well, move away yourself if you don't like my company. Heinrich, why do you not stop now? You've already lost more than we can afford. One more throw in, sir. I can win it all back if only this young man will move away. Why should my husband move? He's had a bad run of luck, too. Rien ne va plus. Ne. Oh, oh, you've lost again, Watson. Heinrich, you must stop now. I must stop inside because I've lost everything. I hope you're satisfied, Mr. American. You've broken my luck and ruined me. I hope that you and your friend will be ruined too. Heinrich, Heinrich, wait for me. I never heard such rubbish in my life. Were you listening to him, sir? I heard his last few remarks, Mr... Uh, Gilbert. Roger Gilbert. Gilbert. And this is my wife, Helen. How do you do? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Didn't think his remarks were a little out of place, Doctor? Yes, I certainly did, Mrs. Gilbert. I don't see how he can possibly blame your husband for his run of bad luck. I didn't like the look on his face as he left the table, though. Have you any idea who he is? His name is Schneeman. He's staying at the same hotel as we are. I've never spoken to him, but I've heard him being paged there. Well, you shouldn't gamble unless he can afford to lose. Well, I'm losing, darling, and I can't afford it. Oh, I can let you have more money. You know that. Oh, no, Helen. I, I may have married an heiress, but I'm not going to use her fortune to gamble with. Oh. <laughs> I'll lose my own money, and then I'll quit. Mesdames and messieurs, take for you. You lost it, Watson? Yes, Holmes. This time I know that number 10 is going to come up. It's got to. <laughs> I've lost again, darn it. Helen, this is my bad night. Well, why don't you stop now, dear? Holmes, I've made 350 francs. On this throw of the wheel, old fellow, but as you've lost some 500 francs doing it, I can't say that you're quite stagger me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I can see that you're no gambler. <laughs> I'm afraid not, Mrs. Gilbert. I didn't say that, Holmes. Uh, you may not like roulette. You've taken a good many chances in your life with long odds against you, too. Well, nevertheless, chap, in the sense Mrs. Gilbert means it, I'm not a gambler. Oh, that's a good idea. Say, what's the commotion over there? That German woman with a crowd forming around him. Yes, yes, the wife of that man that said I ruined him. Attention! Attention! Est-ce qu'il y a un docteur dans la salle? There must be trouble. He's asking for a doctor. A doctor? Come along, then. Will you excuse me, please? Thank you. Excuse me, madame. Mon ami, a doctor. Monsieur! What happened, madam? It is my husband. Is he ill? I just found him lying out in the garden. Please come with me at once, gentlemen. Uh, of course we will, madam. What seems to be the matter with him? Here, doctor. I think he is dead. He's lying by that tree, doctor. Please see if you can help him. Somebody else seems to be on the scene before us. Who are you, sir? I am Monsieur Chevray, director of the casino. 
Do any of you know this poor man? I am his wife. Is he? Is he dead? I am. I am afraid so, madame. Let me look at him. I'm a doctor. Was your husband gambling in the casino tonight, madame? Yeah, he was. Poor Heinrich. He lost everything that we have. I'm afraid he is dead, madam. Shot through the heart. Oh, to leave a cut. Suicide, Watson? Yeah, looks like it. Mm. Yes. Powder burn on the shirt front. Revolver clutched in the right hand. Fingers in a natural position. The angle of the wound settles it. Obviously self-inflicted. I missed you as you slipped out of the casino. What's wrong with him? I'm afraid he's dead, Mr. Gilbert. Yes, he committed suicide. I hope, young man, that you are satisfied. All night you brought him bad luck. He asked you to move away from him to change his luck, but no, you could not do it. Oh, Frau Schneemann, I'm terribly sorry, but I really don't see how you can blame me. I do blame you, and I also blame you, Monsieur Chevry. Me? But what have I done, madame? Why do you let a man lose all his money at your tables? Is life so cheap to you, and money so important that you cannot close the tables to someone before he's ruined? Madame, I am all sympathy for you in your tragic loss. But the casino cannot be responsible. If your husband could not afford to gamble, then he should not come here. How are we to know the financial limitations of our, of our customers? You said your husband lost everything you had tonight, madame. Yeah, everything. Then how do you account for this sheaf of banknotes in his breast pocket? Good Lord, must be several thousand francs, sir. Then he wasn't ruined. And his suicide, therefore, cannot be blamed on his losses at my casino, madame. How do you account for this money, Frau Schneemann? Well, I do not understand. Heinrich kept nothing from me. I know that he had not so much money on him when he started tonight. Uh, uh, well, why do you all look at me like that? Is it that you think? You think... Quick, why not you spend it? I've got it. Please, let's get her to her room. You can take her to my suite in the casino. No, let's take her to the hotel. My wife will look after her. Poor woman, she's had a dreadful shock. She can probably do with another woman's company. It's very considerate of you, Mr. Gilbert. Where are you staying? At the Hotel Creon. It's quite near here. I'll get a cabin. While I'm doing that, Watson, see if you can revive her, will you? Then we'll take her to the Hotel Creon. Kind of you, Mrs. Gilbert, to let us bring the poor lady into your suite. Well, it's the least I can do, in spite of what she said about Roger bringing her husband bad luck. Oh, I'm sure she'll need your help when she wakes up, Helen. Yes, I think you'll find that she'll sleep for some hours. I gave her a strong sedative. Well, we were just about to have a drink, gentlemen. Do you care to join us? Oh, thank you, sir. Well, that'll be very nice, Mr. Gilbert. Roger was just telling me that quite a large sum of money was found on Herr Shaman's body, Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes, Mrs. Gilbert. Several thousand francs. It's very puzzling, Holmes. Why should a man commit suicide with so much money on him? I think the answer is obvious. He didn't. What on earth do you mean? Well, the money was placed there after he had shot himself. The bank notes were in his breast pocket, if you remember. Not the usual place to carry money. Though it is the easiest pocket for someone to insert it without disturbing the body. But why on earth should someone place money on it after his suicide? To prevent the casino from getting a bad name, I've heard of it being done on several similar occasions. Gives the impression that the unfortunate victim had other motives than gambling losses to a country suicide. Wait, Scott, you mean that one of the casino employees found the body lying there and slipped the money in his breast pocket before we arrived on the sea? As you know, my dear Watson, I'm not a gambling man, but I'll lay you a hundred to one. That is what happened. Well, that's a new one. Well, here are your drink, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Say, Helen, Mr. Holmes has given me a brainwave. Another one? What is it this time, Roger? Now, I've been losing very heavily tonight. Roger, no. I've told you. If you need money, I'll be only... But I don't. I've got a scheme for making some. Oh. I'm going to gamble again tonight after dinner. If I lose, here's what I'll do. I'll stain my shirt front with red ink. Walk out in the grounds, fire a shot, and lie down as though I'm dead. I'll wait for someone to come along and stuff my pockets full of banknotes. <laughs> not, not a bad idea, Mr. Gilbert. I think it's a darn good one. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Well, it's a whimsical one at any rate. Who knows? You might even be successful. Roger, you're not really going to do it, are you? Sure. Perhaps I'll get some of my losses back that way. <laughs> well, let's drink to it, gentlemen. At least I may have hit upon an idea of making money. <laughs> Dear Watson, you'll have to work hard at your practice when you get back to England. 
Your infallible system appears to be extremely fallible. And yet the fellow who told me about it said it couldn't miss. It's just a matter of doubling mistakes each time you lose, oh, and then... Oh, my dear fellow, I've been studying your system, but I can tell you a really infallible way of making money at roulette. You can? What is it? Well... Own the gambling house and operate the tables yourself. The odds would be all in your favor. Oh, what a brilliant suggestion. Own the gambling house and operate the tables. Not gambling for tonight, Watson? It's nearly 11 o'clock. No, yeah, I think so. Let's take a stroll around the other table, shall we? By the way, old fellow, the young American, Mr. Gilbert, was losing heavily again tonight. He was? I wonder if he'll try that trick that he threatened. The one with the red ink. The shot in the night. I shouldn't be at all surprised. As a matter of uh, interest, I saw him leave the tables about half an hour ago. Shh, shh, shh. Here comes his wife on the arm of Monsieur Chevrolet, the director of the casino. Good evening, Mrs. Gilbert. Monsieur? Bonsoir, monsieur. Hello, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Monsieur Chevrolet is giving me a personally conducted tour of the casino. It's quite fascinating. And uh, it is quite fascinating for me to have so beautiful a woman on my arm, mademoiselle. <laughs> I know that I am the envy of all the men in the room. Oh, stop <laughs> flattering me so much. I'm not used to it. Mrs. Gilbert, how is, um, Frau Schneemann? She seems much better. She wakened an hour ago and insisted on going back to her own room. I wanted her to spend the night with us in our suite, but she wouldn't hear uh, of I it. I think I should drop in and see her before I go to bed. Oh, you have finished the gambling for tonight, perhaps, Doctor? Uh, no, perhaps about it, Monsieur Chevry. I've had a bad run at the tables. Oh, I am so sorry. Has anyone seen Roger? He left the tables about half an hour ago, Mrs. Gilbert. After doing as I did and losing quite heavily. So he lost again, did he? I wonder if he'll try that uh, new system he was talking about. <laughs> we were just discussing that possibility ourselves, Mrs. Gilbert. Mrs. Gilbert! Mrs. Gilbert! Frau Schneemann, you shouldn't have left your tell you now. It is too late to worry for me, Herr Doctor. It is for Mrs. Gilbert now that you should worry. What do you mean, madam? Well, I went back just now to where poor Henrik died. And there, lying in the grass, I saw another body. I was too shocked to go too close. But I am quite sure that I recognize your husband, Mrs. Gilbert. Oh, Dr. Watson, she's ruined Roger's trick. And he'll have taken fright and bolted by the time we get there. Watson, maybe let's go at once and find out, shall we? <laughs> he, he hasn't gone. He's, he's still lying there. It's a most convincing spectacle. That red ink really does look like blood. Yes. And blood sometimes looks like red ink. Mr. Gilbert. Roger, get up. The joke's spoiled. Roger, get up. I'm afraid that's impossible, Mrs. Gilbert. He's dead. Dr. Watson's story will be continued in just a second, which is all the time I need to tell you that the easiest way I know to transform a simple meal into a feast is to serve that meal together with Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a delicate white wine. It's the perfect companion for chicken or turkey. Turkey. Ah, yes. Turkey and Petri Sauterne. That's the heart of any Thanksgiving dinner. Look, why not make this Thanksgiving dinner the best one you ever had? Give it the air of a banquet. Serve it with Petri Sauterne. And when you buy that Sauterne or any wine for your Thanksgiving dinner, whatever you do... Look for the letters P-E-T-R-I, because a Petri wine is always a good wine. Well, Doctor, so the young American's joke turned out to be another tragedy. Yes, Mr. Bartell, the poor fellow was lying there dead with a bullet wound in the heart and a great splash of blood staining the whiteness of his shirt front. What happened next? Monsieur Chevry, director of the casino, took the distraught widow away from the scene while Holmes and I examined the body closely. Within a few minutes, we were joined by Inspector... Uh, Ganivé of the French police. As we stood there in the moonlight, the sounds of music could be heard from the casino. It was hard to believe that two men had died in that lovely garden since the moon had risen. Monsieur Holmes, you and Dr. Watson have concluded your examination. Yes, Inspector Ganivet. You favor me with your observations. You say that you are certain that this is not another suicide? I'm sure of it, Inspector. Look at the wound. The bullet entered the body at a direct right angle, whereas a self-inflicted shot is always fired obliquely. Yes, that is so. Then uh, you suggest that this man was shot from above as he lay on the ground pretending to be dead. I'm convinced of it. Why, Monsieur Holmes? Well, for two reasons. 
Though it's impossible to be sure without a laboratory test, I'm certain that beneath those blood stains are stains of red ink. Look for yourself, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed it does look like it. What is your other reason for being certain that this man was shot as he lay here pretending death? I'll show him the banknotes, Watson. Uh, here you are, Inspector. We found them stuffed in his breast pocket. So, notes with a bullet hole through the middle of them. Very illuminating. Uh, tell me, gentlemen, how many people knew of this, uh, this little plot you have told me about? This plan of the dead man's to pretend to be shot? Just three people, Inspector. Dr. Watson, myself, and Mrs. Gilbert. Hello, then the answer is obvious. You and your friend are innocent. It must be the wife who killed him. No one else knew of the plot. Mm, I'm not so sure of that. Frau Schneemann, the dead German's widow, was in the next room when Gilbert told us about his plan. She might have heard, though I could swear that she was asleep. I gave her a very strong sleeping draft. From what you have told me of her husband's suicide, she might easily have had a motive for murdering this oh, man. Oh, come, 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 gentlemen. Surely it's obvious who murdered Mr. Gilbert? Who, Monsieur Holmes? Well, it's certainly one of the two widows. Since there seems to be some doubt in your minds, I suggest we return to the casino. I can promise you the answer to your question within a very few minutes. <laughs> Well, Monsieur Chevrolet, now that we're all assembled in your office, I shall sit down quietly and let Inspector Ganivet conduct his examination. No, 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 Monsieur Holmes. No, you have handled the case so far. Please to con continue it to the end. Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I should appreciate it. <laughs> and we have it at your signal. Very well, gentlemen. It won't take me long. Frau Schneemann. Ja, Herr Holmes. Uh, what time did you leave your hotel tonight? Well, I do not know what time it was. Well, what made you leave it? Uh, I could not sleep. I knew that they had taken poor Heinrich's body away, but I felt that I must walk back there. It was the last place I saw him alive. How close did you come to Mr. Gilbert's body when you saw it lying there? Oh, close enough to see who it was. Then I ran into the casino to tell his wife I knew what had happened. How did you know? You, you uh, didn't come close to the body. I could tell by every line of the body as it lay there. I could tell because I knew that poor Heinrich's death would not be avenged. Thank you, Frau That will be all you may go. Monsieur Holmes, she has no alibi. Surely you should stop her. If I'm to conduct this investigation, I must do it my own way. Pardon, Monsieur Holmes. Please continue. Uh, you may go, Frau Schneemann. Mrs. Gilbert? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Where were you prior to our meeting in the casino tonight, just before we discovered your husband's body? After I left the hotel, I walked over here along the seafront. Can anyone verify that statement? I suppose not. I didn't meet anyone that I knew. And what did you do when you arrived at the casino? I played a little chemin de fer. A few months later, Monsieur Chevrolet came over to the table and asked if he might escort me over the club. Ten minutes after that, we walked into you and Dr. Watson. That is quite true, Monsieur Holmes. I can swear to it. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert. I'm sorry to distress you with these questions. You may go. I'll wait outside, Mr. Holmes. I must know what happened. Wait for me there, madame. I shall join you in a few minutes and escort you home. Ah, well, another suspect with a poor alibi, alibi eh, hey, Gallivet? I must say, Monsieur Holmes, your methods puzzle me. It seems to me that both those women should be watched. Yes, I agree with the inspector, Holmes. Please don't worry, inspector. I've asked two of your plain clothes men to keep an eye on the ladies. And now, Monsieur Chevray, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Ask me any questions you wish, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. You will agree that it is the custom of the casino to put money on the bodies of suicides after their death. To give the impression that gambling uh, gambling losses were not responsible for the tragedy. Well, I, I, I do not think... Oh, come now, Chevrolet. I know that is a fact as well as you do. Exactly. Now, on those rather gruesome occasions, whose responsibility is it to secrete the money? Yours? Or do you entrust the matter to an underling? I do it myself. I see. Did you place the money on Herr Schneemann tonight? Yes, monsieur, I did. And did you also perform the same service on the body of Mr. Gilbert? No. I knew nothing of that death until a German lady, Frau Schneemann, running into the casino. Excuse me, interrupting, Monsieur. Uh, of course, Inspector. What is it? I think that you are wasting time. It is obvious that Madame Gilbert committed the crime. She knew of her husband's plot. She had no alibi, and she had the motive. For is not uh, <laughs> marriage itself the greatest of all motives for murder? Oh, my dear Inspector. How very cynical. Madame Gilbert did not kill her husband. I know it. And what is your opinion, Watson? Well, said German woman. She had no alibi either. And remember, she was half mad with, with grief. Mr. Chevrolet, you say that you know Mrs. Gilbert is not guilty. How do you know? I was with her myself at the time the murder was committed. Oh, indeed. How very interesting. 
And what time was the murder committed? Well, it, it was... It, it was... Our investigations have never established what time the murder was committed, Monsieur Chevrolet. I'm afraid you've walked into my trap. You've given yourself away. Great Scott Chevrolet, it was you. Chevrolet, I've known you a good many years, and this is going to be a hard thing to do. I am going to arrest you. Oh, no, you are not, Chevrolet. Put down that revolver, sir. Do not be frightened, Doctor. I am not going to shoot you. Chevrolet, why did you murder Roger Gilbert tonight? Surely you know that too, Monsieur Holmes. Because I am in love with his wife. She's young, beautiful, and rich. It did not occur to me until I saw the young fool lying there tonight pretending to be dead. In my profession, it is natural that I should carry a revolver. What was simpler? Mr. Gilbert gave me the perfect opportunity. I, I could not resist it. Put down that revolver, Chevrolet. Why are you all so frightened? Surely you know how I am going to use it this time. I think so, monsieur. But it's a coward's way out. What an unreceptive remark for such a perceptive man. No. No, all my life I have been a gambler. I gambled tonight. For the highest stakes of all, and... And I lost. No. No, I'm not afraid to pay for my losses. Au revoir, monsieur! <laughs> Case, Holmes. I never suspected Chevrolet. And I, old chap, suspected him from the beginning. Well, I wasn't the only one who was stupid anyway. Inspector Ganivet thought it was the wife. True. Very puzzling conclusion for a detective inspector to arrive at. Well, it seemed logical enough to me at the no, time. No, 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 my dear Watson. Cold logic should have told you otherwise. Roger Gilbert had been losing heavily and had planned this hoax. He obviously had no money on him. Therefore, the money was planted in his pocket by Chevrolet. After he shot him? No, my dear fellow. Before. Before? The bullet hole through the banknotes provided that. Now, uh, had the money been put there innocently, Gilbert would have, um, well, you know, come back to life as soon as the person placing it there had left. He would not have remained lying on the ground for a murderer to find him. And Chevrolet must have bent over him as he lay there, placed the money in his breast pocket, and then fired. Uh, precisely, Watson. Well, Holmes, I must say you solved it very neatly. You've told Inspector... Ganivet, that you wanted no credit in the case. Naturally, uh, publicity would be unfavorable. If you remember, no one is supposed to know that we're in the South of France. <laughs> I'm certain that the inspector learned a few tips about detection tonight. Possibly, old fellow. <laughs> and I hope that uh, you have learned a few about gambling. How do you mean, Holmes? Huh? Well, you're backing the wrong color. Hmm? A gambler is usually superstitious, and superstition... Well, I should have told you what color to follow tonight. I still don't understand you, Holmes. I was playing number ten. Exactly. Number ten is black. You should have followed a red color tonight, old fellow. The color of red ink. Red ink. And blood. Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. I didn't know you liked to play roulette. Well, you know, I, I figured out a system for roulette. It's like yours. Uh, every time you lose, you double your money and keep doubling until you win. Oh, it's a great system, Mr. Bartell. There's only one thing wrong with it. What's that? You lose, you go broke before you win. <laughs> look, look, look. Take, take my advice. Don't gamble. You can't beat the laws of chance. Uh, but suppose I bet on a sure thing. Like what, for instance? Oh, like the fact that Petri wine is always good wine. It is, you know. Because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been hanging down from father to son, from father to son, the art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. Ever since the Petri family started their business way back in the 1800s, they've been perfecting the art of winemaking. That's why Petri wine is always good wine. The Petri family took time to bring you good wine. So no matter what type of wine you prefer... Why not take a few seconds of your time to look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell delicious wine, Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had when we were in Stratford-on-Avon many years ago. It concerns an actor, a mysterious boating accident, 
and several dead butterflies. It sounds good, Doctor. I'll see you then. Oh, fine, but now, now, don't forget next week we're going to broadcast our program from the Paramount Theatre in Hollywood for the Victory Loan Drive. So if any of our friends are going to be in Hollywood, we'd love to see them there. Just buy a Victory Bond at any store or bank on Hollywood Boulevard, and in return, you will be given your ticket of admission. Better hurry up, though, before all the seats are gone. Let's really buy lots of those Victory Bonds. Let's finish the job. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Jimmy Wells? Yeah. Well, it took me a long time, but I finally did it. Did what? Found you. I'm Boston Blackie. So what? So, for the first time in the last few days, you're safe. Unless I have the wrong Jimmy Wells. Is your wife's name Dorothy? Yeah. Do you live at 2100 Leslie Boulevard? Uh-huh. And you're a salesman? That's right. Then you're the Jimmy Wells I want. I don't know what for. For protection, Wells. Your protection. What? I got a tip from unhealthy sources that you're going to be killed. Oh, then they're serious about it, huh? They mean business, Wells. With a business end of a gun. But you don't have to worry now. I'll take care of you and them, too. You will, huh? Yes. Get lost, Blackie. You don't seem to understand. They're going to kill you. You don't seem to understand. That's exactly what I want. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Look, Wells, I didn't spend 48 hours looking for you just to hear you say that you... you want to be killed. Well, you heard me say it, Blackie. I've heard other bad jokes, too. Oh, this isn't a joke. What is it? New brand of humor? I'm dead serious, Blackie. Dead serious, huh? Well, if you are, you're going to be dead, period. That's exactly what I want to be. I'd like to ask you why, but I'm not going to. I'm afraid of the answer. Look, let's stop this kidding before I begin to think that I'm crazy, too. You are crazy if you think I'm going to let you protect me. Well, if that's the way you feel about it, I'm crazy if I try. So long, Wells. It was weird knowing you. Goodbye, Blackie. I'll be... uh... I know exactly what you'll be if I don't help you, Wells. Dead. But I don't think you really believe that. Oh, yes, I do. I know it's going to kill me, too. Who? (laughs) You don't think I'm stupid enough to tell you, do you? You stop them. That does it, Wells. It does what? That convinces me you're really serious about wanting to be killed. I was wondering how long it would take you to realize that. Well, I know it now. But what you don't know is you're going to get protection whether you like it or not. Oh. (laughs) I'm afraid I had to knock you out so your killers, when they come calling, wouldn't find you in. Come in. Hello, Faraday. Oh, hello, Sergeant Wilson. Where's the inspector? Home, Blackie. At least I think he is. Let me go. 
Come on in, uh, you. Who's your groggy-looking friend? Oh, look, will you let His me His name is Jimmy Wells, and I want you to keep him under lock and key. What's he done, Blackie? Nothing, except he wants to make like a victim. Huh? Let me out of here. I want him to kill me, you understand? Why don't you let me alone? You've got no right to hold me here. Well, now, what do you know about that? I don't know anything about it, Sergeant, except he's been marked for execution by the underworld, and he's as happy about it as if he were in his right mind. He's really been put on the spot, eh? For a rub-out, Sergeant. You better give him a nice, safe cell until I can get in touch with Faraday and find out what to do next. Well, I don't know, Blackie. Maybe I can... Uh, hold him in the next room. I'll answer that. Maybe Faraday. Okay, come on, Wells. You can Hold me. I'm on and shut up with you. Goodbye, Sergeant. Hello. Hello? Oh, hello, Faraday, old pal. This is Blackie. Now, this is all I need. Goodbye. Oh, don't say goodbye, Faraday. You can take more of me than this. What's the matter? Hmm? Why aren't you at your office today? Now, why are you in my office? It's none of your business why I'm not there. Where's Wilson? He's in the next room. Look. I picked up a guy named Jimmy Wells who's trying to get himself knocked off by an underworld mob. How do you know? I got a tip through my usual, unusual sources. This guy, Wells, doesn't want help, but we'd better give him protection before they give him the works. Yeah, what do you want me to do about it? Just want you to know that I want him locked up. No, you can't put that guy behind bars unless he asks for it. But hold him for a few minutes. I'll see what can be done. Okay. I was afraid when you weren't here that you might be sick. I am sick. Of you. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> hey, Wilson, come on in here. Blakey, I... Hi, I just talked to... Hey, Wilson, where'd you get that swollen eye? That guy Wells gave it to me, Blakey. I got a black eye and he got away. <laughs> Dorothy Wells? Yes, I am. I'm Walter Branch. May I come in? Why? I... Let's make up our mind for her, huh, Mr. Branch? I'm sure we're welcome, Tommy. We'll take up only a few minutes of your time, Mrs. Wells. Close the door, Tommy. Sure, Mr. Branch. Is your husband at home, Mrs. Wells? No, he's not. Do you know where he is? No, I don't. You're sure he isn't in hiding somewhere in this house? No. I don't know where he is. And even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. I know why you want to see him. You want to kill him. Oh, now, how can you say a thing like that, Mrs. Wells? Because you do want to kill him. That's what you're looking for, him. You and this this gunman of yours. I go everywhere Mr. Branch goes, Mrs. Wells. And all Tommy and I want to do is talk to your husband. Are you sure we don't know where we can uh, get in touch with him? I hope you never find him. Because I know what you'll do to him. Well, you do us an injustice, Mrs. Wells. All we want to do is talk uh, business with your husband. But uh, since he isn't he here... He isn't here. Now, will you leave, both of you? I guess the lady doesn't want us here, Mr. Branch. Obviously not, Tommy. Mrs. Wells, when you see your husband, tell him we're sorry he wasn't at home when we came to call. For if he'd been here, it would have saved a lot of trouble for everyone concerned. Uh, you keep an eye on that side of the street, Mary, and I'll do my best to watch this side. Well, don't you think you better watch where you're driving, Blackie? This isn't a country road. I'm watching, but if we do run into somebody, I hope it's Wells. We've been looking for him for three hours. Well, this is the neighborhood where he hangs out. This can go on forever. It's only going to seem that long. Well, maybe we'd better give up. And sign Mr. Wells' death warrant? Oh, that doesn't sound like you. Well, Wells has a wife who might give us some information. That sounds like a shortcut to finding him. Or better still, maybe she knows who's trying to kill him. Well, that sounds like a much better way to keep Mr. Wells from being killed. Never mind finding him. Find his would-be killer. That brilliant piece of strategy has just occurred to me, too, Mary. Uh Uh-oh. It just occurred to me I'm supposed to meet the superintendent of my building at my apartment. It's about redecorating. Well, I'll drop you off at your building and then go to see Mrs. Wells. Okay. Well, I hope she can tell you something. You know what she might tell me, Mary? What? That her husband is already dead. Blackie, I'm Dorothy Wells, Jim's wife. But I haven't seen him or heard from him since yesterday. Well, I saw him, Mrs. Wells. You did? 
But maybe I've seen him the last time. I know what you mean. He's going to be killed, isn't he? That's what I hear. And from people who usually know what they're talking about. Tell me something, Mrs. Wells. Why does your husband want to die? I don't know. Does he carry a large insurance policy? No, a very small one. As far as I know. I see. Then if he dies, he doesn't make you a rich woman, huh? No. Only an unhappy one, Blackie. Jim and I have had a wonderful life together. Even during all the months he's been gambling. Gambling and losing? Yes, and heavily. Losing and not paying? He hasn't been able to. We're not poor, but we're not rich, and Jim has lost thousands. I think you're telling me something that I want to know. Do you know whom he owes this money to? Yes, a man named Walter Branch. He's been here looking for Jim. And Blackie, I'd heard Jim talking on the phone to Mr. Branch a couple of nights ago and threatening to go to the police about something if he had to pay his debts. Uh Uh-huh. I think it was about marked cards or crooked gambling of some kind. Something like that. Mrs. Wells, Walter Branch is looking for your husband, and I'm going out on a limb because I'm going to look for Branch. Faraday, your ears aren't ringing. That's your phone. I know it, Blackie. Yes? Inspector? Yes? We checked the files on Walter Branch. Huh? We broke up his last gambling joint on Lawrence Place six months ago. But there's a rumor he's opened up again in a house at 23 Maple Road. Thanks, Wilson. Thanks a lot. Yes, sir. Blackie, we have a tip. Branch is running a gambling joint at 23 Maple Road. Your department's really clicking, huh? Well, let's go see him. This isn't homicide, Blackie. It's out of my field. And it's going to be homicide if Branch gets to Wells before we get to Branch. What would you rather do? Solve a murder or prevent one? You know the answer to that. Come on, I'm ready. Wait, I'm not. I think I'd better phone Mary and tell her that I might be a little late for our date tonight. For the first time, huh? <laughs> when was the last time you met Miss Wesley when you said you would? I don't know. My memory doesn't go back that far. Yeah, if you thought it'd make trouble for me, you'd be late to your own funeral. <laughs> of course, Faraday. I'd be the late Boston Blackie. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, the more time you waste on that phone, the more time Branch has to get to Wells. Unless this is all a gag of yours. It's not a gag, Faraday. Except that Branch wants to gag Wells permanently. Why Mary doesn't answer. And maybe she's like me. She doesn't like to talk to you. Oh, there's no one like you, Faraday. You're the eighth wonder of the world. Oh. And speaking of wonders, I wonder where Mary is. She's certainly not at home. Come in. Oh, a message for you, Inspector Faraday. Oh, thanks, Wilson. Well, no use letting this phone ring anymore. What is this, Wilson? Where'd you get it? A man brought it to the desk a minute ago. Said some guy gave it to him and told him to deliver it to you. Oh. Oh. Looks like a letter, Faraday. Getting fan mail? Yeah, ever since I started the Down with Boston Blackie Club. (laughs) Hey, look who signed this note, Jim Wells. I can't read the note the way you're holding it. What's it say, Inspector Faraday? What's it say, Sergeant? Look, it says, Inspector Faraday, leave me alone. Don't try to protect me. Because I have Mary Wesley in a hideout. And if the police or Boston Blackie come near me, she'll be killed. What? Then maybe I'll die in the electric chair. But at least I'll be able to die. Now, back to Boston Blackie. Jim Wells has been put on the spot by gamblers who apparently have reason to kill him. Boston Blackie and the police offer to protect the doomed man, but he refuses help and escapes. While Blackie is searching for his would-be killers, Wells abducts Blackie's friend, Mary Wesley, and threatens to kill her and go to the chair for murder if any attempt is made to escort her. As we return to our story, Wells walks into a room where Mary is gagged and tied to a chair. Well, Miss Wesley, if I take that gag off your mouth, will you promise me not to scream? Mm-hmm. All right, all right. I'll see if you can be trusted. <laughs> yeah. At least that must be more comfortable, huh? Yes. Yes, it is. Who are you? Well... Is my name Jim Wells? 
You're the man, Blackie, and I've been looking for. Uh Uh-huh, but you didn't find me because I was waiting for you at your apartment. But why? And why kidnap me and tie me up? That's protection, Miss Wesley. Protection against protection. Well, you won't have much protection against anything when Blackie finds me here. Oh, I don't think he wants to find you, Miss Wesley, because if he does, he'll find you dead. Dead? Very. You see, I want to die, and I don't want Blackie or the police to interfere. Oh, Oh, I'm not crazy, Miss Wesley. You see, I have a reason for wanting to die. And uh, I'll murder you to do it if I have to. Your only hope is that I don't have to. Are you comfortable? Oh, very comfortable. These ropes aren't cutting into my wrist more than an inch or two. If your friend Blackie shows up, something else will be cutting your throat. Couldn't you think of some more unpleasant way to kill me? I've already thought of it, Miss Wesley. Cutting your throat was merely an expression. Oh. Didn't you wonder what I'd been fixing up with the door there? No, I've been too busy wondering about you. Well, let me tell you what I've done. I've tied a rifle to the table there. And I ran a string from the trigger to the door. Oh. Ah, you begin to see, do you? The string is tied to the doorknob. And the door opens out. When the door is open, the string will be pulled tight. <laughs> and the gun will fire. Fine. But you don't think I'm going to sit right here in this spot? Oh, I forgot to tell you, Miss Wesley. Oh. The chair you're sitting in is fastened to the floor. You think of everything, don't you? You're so clever, Mr. Wells. Well, if I hear voices outside... I hope I forgot to tell you. Then I'm putting a gag back over your mouth. There. Good night. Goodbye, Miss Wesley. I'm going out the back way. And uh, if I don't die at the hands of the killers pretty soon... You'll die at the hands of Boston Blackie when he opens that door. You'd better step aside, Faraday. I want to get this visit to Branch over with so I can go find Mary. Branch and his men probably know a cop when they see one. You think they don't know you too, Blackie? Well, they might let me in if they think I'm alone. I hope that note you got threatening Mary was a gag. Believe me, I hope that. Uh Uh-oh. Someone's coming. Duck to one side. I'll stay on this side so I can give you a hand if we have to shove our way in. Yeah? I'd like to see Walter Branch. Who are you? Just a guy from out of town looking for some action. And you won't find it here. The boys said I would. What boys? Just the boys. Let me in. Just a minute. Come on in. But no funny stuff, because I got a gun on you. No, no funny stuff. But I'm bringing a funny friend. Come on in, Faraday. <laughs> no, you don't. Well, you bet. <clears throat> We're in, Faraday. And he's out. Yeah, but what are we in for? This guy's not uh, alone. And he's not out anymore, right? He's coming, uh, too. He's taking us to Branch, huh? If he doesn't, I'll use a little more persuasion. Get up, you went fast. What's with you? What do you want? We want to see Branch. What for? We'll tell that to him. Come on, take us in to see him. Okay, this way. And this better be the right way, too. These guys are as meek as babies when you take their guns away from them, Blanky, huh? This is the boss's office right here. It better be. Come in. A couple of guys to see you, Mr. Branch. To see me? Well, come in, gentlemen. Come in. Thanks, Kay. Guns? What's the meaning of guns? We had to use pistols instead of passes, Branch. This is Inspector Faraday, and I'm Boston Blackie. Hello, Inspector Faraday. Oh, uh, sit down. Tommy, that'll be all. Sure, Mr. Branch. You may put your guns away, gentlemen. I'm not armed. But your assistants are. We'll play safe. As you wish. Uh, To what do I owe the doubtful honor of this visit? You ought to know why we're here. It's about Jim Wells. Oh, well. Now, don't say you've never heard of him. No, I know the man well, very well. Mm, So well, you want to kill him, don't you? I have every reason in the world to want him dead, Inspector Faraday, but I don't believe in murder. The uh, consequences to the killer are equally fatal. I have no intention whatsoever of having Wells eliminated. Though, believe me, I'd be quite elated if he'd 
drop dead. <laughs> Boston Blackie's apartment. Yes, and this is Blackie. Hello, Blackie. This is Jim Wells. Wells, where's Mary? Don't get excited, coming... Blackie. She's all right. In fact, I phoned to tell you where she is so you can go get her. Where is she? She's waiting for you in the living room of a house on Cherry Street, number 10 Cherry Street. Number 10 Cherry Street, huh? Yeah. Why are you telling me this? Well, she's a friend of yours. You probably was worried about her. I sure am. And if anything's happened to her, Wells, you really better go out and get yourself killed. Well, if the boys were right about it, Mr. Branch, Wells is in this house here. This is number 10 Cherry Street. Let's go up and have a look, Tommy. Sure. I'll get out on your side. Okay. Your gun ready? Always ready, Mr. Branch. Anyhow, Wells doesn't carry a rod. Well, have yours handy just the same. We don't want to take any chances. Okay. Hey, looks like there's a note tacked up on the front door. It is a note. I guess Wells knows he was spotted here and it's scrammed, huh? The note isn't signed, Tommy, but look what it says. Well, I'll be a... It says, don't open this door, Blackie, or you'll kill Mary Wesley. Now, how about that? <laughs> I hope I fist. <laughs> hey, Mr. Branch, aren't you going to leave that out there for Blackie? Why should I? Well, Mr. Branch, if Blackie comes here and opens this door, he'll kill it. That's exactly what I want him to do, Tommy. And that's what he'll do. Exactly. <laughs> Who's there? Me, Tommy. Jimmy Wells. Okay, open. Hello, Tommy. Hi, Wells. Come on in. Thanks. Well, everything all set? What do you mean, all set, Wells? You mean about me killing you on orders from Mr. Branch? <laughs> oh, brother, what a setup. <laughs> Everybody in town has an idea I want to die. <laughs> you got instructions to kill me, and you're going to be paid to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> what nobody knows is that it's somebody else's body you're going to show Branch while uh, I fade out of town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds good to you, huh? Only way I know how to beat that Branch guy. He'd get me no matter what protection I had or how long he had to wait or where I ran away to Lucky I found out you was working for him and that you'd listen to reason. And, uh, dough. Sure. Lucky for you. Well, we better make this good, huh? Yeah. Boston Blackie was on my trail, but I fixed a gimmick with the door and his girl, so he'll be hours trying to get her out without killing her. That'll keep him away until we're finished. I guess it will. You, uh, ready to go, Wells? Yeah, sure. Any... T hey, tell me that gun. Put it down. You, you and I are pals. You were going to be paid not to kill me. I was supposed to you give you... You said you was ready to go, didn't you? Oh. Uh. Hi, Mr. Branch. Well, there he is. Yes, so I see. I'm delighted you came to me with Will's story about wanting to bribe you, Tommy. I'm delighted that Boston Blackie is about to open a door that will kill his girlfriend. And I'm delighted with your loyalty. Here's 10 Cherry Street, Faraday. Unless Wells was lying, Mary's in there. Come on. Okay. Hey, take it easy, Blanky. If Wells is on the level, he may be in that house waiting to take a shot at us. I don't think he's anywhere around, Faraday, because we have something to grab him on now. Let's try the front door. I have a hunch Miss Wesley isn't even here. This is just a gag of Wells to keep us away from him so he can get himself killed. You might be right, Inspector. But if Mary is here, he's accomplished the same purpose. We're going to go in there and search the house for her. Right I now. know what happens now. I have to turn my back while you genius your way through a locked door. How'd you guess? Turn around. How do you do it, Blake? Well, with locks like this, I first find a kind of a key that might open the lock. Yeah, and then? And then what I do is so tricky I can't understand it myself. Oh, uh, fine. But I can't unlock this door, Faraday. Why not? 
If you're such a genius. Because a guy doesn't have to be a genius to unlock a door that isn't locked. Very funny. Come on, let's go in. Wait a minute, Farley. If Mary's just behind this door and it isn't locked, it's because somebody wants us to open it. Well, for just once, let's do what somebody wants. Oh, no, Farley. Something tells me we'd better not. Let's work on this window here and get in that way. The shade's down so we can't see inside, but I've got a little piece of steel that'll get us inside. Stand back while I do a little prying. Well, that's you. Always prying. Hey, Blanky, look, Mary's tied to that chair. Faraday, that isn't always tied. Look at that gun and the string running to the front door. Come on in this window with me. Hold everything, Mary. The Marines have arrived. I'll take care of the string. Sit still, Mary. I'll get this gag off your mouth. There we are. Oh, Blanky. Yeah. Glad you didn't open the front door. So am I, Mary. Now all I've got to do is close this case. Who is it? Boston Blackie. Let me in, Tommy. Oh, sure, sure, Blackie. Just a minute. Come on in. Thanks. You seem almost glad to see me. Why not? I got nothing against you, neither is the boss. You want to see him? Not just now, Tommy. I think you're the man that I want to see. What for? The police just found Jim Wells' body, and he didn't drop dead. Not too bad. Who killed him, Tommy? I don't know why you ask me. But I did ask you, and I expect an answer. I expect you do. Answer me, or you'll get something you don't expect. Such as what? Such as this. <coughs> you want some more? Oh, but you do. Oh, yeah. Punk. Oh. Well, I knocked you out, Tommy. Again. Now, maybe, when you wake up, you'll feel like telling me who knocked Wells off. <laughs> Yeah, Inspector Faraday, I killed Wells. I had to when Mr. Branch walked in a room. What do you mean you had to, Tommy? I think he means he was hired to do the job, and Branch is the one who hired him. It's a good thing we grabbed Branch, too. That's right, Blackie. But Wells made a deal with me. He gave me a lot of dough, and we were going to fix it so it looked like he got knocked off. Well, that explains why Wells was so unconcerned about being killed and why he didn't want protection. He was going to disappear with everybody thinking he was dead. Yeah, but it doesn't explain why he put Miss Wesley in a spot where she might have been killed. I can set you straight on that, Inspector Faraday. Wells left a note on her door warning Blackie not to open it. But Mr. Branch took the note and tore it up. He wanted Blackie to open that door and kill Mary Wesley. He did, did he? Well, after the way you talk, Faraday is about to open a door for him. A little green door. In the death house at State Prison. <laughs> I can't understand it. A man with your talents, your brilliance, to do the things you've done. I don't expect you to understand. Perhaps the usual and honest ways of making money are too dull for me and too slow. Making money? Kit, don't you realize you've been stealing? You know my motto by now. Never give a sucker an even break, because if you don't take him, somebody else will. <laughs> In the interest of good citizenship and law enforcement, we present Crime Does Not Pay, based on the famous Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer series of short subjects. In just a moment, you will hear All-American Fake, starring Sidney Blackmer. Does Not Pay, starring Sidney Blackmer as Taylor Dunn, alias Kit Marlowe, in All-American Fake. Each year, each passing season brings to Americans a new crop of heroes. For some reason best known to ourselves, Americans love to honor the young men and women who swim better than all the others 
hit a tennis ball harder or a baseball farther, or make more touchdowns than anybody else. These are our native heroes. Taylor Gunn was well aware of this. He was aware, too, that Americans hate to admit that they've been taken for a ride or outsmarted at anything. And Taylor Gunn was well aware that he had a remarkable physical resemblance to a well-known American hero. These three facts were a combination which helped Mr. Dunn immeasurably in his business. Boy, oh boy, a real garrison finish. Now, how many seconds left to play? Fifty, the announcer said. But I'll never understand why they take time out of the moment like this. Yeah. Seems to me with second down and goal to go, a team would keep hammering until they put the ball over. It's quite simple, ragged old man. This is the point where the quarterback wants help from the coach. So they call a timeout, and a substitute comes in with instructions. <laughs> that sure builds up my blood pressure. <laughs> what a spot for a coach. Field goal would be easy. You just tie the score. Touchdown and win. But State's line may hold it. Here comes Weston out of We'll go in a minute. Mr. Oh, I hope it's a line buck off tackle. They'll try that now and kick it. They have to on fourth down. Oh, Weston better do something fast. We will. Weston's out of the huddle. All right. On my back. What am I? He has it. Got his state through. Comes up a hole up tackle. Yeah. Oh, what am I going? He's all over. Brother, how do you like that? Eh? Yeah, they should have used that power play in the first place. Uh, hey, you, you know what you're talking about, don't you, Marlowe? Well, yes. Now, in my day at Weston... Hey, are you Marlowe? Kit Marlowe? Well, that's my name. Back Kit Marlowe? Well, I confess I Well, am. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> well, 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 wait till I tell my boy I belong to the same club as Kit Marlowe of Western University's Rough Riders. Oh, you think it'll mean anything to the new generation? Oh, <laughs> mean anything. Listen to the man. He doesn't know he's immortal. Oh, yeah. Man, I saw you make that 70-yard run against State in your last game. Never forget it as long as I live. I'm proud to know you, Marlowe. I'm doggone proud. Yeah. Oh, thank you, gentlemen. But, well, I guess those days are gone forever as far as I'm concerned. Oh. <laughs> I'm strictly a businessman now. Uh, 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 if I'm not too uh, inquisitive, Marlowe, what is your line? I guess you'd call it, well, promotion. Sales promotion in a way with a touch of jobbing in it. Uh, any particular line? Well, right now, office supplies, you know, stationary pencils, rubber bands, that sort of thing. Uh, any uh, real money in that? There can be. You won't believe this, gentlemen, but right now, my problem is rubber bands. Oh, you you mean you can't get any? Oh, just the opposite. I could if I could finance the deal. Are you mind explaining that? Oh, not at all. I know where I can buy a car load at 68 cents a pound. Normally, they cost 78. And I've got a customer who will pay a dollar and a quarter a pound. Uh, that's not a bad margin, Marlowe. Well, why don't you swing the deal? It's a cash operation. I've got to pay cash for the bands in the first place, and unfortunately, all my ready cash is tied up in <laughs> typewriters of all things. <laughs> How much do you need, kid old boy? Two thousand. No, but I wouldn't I think just of... hold it, my boy. Hold it. This is strictly business. I'll write a check for a thousand. If McDonald here will do the same thing. Well, <laughs> for a cut of your profit. Oh, but you gentlemen don't know a thing about don't know me. a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Why the whole country knows about Kid Marlowe, <laughs> and that name's good enough for me any time, any place. <laughs> Yes? Uh, I, I beg your pardon. Is, uh, is this the, uh, Marlowe apartment? Uh, Mr. Kit Marlowe? Yes, I'm Mrs. Marlowe. Uh, well, uh, my name is Davis. Uh, Leon Davis? Oh, yes, Mr. Davis. Is, uh, is your husband at home? Not right now, I'm afraid. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, can I help you? Well, uh, that is, uh, no, no, I don't think so. It's about a business deal, I... I guess only, uh, Mr. Marlowe. I think you'd better come in and sit down, Mr. Davis. Oh, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, nice place you have here, Mrs. Marlowe. Thank you. Now then, Mr. Davis. Well, I, uh, I invested uh, $275 in uh, Mr. Marlowe's stationary business. Uh, something about buying and selling rubber bands. Uh, rubber bands? Yes. Are you sure you have the right Marlowe? Well, he uh, he is uh, Kit Marlowe, the former football player, isn't he? Yes, he is. Oh, then he's the right Marlowe. I uh, I remembered him distinctly from his pictures in the papers. I uh, I saw him several times, and 
When he told me he needed cash for a quick turnover, I let him have what I had. With the understanding that I'd get back uh, $350 in one week. And now, Mr. Davis? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's been over a month, Mrs. Marlowe, and I, I haven't seen your husband since. I, I, well, I, I need that money, Mrs. Marlowe. You see, it's, it's my wife. She's, she's sick. I thought the extra 75 would help. I, I can't wait any longer. I've got to have my money. Look, Mr. Davis, if you go to his office and ask him there... I, I tried to do that, Mrs. Marlowe, but well, there isn't any Marlowe in the whole building at the address he gave me. And nobody ever heard of him ever being there. little man, Kit. I felt so sorry for him. The world is full of poor little men like that, Helen. They'll always be little and they'll always be poor. I told him I was sure he had the wrong Marlowe. After all, you've never been in the rubber band business in your life. <laughs> Did you get rid of this, uh, Miss Davis, dear? Oh, I convinced him it must be another Marlowe. Someone he only thought was a football player. Oh, he brought that up, did he? Yes, but he went away after a while. Mm, that's fine. Um, Kit. Yes, dear? He's not the only one who's been here. What? I haven't told you. I didn't want to bother you, but... Kit, they all tell the same story. They all say it was the football player. Can I help it if some, some swindler is using my name? And they all talk about recognizing you from the newspaper picture. Now, look, Helen. My face isn't so out of the ordinary that someone with a faint resemblance couldn't impersonate me. You don't think for one minute, dear, that I... I'm sorry, dear. Maybe I did doubt you for a minute. After all, we've been married nearly two years, and I've never seen your office. And I recognized you from the newspaper pictures, too. Sorry, darling. Of course not, dear. You forgive me? Without the asking. Yes? Yes, this is Marlowe. Oh, hello. What's on your alleged mind, old man? I see Glad to hear it. And the check is certified. Good. Then I can get the cash in the morning. Right. Meet you there in 20 minutes. No rest for the weary, darling. I have to go out for a little while. Don't you ever stop working, dear? Back as soon as I can. Have to see a fellow about some typewriters. Bye, darling. Bye. Oh, hello, Martha. Well, this is Helen, Helen Marlowe. I hate to bother you, but you know about these things. Uh, tell me, if a person wanted to learn the whereabouts of a famous graduate of a college, how would you go about it? Uh -huh. You write to the Alumni Association? I see. Uh huh. Well, thank you, Martha. No, no one special. I'm uh, just interested in learning the whereabouts of a football player I had a crush on a long time ago. <laughs> Yes? Mrs. Kip Marlowe? Yes, I'm Mrs. Marlowe. My name is Bill Latigan, Miss Marlowe. I'm from headquarters. My, uh, credentials. I see. May I come in? Yes, of course. Isn't this where I ask you for your warrant, Mr. Latigan? <laughs> There's nothing as drastic as that necessary, Miss Marlowe. You see, uh, you wrote a letter. I'm the answer to that letter. Oh. I think you'd better sit down, Mr. Latigan. Thank you. Now, about a letter. Yes, to the Alumni Association of Western University. You asked concerning the whereabouts of Kit Marlowe, the uh, famous Kit Marlowe, that is. Yes, so I did. How does it happen that you have the answer? Because my section at headquarters has been interested in the same problem. I'm head of the fraud squad, Mrs. Marlowe. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, go on, Mr. Ladigan. It's quite simple. The Kit Marlowe who went to Western University is still there. Teaching physical education. And any other man who says he's that Marlowe is practicing a fraud. And if he's the man we think he is, he's obtaining money under false pretenses. In less polite language, Mrs. Marlowe, 
we're pretty certain that the man you married is a confidence man and a swindler. In just a moment, Crime Does Not Pay will continue with All American Fake. We continue with Crime Does Not Pay, starring Sidney Blackmer as Taylor Dunn, alias Kit Marlowe, in All-American Fake. When Helen Marlowe recovered from the first shock of learning that her husband was literally not the man she thought he was, she took the only action which seemed possible to her. She faced her husband in their living room and stated flatly, Kit... We're through. I think you're being foolish, Helen. We've had a good life together. I believe we loved each other. Aren't you being just a trifle too squeamish? I'm married to you, and I don't even know your right name. Will it make you feel any better to call me Taylor Dunn instead of Kit Marlowe? Our marriage is perfectly legal in any case, you know. Thank you for keeping me an honest woman. Legally, at any rate. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. You seem to think you've been clever, not criminal. I don't consider it criminal. It isn't any worse than taking the sheep in the stock market, is it? People go into the market at their own risk. People go into any deal at their own risk. That's my way of looking at it. Then you won't give back the money. Why should I? Will you give me back my good name and my pride? If you insist, my dear. Of course, I'll I'll always have a soft spot for you, no matter what I'm doing or, or where I may be. Thank you again. Will you be getting out of town now? On account of your friend, Detective Lieutenant Ladigan? I doubt it. There's not a thing Ladigan can do about me until someone signs a complaint. <laughs> and no sucker wants to tell the world that he is one. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, one and all. You've met lovely Erica Stalzing, Hollywood's greatest importation from old Vienna, and that newest scribe among the syndicated scribblers, Lou Daniels. But just a moment, just a moment. There's one more guest present here tonight who I know you'll get a great kick out of seeing. Western University's most famous graduate, Kit Marlowe! Kit, Kit, come on, boy, take a bow! That's it, take a bow! <laughs> thank you, thank you, Kit. <laughs> All right, maestro, on with the dance. Marlowe, I, uh, I don't think we've ever met. No, but I know your face. How are you, Daniel? Hi, ah, good. Down. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm here by royal command. Movie royalty, that is. Well, is that so? Yes, Erica, uh, Miss Stolzing asked me to bring you over to her table. Oh, that is an honor. <laughs> Lead the way. Good. Come on along. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Erica, my dear, your wish is our law. May I present the great Kit Marlowe. This is a pleasure, Miss Dolzing. I'm so happy, Mr. Marlowe, that you would be so good to join us. My escort, Miss Elephant. Well, how do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do? Uh, please to sit down. Yes, sit down. There's so much I want to ask. Oh, you. thank you. Ask away, uh, Miss Dolzing. Thank you, pardon me for barging in like this, but I've just got to say hello to Kit there. Uh, to me, Lieutenant? Well, Kit, don't you remember me? That Navy game when you knocked me cold. Me, Bugsy Johnson. Oh, Bugsy, of course. Oh, I thought you well, were all this uh, navy blue and gold braid had me full for a moment. It's good to see you. Look, uh, I've got to get back to my table, Kit. Honeymoon. But call me, will you? I'm at the Carteret. Not too early, though, will you? Well, I'll try, Bugsy. I'll try. A great football player in his day, that fellow. And you, uh, how do you say, knocked him cold, Mr. Marlowe? Well, he hit the ground hard, too hard. <laughs> All in fun, though. Oh, I think, Mr. Marlowe, to you, a lot of things are fun. Knowing you is fun, Miss Dolzing. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. No one has said that to me before. Oscar, we will see more of this wonderful man, much more. Lou, darling, you are so sweet to bring him to me. Any time at all, darling, any time at all. Just point the fellow out and you shall have him on toast from your Uncle oh, Lou Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Kid, 
darling, you look worried. Don't you think he looks worried, Oscar? He looks normal to me. Look, Erica, you're wonderful, but there's not a thing you could do, understand? Um, but this is nonsense. When the American man says such things, it is money to others. This much I've learned already, and in Hollywood I'm not yet. I'm right, Oscar? Uh, the queen is always right, my dear. So now, kid tales, we, my Oscar, and I will fix. No? Oh, I'll be all right in a few days. But this is so foolish. You tell us, we fix. Now, today, I have money. Oscar has so much money, he does not know what to do with uh, it. Not quite that much, Eric. Well, I couldn't let you... But you will. Now, you tell us. <clears throat> well, since you insist... I'm in the stationery business. In my pocket, I have acceptances on $90,000 worth of typewriters for a large company. But I don't have the cash to get the typewriters from the manufacturer. Oh, what does this mean, Oscar? Typewriters? Acceptances? Now, now. Uh, may I see those acceptances, Marlowe? Mm, uh, here they are. Hmm. Yes, yes. They look all right to me. You sure these uh, signatures are genuine? Mm, they better be. Wait. Both of you, wait. I'll be right there. Oh, <clears throat> What is she up to? Who knows? She's Erica Stolzing, the one and only. Now, look here, Marlo. Uh, can you be in my office tomorrow morning at 11? Of course. Good, good. I have a group of associates. We uh, finance operations like yours. Uh, come in then. I'll have the papers drawn in blank. We can make a deal, and uh, you'll get the money. Kid, darling. Here, take this. I show this businessman friend of mine $2,000. All the cash I have for now. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Dolzing. I've been after him for months. Now, if you'll sign the complaint... I complained? Of course I complained. You understand, of course, you'll have to appear against him. Appear? Uh, Oscar, what does it mean, this appear? Uh, in court, Erica, on the witness stand. But I cannot. This I cannot do. Why not, Miss Dolzing? Oh, this will be very good. Two weeks I'm in this country, not yet in Hollywood I am. And I'm taken in by this, this, this petty thief. Petty? $60,000 besides your own 2000 Neither one of you will sign a complaint. Wait a minute. Hold on, lad. Again, not quite that fast. 60000 is big money. Now, is there any way I could avoid, uh, well, the appearance in court? Well, if we persuaded him to plead guilty, you might avoid the worst of the publicity. All right, lad. Again, I'll go along with you myself. I think our Mr. Marlowe, or whatever his name is, needs a lesson. <laughs> How about it, Mr. Liggett? Has this Marlowe ever been back here at the club? Oh, we haven't seen a sign of him. He knows what would happen if a gauntlet and I laid eyes on him. Thousand dollar bills don't go on trees. You get around, Mr. Daniels. Can't you help us? Well, the fellow's dropped out of sight completely. <laughs> but it's sure a laugh. Leopard's taken for 60 grand. And Erica. <laughs> you uh, thought he was really Marlowe, too, didn't you? Uh, I sure did. But he didn't get one red cent of my money. Look, Mrs. Marlowe. Miss Henderson, now, if you don't mind. Right, Miss Henderson. Is there anything you can tell us of his whereabouts? I haven't seen him since I threw him out. But his right name is Taylor Dunn, if that's any help to you. Help to us? Holy smoke, at last we got a break. Okay, Washington, this is Lattigan. Hello, Higgins. Did you find anything? Uh, so he was caught once. I get it. First offense, suspended sentence. Fingerprints, of course. Wonderful. Look, send me a copy, will you? I'll start the routine inquiries. We'll get that fella if we have to circularize every post office and substation in the country. As I say it again, slowly now. Taylor Dunn, served hitch in army, honorably discharged with rating as Master Sergeant. Higgins, you run a check for me on all recent reenlistments in the United States Army. be a pleasure, Captain. A real pleasure. I don't know how you feel, Adigan. This must have been a merry chase. Mm. And strangely enough, he's a good soldier. A real leader in his way. Too bad. Maybe he should have stayed in the army in the first place. Well, it's almost four o'clock. Do you push your men, Captain? I'd hate to lose Mr. Dunn Marlowe now. Right. All right. Detail. Hold in. This is the operation, men. <clears throat> Sergeant Donald will report here from the pistol range very shortly. You'll be carrying a sidearm. We want no trouble, but we'll take no chances. You've each been issued ten rounds. If he resists arrest, fire over his head. Then let him have it, but try to avoid a vital area. 
Is that clear? And don't fire unless I give the word. Very well, then. Martin, outside the window just back of my desk. White, your position is across the road facing the front door. You'll find plenty of cover over there. Siegel, there's plenty of room behind the filing cabinet. Carter, take your post in my private office. Leave the door open a little so you can hear and see. All right, men, on the double. <laughs> you take no chances, do you? He'll have a forty-five with him. They make a nasty hole in a man. Hello, here's our pigeon. Sergeant Dunn reporting, sir. I was told on the pistol range you wanted me, sir. I don't, but Lieutenant Ladigan does. Lieutenant? Yes, Dunn, alias Kit Marlowe, Lieutenant Metropolitan Police. I, I'm afraid I don't understand, Lieutenant. I've done nothing. You can save that not guilty plea for your arraignment. You're charged with fraud, impersonation, and taking money under false pretenses. You're under arrest. I don't think you can do this, Lieutenant. I'm in the Army. We know you expected to find cover in the great anonymity of the Army. But the Army doesn't want your kind loose any more than civilians do. You've been released to us in my custody. Ready? Captain, don't let him do this. You'll make me use my gun. Martin, Siegel, Carter, show yourself. And the door is covered from across the road, Don. Good tactics, Captain. My compliments. Look out, Ladigan! Don't touch that pistol! Don! Sorry, Dunn. Learned my judo in the Marines. Thanks for everything, Captain. I think I'll come quietly now. Crime does not pay. <laughs> Sidney Blackmer, who was starred as Taylor Dunn, alias Kit Marlowe, in All-American Fake, will be back with you in just a moment. Now, here in person is Sidney Blackmer. I'm sure you'll be interested to learn that Taylor Dunn did plead guilty and receive a sentence of two to five years in prison. And I think, too, that you had the same feeling listening to his story as I had in playing it, a feeling that this man was not basically bad, that he was misdirected somewhere along the line and then aided and abetted by two things which are so common in our American life, the adulation of heroes and the eagerness of so many to turn a quick profit without too much worry about the exact methods. This is the kind of public carelessness, the kind of indifference in thinking and in citizenship, which are so fundamental in the growth of so much crime. Believe me, protection against crime begins not in the police station, but in our thinking. The basic responsibility for law enforcement lies not with the policeman on his beat, but with you and me in our everyday lives. Crime does not pay. Thank you, Sidney Blackmer. Crime Does Not Pay is written by Ira Marion and directed by Mark D. Lowe, with music composed and conducted by John Gart. Technical advisor is Burton B. Turkus. The events, characters, and names used in the story you've just heard are fictitious. Any similarity is purely coincidental. <laughs>
Danger. It's all me. Let's find a policeman quickly. Just hey there. Oh, what? oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Please help me. I've got to get to a policeman. And before we do anything, we better move into that doorway. Out of this rain. Come on. But Mr. Come on, come on. Now, what happened? Fight with the husband? Oh, no, no. It's the man. What? He saw me. He's going to kill me. What man? Where? A big man. He was wearing a gray hat. He was right behind me. You're wrong, baby. There's nobody behind you. Take a look. But I saw him. I tell you. You were running towards me and nearly knocked me over. You may take my word for a little lady, there was no one behind you. But he was after me. I know he was. You know this man in the gray hat? No. Then why would he chase you on a rainy night? Because I... I saw him commit murder. This is Steve Granger, private detective, with a story about a rainy night which was the setting for violent death. And which, just incidentally, almost had me labeled by my friends in the police department as nuts. In just a moment, I'll take you back to one of my most interesting cases. I took a good look at the young woman who bumped into me in the rain and found a blonde youngster in her early 20s dressed in nothing but a drenched summer dress which clung to her skin like a label to a perfume bottle. Mr. Please. Now, where did you see this man in the gray hat commit murder? From my apartment. Now, what's your name? Pat. Pat Benton. No. Please. Please look back again. I'm sure he's following me. Pat, there's no one else around. Now, come on. Now, let's, let me take you home. Oh, but I'm frightened. I can't go back there. Look, baby, I'm Steve Granger, private detective. We'll see that you're safe. Then he can tell me the whole story. If it holds together, I'll call in the law. Now, is that a deal? Well, yes. Okay. Now, let's hurry. You're soaking wet. <laughs> ahead of the girl and checked her apartment. It was empty. Then while she changed into some dry clothes, I looked it over. It was typical of hundreds of New York apartments. One room doubling for living and sleeping. A window that looked out over a fire escape and three lines of dingy laundry. The window opposite was dark. Well, I feel better now, Mr. Granger. Well, you'll look a little bit better, too. Now, uh, suppose you tell me... How you happened to witness a murder, hmm? Well, it was just a little while ago. You see, when I've got nothing to do at night, I sit by the window and look out over the court. You look into other tenants' windows? Oh, it's a harmless diversion, and you'd be surprised what you see. I can imagine. Go on. My room was dark. I turned off my lights. There was a man in a chair by the window just opposite. That one? The one that's dark? Yeah. He was reading. Hmm. Then he got up and went to the door and opened it. A man and a woman came in. This was the man in the gray hat? Yeah. Can you describe the woman? She was wearing a blue dress and a white stole. It looked like it was made out of linen or something. Did you see her face? No. And they just walked in and killed this man, was that it? Oh, no, 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 no. it wasn't, wasn't like that at all. Hmm. They, they seemed to be very good friends. The man had been sitting by the window mixing drinks and as they talked... The woman sat opposite him. Did it look like they were having an argument? Oh, no, no. Uh, suddenly, the man in the gray hat moved around to the back of the other man's chair. The woman looked up at him and nodded her head. That's when I saw the knife. Right, go on. He plunged it into the man's back. Mr. Granger, it was awful. I've never seen anything like that before. How did the killer happen to see you? Well, I, I was leaning out of my window. The lights in the apartment up above were turned on and they shone right down on me. I screamed and the man in the gray hat looked across and he saw me. You sure about all this? Of course. I moved away from the window. I went over and picked up the telephone. You were going to call the police, is that it? Yes, but there was a knock on the door. I had a terrible feeling with the man in the gray hat. He knew I was a witness to what had taken place. You didn't call? I was afraid he'd hear me and break the door down. I waited. He tried the door. Then I heard scratching, like he was trying a key in the lock. You keep saying he. How did you know it was a man? After a few minutes had passed, I went over and opened my door. I saw him standing at the end of the hall. It was a man in the gray hat. He was waiting for me. How'd you get out? I went down the fire escape. Thought if I could find a policeman, he could arrest him. Mm. No, I'll just use your phone. Are you calling the police? But was there a dial tone on this phone when you tried it? Yeah. It's dead now. It's not working? Nope. 
It must be the man in the gray hat. He cut the line. There must be 50 telephones in this building. And your line would be pretty hard to find. Well, what do we do? Terminal box should be in the basement. Let's go down. See if your line's been disconnected. But I'm afraid. He's come back. He knows I'm here. What do we do? You get in the kitchen. I'll answer it. All right, but I'm too frightened. Don't make a sound. Yeah? Oh, I beg your pardon. I, uh... I was looking for a young woman. I'm sorry there's no young woman here. Yeah, I must have got the wrong apartment number. What's the young woman's name? It doesn't matter. I have her phone number. I'll call her and get the correct address. Good night. Okay, he's gone. Was it him? The man wearing the gray hat? No, this was a heavy set fellow, about 45. Had on a brown suit. Oh, that's the man. Oh, Mr. Granger, I'm afraid. Okay, lock the window. And when I leave, lock the door. Oh, no. I'm afraid to stay here alone. I can't... Okay, Miss Benton. Then you better come along with me. It's dark down here. Let me see. No terminal box on this side. Mr. Granger. Hmm? Don't you think you ought to call the police? Just a minute, Pat. Oh, here it is. Uh, we'll see if you line this cut or what happened. Hey, that light in the far corner. It's out. Stand still. Somebody down here with us. Man in the gray hat. It's going to kill us. Stop that. You can't see any bit of the weekend. Now, don't make a sound. He knows where we are. He's coming to me. I can't stand it anymore. Help somebody. Help. All right, you just want... I'd started after the mysterious stranger, but must have misjudged my distance and passed him because he clipped me right behind the ear. I did a slow, ungraceful swan dive and landed on my face. I'll continue with this interesting story in a minute. I came to in the basement of Pat Benton's apartment house. Groaning, I got to my feet and found the light switch. A dim glow flooded the basement with a bilious yellow light. Pat Benton had disappeared. This was the door to the girl's apartment. I listened to the panel, hoping for some sound. There was none. Inside, I flipped the light switch. There was no one there. I picked up the phone. The dial tone, which hadn't been there a little while before, was back. I dialed my friend, Lieutenant Jake Rankin, at police headquarters. Dragon speaking. Oh, this is Granger. I got something for you. Why, thanks, Gumshoe. I haven't a thing to do down here. I'm just aching for some work, along with a ton of labor on my desk right now. Well, what's on your alleged mind? I'm in the apartment of a girl named Pat Benton. It's 2479 West 44th Street. Are you having a good time? Something strange happening. I met her on the street. She claimed she saw a murder committed. So? I came back to investigate. Her telephone was out of order. We went out of the basement to check up. I got slugged. She disappeared. Well, what do you want me to do? I'm in homicide of the missing persons bureau. Get a John Doe warrant and drop around. I'd like to see the inside of a certain apartment. Okay, so you went downstairs to check the telephone. You got hit. You woke up. The girl was gone. She was sitting right here by this window. She claimed she saw a man stabbed by another man wearing a gray hat. There was a woman with him. Where? Over in that apartment across the court? Yes, bright eyes. How about dropping over and paying a visit? I know this is the light now. It's been dark until just a few minutes ago. Yeah, I don't know, Granger. Barging into apartments at this hour of the night. It... Hey, suppose the girl was a crackpot. She was plenty frightened, but she wasn't a crackpot. Well, how about it? All right, I'll go along with you. This once. Now, this must be it. Let's see. Funny. Name of the plate says Hannah Rosley. The Benton girl gave me the impression that a man lived in this apartment. So what? Let's take a chance anyway. With shots in the basement, you'd have a legitimate reason to ask questions. Right. Somebody's home, all right. Can hear him rustling around. Who's there? Police department. Police? 
What's wrong? I'm Lieutenant Rankin, ma'am. We got a report there'd been some shots fired in this building. Shots? Yes. Have you heard anything? No, no, not a thing. How long have you been home? Why, well, I just got in a little while ago. Hmm. Would you like to come in and look around? <laughs> in case you think I've been indulging in a little target practice. Well, Miss Rosalie, uh, maybe we ought to uh, look down in that area way, Lieutenant. Might spot something. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, by all means, come in. Look all you like. You'll, uh, you'll find I'm a very law-abiding person. I'll just open this window for a second, Miss. See anything? No, not a thing. It's too dark. Well, you finished? Yeah. Well, thank you, Miss Rosalie, and we're sorry about the intrusion. Oh, don't mention it, Lieutenant. Hey, good night. Good night. Granger, are you sure you're not dreaming all this up? Nope. Why the gag about the window? Wanted to check the chair the Benton girl told me about. And? It would be possible for Amanda to do exactly as she said. I used the window routine to check the chairs for blood stains. There were none. No, and I didn't see any dead bodies either. They could have disposed of the body. Could have been hidden in a closet. Granger, Hannah Rosie lives in that apartment, alone. Why would a man be sitting there? There was a man there sometime tonight. What? The ashtray next to the chair where Pat Benton claimed she saw the man was loaded with ashes from a pipe. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. She could have had a male visitor earlier. Uh-huh. Now, look, gumshoe. I'm leaving this to you. Give me a description of the Benton girl. I'll turn at headquarters. Okay. I got another idea, too. Got your car here? Park to the curb. Why? I think we're being watched. Where? Who? The watcher wouldn't be that obvious. Ooh. Car's over there. By that fire hydrant. I'll go with you. Then drop me off at the next corner. Coming back here? What have I got to lose? <laughs> I rode to the corner with the police lieutenant, got off, walked into a phone booth and dialed a number. A minute later, I was talking to Cal Hendricks. Hiya, Stevie. What's on your mind? Cal, get out your thinking cap and do a take on a woman named Hannah Rosley. She's about 35, red hair, 5 feet 6 in heels, dresses well, sounds like a well-educated person. Okay, you want me to check Hannah Rosley? What else? I'll be prowling an apartment building at 2479 or 2481 West 44th Street. If you come up with anything, call Rankin. <laughs> I moved out of the drugstore from where I'd phoned the newspaper man and back to towards 2481 West 44th, block away. Close to the building, I got a break. The man scurried out of 2479 and went next door to 2481, and I recognized him. It was the man who'd been looking for Pat Benton when I answered the door of her apartment. This was interesting. 2479 was Pat Benton's building. 2481 was the building in which Hannah Rosalie had her apartment. The one where Pat saw a murder committed. It looked to me the tail for the man in the gray hat was in order. In just a minute, I'll bring you the climax of the case. When I saw the man who Pat Benton said was a murderer go into number 2481... I slipped through the courtyard between the two buildings and made use of the fire escape, which led to Hannah Rosalie's window. I parked outside, feeling like the end man in a bad minstrel show. Peering underneath a drawn shade, I could see the man and could barely hear the voices. They're gone. Yeah, just as I said. The police officer took the other man with him in his car. I recognize the other man. He's Steve Granger. A private eye? Yeah. He doesn't know you. Oh, no. Well, we can't take a chance now. We'll have to dispose of the girl as well as Kelvin's body. How? I have Granger's revolver. I have a little surprise for him. You're going to kill her? With this gun. With his gun. The police will ask questions when they find her body. It'll divert suspicion. That's murder. What we did to our friend was murder, too, my dear. I was very careful to carry Granger's gun in my handkerchief. The only prints will be his. Very smart, Will. Now, you go over to the girl's apartment. Pack her clothes in that old suitcase. 
I'll think it in Long Island Sound after I dispose of her. Uh, where are you going now? To get the car. Then I'll get the girl out of the basement. Well, wait. Wouldn't it be better just to have the girl disappear? Look, baby, I'll do it my way, and don't you ever forget that. I'd heard enough. The spot where Pat Benton was being held prisoner. It took two minutes to get over to 2479 and down the steps to the cellar. I remembered seeing a doorway that led into a laundry room, probably filled with automatic washes and whatnot, and figured it as a logical place to hide the girl. This was the laundry room. Over in one corner, there was a pile of linens. Underneath, I looked into the frightened eyes of a Benton girl. Take it easy, Pat. I'll be out of here in two seconds. He pelled it a nice gag job on you. There you are. Let's, let's get at those cords. Come on. I was afraid he'd come back. He's going to. But he'll be in for a disappointment. There you are. Can you stand? Uh, Come on, let me help you. Uh, my, my legs, I can't move. Well, rub them as hard as you can. We haven't much time. He'll be here shortly. How did you find me? Never mind. Keep rubbing. Oh, they sting. Try walking. I'll help you. Come on. I've had a foot go to sleep, but nothing like this. Yeah. Uh-oh. Hold it. That's your friend. We're going to find a place to hide. Over there behind the furnace. I move as softly as you can. Quick and don't make a sound. He's gone back. When he finds out you've gone, he'll look around the laundry room first. Is there a back way out of here? Yes, over there. A door that leads up to the street. Oh, come on. Watch him back of us while I get this door open. You see anything? He's still in the laundry room. Good. Hurry up. And if he sees us, you run while I distract him. Grab a taxi and go to police headquarters. Tell Lieutenant Rankin what's happened. All right. Go on ahead of me. Turn around. Turn around. He's seen us. Yeah. Right. Come on. Let's move really fast. We have the police? No. First to my apartment. Mr. Granger, don't you think the man in the gray hat might come over here to my apartment? Uh-huh. That reminds me. A gun? That's right. This trip will take no chances. And I want to make a phone call. Hello, Cal. What'd you find out? Uh-huh. I see. Yeah. They did. Uh, did you get a description of the man? Uh-huh. Yeah, this begins to add up. Sure, that's why one was killed. Yeah, thanks, Cal. You're a great help. Good night. No, no, I don't need another thing. See you tomorrow. It was Cal Hendricks, an old pal. He locked up your friends for me. I think I know why that man was killed. Why? Anna Rosalie has been working around the country with two men. One is named Will Stanick. The other one's name is unknown. They were last seen in Chicago where they fleeced some widow out of her life savings. But why was the one man killed? Well, Stanick is the man who tied you up. He knifed his partner. Probably a disagreement about money. Or even a double cross. Then the police can pick him up and we won't have to worry? Yeah. Except for one thing. What happened to the body of the man who was killed? It wasn't found? No. But when Lieutenant Rankin learns the truth, I have an idea that uh, Miss Rosalie will talk. I want you to help me. How? Ever see one of these before? Why, no, no, I haven't. Well, it's a blackjack. You hold it like this and apply it to the top of the person's head, right? Oh, I've seen it done in the movies. So you know how to do it? Well, I, I could try. Okay, use it if you have to. Now, don't spare the muscle. Both of these people are killers, remember? I know. Mm-hmm. We've got to bring these characters out into the open. That's the door. It'll be him. Stand over there. Look natural. And put that blackjack out of sight. All right. Oh. Mr. Gray. Come in, Miss Rosalie. Oh, there you 
sorry, Pat. I've been looking all over for you. You stay away from me. Oh, now, really, that's no way to talk to your cousin. Mr. Granger, keep her away from me. Would you mind explaining, Miss Rosalie? Oh, Pat is my cousin. She's she's been having a little trouble. It's affected her mind. Oh? That's why we got apartments overlooking each other. I I can keep an eye on her. Mm Mm-hmm. You see, she... uh, she keeps imagining that she sees murder. She tells people about them and they're inclined to believe her. And, oh, well, it, it is very embarrassing. I can imagine. Oh, she's uh, told you, of course. She has, and I'm inclined to believe her, Miss Rosalie. Particularly when she mentions a stabbing in your place. Oh, really, now, I'll, I'll just have to take her home if you don't mind. I definitely do mind. Because your little gag won't work, Miss Rosalie. I don't have to stand for this, you know. Miss Rosalie, when you came to the door, you knew my name. Even though I wasn't introduced when Lieutenant Rankin and I were at your place earlier. But I... But nothing. I perched on your fire escape. I heard you and Will standing talking about this girl. That's what... Yes. That's what happened. And you and your partner guessed it. That's why you are here, pretending to be her cousin. You want to get her out of here. So he can kill her. I'm leaving. No, you're not. You're staying. There's a certain police lieutenant who wants to chat with you, baby. Look, I... I, I... Stand still, Mr. Granger. It's the man in the gray hat. Yes, my dear. You gave me quite a chase. You're a smart character, Stanek. You got in here and hid in the kitchen, right? Right. And before you make the mistake of reaching for that gun... I'll take it. Here we are. Well, nice little party I'm having tonight. Even if two of the guests are uninvited. Quiet. Hannah, get the girl out of here. My car is around the corner on the side street. Well, hurry. You're quite an organizer, Stanek. Go on, Hannah, hurry. Have you a gun? Yeah. Good. If she makes any noise or tries to attract attention, you know what to do. Yeah. Please, Granger, no moving around. I don't trust you. Thanks. I didn't think you would. You won't be long, Will. Not more than a few moments. Drive around the front. The police don't know my car. Very well. Come on, Miss Banton. Mr. Granger. Go with her, baby. Well, this makes it just you and me, eh, Stanley? Yeah. And I haven't got much time. Would you stand over there... Yeah. I'd be glad to. Now let's go. You wouldn't shoot. And you know it would. And I... Oh. I don't think so. Now for Hannah Rosalie. Okay, Miss Rosalie, up with up. Hey, what goes... I think you'll find that Miss Rosalie is indisposed, Mr. Green. What? The blood, Jack. You know, as you suggested, I hit her over the head. Well, friends, that's the story. I'll be back to wrap up the case in just a minute. Hold on. At the time we got Hannah Rosalie and Will Stanek tied up, Lieutenant Rankin showed. Indications were that both of them would go up on murder wraps for the killing of their unnamed partner. Rankin phoned for transportation, after which we went downstairs once more. And just wanted to see in what name this car is registered. I think you'll find it quite legal, Lieutenant. Oh, you do, do you? Uh, I guess you're right. It belongs to Will Stanek, all right. You know, Granger, you did a good job. Oh, I better thank Miss Benton here. She did most of the work. Including the spotting of the murder. Holy smoke! I forgot. You got what? The body. We haven't got a corpus delicti. We haven't? Well, just come with me, Lieutenant. There you are, Lieutenant. In the trunk compartment. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. But, Lieutenant, that's what I always thought you were. Steve Granger again. You've just heard one of the most interesting cases in my files. 
And I'll have another one for you. So be around next time. The National Broadcasting Company brings you Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell in... Dangerous Assignment. Over here. Here I am with the boat. Swim over this way. Here, let me help you, I bought. Give me your hand. Come on. Come on. Come on. You set the charge of natural glycerin? <laughs> Good. And no one saw you leave the ship? <laughs> on schedule. The ship goes to the bottom, and only the two of us know the location. <laughs> and now... Wait. Wait, no. No, put down the knife. No. No, no, no. Three ships sunk in two weeks, Steve. And the last one cost the lives of six passengers. But, Commissioner, why send me halfway around the world just because three ships were sunk? Steve, those ships carried U.S. rehabilitation supplies. I see. Now, as usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Here's your press credential, Steve. Your passport and plane ticket. Ruth, did you say plane ticket? You take off in two hours. Now, look, I was figuring on a little deal. Uh, can't it wait till tomorrow? No, it can't wait. And that's another thing, Steve. On this assignment, there's to be no women and no gambling. It's strictly business. Dangerous business. Okay, Commissioner. All right, Steve. Your first stop in Saigon is the Malayan Star Lines. The manager's name is Bravon. You've got your assignment. Get going. You've seen him in The Great McGinty, as Major Devereaux in Wake Island, as Trampas in The Virginian. Now, here is our star, Brian Donnelly, in another two-fisted portrayal as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. The time now, the place, Saigon, inscrutable city of the Orient where the ancient and the modern rub elbows in the narrow, crowded streets. Saigon, city of intrigue, of shadows, of forgotten men, of danger. Mr. Bravant, I believe you're in charge of the melee and star lines here in Saigon. That is correct, Monsieur... Mitchell, Steve Mitchell. I'm a foreign correspondent. I just flew in. I'd like an interview. There's not much of which to talk. Three ships of our line sail for Singapore. The first night out, an explosion, they're gone. Just like that, huh? We just like that. Could uh, I take a look at the passenger list for those three ships? Certainly. I have them on my desk. Thank you. You don't carry many passengers. Only a few. Any survivors? From the first sinking, none. From the third sinking, also none. How about the second? One. Who is it? An Englishman named Dixon, the cook. Is he around anywhere? I'd like to talk to him. Aran, tell the Englishman Dixon to come to my office. Most of your crews have been with the line quite a while. It is the exception rather than the rule, monsieur. Out here, one must take what men one can get. I see. What kind of cargo were your ships carrying? That is the mystifying part, monsieur. Here are the cargo lists. As you see, the Malayan Star Lines carry American rehabilitation supplies... Teakwood, spices, rubber, the usual. This uh, teakwood, I notice all of it comes from the same place. Yes, the plantation of Monsieur Surat. It is inland, up the Saigon River. Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Brevant? Uh, oui, yes. Uh, this gentleman is Monsieur Mitchell, a journalist. Nice to meet you, sir. Hi. Uh, Mr. Brevant tells me you're the only survivor from the second sinking. Oh, I'm the only one from any of them. That makes you pretty lucky, doesn't it? <laughs> lucky ain't off of it. Look, uh, did you notice anything unusual aboard your ship before the explosion? Well, I was back off. 
getting a breath of air before turning in, I was. And I noticed a silhouette of a small boat in the moonlight. Off our starboard beam, she was. And running without lights. Without lights? That's right. Anything else? I didn't have time to notice anything else, mister. Because just then there's a sheet of flame. The whole ship goes up in the air and the next thing I know, I'm holding on to a spar in the water for dear life. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you any idea what your ship's position was when she went down? Near as I can figure, we was in shoal water close to Polo Condori. That is an island a hundred miles off the coast of Indochina, monsieur. But, of course, it is but a guess. We have no way of knowing the exact location. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the information. I think it ought to make a good yarn. Do you intend to remain here in Saigon long? Oh, well, that depends. I'd like to talk to Mr. Surratt, the plantation owner. Do you know where I might find him? There's a gambling casino just down the street, monsieur. If he is in Saigon, he will be there. Good. I'm beginning to feel lucky. I am certain you will not lack for games of chance in Saigon, monsieur. I personally find gambling a bore, but it would seem I am in the minority. Yeah, I guess you are. Well, thanks for the story. I'll see you around. Hmm. He's an inquisitive gent, ain't he, Mr. Brevon? Yes, he is indeed. Newspaper chap, is he? That is what he said. Dixon, tell her to answer my telephone for me. I'm going out for a while. Sixteen. Red. Even. Sorry, monsieur. You lose again. Look, this game is slow death. Haven't you got something with a little more action in it? And Miss Shea would perhaps prefer the dice table downstairs. That's a thought. Thanks. Oh! oh I beg your pardon. Oh, no, it is my fault, monsieur. <laughs> Let me pick up your chair. Oh, you are most kind, monsieur. It was very clumsy of me. As a matter of fact, I bumped into you deliberately. It was the only way I could think of to meet you. Monsieur has a ready wit. All bets down. If you're looking for something to tack on after the monsieur, it's Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. They call me Leanna, monsieur. They picked a nice name. Well, here are your chips. You pick up my chips and my luck with them. You must allow me to buy you a drink, huh? You see, I am superstitious. Good. So am I. And having a drink with you is suddenly a superstition of mine. <laughs> Let us go to the bar. Liana. Liana. Well, I should have known you wouldn't be alone. It is only my brother, monsieur. Oh, where are you going, Liana? It is all right, Matihika. I'm sure the American will take good care of me. Uh, monsieur Steve Mitchell, my brother, Matik. Hello. Oh, your servant offended. Dear Matik, you play some of my chips now while we have our drink. Come along, Steve. You uh, live here in Saigon, Liana? For the most part. But I'm restless. I travel a lot. Tomorrow night I leave for Singapore. Oh, I guess my luck hasn't changed after all. I will not be gone long. How are you going to Singapore? I travel by tramp steamer. It is not so boring. Oh, not on the Malay Star Line. Why, yes. Ah, here we are. <laughs> sort of crowded right here. Why don't we move down to the other end? Well, there all is right. room here. I will move over. Oh, thank you. No trouble, sir. No trouble at all. What will you have, Stephen? Bourbon and... Hey. What is it? I just saw someone I know, Leona. Uh, excuse me just a minute. Of course. Be back in a minute. I will order the drinks. Well, my dear. He seems interested in the Malayan star line, sir. You think he is involved? It is possible. Very well. I will proceed on that assumption. Boy, come here. Oui, monsieur? I want a message delivered for me. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Bravant. Huh? Oh, Monsieur Mitchell, is it not? Have you written your story yet? Not yet. I'm a little surprised to see you here at the casino. When we talked this afternoon, you told me gambling bored you. It does. But I do find interest in observing gamblers, Monsieur. Particularly when high stakes are involved. Oh? Monsieur, I congratulate you on the speed with which you have made yourself acquainted in Saigon. What do you mean? Did I not observe you conversing at the bar with Surat? Surratt? The stout gentleman. You mean the guy who was standing next to me, the one with the face like a toad? <laughs> Your description does not flatter him, but it is accurate. Well, 
Thanks, Laurent. I'll see you around. Undoubtedly, monsieur. I'm sorry I took so long, Leona. Oh, it is quite all right. Well, here is your drink. Thanks. Say, uh, what happened to the guy who was next to me here, the one who moved over to make room? Huh? Oh, I did not know, Steve. I was not noticing. Hmm. Surratt. Is that his name? Yeah. Well, cheers. Cheers. Monsieur Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Over here, boy. You are a busy man, Steve. <laughs> I seem to be. Monsieur Mitchell? Yeah, what is it? Uh, you are wanted outside, monsieur. Oh? By whom? Oh, he not give name, monsieur. But he say, quite urgent. Okay. Here. Oh, thank you, monsieur. Lana. I know, I know. You will be gone but a minute. Yes, I will wait for you. Mitchell Effendi. Who are you? You are Steve Mitchell? What do you want, a calling card? Yeah, I'm Steve Mitchell. I suppose you tell me why you got me out here. I am Dalai. I suggest that we walk, Effendi. Oh. You always suggest with a gun, Dalai? When it is necessary, Effendi. Come. Mind telling me where we're going? Certainly not. Right around the corner here. And into the alley. Cozy in here. And dark, if empty. Wait a minute. Looks like we've got company in here. It is but my friend Banjack, if empty. Oh, hello. What's the matter? Is he bashful? He cannot speak. His tongue was removed by force some years ago. But he is strong and willing. Banjack. Why, you... Be- that... Reminder from Banjack will serve to open the conversation. Look, I don't know what this is all about. To be brief, Effendi, you have information which I require. The locations of the three sunken ships. The ships? You think I know where they were sunk? Banjack. Look. Perhaps that will refresh your memory. How can I tell you the location when I don't know? Again, Banjack. I tell you, this wasn't going to do you any good. I don't know where those ships were sunk. Very well. If you intend to be stubborn, you may proceed, Banjak. I told you not to resist. Well, if you think I'm going to stand here and let this big ape make mince meat out of me. Very well, Effendi. It is a pity the Effendi bleeds so easily, Banjak. But I must not deprive you of extended enjoyment. You may kick him. I will tell you when to stop. The National Broadcasting Company is bringing you Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell in the second of an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment. The time, the next morning. The place, a luxuriously furnished bedroom in a spacious villa near Saigon, overlooking the sea. Oh. Ah. You are awake at last, Fendi. Ah, uh, you can call it that. Well, hey, wait a minute. You're Leona's brother, aren't you? Matik. Your servant, Fendi. Look, would you mind telling me how I got into this harem? <laughs> You are in the house of my sister, Liana. How did I get here? Well, Liana became worried when you did not return to the casino last night. We went outside to look for you and found you crawling out of the alley badly beaten. So we brought you home with us. You are all bloody. How do you feel now? All bloody? Hey, help me out of this mink-lined cradle, will you? Oh, of course. Where are my pants? Hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. It was I who put you to bed. And here are your pants. Thanks. 
Uh, where's Liana? Swimming in the ocean. Come. You can see her out the window. Hey, she's quite a swimmer, isn't she? Does she always swim out that far? Oh, yes. Every morning. Well, I'm not that ambitious this morning, but a dip would do me good. Quite a, a swimmer yourself. <laughs> Thanks. That water made me feel almost human again. Any cigarettes around here? Ah, uh, right here on my robe. Hey, here you are. <laughs> hmm. You uh, you look much better than when we found you last night. Please. You know, you've taken awfully good care of me, Liana. Why? Why? Oh, perhaps. Perhaps there have been. So many places, many times, many men in my life. And with me, it, there's always been the same. But then last night, I saw you. And I knew you were something different. How different? <sighs> does, does that make your bruises feel better? It helps. You know... <laughs> That's a kind of medicine I could get addicted to, Liana. Perhaps. Perhaps when I return from Singapore, there will be more time to become addicted. Maybe. When do you sail? At eight tonight. On the Malayan Queen. I guess my luck's still no good. <laughs> okay, look, I gotta go back to my hotel and pick up a change of clothes. But anyway, I'll be down to see you off tonight. How'd you get in here? I am Surratt. I learned you were registered at this hotel, so I took the liberty of waiting here in your room. Quite a liberty, wasn't it? When occasion demands it, the courtesies must be omitted. What's the occasion? I will be brief. Mr. Mitchell, I will assume you are a man who is interested in money. That's a safe assumption, Surratt. I believe you're in possession of certain information which is of value to me. Here we go again. Sir? Look, you happen to know a couple of cutthroats named... Dailai and Ben Jack. Ben Jack's a big lug with no tongue. Dailai, Ben Jack? I have not had the pleasure of their acquaintance, sir. Oh, it's no pleasure, believe me. Sir? I'll skip it. Now, what's this about certain information I have? I will not waste words. Ten thousand American dollars for the location of the sunken ships. Ten thousand? Means a lot to you, doesn't it? You've been shipping teakwood on the Malay and Star Line, haven't you? From my plantation up the river, sir. It is a matter of record. I didn't know teakwood was that valuable. I repeat my offer. Ten thousand American dollars. Uh, I'll have to have a little time to think it over, Surratt. I cannot grant you much time, sir. I'm sailing tonight on the Malay and Queen. You have until 7.30 this evening. Okay. I will expect your answer before sailing time. Until then, good day, sir. Uh, Mr. Bravant, please. I am sorry, sir, but he's gone. Gone? Yes, sir, on a business trip. He is sailing in half an hour on the Malayan Queen. Could, could you get word to him that... Uh, uh, never mind, I'll call you back. Come in. Mitchell. Dixon, what's the matter? A knife in my back. What happened? Malayan Queen, ready to sail. Yeah, I know. I saw someone go aboard that was on the other ship. You mean the ship that was sunk? Yes. Who was it? Followed me here and stabbed me. Who stabbed you? I... Dixon! Dixon! Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Mitchell, but I don't leave the bridge until we're out of the channel. That's okay, Captain. 
I'd like you to look at these credentials. They'll explain who I am and why I'm aboard your ship. Hmm. You're investigating the recent sinkings. Yes, Captain. A couple of people seem awfully interested in the location of those sunken ships. I'm kicking an idea around that maybe there was something pretty valuable aboard them. Hmm. What would it be? I don't know. Are you carrying the same sort of cargo on this ship that was on the others? Yes, as far as I know. Another shipment of teak wood from Surratt's plantation? There is. Also, some American rehabilitation supplies. Hmm. Tell me, could those rehabilitation supplies be salvaged after they were sunk? Oh, no, no. The water had ruined them. Hmm. Captain, suppose you wanted to sink a ship and recover something from it later. What? Where would you sink it? Well, I, I suppose in shallow water. Yeah. Now, what's the first shallow water we'll be passing through tonight? Well, let's see. We'll pass through the Diablo Shoals a little after midnight. Depth there is only 15 fathoms. I see. Is that the passenger list on your desk? Yes. Here. Yeah, looks like the gang's all here. Bravant, Liana, her brother Matik, and Surratt. Captain, I need your full cooperation. Why, certainly. What is it? I'd like you to order these four passengers to be in Bravant Stateroom three hours from now at 11 tonight. Bravant, I demand an explanation of this, being hauled up to your cabin like a common criminal. But, Monsieur Surat, I am as much in the dark as you. I do not think it necessary to point out that this may cost you my business, Bravant. If you would only tell us the reason for all this, Effendi Bravant. Matik, I am sure there must be a good reason for all this. If we are but patient, we will learn what it is. Here is the man who is responsible, Monsieur Mitchell. Steve. Hello, Liana. Matik, your servant, Effendi. Good evening, sir. Surat. Apparently you forgot our appointment, Mr. Mitchell. I didn't forget it. I had a couple of other things to take care of. Perhaps, sir, you'll be good enough to explain what this is all about. Sure, I'll explain. I'll make it short. I think one of you is responsible for the sinkings of those three ships. You are joking, Steve. Sorry, Leona. But, but to suggest that I could have anything to do with it. You're a good swimmer. I'm afraid I'll have to count you in. Oh, it is so ridiculous to think that I or my brother could be involved in such a thing. You make a serious charge against us, Effendi. I know. This is an insult to my long years of service on the line. Perhaps it is a serious charge as far as the others are concerned, Mr. Mitchell. But to suspect that I am involved is ridiculous. Much valuable teak wood of mine was sunk with those ships. Yeah. And maybe it's more valuable than I thought at first. What do you mean by that, sir? I'll let it ride for the time being because I've got another piece of news for you. Of course, it isn't really news to one of you. What do you mean, Steve? There was a ship's cook named Dixon, survivor of one of the sinkings. Tonight, he saw one of you come aboard. He recognized you as being on that other ship. So whichever one of you it was, killed him to shut his mouth. I assure you, this is the first of these ships I have been aboard, sir, and also the last. One of you four is the killer and dynamiter. That person has a bomb planted on this ship and plans to dive overboard before the explosion. And that explosion is due for about midnight, 45 minutes from now. Steve, this is ridiculous. Is it? Just keep your eyes on that clock, all of you. Nobody's going to leave this cabin for the next 45 minutes. We're going to sweat it out together, just watching that minute hand creep around to midnight. Anyone feel like talking yet? Really, Mitchell? Really, what? Haven't Bravant? you carried this silly joke far enough, Steve? There is only one way to prove he is mistaken in his suspicions, Liana. That is to wait. Can't we get a little air into this cabin? It's so infernally hot. You know something, Surratt? It's going to get a lot hotter. Seven minutes to midnight. We reach shallow water in about ten minutes. That means ten minutes before the ship gets blown up. Anybody's tongue loosening up? Surratt? I demand to be released from this pest hole. Bravant? You must be insane. Liana? To think I once considered you... Yeah, to... yeah, save the romance. Matik, how about you? You feel like talking? When one knows nothing, one can say nothing offended. Okay, keep watching that minute hand, hmm? I 
can't stand this any longer. I've got to get out of here. You've got to let me go. So you're the one, Surratt. No, no, no. You must believe me. I would be the last one in the world to blow those ships up. Why? Surratt! There's there's gold hidden in those crates of cheek wood. Surratt, you fool. He was only bluffing. Now you have told him. You haven't told me enough. Keep talking. You I, fool. I have nothing more to say. Look, Surratt. Three ships have been sunk on account of this. Now open up. Start talking. No, no. I... You better talk before I beat it out of you. Now spill it. All right, all right. During the war, an air raid... A ship carrying gold bullion steamed up the river to escape, but it was sunk near my plantation. I think I can take it from there. You recovered the gold, and this is the way you've been sneaking it out of Indochina, huh? Hidden in crates of teakwood? Yes, it was Liana's Shut idea. Shut up, Surat! But someone must have found out about the gold and has been sinking the ships. Yeah, in shallow water so they can get the gold later. Fendi Mitchell, now that we know Surat is guilty, you will please allow me to leave. I have a headache. Mitchell, it is almost midnight. Yeah, nobody's leaving until I find out who's mined this ship. Fendi Mitchell, you I... keep looking at your watch, Matik. Why? Matik, Matik, what is the... Ma... Matik, you didn't. You did. You put the explosives on this ship, too. You were going to jump overboard and leave me here, you fool. Where'd you plant it, Matik? Where did you plant it? Let me out of here. You're not going anywhere. The nitroglycerin will explode in two minutes. Matik, you sank those ships. You and Liana betrayed me. Very well. Surratt, put that gun away. Surratt! Surratt! No! And for you, Liana... No! Grab that gun, Bravon. Wait, wait, wait. My ticket. Where's the nitroglycerin? Where is it? Oh. Surratt, you jughead. You killed the only man who knew where it was hidden. We've got a minute and 50 seconds to find that nitro. Genius. Any ideas, Bravant? My ticket could not have put it below decks. Men are stationed all over the ship. It must be in this cabin. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get back, Bravant. Wait, wait. Take that side of the room. I'll take this. All right. It's got to be in here somewhere. It's got to be. There's nothing over here, Mitchell. Wait a minute. Listen. There's something kicking. Uh, yes, yes, I hear it. Under the bunk. Look, that black suitcase. Easy. Go oh, over about. Go over about quick. Yeah, I got to get out of the way, Bravant. I got to get it over the rail. Hurry, Mitchell. Hurry. Only a few seconds more. We'll explode through it as far as you can. You don't have to tell me that. Hit the deck. Uh, Mitchell, are you all right, Mitchell? Yeah. Except that I'm about five years older, Captain. That was close. Yeah, too close. Probably buckled a few of the ship's plates. Yeah, well, you better put Surratt under arrest. You can turn him over to the authorities when the ship reaches port. Yeah. Chances of getting the gold that's already been sunk are pretty slim, but there's probably a lot of it still at Surratt's plantation. The government can check that. Mitchell, allow me to say I have never seen one so calm in the face of danger. All the time we were waiting in my cabin after I realized what your plan was, my heart was in my throat. You think mine wasn't? It was choking me. <laughs> uh, look at me, Bravant. I look like a fairly intelligent guy, don't I? Well, yes, of course. With a normal assortment of brains. Certainly. And a reasonable amount of common sense. But of course. And will you tell me something? What is it? Why did I ever get myself mixed up in a job like this? You have just heard the second in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif and directed by Bill Karn, with music by Bruce Ashley. Be with us again next week at this same time, when Brian Donlevy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. <laughs> This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Fed up with the everyday grind? Tired out from the summer heat? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are spurring a lathered horse through darkened streets, 
trapped by two hostile armies with a kit of magic in your pocket and the American Revolution in the balance. Tonight, we escape to an earlier day and to the workshop of a famous wizard, as Stephen Vincent Benet told it in his delightful story, A Tooth for Paul Revere. Some say it all happened because of Hancock and Adams, and some put it back to the Stamp Act and before. Then there's some that hold out for Paul Revere and his little silver box. But the way I heard it, the American Revolution broke out because of Lige Butterwick and his tooth. My great-aunt was a Butterwick, and I heard it from her. Every now and then, she'd write it out and want to get it put in the history books, but they'd always put her off with some trifling sort of excuse. But the way she told it to us kids, sitting there before the flickering fire on some blustery, blowy night, it sounded spooky enough and wonderful enough to be as true as the Union. History books, bah. You don't get the right of things from such. In the story of a nation, it's the queer corners that count. The tales that get whispered down through families. Now, take Paul Revere, for instance. All most folks think about is his riding a horse. But he was a silversmith by trade. And there was a kind of magic in that hand of his. I could see just a little bit farther into the millstone than most folks. And in that little shop of his on those fateful nights... He sat over a miraculous flame and brewed the revolution in a silver teapot. And then he put it into a little silver box. No bigger than this. Yes, that's the way my great aunt talked about Paul Revere. And the chills ran up our spines. But it takes all kinds to make a country, she used to say. And it isn't till the plain ones, like Lige Butterwick, get stirred up that things really start to happen. Lige was just an ordinary sort of man without special vision into a millstone. It might be a grand day in the history books, but for him it was just Tuesday till he read about it in the papers. Folks could argue and fret about Boston tea parties and British warships in Boston Harbor and British soldiers in Boston streets. But Lige Butterwick just plucked his tongue and wondered how the corn might stand this year on his farm outside Lexington, Massachusetts. One day, Lige Butterwick woke up with a toothache. The hot salt pack and the tansy tea his wife fixed for him didn't seem to help much. On the third day, Mrs. Butterwick tied a string to the tooth and Lige stood by the door. You ready? Uh Uh-huh. Well? Marthy, when it came to the pinch, couldn't quite do it. So? That's how Lige Butterwick came to ride into Lexington, Massachusetts that day. He just had to see somebody about that tooth. And when he got there, the town was in an uproar. Lige! Lige Butterwick! Eh? Oh, Good day to you, neighbor Williams. Lige, I didn't expect to see you here today. It's my tooth. Tooth? What do you mean? Uh, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Huh? Oh? Isn't it exciting? Exciting? The toothache? No, no, you idiot. All this. (laughs) Have you seen them yet? Seen who? Why, Hancock and Adams, of course. John Hancock and Sam Adams. They're at the Parson Clark's. Only folks who come here to see was the barber. I figure he's the only one who can do something for my tooth. Uh, you don't fool me, Lige. You're probably just as excited as I am. Have you cleaned your musket? Musket? Why, it's five months the hunting season yet. <laughs> That's where you're wrong, Lige. Looks like hunting season may be early this year. Huh? Keep your powder dry. Uh, huh? And so Lige Butterwick came to Lexington. And it was a great day for the history books. And to him it was just Tuesday. And his tooth was jumping. And he went to see the barber as the likeliest man he knew to pull a tooth. 
But the barber took one look at it and shook his head. Now, I can pull her out all right, Lige, but uh, she's got long roots and strong roots and she's going to leave an awful gap when she's gone. Hmm. That's true. Now, what you really need, though it's caustic my business, one of these here artificial teeth to go there in the hole. Artificial teeth? Yeah. Hey, uh, land of mercy, it's flying in the face of nature. Nothing of the kind, Lodge. Artificial teeth is all the goal these days. I think you ought to keep up with the times. But I, it would do me no good to see you with an artificial tooth. Yes, indeed it would. It would do you good, but uh, supposing I did want one, how in tonk it would I get it in Lexington? No, you just leave that all to me. You'll have to go into Boston, but I know just the man. Here, if I can find his. Yeah. Yeah, had his prospectus here somewhere. Oh, oh yes, yeah, here. See here? Mm-hmm. This fella I call it in Boston that fixes him, and they say he's a boss workman. Very. Yes, now you just listen to this here. Whereas many persons were so unfortunate as to lose their four teeth. Now, that's you, Lodge. Oh, yeah. Uh, to their great detriment, not only in looks, but in speaking, both in public and private. This is to inform all such that they can have them uh, replaced by artificial ones. I see. That will look as well as the natural and answer to the end of speaking to all intents. Hmm. Oh, yes, and then see, it goes on. Oh, his name, yes, his name is right here. Uh, Paul Revere, Goldsmith, near the head of Dr. Clark's Wharf in Boston. Hmm. Sounds well enough, but what's it going to cost? Oh, I, I know Revere. Comes through here pretty often, as a matter of fact. Does? Yes, and he's a decent fella, even if he is a pretty big bug in son's liberty. Now, you just mentioned my name. Well, it's something I hadn't thought of, mm. but and for penny, and for pound... Mm. Mr. Day's work already, and that tooth's got to come out before I go stark staring mad. But what sort of man is this Revere, anyway? Oh, he's a regular wizard. Regular wizard with his tools. Wizard? Hmm. I don't know about wizards, but if he can fix my tooth, I'll call him one. So, Lige Butterwick got back on his horse and started for Boston. He rode through the busy, excited streets of Lexington... And when he came opposite the residence of Parson Clark, he saw a little crowd collected, men staring. So he stopped his horse for a moment and looked. Mister, is that them? Is it who, son? Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams, sir. There, through the window. Tall, handsome man and the short man with a face like a bulldog. Hmm, I wouldn't know, son. They're strangers to me. Get out. And when he got to Boston, he began to feel queer. And it wasn't only his tooth. He hadn't been there for four years, and he'd expected to find it changed, but it wasn't that either. The sky was clear and beautiful, but Lige felt like there was thunder in the air. It was uncanny. And the people, there'd be little knots of them on the corners, but when you came up to them, they seemed to melt away. Or they'd look at you and stop talking. And then he came to the harbor. Out there in the port of Boston, riding black and grim with the British warships. He'd known they'd be there, of course, but it was different somehow, seeing them with their guns pointed in at the town. Suddenly he felt uncomfortable. Felt he'd like to turn and go home. But he was hungry, and so he went to a tavern for a bite. Uh, good day to you. And what may I do for you, stranger? Uh, just a bite and a sup, if you're serving. I have a seat. You'll be served. Mm, thank you. Uh, nice weather we're having these days. It's bitter weather for Boston. Uh, well, <laughs> now maybe for Boston, but out in the country we'd call it good planting weather. I guess maybe I was mistaken in you. It is good planting weather for some kind of trees. Uh, uh, trees. Well, now, I suppose you're right about that. That's so. Uh, and what kind of trees would you be thinking of? There's trees and trees, you know. Uh, well, uh, now that you ask you me, You meant I... the Liberty Tree. And may it soon be watered in the blood of tyrants. Now, the Royal Oak of England and God save King George and loyalty! Hey, boys! Hey, stop! I didn't mean... <laughs> Glory. I always heard city folks were crazy. But politics must be getting serious in these American colonies when they start fighting about trees. Oh. I, 
And it is, friend. So they threw you out, too? Yes, blast them. But I want to shake your hand. Nobly done, friend. I'm glad to find another true-hearted man loyal to the crown in this pestilent, rebellious city. Well, I don't know as I quite agree with you about that. But I came here to get my tooth fixed, not to talk about politics. And as long as you've spoken so pleasant, I wonder if you could help me out. You see, I'm from Lexington Way, and I'm uh, looking for a fellow named Paul Revere. Paul Revere? No, so it's Paul Revere you want, my worthy and ingenious friend from the country. Well, I'll tell you how to find him. Good, I thank you. You go up to the first British soldier you see and ask the way, but uh, you'd better give the password first. Password? Yes, you say to that British soldier, any lobsters for sale today? And then you ask about Revere. Uh, but oh, why do I talk about lobsters first? Well, you see, the British soldiers wear red coats, so they like being asked about lobsters. Uh. Just try it and see. <laughs> Just try it, my friend, and see. Uh, pardon me, sir. Uh, do you have any lobsters for sale today? What? How dare you seize that man? <sighs> uh, barrel, place to hide. Now, they've gone past. Oh, oh yes, thank you. Nice. nice. Look at your clothes. That was a tar barrel you jumped into. Yes, I'm a sight. What were they chasing you for? I really don't know. Guess I didn't give the right password. Password? Yes, but all the same, I don't think soldiers ought to act like that when you ask them a civil question. But city folks are soldiers; they can't make a fool out of me. I came here to get my tooth fixed and get it fixed at will if I have to surprise the whole British kingdom to do it. Good for you, sir. Uh, can I be of any help to you? Ah, you can, boy. Uh, tell me where I may find the silversmith, Paul Revere. Oh, that's easy. Right before your eyes. There's a sign hanging down by the wharf, and that's his shop. I work there. Well, now, those soldiers did me a good turn after all. Come on, boy, now maybe I'll get my tooth fixed. Butterwick was in the shop of Paul Revere. Silversmith, goldsmith, jack of all trades, sculpturer of artificial teeth, brewer of revolutions, wizard. The shop itself was small and dark, with mysterious shadows lurking in the corners and the back. It was crammed full of the wondrous products of its owner's skillful hand, gold and silver objects of great beauty. Prince of Boston and caricatures of the British. Odd boxes and bottles filling the shelves. At this particular moment, it was also full of customers. And Lige Butterwick, with the cautious shyness of the countryman, sank back into a corner seat out of the way and watched as Paul Revere waited on several customers. And the last of these was a grand lady who looked like a an irate turkey goblin. Oh, Master Revere, I am so disappointed. When I took the things from the box, I could just have cried. It's I who am disappointed, madam. What was the trouble? Must have been carelessly packed. Was it badly dented? No. I'll speak to the boy. No, no, it wasn't dented. But I wanted a really impressive silver service. Something I can use when the, the governor comes to dine with us. I certainly paid for the best. And what have you given me? I've given you the best work of which I'm capable, madam. It was in my hands for six months. And I think they're capable hands. Oh, I know you were a, a competent artisan, Master Revere, uh, but... Silversmith, ma'am. Well, I don't care please. what you call it. I know I wanted a real service, something I could show my friends. And what have you given me? Oh, it's silver if you choose. But it's just as plain as a picket fence. <laughs> Simple. Plain. You pay me high compliments, madam. Mm, compliments, indeed. I'll send it back tomorrow. Why, there isn't as much as a lion or a unicorn on the cream jug. And I told you I wanted the sugar bowl covered with silver grapes. But you've given me something as bare as the hills of New England. And I won't stand it, I tell you. I'll send to London instead. Send away, madam. We're making new things in this country. New men. New silver. Perhaps who knows a new nation. <sighs> Plain, simple... Bare as the hills and rocks of New England. Graceful as the boughs of elm trees. 
If my silver were only like that, indeed. That's what I wished to make it. As for you, madam, with your lions and unicorns and grape leaves and your nonsense of bad ornamentation done by bad silversmiths, your imported bad taste and your imported British manners, puff! What? Away with you! Puff! 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 What? What did he do? Puff, I say! Oh. <laughs> William? Yes, sir? <laughs> Put up the shutters. We are closing for the day. Uh, oh, William, no word yet from Dr. Warren? Not yet, sir. <clears throat> yeah, what's that? Well, who are you there in the corner? Well, Mr. Vare. It is Mr. Vare, isn't it? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, it's a kind of a long story, but uh, closing or not, you got to listen to me. The barber told me so. The barber? You see, I'm Lige Butterwick, and it's my tooth. How? Yeah, tooth? Oh. <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd better begin at the beginning. Uh, oh, but wait now. Here, you don't talk like a Boston man. Where'd you come from? Oh, around Lexington Way. And you Lexington? Say, were you there this morning? Well, of course I was. That's where the barber... I Never mind about the barber. Were Miss Hancock and Mr. Adams still at Parson Clark's? Well, uh, they might have been, for all I know. But I couldn't say. Great heaven, is there a man in the American colonies who don't know Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams? Oh, well, uh, there seems to be me. But uh, speaking of strangers, uh, there was two of them staying at the parsonage when I rode past. One was a handsome man. The other man uh, looked more like a bulldog. So they are still there. And the British ready to march. Did you see many soldiers as you came to my shop, Mr. Butterwick? See them. They chased me into a tar barrel. It was a whole parcel of them by the common with guns and flags. Looked as if they meant business. Thank you, Mr. Butterwick. You're a shrewd observer. You've done me and the colonies an invaluable service. Well, that's nice to know, but uh, speaking of this tooth... <laughs> You're a stubborn man, Mr. Butterwick. All the better. I like stubborn men. I wish we had more of them. Well, one good turn serves another. You've helped me. I'll do my best for you. I've made artificial teeth, but drawing them is hardly my trade. All the same, let's have a look. Here, come over here by the light. Hi. And now open. Ah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Motherwick, it appears to be compound agglutinated infraction of the upper molar. Oh. And I'm afraid I can't do anything about it tonight. But, but, but uh, here's a draft that will ease the pain for a while. There. Drink. <clears throat> it's, um, it's spicy and, uh, and queer. <laughs> Never mind. Now you go to a tavern, get a night's rest, come back see me in the morning. I'll find a truth drawer for you. If I'm here. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, you must have some liniment. Uh, it's a queer kind of shop you have here, Mr. Vare. Yeah. <laughs> some folks think so. Say, uh, what's in that little bottle? Where? Oh, there. That's a little chemical experiment of mine. I call it Essence of Boston. But there's a good deal of the east wind in it. Essence of Boston? Well, they did say you was a wizard. It's... Genuine magic, I suppose. Genuine magic? Of course. And here. Here's the marsh with your liniment. Hey, no, no. Not that one. This one. Ah, thank you. Uh, but that other little box there, the little silver one with the stars on it and the elm tree. Oh, yes. You like it? Pick it up. Yeah, mighty pretty work. Thank you. My own design. Thirteen stars there. See them? Uh-huh. You could make a very pretty design with stars for a new country, say, if you wanted to. I've sometimes thought of it. But, um, uh, wh what's in the box? It feels queer. What's in it? What's in the air around us? Gunpowder? War? Making of a new nation? But the time isn't right yet. Not quite right. You mean... That this here revolution that folks keep talking about? Yes. In this box? Glory be. 
Master Avia, it's come. It's come. The message from Dr. Warren. William, my writing boots. Now, hurry. I must be off. Sorry, Mr. Butterwick, but I must rush. Take your liniment and come back tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Yes, I, thank you, I, if I'm back thank tomorrow, you, I'll help you. Yes, today, sir. It's on a day. It wasn't till Lige Butterwick was alone in his room at the tavern where he was to stay the night that he realized what he had done. In the bustle and haste of leaving Mr. Revere's shop, he had picked up the wrong box. Instead of the box of liniment, he held in his hand the little silver box with the 13 stars upon it. He hadn't quite believed Mr. Revere when he talked about the box. But then, everything had seemed so almighty queer since he'd arrived in Boston. And his tooth ached, and his head felt light. And he, being human, was curious. He looked for a keyhole. But there was none. The box wouldn't open. He shook it. Suddenly, it felt warm. As if the was something alive inside it. He held it to his ear. Great Godfrey. Now, Elijah Butterwick was feeling scared. But he was feeling kind of good, too. And then he found out that he was talking to himself. Well, I'm not a Britisher. I'm a New Englander. And maybe there's something beyond that. Something people like Hancock and Adams know about. And if it has to come with a revolution, well, I guess it has to come. Can't stay British as forever here in this country. But what am I going to do with this box? Too big a job for one man. Guess we'll have to take this back to Paul Revere. <laughs> First, he went to the little shop on Clark's Wharf, but it was closed up tight. And it was a while before he could rouse anyone. Then it was the boy, William, who opened the door. Oh, it's you. Well, Master Revere isn't here. But I've got to find him. Can you tell me where he's gone? Why do you want to know? Got something for him. He needs it. You wouldn't be a spy for the British now, would you? A spy? Me? Well, then what is it you got for him? This box. Little silver box. Took it by mistake. Think it's important. The box? By the flag, it is important. But he's gone. Gone to warn the patriots that the British are coming. Uh, which way, boy? Which way did he go? Uh, across the river. Uh, to Charlestown. All right, thank you, boy. I'll be following. No, you don't get any boats for me. There was a crazy man long here an hour ago, and he wanted a boat, too. My husband was crazy enough to take him. And then do you know what he did? No, ma'am. He made my husband take my best petticoat to muffle the oars so they wouldn't splash when they passed that Britisher ship. My best petticoat, mind you. Huh. When my husband comes back, he's going to get a piece of my mind. Uh, was his name Paul Revere? Was he a man of 40-odd, keen-looking, kind of Frenchy? Don't know what his right name is, but his name's Mud with me. My best petticoat tore into strips and swimming in that nasty river. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'll get a boat elsewhere. Mr. Butterwick, sir, be careful. Your own is right under the stern of a British man of war. Don't worry, I see it. Please, Mr. Butterwick, shh. Oi, there! Good evening, Mr. Christian. Good evening. I guess not. Thought I heard a boat. Be careful, Mr. Butterwick. All right, boy. Revere, he's been gone an hour. Gone? Gone where? Riding to Lexington to warn Hancock and Adams as soon as he spied the lights up there in the North Church. I've got to catch him. It's this box. He's got to have it. Where can I get a horse? Right over here. Come on. Out through the darkened streets of Charlestown, he rode. On into the black of the countryside. Once he got lost, but he found his way again and rode on. It was just dawn as he came in sight of Lexington, and the dew was glistening on the green of the April grass. But Lige Butterwick didn't notice the beauty of the dawn. The little silver box was hot now and burning in his pocket. And then suddenly he reined in his horse. 
were there on the road were two men carrying a trunk. And one of them was Paul Revere. Well, Mr. Revere, say I'm on time for that little appointment about my tooth. Well, um, <laughs> it's you. <laughs> you are a stubborn man, Mr. Budwick. I'll allow. But uh, you give me a merry chase all night. I've had one myself. Been captured by the British once and escaped. Don't know what's still in store for me, but we're carrying a precious cargo here in this trunk. We're bringing to safety all the private papers of Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams. Uh, which reminds me, I've uh, something for you here. What? A silver box. You've got the silver box. I, by mistake, and it's getting frightfully hot in my hand. Yes, my friend, and a little wonder. Look across there, Lexington Green. The Green? What? Why, there's a line of Lexington men. And there across the creek, facing them, is a column of British redcoats. Aye. Lined up with guns, they are, Mr. Bradwick. They've come to arrest Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams, and the minute men stand before them. Mr. Fair, I'm a peaceable man. I've had little notion of politics. But I don't like what I saw in Boston. I don't like soldiers chasing peaceable citizens into tar barrels or uppity ladies with imported British manners. And I don't like British redcoats on Lexington Green. That I don't. Mr. Bedwick, what are you doing? I'm stamping on your silver box, Mr. Revere. I'm breaking it open. Do you know what you've done? You've let out the American Revolution. Look, they've fired the first shots. Well, I guess it's about time. And I guess I'd better be going now. Uh, but, Mr. Bedwick, where are you going? Home. Got a musket on the wall there. I'll be needing it. Uh, but here, what about your tooth? Oh, a tooth's just a tooth. But a country's a country. Anyhow, doesn't ache anymore. Escape, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Tonight brought to you A Tooth for Paul Revere by Stephen Vincent Benet. Adapted for radio by John Dunkel and featuring Harry Bartell as Lige Butterwick, Parley Bear as Paul Revere, and Barry Kroger as the narrator. Special music by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are deep in a fabulous cavern in the mountain, surrounded by a horde of angry natives from a lost world held at the mercy of the most beautiful woman in the world, the terrible queen called She. Next week, we escape with H. Ryder Haggard's famous story, She. Good night, then, until the same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. There he goes, into the drugstore. He's stepping on the scale. Weight, 241 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is the fat man? Gambling at its best is a sucker's bad time. And the schmo who makes a steady diet of it ought to take a course in simple mathematics. He's got a better chance of striking oil in his own backyard than he has of winning a sweepstakes. And if he thinks he can outguess a roulette ball, he's a real dreamer. But the gent who gambles with someone else's life is the biggest jump of all. Because his high OUs are never marked paid in full until he gets the chair for murder. <laughs> That's the Fat Man. A fast-moving criminologist who dips the scales at 241 pounds. Brought to you by the Norwich Pharmacal Company, makers of Pepto... The Fat Man, starring J. Scott Smart. In tonight's adventure, Murder Wins the Draw. <laughs> Thank you.
When a happy tourist goes to Central America, he usually runs into nothing more dangerous than a good cup of coffee and a fried banana. But with me, it's different. If there's trouble around, it always walks right up and pokes me in the eye. However, this particular form of trouble wasn't hard to look at. She had the kind of legs you see in the hosiery ads and a profile to match. But when she grabbed my arm in the airport at married a Yucatan, I had a hunch that although the mistake was hers, I was the one who lived to regret it. Darling. What? Oh, Angel, I was so worried you'd miss our plane. Have your bag checked, Alan. We don't have too much time. The name happens to be Runyon. Oh, Porter. Porter, those suitcases. Wait a minute, count to seven. The plane for Guatemala City. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to New Orleans. You're going to Guatemala City, dearest, with me. And here's your ticket. <laughs> pushed something into my hand and led me to a counter. When I opened my palm, I saw it was a roll of $50 bills. But it was the anguished look of terror on her face that stopped me from brushing her off. Twenty minutes later, I was heading south to Guatemala City and wondering why. Okay. Okay, what? Let's have the gimmick. <laughs> I'm afraid I owe you an apology. I've made a slight mistake. Well, don't let it worry you. I'm used to boarding planes that fly in the wrong direction. I like to take the long way home. How can you ever forgive me, Mr. Runyon? Let's dispense with the syrup, sweetheart. I prefer an explanation. I made a mistake. We'll let it go at that. You've been paid for your trouble. There was over $500 in that roll. I have nothing more to say, so leave me alone. She wasn't kidding. All the way to Guatemala, she kept staring out the window, and I could have gotten more conversation from a dummy. She was the first one out of her seat when we landed at the airport, and she'd finished with her baggage inspection by the time I reached the customs counter. But as the porter put my suitcase on the counter next to her, she suddenly grabbed my arm again and went into the old refrain. Darling! This is where I came in. Oh, darling, we'll be late. Ask that customs agent to look at your suitcase. They were in a hurry. Once is enough, sweetheart. No encore. But, dearest, we have an appointment at the hotel. Please, don't be difficult. I'm looking for you. Oh, hello. Who's the fat guy, Helen? He's here to protect me. Don't hand me that. Get your bag. Helen, don't. You're hurting my arm. Get your bag. Just a second, Miss. You'll keep out of this. Helen, please. Please don't start any trouble. I'll come with you. All right, Porter, grab that suitcase and let's get out of here. Uh-huh. I reserve the room at the hotel grand for you, Helen. All right, all right. Senor. Uh, huh? Customs Inspector Senor, you will please open your suitcase. Oh, oh sure. Uh, I'll be in here but my personal thing. <laughs> Is that so, Senor? <laughs> What's so funny? The next time you buy a girdle, Senor, you might try a larger size. Now, wait a minute. Put your silk nightgowns are exquisite. <laughs> this is not my suitcase. <laughs> there are no apologies necessary, Senor. I'm happy to see you are wearing the new look. Stop <laughs> chilling yourself and give me an exit stand, Chico. I'm taking those nylons back where they belong. <laughs> I checked into the Hotel Grand about half an hour later and gave the desk clerk a description of the gal who grabbed me at the airport. And it was now in possession of my shirt and shorts. He gave me a room number and a little bellhop escorted me upstairs with a running account of the natural wonders of Guatemala City. And the girls, senor, ah, we have so many beautiful girls, and Pedro can arrange for you to meet the best. Who's Pedro? At your service. Uh, this way, senor. Uh, let's go in the other direction. But your room is 65. Right now, I'm looking for 78. Well, that room is already occupied, senor Runyon. And look, Pedro, don't argue. Lug that bag to 78. Whatever you say, senor. Now, there it is, right across the hall. See. There is no one inside, Senor. You got a pass key, haven't you? But this is very irregular. Uh, how about this? <laughs> For a slight fee, Senor, almost anything is regular. I have a key, of course. There you are, Senor. The room, as I told you, is occupied. You're right, Pedro. It's occupied by a corpse. I do. <laughs> The corpse was a woman I'd never seen before, quietly dressed and about 40 years of age. 
She was sitting in a locker pinned against the back by the blade of a three-foot machete. The security police identified the woman by her tourist card. Her name was Alice Vinson, and her home was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The motive wasn't petty theft because her cash was in her handbag. And one look at her prematurely aged, not-too-attractive face convinced me it couldn't have been a crime of jealousy. Along about 11, I tried to get some sleep. But I hadn't even got my shoes off when my phone started ringing. Yes? Mr. Rudyard? You're speaking to him. I hope I didn't wake you. No, no, not at all, sweetheart. Well, this is Helen. You remember, don't you? Oh, sure, I remember. You're one little number I'll never forget. I'm afraid there was a mix-up at the airport. Yeah, a little switcheroo. You've got my suitcase, Mr. Runyon, and I've got yours. I only wish I had your nerve. What? Did you check into room 78 at the Hotel Grand tonight? Why, uh, I know. They've got you listed on the register, baby, and so have the Guatemalan cops. Well, I haven't done anything. Anyway, I've called you about something more important. Really? I want my suitcase back. Well, come over and get it. Well, that, that's rather difficult right now. Can you come to me? It'll be a pleasure. What's the address? I'm calling from a public booth. I'll pick you up on the corner of 12th and Avenida Marcos in 15 minutes. Is that convenient? Very. And you'll have the suitcase with you? Tucked right under my chubby little arm. Oh, then I'll see you in 15 minutes, Mr. Runyon. And thank you ever so much for being so obliging. All right, all right, keep the shirt on. Well. Senor Runyon? Yes? I would like to talk to you, senor. Alone. She couldn't have been more than five feet tall with the delicate features of a doll. Her voice was like sugar cane, and when she smiled, it reminded you of a Caribbean moon. A nickel-plated short barrel thirty-eight revolver in one of her neatly manicured hands completed the picture. Sit down, senor. Thanks. And please don't move. It would be rude of me to blow your brains out, no? To say nothing of the inconvenience. Where is the suitcase? What suitcase? The one you will produce for me before I kill you. Oh, oh, that one. I have no time for the stall, senor. The suitcase, por favor. In that closet. Yes. And now, senor, if you will turn around and face the wall. What are we playing? Cross in the corner? Turn, senor. Yes. No. Yes. As I said before, she couldn't have been over five feet tall, and she was as delicate as a doll. But when she brought the butt of that rod down on the back of my skull, it was like playing patty cake with a pile driver. I must have been out for half an hour, and when I started to come around, my head seemed to be rattling like a couple of dice cubes. But as my eyes slowly came into focus, the dice cubes changed to footsteps, and I realized that someone was casing my room. When I opened one eye, I could spot his number 12 shoes as they passed back and forth six inches from my nose. I bided my time until my strength started flowing back. Then, as he passed me once more, I reached out and grabbed his ankle. Hey, easy, nurse. Just won't let go of me. Just as soon as I check your pockets. Oh, please, you stupid ears. Oh, quiet, sweetheart. What do you think you're doing? I said quiet. Hey. That's better. Now, you get up and talk this thing over. Making a big mistake. Yeah, sure, I know. Everybody seems to be making mistakes in this part of the world. Where's Helen? I don't know who you mean. You're the man who met her at the airport, the guy she called Alan. My name is Runyon, and I'm in a very bad mood, so start making some sense. Okay, okay. I only came here to get our suitcase. You said you delivered, you never showed up. Well, I'm all ready to keep that appointment now. Where's the bag? Don't tell me you didn't find it. Stop calling me, Runyon. This is no laughing matter. Alice Vincent would have testified to that along about the time someone stuck a machete in her chest. What? You didn't know? No one I know. Look, Runyon, is that suitcase really gone? 
How do you think I collected this lump on my skull? She got here ahead of you. Like a lying little tramp, she crossed me again. What makes that suitcase so valuable, Alan? That's my business. But if you want to play ball, I'll make it worth your while. Are you open to a proposition? We'll talk it over on the way to the security police. I'll be a sap running. you got nothing on me. The only thing you can hold me for is room breaking. Is that all that interests you? Frankly, no. I'm looking for bigger fish to fry. All right, it's your chance. I played along with that double-crossing female once too often. If she's open for a murder rap, I don't want any part of her. What's your proposition, mister? It involves a quarter of a million bucks. Mmm, a lot of zeros. A hundred and twenty-five grand for each of us, Runyon. Do I deal you in, pal? Start shuffling the cards. Okay. Then follow me. <laughs> Well, this is a mighty peculiar fat man, Kate. Now let's catch up with the fat man. Guatemala City at night is one of the quietest places in the world. The streets are dark and lonely, and you can count the strollers, if any, on the fingers of one hand. I didn't trust this loudmouth Allen guy any further than I could see him. And when he stepped into the shadows of an open doorway, I almost jumped him. But then I saw him bend over a figure huddled on the step. Yes, sir. The old woman says Helen has to come back yet. You suppose she ran out on you? No, she's got to come back. I got her passport and tourist cards. She can't leave this country without them. You still no. haven't told me what's inside that suitcase. Why should I tell you? So you can grab hold of it yourself and cross me, too? You'll work with me and we'll split 50-50. That's the deal. Okay, what's next on the list? Well, I'm waiting here for Helen. I got a room on the second floor. I thought you stopped at the Grand. Well, sometimes it doesn't hurt to have more than one address. Tell you what, Ronnie, you go back to your hotel room and I'll call you when she gets here. I can handle this gal alone. And let you run out on me? Well, you shouldn't be so suspicious. Would I have told you this much if I wasn't on the level? When will I hear from you? The minute Helen shows. Okay, Alan. I'll be waiting for your call. I could almost feel his wiseacre grin on the nape of my neck as I turned and walked away. But that grin would have turned a little sour if he could have read my mind. The lobby was empty when I reached the hotel. But I found the boy I was looking for asleep in a chair near the vacant bar. Pedro. Hmm? Hmm? Pedro, 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 wake up. Oh, oh, senor, what can I do for you? I'm looking for company. Oh, a girl to talk to, senor, to dance with, perhaps? What do you got to offer? Guatemala is full of lovely women, senor. Lolita, Conchita, Chiquita, Malita. I know them all, senor. The gal I'm looking for is about five feet tall. She wears her hair in a bun on the back of her neck, and she's very easy on the eyes. Ah, you all the girls are easy on the eyes, senor. This one's got a small birthmark on her cheek. Looks like a triangle. Now, that would be Lolita. You have picked the most beautiful in the city. And can I meet her? Si, senor. Where? At the Club Cantale. A nightclub? It's a place where you can dance for ten centavos. Oh. She works there, huh? See, si, Lolita is very popular with the boys. Yes, she would be with her lovely disposition. You know where is the Club Cantale? No. Suppose you trot along with me, Pedro, and introduce us. <laughs> The Club Cantale was a tough little joint in the senior part of town. The kind of place that supplied dance hostesses for the customers. Half a dozen girls were lined up at the bar when Pedro and I walked in, and I recognized the cutie who clipped me. I turned my back and sat down at a table as Pedro went over to talk to her. He said a few words, then brought her over to where I was sitting. I turned around just as she reached the table. And you could have knocked her over with an eyebrow pencil. Hello, Lolita. Oh, don't you recognize me? No. Take a look at this lump on my head. It might refresh your memory. You know each other, senor? And how? You can go back to your snooze now, Pedro. I'll carry on from here. Uh, senor, before I leave, I have some lottery tickets. All very good numbers, senor. I sell them as a sideline, no? So does everyone else in Central America. 
No, I'm not playing the lottery, lottery Pedro. Take this five and beat it. Hey, Lolita, this is number... Get out of here, stupid... Hey, wait a minute, Pedro. Leave that ticket on the table. Here, uh, keep the change. Gracias, senor. Oh, Pedro, you know what that ticket means? Yeah, what is it? Well, you know, Pedro, I'm not playing the lottery, Pedro. Take this five and beat it. Hey, Lolita, this is number... Get out of here, stupid... Hey, wait a minute, Pedro. Leave that ticket on the table. Here, uh, keep the change. Gracias, senor. Oh, muchas gracias. What's the matter, Lolita? Nothing. This lottery ticket bother you? I don't know what you're talking about. Lolita, I understand the tourist trade is appreciated here in Guatemala. Mm. I don't think the cops would like it if I told them you ran around slugging their better customers with revolver butts. Oh, and there's also a little matter of murder, Lolita. Murder? Now, it's funny how that word gets a double take from everyone. Were you an innocent bystander, too? Senor, I will make you a proposition. Go right ahead. I've been getting them all night long. How would you like to share a fortune with Lolita? Between you and this Alan character, I'm getting to be a wealthy guy. Alan? Skip it and keep talking. Do you know what was in that suitcase I took from your room? I didn't up to now, but I think I can guess it. Uh, was it a lottery ticket, Lolita? The winning number for the Grand National, 250,000 hectares. The Grand, she stole it. Helen? Si. Who owned the ticket first? This I do not know. Then how did you find out about it? In the hotel lobby. I hear that blonde girl on the tall gringo talk. He squeezed her arm and she said the ticket is in her suitcase. Then she finds out the suitcase is not hers. The one she has is missing. Oh, then what? Well, they both leave the hotel to go back to the airport for the bag. Five minutes later, you walk in. I see you have a bag that looks like the other one. And I hear her say something about a fat man. So you decided to climb on the bandwagon yourself? This is the truth, Senor Ronnie. Where's the suitcase now? In my dressing room. But something is wrong. I, I search for an hour and I do not find the ticket. Maybe you didn't look for it in the right places. Well, this time, you'll get some help from me. If her story was straight, I was beginning to get an idea of how the late Alice Vincent was mixed up in it. All I had to do now was to make sure I didn't walk right into what Alice did. Lolita's dressing room was in back of the club, and when we stepped inside, we ran into an unexpected guest. It was Helen, the girl with the taking wave. And she was bending over the leather suitcase with a penknife in her hand. What are you doing in my room? I was just waiting to talk to you. You have no right to search my suitcase. Your suitcase? It happens to belong to me, you little thing. Don't you call me a... Take it easy, girl. Take it easy. The party's young yet. Oh, I should have known you were working with her. You're as big a crook as she is. You mind if I see what you just cut out of that suitcase lining... I don't know what you mean. She has the ticket. It was in the lining and she has it in her hand. Turn it over, Alan. Not a chance. You stole that winning ticket from Alice Vincent. Well, she can't prove it. It's not registered in her name. Whoever turns it in collects the money, and I'm the one who's turning it in. You're right about one thing. Alice Vincent can't prove it. She's dead. Huh? Dead? And if you try to turn that ticket in, baby, you'll get the squeeze for her murder. Oh, you're just bluffing me. I didn't kill her. She took me on as a traveling companion in New York. When I left her a couple of days ago in Merida, she was alive. You were in hot water right up to your pretty neck, Helen, and it's beginning to boil. Well, all right. Well, then I'll, I'll make you a proposition, Runyon. Hold your hat, boys. We'll split on this ticket 50-50. We don't have to fight about it. We can both be rich. And what about me? You. You can drop dead. I... Yeah, well, I'll spit in your face. Have a good time, girls, and remember, no fighting in the clinches. They were scratching their initials in each other's skin as I closed the door behind me, holding the lottery ticket Helen had dropped when Lolita opened with her first right cross. Fifteen minutes later, I was climbing the stairs to Alan's furnished room, where I found him pacing the floor like a hungry coyote. She didn't come back yet, Runyon. It's all right, sweetheart. I found her. She did? Yeah. And I've got the lottery ticket you were so cagey about. Let me have it. Not so fast. I'm entitled to a little explanation in as much as I'm an active partner. What kind of an explanation do you want? Helen stole that ticket. She was supposed to split with me, but she ducked out the Yucatan. That's why she grabbed me at the airport. She thought you might follow her. I wasn't even there when she left. I know that. You'd left for Guatemala on Alice Vincent's trail. She was going back to collect on her winning ticket, and she probably never even knew your girlfriend Helen had grabbed it until she got to Guatemala City. You need that ticket running, you're wasting time. I'm in no hurry. Listen to the rest of my story. Before. Interesting. 
You didn't know that Helen had stolen the ticket either until you maneuvered Alice Vincent into that hotel room and jabbed her with a machete. Wait a second. Then you caught on, and you decided to wait at the airport to grab your ex-partner. You knew she had to get here sometime to collect her dough. You must be nuts, Runyon. I didn't murder Vincent. No? No. Then who did? Helen, naturally. But she couldn't have. She never even came up to her hotel room. You both found out she had the long suitcase in the lobby and you went back to the airport. I found the body before she could have returned. And what does that add up to? It adds up to this, Sonny. Alice Vincent was murdered before your gal friend even landed here. She was stabbed in a room which you reserved in Helen's name. Helen didn't have to kill for that ticket, mister. She already had it. But you didn't know that, so you knocked off Alice Vincent and then found out she only wasted a lot of time. What are you trying to do? Grab that money for yourself? I'm turning that lottery ticket over to the government, sweetheart. And from there, it goes to Alice Vincent's estate. Are you crazy? I thought you said we were partners. I don't hold hands with a guy who's three feet from a Guatemalan firing squad. You're the last one who's going to cross me, Runyon. (laughs) You ought to know better than to draw on a man with his hand in his pocket. But you were never too lucky when it came to a draw in any case, mister. The number you picked on the last one is up. While the fat man rests up after that. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. It surely is. After all, the temperature does vary in the Argentine. A capillaris can be very warm if he's after a woman. And very cold if he's out to kill a man. You know, of course, that I'm married to Greg Collins, the famous private detective. I'm Gail Collins. And I'll be back in a moment to set the stage for our puzzling crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. Tell me, Senora Collins, you mentioned the Argentine. What's our story titled tonight? I call it The Chrome Yellow Death. Mmm, sounds exciting. Believe me, Jack, it was. Greg and I received an invitation to Los Colorados, just outside of Buenos Aires. Very wealthy tobacco magnate Tom McDougall owned an exquisite hacienda farther inland. In rather fetid, tropical, almost jungle area. He had known Greg a long time, and he'd asked us to fly down from San Francisco as his guests, including the plane fare. What especially intrigued Greg, though, was that instead of the usual come and visit me note, the letter from McDougal hinted that there were some high jinks going on in Cruz Angelo. Anyway, we had left the airport and driven way inland to Tom's Hacienda, where the foreman greeted us. Bienvenido, senor y senora Collins. Welcome. I am Antonio Sebastian, senor McDougal's foreman. I will take the baggage, I think, no? Hello, Antonio. We haven't seen you in about five years, have we? No, senora. It is a pity. It is a shame. Where's Tom, Antonio? Out in the tobacco fields, I suppose. Ah, no, senor Collins. Uh, Senor McDougal, he never go near... He just let Antonio grow the tobacco. He stay here all the time. Uh, he will be here soon, I think. Uh, would you like to make yourself comfortable? Oh, Please, sure. Uh, here, I have prepared a daiquiri for you. Oh, that's oh, well, that's Antonio. Nice. Yeah. Antonio, make the best daiquiri in all Argentine. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Well, salute. Salute, y pesetas, y amor, Antonio. Salute, senor y senora Collins. Sensational. Oh, I'm going to steal you from Tom, Antonio, just to have you in San Francisco. <laughs> we'll pay you twice what Tom does. And all you have to do is make Dakiri. Antonio. Antonio. Ah, there's Senor McDougal now. I'm here, Senor, with your visitors, Senor and Senora Collins. They're here. I hadn't expected them so soon. Greg, my boy, and Gail, how are you both? Oh, we're fine, thanks, Tom. And you look a bit hot and bothered. Something wrong? Yes, a fire almost destroyed my tobacco crop. What is that? Oh, we got it out. 
but it was a pretty close thing. You were in the field, senor? Yes, Antonio. And something's very funny down there. I'll talk to you about that later, after dinner. Daddy. Oh, Lorna. Uh, Greg, Gail, you remember my daughter. Yes, of course. Oh, hello. Hi, oh, hello. Um, Daddy, did you tell me the truth? Do you swear you didn't hurt yourself putting out that fire? No. Have I ever lied to you, Lorna? Yes, often. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you something when we finish dinner, Greg. Huh? Uh, what's that, Tom? Something I found in my tobacco field. A rag. Soaked in kerosene. You found what, senor? A rag, Antonio. Soaked in kerosene. Somebody started that fire deliberately. But why, Tom? I don't know, Gail. Something screwy is going on here, and I can't figure it out. Today, we had a brush fire. Last week, someone put poison in my wells. Antonio and I have watched and waited. We even notified the police. and had a few agents to police here, hanging around for a while. Anybody in these parts got it in for you, Tom? Oh, no, senor. Senor Tom, everybody love him. Everybody except Granite. Who's Granite? Chapel lives about ten miles from here. Wild little fellow. He's an exporter. He's also a nut about Latin American culture. He collects things. Has about a dozen rooms full of Aztec weapons, Mexican novelties, Brazilian coins, all kinds of junk. Well, what's he got against you? He wanted to buy this place. Of course, I wouldn't sell it to him. But you're wasting your time thinking it's granite. He's clever. He wouldn't be pulling any of these stunts. They're too obvious for a man like him. Daddy, I still say you should sell and let's get out of here. I, I hate this place. It's horrible. I can't sleep nights. Oh, please, senorita, do not cry. Hello, Lorna, darling. Oh, hello, Stuart. Greg, Gail, this is Stuart, my fiancé. Uh, hi, oh, Stuart. Oh, oh. You're just in time for dinner, Stuart. He's always just in time for dinner. Oh, now, Daddy, you've got to stop that. Young man, I'm among good friends, so I can speak freely. Someday, I'm going to take you by the seat of your pants and toss you up, once and for all. Look, McDougal, you might as well get used to the idea that I'm going to marry Lorna. Because that's exactly what's going to happen. It is, eh? Why, you insolent... Daddy, young... please. We have guests. Oh, oh, oh yes, eh? I'm sorry, Greg, Gail. That's okay, Tom. Daddy's just in a bad mood because we've had some more trouble. I know. I heard about the brush fire. Mr. Granite told me. You know Mr. Granite, Stuart? Yes. I work for him. I'm his foreman. Is he in town now? Yes, he is. And he's on his plantation. Now, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Collins, but you're on the wrong track. Mr. Granite isn't the only person in town who has a grudge against MacDougall. Stuart, don't start that Look again. Look here, Stuart. Oh, Senor Stuart, please, you know how you say exaggerate. Do I, Antonio? I began to see that Tom MacDougall's beautiful hacienda was actually a very strange place. There was hatred and suspicion everywhere. But keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a minute with more of our story. After dinner, Greg and I took a stroll in the grounds. It was cool, the stars were out, and we stood by a long line of fountains that Tom had lit up with colored spotlights. Oh, aren't those fountains gorgeous, Greg? I know something much prettier. What? You, Tom. Oh, Greg. That's the first nice thing you've said to me for ages. Why aren't you romantic anymore? I know the next line, bub. It's about how marriage changes men and they take their wives for granted. But you do. Now, look, darling. Let's go up on that little balcony. You see it? Mm-hmm. The stars are shining right on it. Just see if I've forgotten how to be romantic. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Greg. Come on. The stairway's over here. Uh, Greg, Look. Under that archway on the floor. It's Tom. He's fainted. Here, let me see him, Gail. What's that around his neck? It's a gimmick they call Las Bolas. Three strips of leather with three lead balls. But what's he doing with it? What's wrong with him? Las Bolas has one major purpose, Gail. And it's just served that purpose very well. You use Las Bolas to commit murder. 
The dead body of Tom McDougall sprawled on the colored tiles by the fountains in the starlight was a gruesome paradox. Greg leaned over, loosened those leather strips that were around Mr. McDougall's throat. It's quite a weapon, Gail. Used extensively in Argentine. These three lead balls are each at the end of a leather strip, see? An expert, and only an expert, can use Las Bolas. And he tosses it, sometimes from as much as 20 feet away. One ball knocks the victim unconscious. You see that bruise on Tom's head? Yeah. The other two wrap themselves around the throat, strangling the victim. Evidently, that's just what happened to Tom. We'd better call Antonio, don't you think? He can get the police. Antonio! Antonio! You call me, Senora Collins? Madre mia! Senor McDougal! Ah, Los Bolos! He, he's dead? He's dead? Yes, Antonio. Oh, Senor McDougal. Mr. Collins, Stuart and I wanted to ask you if... Daddy! Well, what's wrong with him? What's happened? Daddy! Your father is dead, Lorna. Oh, oh no. Easy, Lorna. Easy. Come with me, honey. Sit down over here. Did you find MacDougall's body just that way, Mr. Collins? Just this way, Stuart. Not five minutes ago. Recognize this yellow leather gadget? Yes. They call it Los Folos, don't they? Yes, they do. Take care of Lorna, Gail. I'll get someone to phone the police. You kill Senor McDougal. That is what I think, Senor Stewart. Shut up, you crazy fool. You hate him. You kill him. Where'd you get that idea? When you learn how to use Los Bolos. Suppose I do know how. That doesn't mean I'd murder McDougal, does it? Please, please stop fighting this way. Daddy's dead. What good does it do to accuse each other? I think I can help, Lona. How? By going to the other plantation and talking to Granite. Stuart and Lorna stayed and waited for the police. Meantime, Greg and I got into a station wagon with Antonio and did 85 on those dirt roads till we reached Granite's plantation. Granite was a queer-looking duck, short, shabbily dressed, with very heavy glasses. He smoked small black cigars and peered at us behind a huge desk covered with paraphernalia. <laughs> what can I do for you, Mr. Collins? I have some news for you, Mr. Granite. Mr. McDougal is dead. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I loathe the man. A heart attack, I presume? No, no heart. Somebody kill him with Los Bolos. Well, then, he had the satisfaction of dying in a rather picturesque way. Uh, most of us aren't that fortunate. You wanted to buy Mr. McDougal's estate, didn't you? Oh, yes, indeed. I'm an exporter, Mr. Collins. The McDougal estate is by the waterfront, uh, has a ready-made landing... Uh, by the way, will you give Lorna McDougal a message for me? Yeah, what is it? Tell her I want to see her. Say it's very important. I'd never have persuaded her father to sell. He's very stubborn. Well, uh, somebody save me a headache. Do not speak of the dead this way, Senor Granat. You'll be punished. Senor, Senora Collins, please excuse me. Oh, where are you going, Antonio? I wait outside. I cannot speak to Senor Granat. If I speak to such a, how you say, man of the devil, poor Antonio will be punished himself. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, like most of the natives, Mr. and Mrs. Collins, Antonio is an illiterate fool, weaned on superstition. I'm sorry, Mr. Granite. I'm very fond of Antonio. You still haven't told me why you came here, Mr. Collins. You suspect me of murder, of course. But you must be incredibly naive to think that you could just walk in and have me hand you a written confession. I haven't accused you of murder, Mr. Grunner. I'm just, shall we say, gathering information. Let me help you. Would you like to look around my place? Most of my guests find it fascinating. I've dozens of rooms in which I've gathered Latin American curiosa. One entire room is filled with the remnants of the Mayan civilization. Oh, and uh, by the way, you'll see also a bolos, uh, which I know how to use. Uh, mine is painted green. 
What color was the one the killer used? Chrome yellow. Oh, disturbing shade. I don't like it. Would you and your lovely wife care to follow me? I can describe the items in my collection as we go. Thank you, Mr. Grennett. I'd rather not. Then may I offer you a drink? I have one of the largest wine collections in Argentine. I think we'd prefer to leave right now, Mr. Grant. Very well, Mrs. Collins, just as you say. My man tells me you came in your own station wagon, or I'd be happy to offer you a car. Uh, the front door is this way. Good night. Good night, Mr. Grant. Coming, Antonio? The station wagon is right outside, senor. I drove it around to the front. I... Oh, my head. I feel dizzy. I feel sick. Antonio, what's wrong? Oh, sick. Antonio feels sick. The drink, there was... There was poison in the drink. Oh, what drink? Uh, Try to talk, Antonio. What drink? Say no, Grana. Man, he give me drink while I wait out here. Oh. Oh, oh. Antonio! He's been poisoned! I resent the accusation, Mrs. Collins. Antonio may be ill for half a dozen reasons, but certainly not because of anything he was served in my house. Uh, I'll call a doctor. You'd better call a doctor, and quickly, too. If Antonio dies, you'll have killed him. I'll have the physician come over at once. Don't excite yourself, Mrs. Collins. Antonio! Oh, he's so cold, Greg. And his eyes. Gail, we've got to leave Antonio in Granite's hands. But we can't. We must. Why? We've got to get to Lona McDougall. Bring her back here as soon as possible. We drove to the Hacienda, picked up Lorna, and made all speed back to Granite's place. As we walked through the huge entrance, across the tiled floor. Look, there's Antonio. How are you, Antonio? Better, Senora. Mr. Granite did not send for the doctor. He didn't. Well, where is he? I'll tell him a he thing. He took good care of Antonio. Got me these blankets. Put me on the sofa and gave me a drink. Antonio better. See, Greg? Granite got a little too ambitious. He knew he couldn't let Antonio die right in front of our eyes. Where is he, Antonio? In that room, senor. He went in there. I think. Antonio not sure. Antonio fell asleep. All right, Lorna. You know what to do. Go into that room? That's right. Tell Granite you want to know exactly what he has to say. Why he wanted to see you. And don't be afraid of him. Remember, we'll be right outside the door. What are you doing? Uh, don't worry, Antonio. Just relax. Go on, Lorna. Through that door. Stand over there, Gail. So Granite can't see you when she opens the door. Ready, Mr. Collins? Ready. Open the door. Well? See him, Lona? No. No, he's not here. I don't see him anywhere. I... What is it? In the corner of the room. Mr. Granite. He's dead. Lost boulders. Mr. Granite was lying in the corner of his room with a yellow leather bolus wrapped around his neck. His face twisted in agony, with a horrible purple tinge from strangulation. In just a minute, we'll bring you the climax of the case. <coughs> Greg had examined the body and called for the police. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. You've had more than your share, Lorna. I don't understand it, Greg. All this time, I've been thinking that Mr. Granite was... The killer... Well, I was on that trail for a while myself, Gail, but... Mr. Collins, Mrs. Collins. Oh, there's Stuart. What are you all doing? What? Oh. Mr. Granite. He's dead, Stuart. Died the same way Tom McDougall did. Mm-hmm. North Wallace, huh? Where'd you come from, Stuart? I work here, Mrs. Collins. I told you that before. I'm Mr. Grant's foreman. Antonio, is this the man who gave you the Drink? Drink? What's wrong with Antonio? No. Senor Granite has houseboy. You know, 
I think we could wash this up even before the police get here. The police? Now, if you'll calm down for a second, Lorna, and answer a question or two. Please, please, no more questions. Not about Daddy anyway. I can't talk about that, please. Now, take it easy, Lorna. Sit down. <laughs> have a cigarette. I'm sorry I only have these native cigarettes. Oh, no, no, thank you. I only smoke American brands. Anybody else? Antonio. I bet you could use one. Oh, uh, thank you, Senor Collins. <sighs> ah, that is what Antonio need. Calm the nerves, I think. Why don't you take the chair in the corner, Stuart? I'm sure we'd all stop screaming at each other if we could get at the truth. Back. Never mind the psychological approach, Mr. Collins. All this cozy business doesn't impress me at all. Get to the point. Oh, I will. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I will. If I can get everybody to cool off. Uh, how about you? Uh, smoke? All right. I'll take one. <coughs> what the... <coughs> what the kind of... <coughs> <laughs> What's in this cigarette? It's marijuana. What? Greg, did you say marijuana? That's right, Gail. The killer smokes marijuana, and he... You are very much smarter than I thought, Mr. Collins. Antonio! Get out of my way, Mrs. Stop, Collins. Stop him! He'll get out through the window. Quick, the ball is on the wall. Give it to me. Here. Watch out, Antonio. I'm going to throw it. No! No, don't throw it! Oh, my legs! My legs! You're lucky, Antonio. I decided to wrap it around your legs and take you alive. You're lucky I didn't give it to you in the throat the way you did with MacDougall and Granite. After they took Antonio away and we said goodbye to Stuart and Lorna, we decided to finish our vacation in Caracas, Venezuela. As we waited in the airport. All right, Greg. Start from the beginning about Antonio. And tell me slowly. Because I'm not in a very bright mood. Well, it isn't complicated at all, Gail. When Antonio collapsed, after he said he'd been poisoned, a packet of cigarettes fell out of his pocket. I recognized them. They were marijuana cigarettes. Well, that gave me a hunch. And when we went back to pick up Lorna, I had a look at the tobacco growing there on the outskirts of the McDougal plantation. It was marijuana. But what's that got to do with it? Uh, don't you see? I've clinched it. Antonio, when we first met him, said McDougal never examined his plantation at all. He left it to his charming foreman. Antonio. Then if you knew it was Antonio... Well, I, I wasn't absolutely positive, Gail. Until I purposely offered those cigarettes to Lorna, Stewart, and Antonio. And, of course, all they knew was that I had a native pack. Lorna refused them. They made Stewart sick. But Antonio enjoyed them. I know the rest. I can fit the pieces together as well as you can. Antonio was probably growing the marijuana way out near the jungle where McDougal wouldn't notice it. Yeah, that's right. Antonio not only smoked the awful stuff, but mm, probably sold it at a terrific profit. He poisoned the wells and started the brush fire because he wanted to jinx the place. He didn't want anyone to buy the plantation. They might find out his secret. But McDougal must have stumbled across the stuff, so... Antonio killed him. That's the deal. Then, to throw suspicion off himself, he slipped himself a mickey in Granite's house. But Granite, who was a very sharp apple, must have guessed Antonio was faking. So, Granite had to get the Bolas treatment, too. Villa, call for flight 63 to Caracas. Greg, darling, when we get to uh, Caracas, you owe me something. Yeah? Uh, what is it? A balcony in the starlight. Uh -huh. You were going to show me that even though we've been married for a few years, you could still be romantic. 
You're going to recite poetry and give me flowers and... Oh, no, girl. Oh, no. Oh, not me. I don't get romantic with all that icky stuff. But, Greg, when we do get to that balcony with gardenias all around it, the stars are out, and we're alone, what will you do? Hmm? Oh, I'll think of something. Well, folks, Gail and I hope you enjoyed our adventure, The Chrome Yellow Death. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For where there is crime and romance, there you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Colin. Neighborhood Chevron Gas Station invites you to Let George Do It. Brought to you by the makers of climate-tailored Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. George Valentine opened his own office, he advertised to the world at large that no matter what problem might be troubling them, all they had to do was leave it to George. Since then, he has had a variety of clients with a variety of problems. Now it's early morning. George is just opening the door to his office. Oh, here's Mr. Valentine now. Well, good morning, Claire. Mr. Valentine, this is Mr. Ralston. He's been waiting to see you. Oh, fine. Glad to know you, Mr. Ralston. What can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Valentine, do you... Uh, do you like dogs? Do I like dogs? Why, Mr. Ralston, you're speaking of man's best friend. Everyone else may fail you, but a dog remains faithful and loyal to the end. I guess I like him. Why? Because I've got to find Snookums a home for a couple of days. Snookums? My dog. Oh. My wife calls him Snookums. She... She's a great one for nicknames. She calls me Bunny. <laughs> Where do I come in on this, Bunny, uh, Mr. Ralston? Well, you understand I can't trust just anyone with Snookums. He's a very valuable dog. Uh, besides, my wife is quite fond of him. But, Mr. Ralston, why do you have to find a home for him? Well, I, uh, well, uh, I've got to have him out of the house for the next couple of days. Why? Because I, uh, well, because I just do, that's all. Well, why not send him to a kennel? Oh, I couldn't do that. They might, uh, I mean, they, uh, well, I, I couldn't do that. Why not? Snookums wouldn't be happy there. You see, he doesn't like dogs. <laughs> he doesn't like dogs? No, just people. Uh-huh. <laughs> Mr. Valentine, I, I believe you're just the man I've been looking for. Uh, will you take care of Snookums for me? Oh, but Mr. Ralston... You'd I... have to keep him with you all the time. I'll be back here day after tomorrow to pick him up. Uh, will you do it? Uh, I don't know about that. I'll pay you well, of course. How well? Uh, suppose we say uh, $200 for the two days. Uh, $200 and expenses? Oh, yes, of course. $200 and expenses. Mr. Ralston, I'm your man. But, Mr. Valentine... It's all right, Claire. Where's Snookums now? Well, uh, downstairs in my car. Uh, you'll have to take him right away. I can't keep him with me for another minute because I... But, well, I mean, uh, well, you see, I'm in a hurry. Claire, get Sonny. Have him go with Mr. Ralston to my apartment. Sonny can stay with Snookums till I get home. All right, Mr. Valentine. Then I'll see you day after tomorrow, Mr. Ralston? Oh, yes, certainly. I'll be here. Oh, and, uh, Mr. Valentine... Uh... You'll be good to him, won't you? Good to him? <laughs> ah, don't you worry, Mr. Ralston. That mutt has got himself a mother. Okay, Claire, let's go. I bought Snook of something for supper. What'd you get? Quarter pound of hamburger. Oh, do you think that'll be enough? Well, it ought to give him two good meals anyway. What kind of a dog is he? Uh... Well, to tell you the truth, Claire, I forgot to ask Mr. Ralston. He was in such a rush. He certainly was. Yeah. Snookum. Must be a lap dog with a name like that. Think so? Yeah. Probably a Pomeranian or a Pete. Mr. Valentine, I don't like to keep bringing up a woman's instinct. 
but I wish you hadn't gone ahead with this. Now, what's the matter with you, Claire? Why, what could be softer? $200 in expenses just to have a dog for a roommate. Yes, but there was something about Mr. Ralston. He seemed to be keeping something from me. Oh, women and their imagination. Come on, hurry up. Snookums must be getting hungry. <laughs> I hope Sonny's been nice to Snookum. Oh, you don't have to worry. Sonny's always been crazy about kittens and rabbits. Yeah. I suppose he likes little dogs, too. I hope so. <laughs> Yo! Hey, look up! Mr. Valentine, it's a whole... No, no! Now, don't be afraid, Claire. It's just a great day. Just a great... Mr. Valentine! Down, Snookum! Down! He wants the meat. Well, I'm trying to give it to him. Get down! Get away from me! Mr. Valentine, give him the meat! But he wants my arm, too. Look, throw the package on the floor! Oh, here, Snookum! Yeah, there. Phew. Okay, Claire. Oh, look at your apartment. Oh, you mean what's left of it. Now, why would Sonny let him chew up the furniture? You'd think he'd have enough sense to take care of him. You'd think you'd have enough sense to ask what kind of a dog it was. Oh, where is that kid? That's funny. I wonder what... Oh, Mr. Valentine, you don't think... Now, Claire, don't be silly. He's a friendly dog. Too friendly. Sonny, where are you? On top of the mantel. <laughs> Sonny! What are you doing up there? He kept knocking me down. I had to get away. Oh, Sonny, you're a coward. He's bigger than I am, Mr. Valentine. I didn't mind when he knocked me down and licked my face, but I got a little nervous when he started putting my head in his mouth. <laughs> All right, come on down. Now while he's there. Claire, put Snookums in the kitchen. Put him there yourself. You're his mother. Oh, great. Here, Snookums. Snookums. Oh, follow me, Snookums. You run, he'll follow you. He will? Okay. Come on, Snookums. <laughs> He followed me. Now, stay in there, you big mutt. All right, Sonny, you can come down now. Okay. A little lap dog. Well, how was I to know? I've got news for you, Mr. Valentine. He eats six pounds of food a day. Six pounds? What kind of food? I'm not sure. He seemed awful fond of my head. Okay, I'll get him a bone. Mr. Valentine, if you listen to me, you'll take that dog right back to Mr. Ross. Now, Claire, I promised to take care of him, didn't I? Anyway, I don't even know where Mr. Ralston lives. You see, there's something awfully fishy about the whole thing. Maybe it isn't even his dog. Will you stop it? All right, have it your own way. But I'm not staying. See you in the morning. Yeah. Good night, Mr. Valentine. Uh, Sonny, wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? Oh. Oh, no, you're not. You're going to stay here and help me take care of Snookums. But, Mr. Valentine... You heard me. Where will I sleep? Well, you can sleep with me. And where will Snookums sleep? In the kitchen. Okay. But you tell him, will you? Well... Good night, boys, and sweet dreams. Sonny. Hmm? What's the matter? Will you please get your cold feet off my back? You must be dreaming. <laughs> oh, Sonny, stop it. Oh, Sonny. It isn't me, it's Snookums. Snookums? Why, you get out of this bed, you mutt. Now go on, feed it. Sweet dreams, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, sweet dreams. Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Mm. Yeah. Huh? Snookums. What? Your turn, Mr. Valentine. Oh, not again. <laughs> Oh, Claire, it's you. Good morning, Mr. Valentine. Beautiful morning. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, Sonny. Jeepers, says, how can you be so cheerful so early in the morning? It isn't very early. Oh, we didn't get much sleep last night. Oh, too bad. Where's the new boarder? In the kitchen, eating his breakfast. Horse meat, pounds and pounds. He's practically got the whole horse in there. <laughs> I brought you the morning paper, Mr. Valentine. Oh, that's thoughtful of you. Here, read this story on the second page. Why, something special? I don't like to say I told you so, Mr. Valentine. Read it for yourself. Hey, what's it all about? Go ahead. Softer and chats. It's a picture of Snookums. Read it. Valuable dog stolen. Stolen? Hercules of Meadowbrook, owned by Madame Charlotte Cornwell Smith, famous retired opera singer. Opera singer? Disappeared from his home yesterday. Oh, I don't want to read any more. Go ahead. What does it say, Claire? Madame Cornwell Smith entered him in the dog show tomorrow morning. He was expected to make his championship. 
Foul play is suspected. Well, do you suppose Ralston stole him and then got cold feet and dumped him off on me? He's your little charge. You figure it out. Jeepers, Mr. Valentine, what are you going to do? Well, we've got to get Snookums to Madam Cornwell Smith's home without the police seeing him. Uh, maybe she'll believe my story. It's going to take a little doing to get that big ox home without somebody seeing him. But we can't keep him here. That dog is wanted by the police. Yeah. We got a hot dog. <laughs> Down. Okay, Sonny, open the front door and see if the coast is clear. All right, Mr. Valentine. Claire, where'd you park my car? Around the corner. I couldn't get any closer. Well, if the coast is clear, we'll make a dash for it. You and Snookums make the dash. I'll catch up with you. Mr. Valentine. What's the matter? There's a policeman crossing the street, and he's headed this way toward this building. Oh, great guns. Come on, we got to get him back upstairs. You haven't got time. Then we got to hide him. Have you got a piano box handy? Oh, wait a minute. Look, in front of Mrs. Jones' apartment. A buggy. A baby buggy? Yeah. Come on, Sonny. Help me. But, Mr. Valentine... Mrs. Jones won't mind if we borrow it for a few minutes. Sonny, get his feet. He keeps wiggling them. Claire, help him. I'm trying to. Now, give him a shove. <laughs> there it is. Okay, cover him up. You wheel him, Claire. You wheel him. He's your baby. Oh, thanks. Now, come on, fast. And don't stop to talk. Open the door, Sonny. I've got all my fingers crossed. He's coming this way, all right. Oh, Lady Luck, stay with us. Well, good morning, folks. Out to give the baby an errand? Oh, uh, that's right, officer. Come along, sweetheart. Uh, can I take a peek? I'm just crazy about babies. Oh, uh... uh he's sleeping, officer. Oh, too bad. Who does he look like? Just like his mother. Uh, uh, isn't that nice? You're too modest, darling. Officer, he's the image of his father. Really? No. Oh, yes. He has his father's ears. <laughs> Come on, Claire. Goodbye, officer. Uh, say, did you hear a dog last night? We got several complaints from this building. A dog? Well, uh, we were awfully busy last night, officer. Snookum kept us up. I know how that is. I got six just like yours. <laughs> I want to speak to Madam. Why, it's you. Oh, hello, Mr. Valentine. I want to talk to you. Not so loud. Uh, uh, come in. Well, what are you doing here anyway? Why, I live here. You live here? Certainly. I'm Mr. Madam Cornwall Smith. Huh? I mean, she's Mrs. Ralston. Well, now, look. I don't know what this is all about, and I don't want to know. But I've got your dog outside my car. You come on down with me and get him, you understand? Mr. Valentine, you promised you'd help me. I don't want to be in on anything crooked. But this isn't crooked. You see, first, there was her voice. Her voice? I had to play second fiddle to my wife's voice. Oh, that's right. She was an opera singer, wasn't she? Uh, then I bought Snookums. And since then, she's paid no attention to me at all. Snookums comes first. Why, I'm the one who's been leading a dog's life. Well, I'm very sorry for you, Mr. Ralston, but she I don't... She said she'd enter him into this show, but she promised to give him away if he didn't make his championship. Give him away? My brother has children. They'd love to have Snookums. Are they big, strong children? You see, Mr. Valentine, I'm afraid that if he's in the show, he'll become a champion. And you know what my life will be like then? You mean you want me to keep Snookum so that he can't be in the dog show? Is that it? Will you do it? Oh, now listen. The police are looking for him. Well, I can't call them off or my wife will suspect me. But the dog belongs to me, not to my wife. And I have papers to prove it. I'm sorry, Mr. Ralston. I'm your client. You can't let me down. I don't like to, Mr. Ralston. It's only until tomorrow. It's the only thing I can do to get a little uh, attention around this house. Things have got to change. After all, I've been a chump for 30 years. Okay, Mr. Ralston, okay. I guess I can be one for another 24 hours. Well, George seems to be having a lot of trouble with his latest client, a great Dane. We'll see what happens in a minute. Meanwhile, I'd like to talk about two of the best things in a motorist's life that are free. Sure, you guessed it. I mean free air and free water. And my point about these familiar conveniences is very simple. They really are free at a Chevron gas station. The Chevron dealer never wants you to feel that just because you want a tire checked, you have to buy a quart of RPM compounded motor oil or some Chevron Supreme gasoline. No, sir. He welcomes the chance to fill your radiator to check your tires. It lets him prove that he really is alert and cheerful about his service. All Chevron gas stations, you know, are home-owned. And the best way these local businessmen have of making good is to treat you right. Just remember that next time your radiator or tires need checking. 
Look for a cream green and burgundy Chevron gas station. You're always welcome. And your Chevron credit card will be good as gold. George promised Mr. Ralston he'd hide Snookums until after the dog show. Now, it's a few minutes later. George, Claire, Sonny, and Snookums are driving home. Of all the crazy fool jobs, this takes the prize. Playing nursemaid to a dog, I quit. Now, Claire, will you stop it? We'll get to my apartment soon, and all I have to do is keep him there until tomorrow. Hurry, will you, Mr. Valentine? There's not much room in the back of this car for both Snookums and me. Now, Sonny, with Snookums on the floor, you've got the whole back seat to yourself. Yeah, we started out that way, but now our positions are reversed. Mr. Valentine, don't pull up in front of the building. What's the matter? That policeman again. Oh, no. He's talking to some woman. Mrs. Jones, we borrowed her buggy. What are you going to do? Oh, uh, drive her out of the back of our building. Sonny, you take Snookums up the fire escape. Oh, Mr. Valentine. Clara and I will wait until the coast is clear, then we'll go up the front way and let you in. Why do I have to be the one to take Snookums? Now, Sonny, follow order. <laughs> Did you unlock the back door, Claire? A few minutes ago. Then what's keeping Sonny and Snookums? I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Valentine. Oh, well, I'd better find out. Sonny's probably got his hands full. Not a sign of him. There's Sonny, at the bottom of the fire escape. Sonny, what are you doing down there? I'm looking for Snookums. What? Where is he? If I knew, I wouldn't have to look. What are you talking about? Sonny, come on up here. I was afraid something like this would happen. Now, Claire, a dog his size doesn't just disappear all of a sudden. Sonny, will you hurry? I'm coming as fast as I can. What happened? Where is he? Well, you see, when we got to the fire escape, he went ahead of me. When I was on the second floor, he was on the fourth floor. Why did you let him go to the fourth floor? I live on the second floor. Yeah, I know that, but I don't think Snookums does. Oh, never mind. Which way did he go? Well, then I went up to the fourth floor, but he went down to the first floor. And that's the last I saw of him. Do you suppose he's somewhere in the building? Claire, you go to all the apartments on the first floor. I'll take this floor. And Sonny, you take the third and fourth floors. Hey, why do I get two floors? Because you lost him. Now get going. Isn't that your telephone, Mr. Valentine? Yes. Come on, Claire. Sonny, you go ahead and find Snookum. I'll try, Mr. Valentine. Want me to get it? Never mind. Hello? Hello, Mr. Valentine. Yes? This is Mr. Ralston. Oh, yes, Mr. Ralston. Something terrible has happened. Dumpling has had a nervous collapse. Who's Dumpling? My wife. Oh. She's worried about Snookums. That's why I called you. Mr. Valentine, I've decided to tell her everything. I want you to bring the dog back. Well, I can't do that. You can't? Why not? I mean, you can't do that. Uh, now, look, Mr. Ralston, this is your chance to take a firm stand. You don't want to be a chump for the rest of your life, do you? Well, no, I don't think so, but... Mr. Be... Ralston, be a man. But she cries all the time, and it's so unnerving. I think I ought to let the... get the dog back to her. Yes, Bunny, I think you're better. Who said that? It sounded like my wife. It is your wife. I'm on the extension phone. Oh, dumpling. <laughs> Well, uh, you see, dear, uh, it was like this. We'll discuss uh, that later. Mr. Valentine? Yes, Mrs. Ralston. You bring that dog back here immediately, do you understand? Oh, but, uh, Mrs. Ralston... I said immediately. But, uh, you uh, Snookums likes it here. I don't care about that. I want Snookums. Oh, well, you'll get him back when I find... when I find time. Has something happened to Snookums? Oh, no, 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 of course not. Well, remember, he's going to be in a dog show tomorrow. I know, but... Yes, yes, you see, that's just it. You don't want him doing a lot of traveling today, do you? It might upset him. Well, Snookums is sensitive. Oh, he is. Very sensitive. Very well. But if Snookums isn't back in time for the show and in good condition, you can do your explaining to the police. Is that clear, Mr. Valentine? No, perfectly clear. All right. Put him on. Put him on? Yes. I want to talk to him. You want to talk to Snookums? He'll recognize my voice. Oh, he always recognizes your voice, Dumpling. Put him on. You, uh, just a minute. Claire, what am I going to do? She wants to talk to Snookums. Figure it out for yourself, Mr. Valentine. Oh. Uh, here, Snookums. <laughs> Snookums. <laughs> oh, Snookums. All right, Mrs. Ralston. He's listening. Oh. Go ahead and talk. Snookums. Hello, my precious. Hello, my angel. Speak to Mother. Sweetheart. Snookums, speak to me. <laughs> What's the matter with his voice? Bad connection. Oh. Now remember, the first thing in the morning, Mr. Valentine, we'll meet you at the dog show. All right, Mrs. Ralston. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Ralston. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Valentine. Uh, goodbye, Dumpling. You come upstairs. Hello, girl. 
girlie. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you, but have you seen anything of a dog? Hey, how are you, girlie? A large dog. Hmm. Hey, what are you doing this evening? Looking for a dog. Um, pardon me, but have you seen anything of a dog? A dog? Yes, ma'am, a dog. He just got home from work. He's eating his supper. <laughs> Come on, will you hurry up? Now where are we going? Well, it's a cinch he's not in this building. We'll have to look in every building for miles around. Sonny, why didn't you hang on to him? Jeepers, I'm sorry. Oh, you're sorry. A lot of good that does. Don't you realize he's a very valuable dog? Maybe we ought to call the police. Oh, if they hear about this, then I will be sunk. I'm sorry, Mr. Valentine. Will you stop saying that? Now take it easy. Well, can you blame me? I fail a client. His wife never speaks to him again. The man's life is ruined. And Sonny's sorry. I'm very sorry. Oh, come on. Mr. Valentine. What's the matter? That policeman again. Oh, just keep right on walking. Don't see him. Wait, just a minute there. I want a word with you. Oh, (laughs) good afternoon, officer. What were you doing with Mrs. Jones' buggy? I found it for her around the corner. Oh, (laughs) Oh, darling, we we forgot to return her buggy. (laughs) You forgot, sweetheart. Yeah, well, I'm terribly sorry, officer. I'll apologize to Mrs. Jones when I see her. And another thing. Mrs. Jones tells me you don't even have a baby. Now, what's going on around here anyway? Well, uh, you, uh, she she didn't know about it. I mean, it just happened, yeah. I mean, you know, sort of sudden-like. Wasn't it, darling? Oh, yes. Very sudden. Well, where's the little one now? Where's the little one? Well, he's he's at Grandma's. Yes, we're just going to get him. Goodbye, officer. I'll see you again. I think he's getting suspicious. Well, we have enough to worry about. Hey, something's going on across the street. Well, come on, let's go. Maybe one of them has seen Snookum. Is that a restaurant? Well, in a way. It's called Frank's Place. Ladies invited. I never saw such a sight. He dashed over to our table and knocked it right over. Uh oh. Well, he almost caught the riot jumping up on it. It sounds like Snookum's all right. Come on. <laughs> hey. Hey, this is no place for Snookums. He's not old enough. Mr. Valentine, look. It's Snookums. He found asleep. Asleep? He's out. Poor Snookums. Oh, he shouldn't have done it. I guess he's going to the dogs. You better wake him up so he can walk home. He's in no condition to walk. Then what are you going to do? Carry him. Mr. Valentine, aren't you overestimating your strength? Well, I'll just have to do it, that's all. Sonny, give me a hand. I can't budge him. Claire, get his feet. Sonny, get under him. All together now. Steady. Oh. Don't stop. Almost. There. Oh. What a load. Help me walk, Claire. Sonny, get on the other side of me. Okay. All right, let's go. Hey, did this case to come out? Oh, yes. They fit your dog, bud? Yeah, thanks a lot. Not so fast, bud. That dog did a lot of damage around here. Okay. Claire, give the man my card. Just send me a bill. You bet I will, bud. You owe me for three tables, six chairs, and a dozen glasses. Yeah? Yeah. And six short beers. Oh, I don't know if I'll ever be able to make it. We're almost there, Mr. Valentine. I'll never be the same again. Uh Uh-oh. Now what? That same policeman outside your building. Oh, cover Snookums up, Claire. With what? Use your coat. Oh, no, you don't. I just bought this coat. Hurry up. I'll get you another one. With a fur collar? And ermine tails. Cover his face, too. Now, come on, walk fast. He's looking our way. Well, don't pay any attention. Hey, you! Hey, what have you got there? Oh, <laughs> hello, officer. Just bringing baby home again. <laughs> I thought it was a new baby. That's an awful big load you've got. Uh, well, you see, we... Uh, uh, well, didn't we tell you? Tell me what? You tell him, darling. Oh, no. You tell him, sweetheart. Well, somebody tell me. <laughs> Twins. Twins? You didn't say anything about twins? Well, I... I didn't want to brag. <laughs> twins. What do you know about that? Now I've just got to have a peek. Oh, Claire. I'm sorry, officer. Night air, you know. Bad for them. Yeah, they're so young. We can't uncover their faces. It'll be very unhealthy for us. For them. Yeah, sure, sure. We'd better get them right in, sweetheart. Yes, darling. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Burp. It was your... Oh. <laughs> and what was that? That was his brother. Okay, Mr. Valentine, I put some more 
ice in the ice bag. Okay, put it on his head. Here, Mr. Valentine, another can of tomato juice. Put it down, Claire, and help me rub his paws. Why don't you just let him sleep it off? Don't you realize this dog has got to be in a dog show tomorrow morning? Jeepers. Well, there's only one thing left. A cold shower. But how are you going to get him in it? One of us will have to get in with it. Don't look at me. I'm not looking at you. Mr. Valentine. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm very sorry, Mr. Rolfe. Oh, you did what you could, Mr. Valentine. There'll be no living with them now. I wish I could help you. No one can help me anymore. Uh, Mr. Ralston, about my bill? Oh, just mail it to me. But there were a few expenses. Expenses? Yeah, 12 pounds of meat, one damaged apartment, one damaged restaurant. We'll forget about the damaged nerves. Just send me the bill. Buddy! Buddy! Uh, uh, we're over here, Dumpling. Uh, we wanted to get away from the crowd. Oh, isn't it wonderful? At last, my ambition has been realized. Snookums is a champion. Oh, congratulations, Mrs. Ralston. Oh, you're really the one who should be congratulated, Mr. Valentine. Why? What do you mean? Well, usually, Snookums doesn't show at all well. He gets so nervous and skittish. That's so? I don't know what you did to him, Mr. Valentine, but I never saw such a change in a dog. Bunny, did you notice? He was so dignified, so sedate, so sober. Yes. <laughs> we finally managed to straighten him out. I owe you a great deal, Mr. Valentine. I wish I could think of some way to repay you. Oh, I can think of a way. Oh? You see, Mrs. Ralston, I've become very fond of Snookums, and I'd like to know that he was happy. You don't think he's happy now? Why, he's a champion. Well, I, I don't think that means much to a dog, and Snookums is a very affectionate animal, Mrs. Ralston. He should be around children. Children? <laughs> That's right, Dumpling, and my brother's family. Well, maybe you're right, Mr. Valentine. Maybe he's right, Bunny. I think he's wonderful. Snookums doesn't really need me now that he's a champion. And besides, I just bought Nero of Falconville. You bought another dog? Oh, yes. And if I devote myself to him, someday I may have another champion. Dumpling. Come, Bunny. I want to introduce you to Nero. Goodbye, Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine. I'm sorry, Mr. Ralston, but I can't do anything for you. Bunny, are you coming? Yes, Dumpling. <laughs> Ah, oh, the poor little guy. Hey, you. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, no. Hello, officer. Well, congratulations, young man. Congratulations? For what? For what? I see your twins won his championship. George will be back in a moment. Meanwhile, most everyone, I suppose, has heard of the hit show Harvey. It's all about a rabbit that no one ever really sees. Well, your neighborhood Chevron gas station has a Harvey, too. Only instead of a rabbit, it's a welcome mat. And as a matter of fact, this welcome mat isn't so very invisible if you look real close. There's welcome, for instance, in the smile of the attendant at a Chevron gas station. That clean, bright, cream green and burgundy paint job seems to say welcome, too. It's in the accommodating way the Chevron man checks your tires or wipes your windshield. And in the way he gives you street directions or says thanks a million when he returns your Chevron credit card. Naturally, there's a good reason for the friendliness you meet at Chevron gas stations. You see, they're all home-owned. They're local businesses that depend on keeping folks pleased to keep their trade. And remember, all Chevron dealers carry RPM compounded motor oil and Chevron Supreme gasoline. <laughs> Well, next week, Mr. Valentine is in for a mad chase, and you'll probably hear something like this. Mr. Valentine, do something. She's trying to lose us. Keep your eye on her tail light, Claire. I'll fix her. What are you going to do? Turn off our lights so she won't know we're following her. Mr. Valentine, don't do that. I can't see a thing. What are you worried about? I can't see anything either, and I'm driving. <laughs> Mr. 
Chevron gas stations all through the West invite you to be with us again next week for another chapter of Let George Do It, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It, starring Robert Bailey as George, with Francis Robinson as Claire and Eddie Firestone Jr. as Sonny, is written by Pauline Hopkins, produced and directed by Owen Vincent. Others in the cast were Junius Matthews as Mr. Ralston, Georgia Backus as Mrs. Ralston, Willard Waterman as the policeman, Herman Waldman as the bartender, and Ed Harper as the woman, and Snookums was played by Earl Keane. The music was composed and conducted by Charles Dent, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Woodbury Facial Soap. The beauty soap for the skin you love to touch. Your love never, never change. Keep that breathless charm. Won't you please arrange it? Cause your love just the way you look tonight. Woodbury, the makers of Woodbury Facial Soap, the beauty soap made for the skin alone, present... The Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North. Pam feels like going to the movies because she decided that Jerry's been working too hard and needs an evening of relaxation. Well, it's all right with Jerry because he feels like going to the movies, too. But he'd like to know what they're going to see. So as he and Pam walk toward the neighborhood theater, he asks her... What picture are we going to see, Pam? Oh, I forget the name of it, darling, but uh, I know you'll like it. It has, um, what's her name in it? And I like her, huh? Oh, you know who I mean. She was in that picture with, uh, oh, you know, uh, Jerry, that that tall, dark-haired fellow. There are a lot of tall, dark-haired fellows in the movies, darling. No, but uh, this one, um, uh, he was... Uh, I know, I know. He played in the picture with what's her name? That's right. Oh, what is his name, Jerry? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, I see I'm not the only one who forgets names. And you always say that I never can remember. Mm. Oh, that reminds me, Jerry. I forgot to tell you. Uh, that fellow phoned today. What fellow? I-, I don't remember his name, darling. Uh, but I wrote it down. And his phone number, too. Well, who is he? What do you want? Oh, you know, that author. Darling, I know lots of authors. I'm a publisher, remember? Well, uh, this one's from out of town. Uh, Ohio or someplace. Eugene Lawrence? Yes, that's it. Eugene Lawrence. Is he in town? Yes, but uh, he'll be leaving tomorrow. But Pam, I want to see him. Where'd you say he's staying? I didn't. I don't remember, Jerry. Uh, But I I wrote it down. Well, I'll go back to the apartment. I want to call him. You go on the show. But, Jerry... Darling, this is important. It's business. I'm publishing his book, and there are certain points we've been discussing through the mail that I'd like to talk over in person. Now, where did you write his phone number? On a folder. Folder? Uh, Yes, dear. It's right next to the telephone. What kind of a folder? A match folder. You you can't miss it, dear. It's orange and black. I remember. It has the name of that awful nightclub you lured me into going to the other night. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. But why do you have to take messages on match folders? Well, it was right there next to the telephone. Couldn't you use the pad? No, dear. Why? It was in the kitchen. What was the telephone pad doing in the kitchen? The kitchen table wobbles, Jerry. Oh. I still don't see what you're making such a fuss about. I threw the folder away. Oh. When? Just now, a few minutes ago, somewhere between here and the apartment. Come on, let's retrace our steps and see if we can find it. All right. Jerry, are you sure it's not in your pocket? Positive. There was only one match left, and I used it. I remember distinctly because I was so pleased with myself for lighting the cigarette on a single match with the wind blowing. Well, then you should remember where. Darling, I don't make it a point to notice my surroundings every time I stop to light the cigarette. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? Uh, a chewing gum wrapper. Uh... You know, Jerry, I don't think you're fair. You threw the match folder away, and... Then you blame me. Of course I threw it away. It was empty. How was I to know there was anything written on it? 
Well, I don't see why you have to be so mean about it. Oh, I'm sorry, darling. It's just that I'm anxious to talk to Lawrence. I won't say anything more about it. But let's try to find the folder. Oh, well, uh, there's a pile of rubbish, Jerry. Maybe it's in there. Well, let's see. No, that's not it. Maybe under here. You know, if you could only remember the name of his hotel, try and think. Uh, hotel, um... Uh... It, it began with an R. Or was it an M? Oh, I know. Caldwell. Caldwell? No. No, that's not it. Anyway, Jerry, I couldn't help it, could I? Couldn't help what? That one leg of the kitchen table is short. I guess not. What you doing, mister? Oh, hello, son. We're looking for a match folder. I got a match. Uh, thanks. That's not what we want. It's the folder. A special one? Yeah, orange, and it has the name of the Zigzag Club on it. Zigzag Club? Uh-huh. Look, I'll tell you what I'll do. That match folder is somewhere between here and 24 St. Anne's Place. You help us look for it, will you? If you find it, I'll give you five dollars. Five dollars? Gee! That's right. And we'd better get back to the apartment, Pam. Maybe Lee Lawrence will phone again. But the movie. Oh, I don't care so much for what's her name after all. Nice evening. Beautiful evening. It stinks. Okay, so it stinks. What do you have? Nothing. On the wagon? I'm here on business. Where's Dutch? In the back. Well, I want to see him. Lula's with him, and he don't want to be disturbed. Yeah, but this is important. It's about the north. Oh. Okay, come on. Hey, uh, you see this tooth? Which one? The one that's missing. No, I don't see it. It ain't there. You know why? No. I walked in on the boss and Lulu once before. Well, this time, not. Okay. Who is it? It's me, Axel. What do you want? Pinky wants to see you. Says it's important. Something about them Norths. Oh, all right. Wait a minute. Okay, Pinky, what's on your mind? Uh, would you pay five bucks for a folder of matches? Huh? I said, would you pay five... What kind of matches? Ordinary ones, like they give you when you buy cigarettes. Are you nuts? Look, um... You don't like that North guy, do you? Look, you said something about matches. The North helped put the law onto your brother, didn't they? Okay, okay, so I hate him. If it wasn't for them, Mac wouldn't be giving the best years of his life to the warden at Sing Sing. What's that got to do with buying match covers for five bucks? Well, if North was mixed up in something, something fishy now. Is he? Could be, could be. Come on, come on, open up. What gives? What do you know? Well, when a guy offers five bucks for a folder of ordinary matches, wouldn't you detect a strong odor of mackerel? You mean North wants to pay five bucks for matches? That's what I overheard him offer a kid on the street. Look, North lost a folder of matches, and if the kid could ah, find it, right... I'd like to see that folder. Suppose I found it. Suppose I got it right here in my pocket. Have you? And suppose it has a name and a phone number on it. Okay, suppose it has. Well, what's it worth to you? That all depends. Maybe it don't amount to anything. Yeah? Then why is North so anxious to get it back? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Let's have the folder. Oh, not so fast. I got to get something out of this. Okay, okay. Give me the folder. I'll call the number and say I'm North. I'll find out what the setup is. And if it's worth anything to me, you'll be taken care of. How do I know I can trust you? I got an honest face. Come on, let's have the folder. Well, all right, but I got to get my cut. Okay, okay. Where's the folder? Here you are. Good. Come in. What's going on, Doc? Be with you in a second, honey. I got to make a phone call. Oh, what's it all about, Axel? Oh, hello, Pinky. Hello. Uh, Pinky found some $5 matches and the boss got interested. Say, what are you trying to... Hello? Hello? Uh, is that Mr. Uh, Lawrence? Eugene Lawrence? Yes, this is he. Oh, well, this is Gerald North. Oh, hello there. How are you? Oh, uh, I'm fine. How are you? Okay. Say, look, I've been thinking over what you suggested, and I've decided you're right. Yeah? Well, well that's nice. Yeah, it would spoil the whole thing if the murder is discovered too soon. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. It has to be kept quiet, and it won't be hard. After all, if Mrs. Stokes keeps her story, there's no way for anyone to find out except the doctor, and he can be bought off. Bought off, huh? It all fits together. She got all the money from her uncle, so money doesn't matter to her, and it's right in character. In character? Sure, and wait till you hear the news.
and you ain't live up, so no one will find out her uncle was crazy. Crazy, eh? Yeah? I don't want to tell you over the phone. I'd rather have more time to talk it over. Are you busy now? I could run over. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Come on over. Are you home? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm home. Oh, good. I'll be right over. Uh, let's see. The address is uh, 24 St. Anne's Place, isn't it? I guess so. I mean, yeah, sure, sure. Fine. I'll be there in ten minutes. Now, so long. So long. What's going on, sugar? Plenty. Boy, oh boy, am I gonna make that Weisenheimer sweat. I told you to be good. What Weisenheimer, Dutch? That North guy. I'm gonna square things with him and that dumb wife of his. Oh, but how? Who was that you were talking to on the phone? Friend of North. Seems they're covering up for some rich dame who knocked somebody off. And aren't they just gonna love it, though, when little Dutch walks in and tells him he knows all about it? Well, what do I get out of it? You'll get yours, don't worry. The dame has a lot of dough she got from her batty uncle. And she's willing to spend it to keep things quiet. Well, she better pay plenty or I'm going Okay, gonna... okay. Come on, Axel. You and me are going over and collect. Okay, boy. Hey, how about me? You wait here. We'll be back. All right, but hit him for plenty. And remember, I got to get what's coming to me. Don't worry, brother. You will. But first, North is going to get what's coming to him. Come on, Axel. <laughs> We'll be back with the Woodbury Facial Soap program and Mr. and Mrs. North in a minute. But first, this is Ben Grauer for Woodbury Facial Soap, the beauty soap made for the skin alone. When a man says he likes you to look natural, ladies, you know what he means. He wants you to look naturally lovely. And that's why those smart young beauties, the marrying Woodbury Debs, never miss their Woodbury Facial Cocktail. One of the most glamorous Woodbury Debs to marry recently is pretty Joanne Newcomb of California. She's now Mrs. Guy Price, Jr. Her complexion is velvet smooth and clear. And if you could ask her about skin care, she'd tell you... He loves me with that fresh, natural look my Woodbury facial cocktail gives. So I pat Woodbury lather into my skin till it glows, then rinse twice, first with hot water and then with cold. Now how does it happen that so many popular girls trust their complexions to no soap but Woodbury? Because Woodbury facial soap is made for the sole purpose of keeping skin lovely. By skin scientists who know the nature of fine textured skin and how to care for it. They put into Woodbury facial soap only the purest beauty oils. Plus a special costly ingredient for extra mildness. Naturally, your skin is softer, smoother, clearer after a Woodbury facial cocktail. So ask for Woodbury facial soap and follow the marrying Woodbury Debs to romance. Now, back to the Woodbury Facial Soap program, The Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North. Hello, I'm Eugene Lawrence. Oh, swell. Come on in. Thanks. Oh, it's good to meet you, North. After all the letters we've written back and forth, it seems like we already know each other. Yes, gosh, I'm glad you came over. I've been trying to get hold of you, but your number was mislaid, and I didn't know where to reach you. I beg your pardon? I said I didn't know where to reach you, or I'd have called. But you did call. I did? I mean... Huh? Don't you remember? No, what are you talking about? Our conversation about the book. You mean what I wrote to you? No, what you told me on the phone. On the phone? Huh? But I... Oh, here's my wife. Uh, Pam, I want you to meet Eugene Lawrence. Oh, hello, Mr. Lawrence. Uh -huh. I'm so glad that you didn't wait for Jerry to phone you, because there was only one match left, and Jerry threw away the folder. Uh, well, what's that? Yes. I suppose it's really my fault, but you see, one leg of the kitchen table was short, and I put the pad under it, so I had to use the folder. Oh. We looked all over the street, but we couldn't find it. Jerry even got down on his knees in the gutter. In the, in the, the gutter? Well, in the gutter. Well, what was he doing there? Well, looking for your telephone number, of course. I uh, said, perhaps I'd better go. I... Oh, but you just got here, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, well, I know, but I... Uh, <clears throat> uh, Miss North, just answer one question. Did you or did you not talk to me on the phone about 15 minutes ago? Uh, uh, just a second. We couldn't have, Mr. Lawrence. Hmm? We weren't here. Hello. Hello, North. We're coming in. Come on. Wait in. a minute. Okay, Wait boy. a minute. Come on, Mrs. North. Axel and me thought we'd pay you a little visit. Well... And this must be that uh, Eugene Lawrence guy. How do you know about me? 
It ain't how I know, brother. It's what I know. Well, what do you know? Plenty. Just what is it you want? Ah, we come to the point. Cash. For what? For keeping my mouth shut. About what? About a certain dame named Mrs. Stokes. What? Yeah. I know all about it. I know her uncle was batty and she didn't want anyone to know it. I know she knocked off a guy and is willing to put up her uncle's dough to keep it quiet. Well, I'm going to have a hunk of that dough, a big hunk. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You, you think that... that I... <laughs> Say, how'd you find out about that? All of a sudden, that ain't so funny, eh? <laughs> I think I'm beginning to understand a few things at last. Okay, okay. What I want to know is, do we talk business or don't we? I'm afraid you're barking up the wrong tree, my friend. Yeah? Yeah. It's all a mistake. Okay, okay. Make like you ain't worried. But you'll sing different when I spill what I know to the cops. You're just wasting your time. I know. You think on account of you got friends on the force, they'll go easy. Well, let me tell you, a cop is a copper. <laughs> you don't know how funny this is. So it's funny. Do you make me an offer or don't you? We don't. Good. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you'd take this attitude on account I got ethics. And if you paid, I'd have shut up. But I always wanted to see you squirm, and brother, I'm going to. Come on, Axel. Okay, boss. And when things get hot north, don't think you'll get out of it by putting it all on that Mrs. Stokes. By covering her, you've been obstructing justice. And that makes you an... Uh, uh, a uh, accessory after the fact. Yeah, an accessory after the fact. Well, let's go, Axel. I got a phone call to make. And then I got an idea this isn't going to seem so funny to these punks. <laughs> Bill, surely you don't take it seriously. All I know is that it wouldn't be the first time you and Pam held out on me. It's really too silly to discuss. The whole thing's been a ridiculous comedy of errors. Don't you see, Lieutenant? He must have been the one who called me, and when I told him about the book... All right, all right. You told me that before. When the Norse get mixed up in something, there's always some explanation. And usually it turns out that the explanation is phony and that something really is going on. Bill... Do you mean to tell me that you're taking the word of a, a, a criminal against ours? Well, I don't know that he is a criminal. I don't know who it was who called me. He wouldn't give his name. It was that awful Dutch Garber. You know, we helped you catch his brother. And he's had it in for us ever since. Besides, Bill, since when have the police taken such stock in anonymous phone calls? When they concern the North. Oh, Bill, come on. Forget it, won't you? It's, it's really funny. I only wish you could see the joke. Yeah, so do I. Say... This gives me an idea for the book. Look, after they pay off the doctor... Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got to answer the phone. Oh, you're not going to keep on being silly about this, are you, Bill? Uh, no. oh, okay, oh, Pam, oh, just oh, call me sucker wagon okay. and let's forget the whole thing. Well, I'm sorry you don't trust us. It's for you, Bill. Oh, um, right, thanks. Yeah, Mullins. What's that? Who? I see... Right. Right, okay. I'll be right over. So long. Well, so it uh, was all a gag, huh? Just something out of a book. You know, someday I ought to like you Norse up just to teach you a lesson. What are you talking about? What happened, Bill? It uh, was Dutch Garber who called me, hmm? Huh? Well, he said he was going to call you. But it didn't amount to anything, did it? He thought he knew something, but it was just a lot of eyewash out of this fellow's book. What are you driving at? What's happened? Well, it seems that one of your fictional characters resented the call. What do you mean? I mean that Dutch Garber has just been found with a couple of slugs in him. What? He, he's dead? Right. Now, don't try to tell me that this is just Chapter 18. Oh. You've got a real corpse with real lead in him. You folks had better start talking and talking fast. <laughs> Gollies, I thought for a while that Bill was really going to lock us up, Jerry. Well, he's pretty sore, and I suppose you can't blame him. No, he'll never trust us again. Not unless we can solve this case and show him that we had no connection with it. Jerry, that's why I want to go down to Duchess Saloon. If we can find that fellow who was with him, he may be able to tell us something. I've got it all worked out. Do you mean you... After the doctor is paid off, Mrs. Stokes hides the body. Oh... That. Must we go into it now? Well, wait until you hear the gimmick I've got. That, that place you didn't like, this fixes it up. A 
it's a, it's a twist that'll be a sensation. I wonder why Bill let us go. He saw he couldn't get anything it, out of us. It's Doxy, and she drags the body out of the car and dumps it in the river. But what she doesn't know is well, that... Well, here we are. The body that was in the uh, car... Not now, please, please. Oh. Well, we have work to do. Uh, here, driver, keep the change. Thanks. Guys, not a very inviting place, is it? Well, it was your idea, darling. Hmm. I've seen nicer places than this in nightmares. And nicer people. Yes. Jerry, see if you can find the fellow who was with Mr. Dutch. Y you know, the one he called Axel. Are you looking for me, Mrs. North? Oh, I, I, I didn't see you. What do you want? Uh, we just wanted to ask you a few questions. Suppose I don't want to answer. Oh, that is part of the TV hospital. All we want to know is where you and Dutch went when you left our apartment. What's it to you? Oh, we just want to know. I come here. I don't know where Dutch went, so what? Where did Dutch say he was going? He didn't. Haven't you any idea whom he was going to see? Go peddle your paper someplace else. I ain't got time to bother with you. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you might be willing to help. Help what? Help us find who killed Dutch. Who killed him? Say, what are you talking about? Dutch is dead, and we're trying Why, to... Why, you dirty rat hey, out of... wait a minute. Yeah? Nobody's bumping off the boss and getting away with it, oh, see? I... What are you doing with that gun? Uh, we didn't bump off the boss. Oh, no? Now I see why you thought it was so funny when he told you what he knew. You was all ready to take care of him. Don't huh? be silly. Get back to your tables, your mugs, and sit down. I'll handle this. Please, Mr. Axel, put that gun away. It's all a mistake. I'll put it away when I'm finished with it. Oh, gollies, everything's gone wrong. And all because one leg of the kitchen table is short. <laughs> Before we return to Woodbury's Mr. and Mrs. North, this is Ben Grower for Woodbury Facial Soap. Ladies, when you work up a good bubbly lather of Woodbury on your face cloth and work it into your skin, you do more than make it immaculately clean. When you run your hand over your face, you find it softer and smoother. And when you look in your glass, you see a complexion livelier, more glowing. For Woodbury Facial Soap is truly a beauty treatment in cake form, as any glamorous Woodbury Deb will tell you. Now listen to what one of the loveliest has to say about it. She's Joanne Newcomb Price, a Woodbury Deb just married out in California. Now she has a fine textured complexion that needs especially gentle care. Yet patriotic Joanne is not one to just sit around and look pretty. She's an ardent victory gardener and sells what she grows for war relief. And here's what she writes. Gardening's dirty work, but my skin stays clear and bright with Woodbury. Even California sunshine doesn't dry or coarsen my complexion. I love the clean feel and look of my skin after a Woodbury facial cocktail. He loves it, too. Why don't you follow the marrying Woodbury Debs to romance? Ask for Woodbury Facial Soap. That's W-O-O-D-B-U-R-Y, Woodbury. The beauty soap for the skin you love to touch. Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin, the stars of Mr. and Mrs. North, will appear next Sunday night on Woodbury's other program, the Chamber Music Society of Lower Basin Street. Be sure to hear Mr. and Mrs. North on Lower Basin Street next Sunday evening, immediately following Walter Winchell. Consult your local newspaper for time and station. Now, back to the Woodbury Facial Soap Program, The Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North. Okay, now, get moving. In the back. Just a minute. Won't you please put that gun away and listen to reason? I ain't interested. Uh, look, Axel, what makes you so sure that we're the ones who bumped off the boss? Any dope would know that. Oh. Didn't anyone know he was going to try to blackmail us? Well, uh, yeah. Well, isn't it possible that they thought that uh, we paid the, the boss and, and they killed him in order to rob him? Well, of I... Of course. There's your answer, Axel. Who knew Dutch was going to come Wait over? Wait a minute. Not so fast. You're just trying to get out of it. Oh, no, we're not. But if you want to make an example, you ought to make it out of the right person. But how do I know the right person ain't you, huh? Would we have come here if we'd killed Dutch? I don't know. There'd have been no point in it. It would have been suicide. Why did you come? We want to find out who killed Dutch. And if you'd only help us, then we'd well, have... Well, okay. I guess you're right. 
Oh. <sighs> it feels good to breathe again. All right, Mr. Uh... Uh, Axel. Now, who knew that uh, Dutch hoped to get money from us? Well, Pinky and, uh... Yes? Only Pinky, that's all. I thought you were going to say someone else. I says only Pinky. All right, all right. Uh, where can we find uh, Pinky? That's him over there. Hey, Pinky, come here. Has he been here ever since you got back? Yeah. Hello, hello. Hey, uh, did I see a bit of gunplay a moment ago? Uh, just a little disagreement. Think nothing of it. Don't worry. I'll only think something of it if something like that didn't happen in this place. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. North. Oh, I see you know us. Oh, yes, I get around, I get around. I'd like to ask you a question, Mr. Uh, Pinky. Go oh, right ahead, but I uh, don't promise an answer. Uh, where were you while Axel and Dutch were out calling on us? Right here. Why? Can you prove it? Maybe. What's it to you? Oh, nothing. Only you may have to. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And now may I ask a question? Sure, sure. Little John Kieran, that's me. Who's that pretty girl at your table? Uh, Lulu? I don't know. I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah, that's Lulu. Dutch's girl. Leave her out of this. Oh, but Axel, with her looks, it's a shame to leave her out. But she don't know nothing, see? Shame on you, Axel. That's no way to talk about a young lady. I mean about Dutch's murder. Dutch's murder? Hey, what do you mean? Uh, Axel, you've spilled the beef. Hey, is Dutch been... As if you didn't know. No, Axel, honest, I was here the whole time. Well, while you two decide who was where, I'm going over and talk to Glamopus. Wait a minute, Nort. I tell you, she didn't know nothing, see? That's all right. With her looks, she doesn't have to. I just want to talk to her. Well, I'm going with you. So am I. Okay. Jerry, I'm surprised at you. She's nothing but a painted floozy. Well, I've always been an admirer of painting, sweetheart. Uh, hello, gorgeous. May we join you? I, uh, sure, big boy. Sit down. Who's a dame with you? Oh, don't mind her. She's a little number I picked up in the subway. Pinky will take her off my hands, won't you, pal? Jerry. I see you've got ideas, but my boyfriend will be coming back soon and, uh... He's not going to like him. Dutch? Yeah. You know him? Sure. But don't worry about Dutch. He won't be coming back for a long time. How do you know? I know. So, come on. Let's be friends. Take your hands off of her. Why? She likes me. Don't you, honey? Well. See? Leave her alone. Go away, Axel. I'm busy. I see you are. North, if you don't leave her alone, I'm going to... Did you say North? Yeah, Gerald North. Hey, what is this? Oh, Axel, now you went and spoiled it all. What is this, North? What's going on? What are you trying to do? That's what I'd like to know. Just checking on a motive? What do you mean? Well, I never really believed robbery was the motive because the murderer couldn't know where the Dutch had the money. So I began looking for another motive, and I think I've found it. Motive? Murderer? Hey, what are you talking about? About Dutch. He's been murdered. Oh, 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 hey, Lolo, please don't. I have an idea it was Axel who murdered him. Oh, oh, yeah, because you were in love with Dutch's girl. Oh, oh, Axel, you, you, you And didn't. you figured this would be a good time to do it, because Why, you... Dutch had just informed on me, so I'd be suspected instead of you. After all, you thought I was already involved in one murder, so I was a natural fall guy. Uh, no, you don't. Don't reach for that gun again. Let go. Not yet, brother. Hey, Pinky. Hey, Lawrence, how about some help? Right on, Lawrence. Get you. Watch out for those two guys. Guys, hey, Michael, run. Hey, Pinky. Hey, Pinky. Well, I was trying to tell you, North, about the book. Oh, there's a free for all, and then... Oh, I can't break it up. Come on, break it up. I got you covered, all of you. Cops, right. Pop it up your hands, you mug. Axel's going for the door. Look up, Ham. We're in the line of fire, so Bill can't shoot. Here, duck under the stage. All right. Oh, we got down just in time. Yeah, Bill's driven him into the corner. Come on, drop your guns and come out of there. You can't get away. The place is surrounded. Okay, mister, you ask. You see, North, there's this... Free for all, and then the cops break in oh, and arrest Mrs. Stokes, and then come the switch. It isn't Mrs. Stokes. Mrs. Stokes is the co- co- corpse. And now I ask you, is that a switch or is that a switch? Oh. Bill jumped them and got him. Oh. Well, North, how does the plot strike you now? Not so hard. Why? What's the matter with it? Well, somehow I found it awfully hard to keep my mind on it. <laughs> So that's why Bill let us go. Yeah, he knew he couldn't get us to talk, so he let us go and followed us, thinking we'd lead him into something. Well, we certainly did. Mm-hmm. Golly, Jerry, he came right in the nick of time, just like the Marines. Oh, it certainly was lucky he followed us. Lucky? 
Well, wasn't it? <laughs> Pam, do you think I'm crazy? What do you mean, dear? Do you think I'd have gotten into a fight with a murderer in a dive like that if I didn't know the police had been following me? Oh, you knew all the time. Of course. But even so, it was a pretty bad few minutes. I hope I'll never have to go through anything like it again. Well, I know what you can do to prevent it. What? You can fix that leg on the kitchen table. <laughs> Your bookseller has on sale the latest Mr. and Mrs. North mystery novel. It's titled Killing the Goose. Get a copy of Killing the Goose tonight. The next Wednesday evening, another radio adventure of Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtis. For thrills and laughs, be sure to listen, won't you? Music for Mr. and Mrs. North is conducted by Charles Paul. This is Ben Grauer saying good night for Woodbury Facial Soap, the beauty soap for the skin you love to touch. Love will never, never change. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Linda. Now, thanks for calling, Angel, but I can't make it tonight. The fellow was caught playing with matches, and it made him so mad, I have to get to him before he gets all burned up. This is Ed Hurley, he friends, inviting you to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon, transcribed today, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Flaming Club. Case of the Flaming Club. It's late Sunday night in New York when Eric Dean walks slowly to the door of his apartment. He looks through the keys on his key ring for the one which fits the lock. He tries one. After a couple of tries, gets it in the lock but finds it won't turn. He's fumbling for another key when he hears someone on the other side of the door. Eric? Yeah? Is that you? Yeah, yeah, it's me, Georgia. What are you expecting? Just a minute. Come on in. Yes, ma'am. No. You've been drinking. Is that a fact? Well, who wouldn't be? Went over the books at Larrabee tonight. We keep getting further in the red. In fact, we're broke. Now, isn't there any way to cut expenses? Cut expenses. Cut expenses. What are we going to do? We fired the band. Got to keep a bartender and a piano player. Oh, there must be something. We can stop eating. Cut expenses at home. Cancel my life insurance. Sure, we can cut expenses. Oh, no, now you're talking about it now. I can see that. But tomorrow... I don't want to talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> Just want to sing and dance. Come on, Judge. Oh. Let's dance. Oh, stop it. All right, what's the matter? Don't you want to dance? Nobody wants to dance. Nobody wants to have fun. I want to have fun. Lots of fun. Laughs. I want to blow my brains out. Ten thirty, and we got six couples. Well, Dean, it was your idea to chuck the band. My idea? They wanted to be paid. There's only one out. You mean there still is an out, Larrabee? One. What? Come on in the office. Okay. Don't tell me you found a sucker we can unload on. No, nothing like that. Well, Larrabee? We could have a fire. What? You heard me. A fire. We have insurance. Are you crazy? It's been done. Yeah. People have gone to jail for it, too. Their only chance to get out from under. Can't you see that, Dean? I don't like it. There's a bottle. Now, wait a minute, pal. Nothing to drink until we get this settled. It is settled. No fire. Why not? 
A can of gasoline, a match, and we collect. I said no, Larrabee. You talk too much. You'd be sure to shoot your mouth off. You think I'm crazy? I think if we got away with it, which we probably wouldn't, but if we did, you'd have to start bragging about how sharp we were. Dean, I give you my word. I know you, Larrabee. I know you'd start... What's the matter? Just a minute. I thought hey. so. All right, Morgan, what's the idea? Let go, Mr. Dean. You were listening at the door. No, honest. Then what were you doing here? You're supposed to be at the bar. I, j- I just wanted to ask you something. There's a phone at the bar, there's a phone here. Dean's yeah. right, Morgan. What are you doing here? Well, Mr. Larrabee, believe me, I... I, I You've I, been snooping. No, Mr. Dean. A Dean's. snooper and a liar, too. Well, that's all for you, mister. You're through, as of now. Not so fast, Dean. What about my back pay? You owe me three weeks... So it. Now, you can't do this. Don't tell me what I can do. You're fired. Don't be a fool, Dean. Get back to the bar, Morgan. I'll straighten this out with Dean. I'm not sure I want that. Now, be reasonable. Dean's upset, that's all. He doesn't realize what he's saying. Oh, don't I? No. Well, Morgan? All right, Mr. Larrabee. If you say so. That's it, Morgan. I'm sorry about Dean, but we've been having a lot of trouble. And... I'm not surprised with him asking for it. And believe me, if he keeps on like that... You haven't seen anything yet. What'll it be, mister? I'd like to see Mr. Dean. No, you wouldn't. Well, why do you say that? Nobody likes to see him. Okay, then let's say he'd like to see me. He phoned me. Oh. Well, try that door back there. I think he's in the office. Thanks. Is it? Mike Waring. Oh, yes, Waring. Come in. Well, good of you to come, Waring. Sit down. Thanks. Oh, what do you want with the detectives? Tell me. How good are you at shadowing? Good enough that I don't waste my time at it. If that's all you want, why pay my fee? This is something special. I got a partner, Mark Larrabee. I want a record of all his movements. Why? Does it matter? I want him followed. I'm willing to pay. You're willing to pay too much. I want to be sure nothing goes wrong. That's why I want the Falcon. Funny thing about me, Dean. When I'm on a case, I like to know what I'm doing. You'll be following Larrabee. Yeah, that's what I call a lot of information. I didn't know you were going to be so curious. It's my business. Well, I'm going away for a few days. Perhaps I want to be sure Larrabee stays away from my wife. Yeah, perhaps you do. There are a lot of other detectives in town who'll keep tab for you. I'm not interested in that kind of business. Why not? I never cared for gossip. You wouldn't have to gossip, just report. See what I mean? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm not afraid of Larrabee calling on Georgia. Well, then we're right back where we started. All right, Waring, if you must know, here it is. Larrabee's been drawing a lot of money out of the business. I can't find out what he does with it. I think he's been gambling. I have to know so I can straighten him out if he is. Mm-hmm. Now will you take the case? Well, you know something, Dean? I still think you're lying. But if you're so anxious to dump cash in my lap, I don't see why I should deprive you of the pleasure. Yeah, all right. It's a deal. Here I am, mister, in this doorway. You looking for me? No. And how come you've been following me ever since I left the club? Have I? Oh, that's a brilliant conversation. Well, I'm not an old coward. I never would have known. Who are you? Does it matter? It matters that you're following me. What's the idea? Who told you I'd be following you? I got eyes. But I haven't been beating Tom Toms. How come you spotted me? You just aren't as sharp as you think. Uh-huh. Or somebody tipped you. Now, who? Look, just because you're clumsy. Not that clumsy. We won't discuss it. You've been following me and you're going to stop. You know what's stopping me? This, if it has to. That loaded? Hang around, you'll find out. No, I'll take your word. I don't like to set up anyway. Good night, Larrabee. Hey, mister, I just noticed the time. You're out of luck. No, not necessarily, driver. Yeah, but it's after two. The club will be closed. Well, I'm not going for entertainment. Just want to talk to the bartender. He may still be around. Okay, just thought you might want to know. Oh, thanks. Some guys raise holy net if you don't... Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? Fire engines. Hey, look, 
they're stopping in the next block. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I see the smoke coming out of that building. Hey. Well, what? Look up there. Isn't that the club where you wanted me to take you? Is it? Yeah, you're right, it is. It's on fire. Yeah, so I see. Back to the adventures of the Falcon. It's a few minutes since Mike Waring discovered that his client's club could briefly boast of the hottest show in town. Now the Falcon is pushed through the crowd and into the burning building. He makes his way through the smoke and flames to the basement steps, hurries down until he's stopped by a fireman at the bottom. Hey. Hey, where do you think you're going? I wanted to see what started this. Well, get out of here. You want to get killed? <laughs> Make like I'm a fireman, too, huh? I got no time for games. Look, it's just that I've got a hunch there's something phony about this fire. I want... Hey, there's a lot of smoke. <laughs> what do you expect? Well, if I could just see a look... <coughs> hey. Hey, look over there. Where? Here in that pile of boxes. Aren't those a man's legs sticking out from behind there? Uh, I don't see any. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Come on. Yeah, here he is. That's Dean. Who? One of the owners of this place. Well, help me get him out of here. We can get him to the respirator. Well, I'm afraid he'll... artificial respiration won't do him any good. Well, you never can tell. Uh, in this case, you can't. <laughs> Look at his chest. He's been stabbed to death. Well, Corbett, looks like we've got the fire under control. Yeah, Waring. Now, come on over to the car. I want to get a few things straight. All right. But isn't it a waste of time, Corbett? You know you'll never keep them straight. Yeah, that's right, Waring. Make with the gags. Us police don't know from nothing. It takes a bright private op like you to bungle a routine tale so bad a man pulls a gun on you. I didn't bungle. He must have been tipped. By who? Well, that's one thing I'm going to find out. <laughs> really hurts, don't it? Yeah. And now, Waring, tell me something about this fellow, Dean. I told you. He was going out of town. He wanted me to keep an eye on his partner, Mark Larrabee. I did, with the results that please you so much. Uh, what did Dean expect you to catch Larrabee doing? Well, he said he was afraid Larrabee was tossing his bankroll down a roulette rat hole. And he wanted me to check. Is Dean his partner's keeper? He claimed he was working at it. Did you swallow Dean's yarn? Would you? <laughs> you kidding? But I'm not smart like you, Waring. Well, Dean's story smelled, but I played along to see how things lined up. And the fire coming right at this time seemed too much of a coincidence. You think Larrabee started it after he shook you? Well, it's something to check. Along with, how come Dean winds up in the basement of his club when he claimed he'd be out of town? He planned to leave. He hadn't gotten around to it. Well, how do you know? You're not the only one who can make brilliant deductions, Waring. I found an airplane ticket in his pocket to Pittsburgh on the 4 a.m. plane out of LaGuardia, from which I deduced he was planning to fly to Pittsburgh this morning. Corbett, you're a genius. Now, if you're through with me, I'll be running along. There's some angles I still want to look into. Why bother, Waring? Your client's dead. Look, I'm going to prove somebody tipped Larrabee about me tailing him. You don't have to prove it, Waring. Somebody did tip him. Yeah? Sure, Waring. You did. <laughs> Wait a minute, will you? Oh. I'm coming. Uh, oh, it's you, Wary. Don't you know it's the middle of the night? No, no, I didn't. My watch stopped. Uh, I'm laughing. Well, I wanted to get to you before anyone else did. What? If you work for Dean and Larrabee, mm. I thought you might be able to tell me something about them. Like what, for instance? Like why you tipped Larrabee that I was hired to tail him. What are you talking about? How would I know? You could have listened in on my conversation with Dean. Listened in? Me? You know my name. You called me by it just now. Well, you well, you told me at, at the club. Yeah, think again, chum. I just went into the club and stopped at the bar to ask for Dean. I never mentioned my name to you. Well, I... I what's the difference if I do know your name? Because maybe that's not all you know. Maybe you know Dean hired me. And if I do... Then maybe you tip Larrabee. And if I did... Now, that'll break Corbett's heart. Who's Corbett? Sergeant Corbett, Homicide Squad. What's he... What's he got to do with this? He likes to rip me. And you wake me up in the middle of the night on any kind of a rib? No, not entirely. There's been a fire. Do you know anything about that? 
Fire? Yes, the club burned down. What? Kind of a coincidence, wouldn't you say? Why? Coming right when one of the owners is suspicious enough of the other to hire a detective to tail him? You think Larrabee or Dean, the fire... Yeah, Larrabee or Dean, the fire. It didn't start itself. But they couldn't have done it. Why not? Well, you were following Larrabee, you say, and, and Dean was on a train to Chicago. Train to Chicago? Where'd you get that idea? Well, he told me. Dean, when? When he left the club last night around six. Dean said he was taking a train to Chicago? I told you. Yeah, I know, so you did. But that's not what the plane ticket says. What plane ticket? The one that's not for a train to Chicago. That don't make sense. Uh, no, pal, you're catching on. But why should it make sense? Nothing else in this case does. Oh, no, no. Uh, all right, all right. Oh, Mr. Larrabee. Hello, Morgan. I'm coming in. Sure. Sure. After all, why should you be an exception? Has someone been here already this morning? Hey, hey let go. Answer me. W Waring was here. Waring? Did you talk? No. You didn't say anything about what you heard the other day, me and Dean talking about a fire. No, I didn't tell Are you. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Hey, what's the idea? I asked you a question. I answered. I want to be sure you're telling the truth. I am, I am. You better be, because that was just a warning, Morgan. If I find out you've been shooting your mouth off, maybe that's not all that'll get shot. Think it over. Hello, Mr. Waring. You mind if I join you? Why, what a question, Angel. Sit down. Thank you. You wonder how I know your name? Do I? Sergeant Corbett told me about you. He told me you eat in this restaurant quite often. Well, bless his little heart. I'm Mrs. Dean. Oh. The sergeant tells me you're suspicious about last night's fire. Mm-hmm. So I understand there's going to be trouble getting the insurance company to pay off. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. You were following Larrabee, so you know he didn't start the fire. How do you know about that? Corbett? No. I talked to Morgan, the bartender. Ah, you're a busy little chicken for someone who's just lost a husband. Well, I'm on my own now. I have to look out for myself. Mm-hmm. But well, didn't your husband have life insurance? Yes. Then you looked after him. The fire won't affect that. I know. But I have a right to collect on the fire insurance, too. Mm -hmm. My husband wouldn't have started the fire. He wanted to prevent it. That's why he hired you. Yes, that's what I figured. But how do you know about it? He told me. He and Larrabee had an argument about it. Larrabee wanted to burn their place, and Eric was against it. You realize you're admitting that Larrabee had arson on his mind. Yes. But you were following him, so you know that he didn't do it. How do you know I didn't see him start the fire? Because then there wouldn't be speculation. You'd have had him arrested. All right, I didn't see him. Well, here's something Morgan didn't tell you. Larrabee shook me before the fire, so he could have done it after he left me. I don't believe it. I don't believe. It's the truth. Oh, dear. I, I didn't know that that changes things. Yes, it certainly does. So I'm afraid I can't help you. But maybe you can help me. How? Your husband told me he was going out of town. Do you know where he was going? Well, of course. And do you know how he was going? Train or plane? Well, train. He doesn't like planes. He gets sick. I see. But I guess he missed the train. Yes, so it would seem. He had plenty of time. He left the apartment at 8 and... Said the train didn't leave until nine. And he did intend to take the nine o'clock train to Chicago, hmm? Chicago? Well, yes. What's the matter? Well, he wasn't going to Chicago. He was going to Palm Beach. to the adventures of the Vulcan. Half an hour has passed since Mike Waring learned that his client apparently had tried to dash off in all directions only to wind up where he started with a knife in his chest. 
Now the Falcon is at headquarters and has tossed the confusion to Sergeant Corbett. Wait a minute, Waring. Wait a minute. Uh, sure, Corbett. I'm not going anywhere. Let's get this straight. Dean tells the bartender he's taking the train to Chicago. Then he tells the wife he's taking the train to Palm Beach. If they're telling the truth. And when we find him in New York, he has a plane ticket to Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I've finally figured it out, Corbett. Yeah, I know. He really intended to go to Kennebunkport, Maine. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding, Corbett. You see, I checked with the Weather Bureau. Weather Bureau? Where do they fit? They told me there was a bad storm in Virginia. Very interesting. There was also an earthquake in Peru. So what? So I checked with the railroad. Dean got on the train to Chicago last night. Then I suppose he got on a train to Palm Beach. Well, I wouldn't know. Hmm. Gets clearer all the time. Well, if we can get that bartender to talk, it will. Yeah? Yeah. He had a fight with Dean a few days ago, and Dean tried to fire him. Oh, so you think this makes the bartender so sore he murders Dean and burns down the club? No, no, no. He'd hardly go that far just over the loss of a job. Jack. But he knows something. And he's one up on me. Well, in that case, let's go catch up with him, shall we? Now, what do you fellas want? Have you caught up on your sleep, Morgan? Don't make me laugh. That's going in, Waring. Uh, hey, hey, hey. You can close the door, Morgan. What do you want? You said Dean left the club at six last night. Yeah. Did he go back? No. He was killed in the club. Well, I mean, I didn't see him. And he wasn't hanging around the club? No. What are you trying to prove, Waring? I'm just trying to account for Dean's time. He left his home around eight. Turns out to be killed in the club at 2.30. Now, what was he doing in the meantime? You got any ideas? Yes, Corbett, I have. I think he went to Philadelphia. Oh, great. Now he goes to Philly. Why? People keep coming here. I'm going to Philly or someplace. Oh, Larrabee. Hello, Morgan. I wanted to... Oh, company. I'll come back. No, no, don't mind us, Larrabee. Come in. I can come back later. Why are you so anxious to get away? Is it because you're afraid we found out about you? What about me? Did you and Dean had a row about the fire? You wanted a fire. He was against it. Morgan, I warn you. Yeah, cut, cut it out. Cut right, it out. Larrabee, stop it. And you're a smart boy, Larrabee. That outburst proves Morgan knows about you. What do you mean? Morgan didn't tell us. Mrs. Dean did. But now that you've shown that Morgan knows, too, he's going to have to talk. What else do you want to know if you know about the fire? Just this, Morgan. Why did Dean object to Larrabee's idea? Now, come on, don't look at Larrabee. He can't hurt you. Well... Waring asked you a question, Morgan. Answer him. Now, look, Morgan, we know Larrabee wanted to start a fire. We know Dean objected. Now, why did he object? With me money in his pocket, too. He was afraid Larrabee might talk. He said Larrabee can never keep his mouth shut. I see. Well, that does it. Does what? What are we trying to prove? Dean's motive. Motive for what? For starting the fire. Well, you mean Dean started the fire? Yes. You see, Dean was afraid to let Larrabee know that's what he intended to do. Ah, so he nixed Larrabee's plan. Mm -hmm, but then he hired me to tail Larrabee so that I'd be a witness when the fire started that Larrabee had nothing to do with it. Yeah. And Dean hops a Chicago train, stays on it just long enough to establish his presence, then slips off the train, probably somewhere around Philly, and flies back to New York. Ah, I get it. He figures to start the fire, then hop a plane to Pittsburgh and slip back on the train there. That's right. That way both partners have an alibi for the fire. But Larrabee catches Dean at the fire and kills him. That's a lie. Why would I kill him if he's doing what I wanted? Well, uh... He's got a point, Corbett. Maybe he wanted all the insurance for himself. I don't know. Well, if you really want to know, don't ask Larrabee. Ask Morgan. Me? Why me? Because, Morgan, you're the one who killed Dean, aren't you? <laughs> Wipe your eyes, Corbett. Maybe I'll pull a boner next week. Morgan confessed. He caught Dean starting the fire, and Dean threatened to frame him. He was going to use that row they had when he tried to fire Morgan as a motive and claim Morgan started the fire for revenge. Mm -hmm. Larrabee and Dean would have alibis, and that would leave Morgan holding the match. Right. It panicked Morgan, and he killed Dean. Oh, well, there it is, Waring. I'll just run along. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait a minute, Corbett. What kind of a straight man are you? Huh? You haven't asked me how I knew Morgan was the murderer. 
All right, go ahead. Well, Dean told his wife he was going to Palm Beach. Say, that's right. I forgot about Palm Beach. Well, so did Dean when he heard about the storm in Virginia. His original plan, apparently, was to work his alibi on a Palm Beach train. But bad weather made it risky, counting on a plane to get him back to the train. So he switches to a Chicago train. That's right. And Morgan said, Dean told him he was going to Chicago. Dean left the club at six, and Morgan claimed he hadn't seen him again. Still, when Dean left home at eight, he told his wife he was going to Palm Beach. So he hadn't switched plans by eight, which means Morgan was lying. He must have seen Dean again after eight. Mm. All right, Waring. You feel better now that you got that off your chest? Oh, yes, much better, Corbett. Thanks. Well, that's good, Waring. You need something to cheer you up? Do I? You will when I tell you. Morgan has confessed to the murder, but he still denies tipping off Larrabee about you telling him. So it looks like it was just your own bungling. <laughs> good night, Waring. <laughs> 